Section One of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Six, by Anonymous, translated by Richard Francis Burton. Five hundred and thirty seventh night to five hundred and thirty ninth night. Simbad the seaman and Simbad the landsman. There lived in the city of Baghdad, during the reign of the commander of the faithful, Harun al Rashid, a man named Simbad the Hamal, one in poor case who bore burdens on his head for hire. It happened to him one day of a great heat that whilst he was carrying a heavy load he became exceeding weary and sweated profusely the heat and the weight alike oppressing him presently as he was passing the gate of a merchant's house before which the ground was swept and watered and there the air was temperate he sighted a broad bench beside the door so he set his load thereon to take rest and smell the air and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the five hundred and thirty-seventh night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the hamal set his load upon the bench to take rest and smell the air there came out upon him from the court door a pleasant breeze and a delicious fragrance he sat down on the edge of the bench and at once heard from within the melodious sound of lutes and other stringed instruments and mirth-exciting voices singing and reciting, together with the song of birds warbling and glorifying Almighty Allah, in various tunes and tongues, turtles, mocking-birds, merles, nightingales, cushats, and stone curlews, whereat he marvelled in himself, and was moved to mighty joy and solace. Then he went up to the gate, and saw within a great flower-garden wherein were pages and black slaves and such a train of servants and attendants and so forth as is found only with kings and sultans and his nostrils were greeted with the savoury odours of all manner meats rich and delicate and delicious and generous wines so he raised his eyes heavenwards and said glory to thee o lord o creator and provider who provides whomso thou wilt without count or stint o mine holy one i cry thee pardon for all sins and turn to thee repenting of all offences o lord there is no gainsaying thee in thine ordinance and thy dominion neither wilt thou be questioned of that thou dost for thou indeed over all things art almighty extolled be thy perfection whom thou wilt thou makest poor and whom thou wilt thou makest rich whom thou wilt thou exaltest and whom thou wilt thou abasest and there is no god but thou how mighty is thy majesty and how enduring thy dominion and how excellent thy government verily thy favourest whom thou wilt of thy servants whereby the owner of this place abideth in all joyance of life and delighteth himself with a pleasant sense and delicious meats and exquisite wines of all kind for indeed thou appointest unto thy creatures that which thou wilt and that which hast foreordained unto them wherefore are some weary and others are at rest and some enjoy fair fortune and affluence whilst others suffer the extreme of travail and misery even as i do and he fell to reciting how many by my labours that evermore endure all goods of life and joy and in coolish shade recline each morn that dawns i wake in travail and in bow and strange is my condition and my burden gars me pine many others are in luck and from misery are free and fortune never loads them with loads the like of mine they live their happy days in all solace and delight eat drink and dwell in honour mid the noble and the dine all living things are made of little rock of sperm thine origin is mine and my providence is thine yet the difference and distance twixt the twain of us afar as the difference of saviour twixt vinegar and wine 
but at thee o god all wise i venture not to rail whose ordinance is just and whose justice cannot fail when simbad the porter had made an end to reciting his verses he bore up his burden and was about to fare on when there came forth to him from the gate a little foot-page fair of face and shapely of shape and dainty of dress who caught him by the hand saying come in and speak with my lord for he calleth for thee the porter would have excused himself to the page but the lad would take no refusal so he left his load with the doorkeeper in the vestibule and followed the boy into the house which he found to be a goodly mansion radiant and full of majesty till he brought him to a grand sitting-room wherein he saw a company of nobles and great lords seated at tables garnished with all manner of flowers and sweet-scented herbs besides great plenty of dainty viands and fruits dried and fresh and confections and wines of the choicest vintages there also were instruments of music and mirth and lovely slave girls playing and singing all the company was ranked according to rank and in the highest place sat a man of a worshipful and noble aspect whose bedside's horrorness had stricken and he was stately of stature and fair of favour agreeable of aspect and full of gravity and dignity and majesty so simbad the porter was confounded at that which he beheld and said in himself by allah this must be either a piece of paradise or some king's palace then he saluted the company with much respect praying for their prosperity and kissing the ground before them stood with his head bowed down in humble attitude and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the five hundred and thirty-eighth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that simbad the porter after kissing ground between their hands stood with his head bowed down in humble attitude the master of the house bade him draw near and be seated and bespoke him kindly bidding him welcome then he set before him various kinds of vines rich and delicate and delicious and the porter after saying his bismillah fell to and ate his fill after which he exclaimed praise be allah what so be our case and washing his hands returned thanks to the company for his entertainment quoth the host thou art welcome and thy day is a blessed but what is thy name and calling quoth the other o my lord my name is simbad the hamel and i carry folks goods on my head for hire the housemaster smiled and rejoined know o porter that thy name is even as mine for i am simbad the seaman and now o porter i would have thee let me hear the couplets thou recitedst at the gate at noon the porter was abashed and replied allah upon thee excuse me for toil and travail and lack of luck when the hand is empty teach a man ill manners and boorish ways said the host be not ashamed thou art become my brother but repeat to me the verses for they pleased me when as i heard thee recite them at the gate hereupon the porter repeated the couplets and they delighted the merchant who said to him know o hamal that my story is a wonderful one and thou shalt hear all that befell me and all i underwent ere i rose to this state of prosperity and became the lord of this place wherein thou seest me for i came not to this high estate save after travail sore and perils galore and how much toil and trouble have i not suffered in days of yore i have made seven voyages by each of which hangeth a marvellous tale such as confoundeth the reason and all this came to pass by doom of fortune and fate for from what destiny doth right there is neither refuge nor flight know then good my lords continued he that i am about to relate the first voyage of simbad the seaman my father was a merchant one of the notables of my native place a moneyed man and ample of means who died whilst i was yet a child leaving me much wealth in money and lands and farmhouses when i grew up i laid hands on the whole and ate of the best and drank freely and wore rich clothes and lived lavishly companioning and consorting with youths of my own age 
and considering that this course of life would continue for ever and cannot change. Thus did I for a long time, but at last I awoke from my heedlessness, and, returning to my senses, I found my wealth had become unwealth, and my condition ill-conditioned, and all I once had had left my hand. And recovering my reason, I was stricken with dismay and confusion, and bethought me of a saying of our Lord Solomon, son of David, on who be peace, which I had heard aforetime from my father. Three things are better than other three. The day of death is better than the day of birth. A live dog is better than a dead lion, and the grave is better than want. Then I got together my remains of estates and property, and sold all, even my clothes, for three thousand dirhams, with which I resolved to travel to foreign parts, remembering the saying of the poet, by means of toil man shall skate to height, who to fame aspire mustn't sleep a night, who seeketh pearl in the deep must dive, winning weal and wealth by his main and might, and who seeketh fame without toil and strife, the impossible seeketh and wasted life. So taking heart, I bought me goods, merchandise, and all needed for a voyage, and, impatient to be at sea, I embarked, with a company of merchants, on board a ship bound for Basura. There we again embarked, and sailed many days and nights, and we passed from isle to isle, and sea to sea, and shore to shore, buying and selling and bartering everywhere the ship touched, and continued our course till we came to an island, as it were garth of the gardens of paradise. Here the captain cast anchor, and making fast to the shore, put out the landing planks. So all on board landed and made furnaces, and lighting fires therein, busied themselves in various ways, some cooking and some washing, whilst others some walked about the island for solace, and the crew fell to eating and drinking and playing and sporting. I was one of the walkers, but, as we were thus engaged, behold the master, who was standing on the gunwale, cried out to us at the top of his voice, saying, Ho there, passengers, run for your lives, and hasten back to the ship, and leave your gear, and save yourselves from destruction. Allah preserve you, for this island whereon ye stand is no true island, but a great fish, stationary amiddlemost of the sea whereon the sand has settled, and trees have sprung up of all time, so that it is become like unto an island. But when ye lighted fires on it, it felt the heat and moved, and in a moment it will sink with you into the sea, and ye will all be drowned. So leave your gear, and seek your safety, ere you die. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say, when it was the five hundred and thirty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the shipmaster cried to the passengers, Leave your gear and seek safety ere ye die, all who heard him left gear and goods, clothes washed and unwashed, firepots and brass cooking pots, and fled back to the ship for their lives, and some reached it, while others, among whom was I, did not, for suddenly the island shook, and sank into the abysses of the deep with all that were thereon, and the dashing sea surged over it with clashing waves. I sank with the others down, down into the deep, but Almighty Allah preserved me from drowning, and threw in my way a great wooden tub of those that had served the ship's company for tubbing. I gripped it for the sweetness of life, and, bestriding it like one riding, paddled with my feet like oars, whilst the waves tossed me as in sport right and left, Meanwhile the captain made sail and departed with those who had reached the ship, regardless of the drowning and the drowned, and I ceased not following the vessel with my eyes, till she was hid from sight, and I made sure of death. Darkness closed in upon me while in this plight, and the winds and waves bore me on all that night and the next day, till a tub brought to with me under the lee of a lofty island, with trees overhanging the tide. I caught hold of a branch, and by its aid clambered up on to the land, after coming nigh upon death. But when I reached the shore, I found my legs cramped and numbed, and my feet brought traces of the nibbling of fish upon their soles. Withal I had felt nothing for excess of anguish and fatigue. I threw myself down on the island ground, like a dead man, 
and drowned in desolation swooned away. Nor did I return to my senses till next morning, when the sun rose and revived me, but I found my feet swollen, so made shift to move by shuffling on my breech and crawling on my knees, for in that island were found store of fruits and springs of sweet water. I ate of the fruits which strengthened me, and thus I abode days and nights, till my life seemed to return, and my spirits began to revive, and I was better able to move about. So, after due consideration, I fell to exploring the island, and diverting myself with gazing upon all things that Allah Almighty had created there, and rested under the trees from one of which I cut me a staff to lean upon. One day, as I walked along the marge, I caught sight of some object in the distance, and thought it a wild beast, or one of the monster creatures of the sea, but, as I drew near it, looking hard the while, I saw that it was a noble mare, teethed on the beach. Presently I went up to her, but she cried out against me with a great cry, so that I trembled for fear and turned to go away. When there came forth a man from under the earth, and followed me, crying out and saying, Who and whence art thou, and what caused thee to come hither? O my lord, answered I, I am in very sooth a waif, a stranger, and was left to drown with sundry others by the ship we voyaged in. But Allah graciously sent me a wooden tub, so I saved myself thereon, and it floated with me, till the waves cast me up on this island. When he heard this, he took my hand and saying, Come with me, carried me into a great sardab, or underground chamber, which was spacious as a saloon. He made me sit down at its upper end, then he brought me somewhat of food, and being unhungered, I ate till I was satisfied and refreshed. And when he had put me at mine ease, he questioned me of myself, and I told him all that had befallen me from first to last. And as he wondered at my adventure, I said, By Allah, O oh my Lord, excuse me, I have told thee the truth of my case and accident which betide me, and now I desire that thou tell me who thou art, and why thou abidest here under the earth, and why thou hast cheated yonder mare on the brink of the sea, answered he, know that I am one of the several who are stationed in different parts of this island, and we are the grooms of King Mirjan, and under our hand are all his horses. Every month, about new moon tide, we bring hither our best mares, which have never been covered, and picket them on the seashore and hide ourselves in this place under the ground, so that none may espy us. Presently the stallions of the sea scent the mares, and come up out of the water, and seeing no one, leap the mares, and do their will of them. When they have covered them, they try to drag them away with them, but cannot, by reason of the leg-ropes. So they cry out at them, and butt at them, and kick them, which we hearing, know that the stallions have dismounted, so we run out and shout at them, whereupon they are startled, and return in fear to the sea. Then the mares conceive by them, and bear colts and fillies, worth a mint of money, nor is their like to be found on earth's face. This is the time of the coming forth of the sea stallions, and, inshallah, I will bear thee to King Mirjan. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say, End of section 1. Recording by Christine G. in Oslo, Norway. The 10th of December, 2011. Section 2 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. 540th Night to 542nd Night. When it was the 540th Night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the Psyche said to Simba the seaman, I will bear thee to King Mirjan, and show thee our country, and know that hadst thou not happened on us, 
thou hadst perished miserably and none had known of thee but i will be the means of the saving of thy life and of thy return to thine own land i called down blessings on him and thanked him for his kindness and courtesy and while we were yet talking behold the starling came up out of the sea and giving a great cry sprang upon the mare and covered her when he had done his will of her he dismounted and would have carried her away with him but could not by reason of the teether she kicked and cried out at him whereupon the groom took a sword and target and ran out of the underground saloon smiting the buckler with the blade and calling to his company who came up shouting and brandishing spears and the stallion took fright at them and plunging into the sea like a buffalo disappeared under the waves after this we sat a while till the rest of the grooms came up each leading a mare and seeing me with their fellow psyche questioned me of my case and i repeated my story to them thereupon they drew near me and spreading the table ate and invited me to eat so i ate with them after which they took horse and mounting me on one of the mares set out with me and fared on without ceasing till we came to the capital city of king mirjan and going into him acquainted him with my story then he sent for me and when they sent me before him and salams had been exchanged he gave me a cordial welcome and wished me long life and bade me tell him my tale so i related to him all that i had seen and all that had befallen me from first to last whereat he marvelled and said to me by allah o my son thou hast indeed been miraculously preserved were not the term of thy life a long one thou hadst not escaped from these straits but praised by allah for safety then he spoke cheerily to me and entreated me with kindness and consideration moreover he made me his agent for the port and register for all ships that entered the harbour i attended him regularly to receive his commandments and he favoured me and did me all manner of kindness and invested me with costly and splendid robes indeed i was high in credit with him as an intercessor for the folk and an intermediary between them and him when they wanted aught of him i abode thus a great while and as often as i passed through the city or to the port i questioned the merchants and travellers and sailors of the city of baghdad so happily i might hear of an occasion to return to my native land but could find none who knew it or knew any who resorted thither at this i was chagrined for i was weary of long strangerhood and my disappointment endured for a time till one day going in to king mirjan i found him with a company of indians i saluted them and they returned my salam and politely welcomed me and asked me of my country and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the five hundred and forty-fourth night she continued it hath reached me o auspicious king that simba the seaman said when they asked me of my country i questioned them of theirs and they told me that they were of various castes some being called shakiria who are the noblest of their castes and neither oppress nor offer violence to any and others brahmans a folk who abstain from wine but live in delight and solace and merriment and own camels and horses and cattle moreover they told me that the people of india are divided in two and seventy castes and i marvelled at this with exceeding marvel amongst other things that i saw in king mirjan's dominions was an island called kasil wherein all night is heard the beating of drums and tabrets but we were told by the neighbouring islanders and by travellers that the inhabitants are people of diligence and judgment in this sea i also saw a fish two hundred cubits long and the fishermen fare it so they strike together pieces of wood and put it to flight i also saw another fish with a head like that of an owl besides many other wonders and rarities which it would be tedious to recount i occupied myself thus in visiting the islands till one day as i stood in the port with a staff in my hand according to my custom 
behold, a great ship wherein were many merchants came sailing for the harbour. When it reached the small inner port with the ship's anchor under the city, the master furled his sails and making fast to the shore, put out the landing planks, whereupon the crew fell to breaking bulk and landing cargo, whilst I stood by, taking written note of them. They were long in bringing the goods ashore, so I asked the master, Is there aught left in thy ship? And he answered, O oh, my lord, there are divers bales of merchandise in the hall, whose owner was drowned from amongst us at one of the islands on our course. So his goods remain in our charge by way of trust, and we propose to sell them and note their price, that we may convey it to his people in the city of Baghdad, the home of peace. What was the merchant's name? Quoth I, and quoth he, Simba the seaman, whereupon I straightly considered him, and knowing him, cried out to him with a great cry, saying, O oh, captain, I am that Simba the seaman who travelled with other merchants, and when the fish heaved, and thou colledst to us, some saved themselves, and others sank, I being one of them. But Allah Almighty threw in my way a great tub of wood, of those the crew had used to wash withal, and the winds and waves carried me to this island, where by Allah's grace I fell in with King Mirjan's grooms, and they brought me hither to the king their master. When I told him my story, he entreated me with favour, and made me his harbour-master, and I have prospered in his service, and found acceptance with him. These bales, therefore, are mine, the goods which God hath given me. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and forty-second night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Simba the seaman said to the captain, These bales are mine, the goods which Allah hath given me. The other exclaimed, There is no majesty and there is no might save in Allah, the glorious, the great. Verily, there is neither conscience nor good faith left along men. Said I, O race, what means these words, seeing that I have told thee my case? And he answered, Because thou heardest me say that I had with me goods whose owner was drowned, thou thinkest to take them without right. But this is forbidden by law to thee, for we saw him drown before our eyes, together with many other passengers, nor was one of them saved. So how canst thou pretend that thou art the owner of the goods? O oh, captain, said I, listen to my story, and give heed to my words, and my truth will be manifest to thee, for lying and leasing are the lesser marks of hypocrites. Then I recounted to him, all that had befallen me since I sailed from Baghdad with him, to the time when we came to the fish island, where we nearly drowned, and I reminded him of certain matters which had passed between us, whereupon both he and the merchants were certified at the truth of my story, and recognized me, and gave me joy of my deliverance, saying, By Allah, we thought not that thou hadst escaped drowning, but the Lord hath granted thee new life. Then they delivered my bales to me, and I found my name written thereon, nor was aught thereof lacking. So I opened them, and making up a present for King Mirjan of the finest and costliest of the contents, caused the sailors carry it up to the palace, where I went in to the king, and laid my present at his feet, acquainting him with what had happened, especially concerning the ship and my goods, whereat he wondered with exceeding wonder, and the truth of all that I had told him was made manifest to him. His affection for me redoubled after that, and he showed me exceeding honour, and bestowed on me a great present in return for mine. Then I sold my bales, and what other matters I owned, making a great profit on them, and bought me other goods and gears of the growth and fashion of the island city. When the merchants were about to start on their homeward voyage, I embarked on board the ship all that I possessed, and going in to the king, thanked him for all his favours and friendship, and craved his leave to return to my own land and friends. He farewelled me, and bestowed on me great store of the country stuff and produce, and I took leave of him and embarked. Then we set sail, and fared on nights and days, 
by the permission of Allah Almighty, and fortune served us, and fate favoured us, so that we arrived in safety at Basora city, where I landed rejoiced at my safe return to my natal soil. After a short stay, I set out for Baghdad, the house of peace, with store of goods and commodities of great price. Reaching the city in due time, I went straight to my own quarter, and entered my house where all my friends and kinsfolk came to greet me. Then I bought me eunuchs and concubines, servants and negro slaves, till I had a large establishment, and I bought me houses and lands and gardens, till I was richer and in better case than before, and returned to enjoy the society of my friends and familiars more assiduously than ever, forgetting all I had suffered of fatigue and hardship and strangehood and every peril of travel, and I applied myself to all manner of joys and solaces and delights, eating the daintiest viands and drinking the deliciousest wines, and my wealth allowed this state of things to endure. This, then, is the story of my first voyage, and to-morrow, inshallah, I will tell you the tale of the second of my seven voyages. Say he who telleth the tale, then Simbad the seaman made Simbad the landsman sup with him, and bade give him a hundred gold pieces, saying, Thou hast cheered us with thy company this day. The porter thanked him, and taking the gift went his way, pondering that which he had heard, and marvelling mightily at what things betide mankind. He passed the night in his own place, and with early morning repaired to the abode of Simbad the seaman who received him with honour, and seated him by his side. As soon as the rest of the company was assembled, he set meat and drink before them. When they had well eaten and drunken, and were merry and in cheerful case, he took up his discourse, and recounted to them in these words the narrative of the second voyage of Simbad the seaman. No, O oh my brother, that I was living a most comfortable and enjoyable life, in all solace and delight, as I told you yesterday. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section two. Recording by Christine G. in Oslo, Norway. The eleventh of December, two thousand and eleven. Section three. Of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Six, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. 543rd night to 545th night. When it was the 543rd night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Simba the seaman's guests were all gathered together, he thus bespake them, I was living a most enjoyable life, until one day my mind became possessed with the thought of travelling about the world of men and seeing their cities and islands, and a longing seized me to traffic and to make money by trade. Upon this resolve I took a great store of cash, and, buying goods and gear fit for travel, bound them up in bales. Then I went down to the river bank, where I found a noble ship and brand new about to sail, equipped with sail of fine cloth, and well manned and provided. So I took passage in her, with a number of other merchants, and after embarking our goods we weighed anchor the same day. Right fair was our voyage, and we sailed from place to place, and from isle to isle, and whenever we anchored we met a crowd of merchants and notables and customers, and we took to buying and selling and bartering. At last destiny brought us to an island, fair and verdant, in trees abundant, with yellow ripe fruits luxuriant, and flowers fragrant, and birds warbling soft descant, and streams crystalline and radiant. But no sign of man showed to the descrier, no, not a blower of the fire. 
The captain made fast with us to this island, and the merchants and sailors landed and walked about, enjoying the shade of the trees and the song of the birds that chanted the praises of the one, the victorious, and marvelling at the works of the omnipotent king. I landed with the rest, and, sitting down by a spring of sweet water that welled up among the trees, took out some vivas I had with me, and ate that which Allah Almighty had allotted unto me. And so sweet was the zephyr, and so fragrant were the flowers, that presently I waxed drowsily, and, lying down in that place, was soon drowned in sleep. When I awoke, I found myself alone, for the ship had sailed, and left me behind, nor had one of the merchants or sailors bethought himself of me. I sailed the island right and left, but found neither man nor gin, whereat I was beyond measure troubled, and my gall was like to burst for stress of chagrin and anguish and concern, because I was left quite alone, without aught of worldly gear or meat or drink, weary and heart-broken. So I gave myself up for lost, and said, Not always doth the crock escape the shock. I was saved the first time by finding one who brought me from the desert island to an inhibited place, but now there is no hope for me. Then I fell to weeping and wailing, and gave myself up to an access of rage, blaming myself for having again ventured upon the perils and hardships of voyage, when as I was at my ease in mine own house, in my own land, taking my pleasure with good meat and good drink and good clothes, and lacking nothing, neither money nor goods. And I repented me of having left Baghdad, and this was the more after all the travails and dangers I had undergone on my first voyage, wherein I had so narrowly escaped destruction, and exclaimed, Verily we are Alas, and unto him we are returning. I was indeed even, as one mad and gin struck, and presently I rose, and walked about the island, right and left, and every whither, unable for trouble to sit or tarry in any one place. Then I climbed a tall tree, and looked in all directions, but saw nothing save sky and sea and trees and birds, and isles and sands. However, after a while my eager glances fell upon some great white thing, afar off the interior of the island, so I came down from the tree, and made for that which I had seen. And behold, it was a huge white dome rising high in air, and of vast compass. I walked all around it, but found no door thereto, nor could I muster strength or nimbleness by reason of its exceeding smoothness and slipperiness. So I marked a spot where I stood, and went round about the dome to measure its circumference, which I found fifty good paces. And as I stood, casting about how to gain an entrance, the day being near its fall, and the sun being near the horizon, behold, the sun was suddenly hidden from me, and the air became dull and dark. Methought a cloud had come over the sun, but it was the season of summer, so I marvelled at this, and lifting my head, looked steadfastly at the sky, when I saw that the cloud was none other than an enormous bird of gigantic girth and inordinately wider wing which, as it flew through the air, wheeled the sun and hid it from the island. At this sight my wonder redoubled, and I remembered a story. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and forty-fourth night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Simba the seaman continued in these words. My wonder redoubled, and I remembered the story I had heard aforetime of pilgrims and travellers, how in a certain island dwelleth a huge bird, called a rook, which feedeth its young on elephants. And I was certified that the dome which caught my sight was none other than a rook's egg. As I looked and wondered at the marvellous works of the Almighty, the bird alighted on the dome, and brooded over it with its wings covering it, and its legs stretched out behind it on the ground, and in this posture it fell asleep, glory be to him who sleepeth not, 
When I saw this, I arose, and, unwinding my turban from my head, doubled it and twisted it into a rope, with which I girt my middle and bound my waist fast to the legs of the rook, saying to myself, Peradventure, this bird may carry me to a land of cities and inhabitants, and that will be better than abiding in this desert island. I passed the night watching and fearing to sleep, lest the bird should fly away with me unawares, and, as soon as the dawn broke and morn shone, the rook rose off its egg, and spreading its wings with a great cry, flew up into the air, dragging me with it, nor ceased it to soar and to tower till I thought it had reached the limit of the firmament, after which it descended, earthwards, little by little, till it lighted on top of a high hill. As soon as I found myself on the hard ground, I made haste to unbind myself, quaking for fear of the bird, though it took no heed of me, nor even felt me, and, loosing my turban from its feet, I made off with my best speed. Presently I saw it catch up in its huge claws something from the earth, and rise with it high in air, and observing it narrowly, I saw it to be a serpent big of bulk and gigantic of girth, wherewith it flew away clean out of sight. I marvelled at this, and faring forwards found myself on a peak overlooking a valley, exceeding great and wide and deep, and bounded by vast mountains that spired high in air. None could describe their summits, for the excess of their height, nor was any able to climb up thereto. When I saw this, I blamed myself for that which I had done, and said, Would heaven I had tarried in the island! It was better than this wild desert, for there I had at least fruit to eat, and water to drink, and here are neither trees nor fruits nor streams. But there is no majesty, and there is no might save in Allah, the glorious, the great. Verily, as often as I am quit of one peril, I fall into a worse danger and a more grievous. However, I took courage, and walking among the Vedi found that its soils was of diamond, the stone wherewith they pierce minerals, and precious stones, and porcelain, and the onyx, for that it is a dense stone and a jaw, whereon neither iron nor hardhead hath effect, neither can we cut off earth therefrom, nor break it, save by means of leadstone. Moreover, the valley swarmed with snakes and vipers, each big as a palm tree, that would have made but one gulp of an elephant and they came out by night, hiding during the day, lest the rooks and eagles pounce on them and tear them to pieces, as was their wont. Why I wot not. And I repented of what I had done, and said, By Allah, I have made haste to bring destruction upon myself. The day became too vain, as I went along, and I looked about for a place where I might pass the night, being in fear of the serpents and I took no thought of meat and drink in my concern for my life. Presently I caught sight of a cave near hand, with a narrow doorway, so I entered and seeing a great stone close to the mouth, I rolled it up and stopped the entrance, saying to myself, I am safe here for the night, and as soon as it is day, I will go forth and see what destiny will do. Then I looked within the cave, and saw to the upper end a great serpent brooding on her eggs, at which my flesh quaked, and my hair stood on end. But I raised my eyes to heaven, and, committing my case to fate and lot, abode all that night without sleep, till daybreak, when I rolled back the stone from the mouth of the cave, and went forth, staggering like a drunken man, and giddy with watching and fear and hunger. As in this sore case I walked along the valley, behold, there fell down before me a slaughtered beast, but I saw no one, whereat I marvelled with great marvel, and presently remembered a story I had heard aforetime, of traders and pilgrims and travellers, how the mountains where are the diamonds are full of perils and terrors, nor can any fare through them, but the merchants who traffic in the diamonds have a device by which they obtain them, that is to say, they take a sheep, and slaughter, and skin it, and cut it in pieces, and cast them down from the mountain tops into the valley soul, where their meat being fresh and sticky with blood, some of the gems cleave to it. 
There they leave it to midday, when the eagles and vultures swoop down upon it, and carry it in their claws to the mountain summits, whereupon the merchants come and shout them, and scare them away from the meat. Then they come and, taking the diamonds which they find sticking to it, go their ways with them, and leave the meat to the birds and beasts. Nor can any come at the diamonds but by this device. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and forty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Simba the seaman continued his relation of what befell him in the mountain of diamonds, and informed them that merchants cannot come at the diamonds save by the device aforesaid. So, when I saw the slaughtered beast fall, he pursued, and bethought me of the story, I went up to it and filled my pockets and shawl-girdle and turban, and the folds of my clothes with the choicest diamonds, and, as I was thus engaged, down fell before me another great piece of meat. Then, with my unrolled turban and lying on my back, I set the bit on my breast so that it was hidden by the meat, which was thus raised above the ground. Hardly had I gripped it, when an eagle swooped down upon the flesh and, seizing it with his talons, flew up with it high in air, and me clinging thereto, and ceased not its flight till it alighted on the head of one of the mountains where, dropping the carcass, he fell to rendering it. But, behold, there arose behind him a great noise of shouting and clattering of wood, whereat the bird took fright and flew away. Then I loosed off myself the meat, with clothes daubed with blood therefrom, and stood up by its side. Whereupon up came the merchant, who had cried out at the eagle, and seeing me standing there, bespoke me not, but was affrighted at me, and shook with fear. However, he went up to the carcass, and turning it over, found no diamonds sticking to it, whereat he gave a great cry, and exclaimed, Harrow, my disappointment! There is no majesty, and there is no might save in Allah, with whom we seek refuge from Satan the stoned. And he bemoaned himself, and beat hand upon hand, saying, Alas, the pity of it! How cometh this? Then I went up to him, and he said to me, Who art thou, and what caused thee to come hither? And I, fear not, I am a man, and a good man, and a merchant. My story is a wondrous, and my adventures marvellous. And the manner of my coming hither is prodigious, so be of good share. Thou shalt receive of me what shall rejoice thee, for I have with me great plenty of diamonds, and I will give thee thereof what shall suffice thee, for each is better than aught thou couldst get otherwise, so fear nothing. The man rejoiced thereat, and thanked and blessed me. Then we talked together, till the other merchants, hearing me in discourse with their fellow, came up and saluted me, for each of them had thrown down his piece of meat and as I went off with them I told them my whole story, how I had suffered hardships at sea, and the fashion of my reaching the valley. But I gave the owner of the meat a number of the stones I had by me, so they all wished me joy of my escape, saying, By Allah a new life hath been decreed to thee, for none ever reached yonder valley and came off thence alive before thee. But praised be Allah for thy safety. We passed the night together, in a safe and pleasant pace, beyond measure rejoiced at my deliverance from the valley of serpents, and my arrival in an inhabited land. And on the morrow we set out and journeyed over the mighty range of mountains, seeing many serpents in the valley, till we came to a fair great island, wherein was a garden of huge camper trees, under each of which an hundred men might take shelter. When the folk have a mind to get the camper, they bore into the upper part of the bowl with a long iron, whereupon the liquid camper, which is the sap of the tree, floweth out, and they catch it in vessels, where it concreteth like gum. But, after this, the tree dieth and become firewood. Moreover, there is in this island a kind of wild beast, called rhinoceros, that pastureth as do steers and buffaloes with us. But it is a huge brute, bigger of body than the camel, and like it feedeth upon the leaves and twigs of trees. 
It is a remarkable animal, with a great and thick horn, ten cubits long, a middle ward its head, wherein, when cleft in twain, is the likeness of a man. Voyagers and pilgrims and travellers declare that this beast called Karkadan will carry off a great elephant on its horn, and graze about the island, and sea-coast therewith, and take no heed of it, till the elephant dieth, and its fat, melting in the sun, runneth down into the rhinoceros' eyes, and blindeth him, so that he lieth down on the shore. Then comes the bird Rook, and carrieth off both the rhinoceros and that which is on its horn, to feed its young withal. Moreover, I saw in this island many kinds of oxen and buffaloes, whose like are not found in our country. Here I sold some of the diamonds which I had by me for gold diners and silver dirhams, and bartered others for the produce of the country, and, loathing them upon beasts of burden, fared on with the merchants from valley to valley, and town to town, buying and selling and viewing foreign countries and the works and creatures of Allah, till we came to Basra city, where we abode a few days, after which I continued my journey to Baghdad. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section three. Recording by Christine G. in Oslo, Norway. The eleventh of December, two thousand and eleven. Section four of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. 546th Night to 548th Night. When it was the five hundred and forty-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Simba the seaman returned from his travel to Baghdad, the house of peace, he arrived at home with great store of diamonds and money and goods. Continued he, I foregathered with my friends and relations, and gave alms and largesse, and bestowed curious gifts, and made presents to all my friends and companions. Then I betook myself to eating well, and drinking well, and wearing fine clothes, and making merry with my fellows, and forgot all my sufferings in the pleasure of return to the solace and delight of life, with light heart and broadened breast. And every one who heard of my return came and questioned me of my adventures, and of foreign countries, and I related to them all that had befallen me, and the much I had suffered, whereat they wondered, and gave me joy of my safe return. This, then, is the end of the story of my second voyage, and to-morrow, inshallah, I will tell you what befell me in my third voyage. The company marvelled at his story, and supped with him, after which he ordered an hundred dinars of gold to be given to the porter, to be given to the porter, who took the sum with many thanks and blessings, which he stinted not even when he reached home, and went his way, wondering at what he had heard. Next morning, as soon as day came in its sheen and shone, he rose, and praying the dawn prayer, repaired to the house of Simba the seaman, even as he had bidden him, and went in and gave him good morrow. The merchant welcomed him, and made him sit with him, till the rest of the company arrived, and when they had well eaten and drunken, and were merry with joy and jollity, their host began by saying, Hearken, O my brothers! to what i am about to tell you for it is even more wondrous than what you have already heard but allah alone kenneth what things his omniscience concealed from man and listen to the third voyage of simba the seaman as i told you yesterday i returned from my second voyage overjoyed at my safety and with great increase of wealth allah having required me all that i had wasted and lost and I abode a while in Baghdad city, savouring the utmost ease and prosperity and comfort and happiness, till the carnal man was once more seized with longing for travel and diversion and adventure, 
and yearned after traffic and lucre and emolument, for that the human heart is nature prone to evil. So making up my mind, I laid in great plenty of goods suitable for sea voyage, and repairing to Bassora, went down to the shore and found there a fine ship ready to sail, with a full crew and a numerous company of merchants, men of worth and subsistence, faith, piety, and consideration. I embarked with them, and we set sail on the blessing of Allah Almighty, and on his aidance and his favour, to bring our voyage to a safe and prosperous issue, and already we congratulated one another on our good fortune and boon voyage. We fared on from sea to sea, and from island to island, and city to city, in all delight and contentment, buying and selling wherever we touched, and taking our solace and our pleasure, till one day when, as we sailed athwart the dashing sea, swollen with clashing billows, behold the master, who stood on the gunwale, examining the ocean in all directions, cried out with a great cry, and buffeted his face, and plucked out his beard, and rent his raiment, and bade furl the sail, and cast the anchors. So he said to him, O oh, race, what is the matter? No, O oh, my brethren, Allah preserve you, that the wind hath gotten the better of us, and hath driven us out of our course into mid-ocean, and destiny, for our ill-luck, hath brought us to the mountain of the Sugb, a hairy folk like apes, among whom no man ever fell and came forth alive, and my heart presageth that we all be dead men. Hardly had the master made an end of his speech when the apes were upon us. They surrounded the ship on all sides, swarming like locusts, and crowding the shore. They were the most frightful of wild creatures, covered with black hair like felt, foul of favour, and small of stature, being but four spans high, yellow-eyed and black-faced. None knoweth their language, nor what they are, and they shun the company of men. We feared to slay them, or strike them, or drive them away, because of their inconceivable multitude, lest, if we hurt one, the rest fall on us and slay us, for numbers prevail over courage. So we let them do their will, albeit we fear they would plunder our goods and gear. They swarmed up on the cables and gnawed them asunder, and on likewise they did with all the ropes of the ship, so that it fell from the wind and stranded upon their mountainous coast. Then they laid hands on all the merchants and crew, and landing us on the island, made off with the ship and its cargo, and went their ways, we wot not whither. We were thus left on the island, eating of its fruits and pot-herbs, and drinking of its streams, till, one day, we espied in its midst what seemed an inhabited house. So we made for it as fast as our feet could carry us, and behold, it was a castle, strong and tall, compassed about with a lofty wall, and having a two-leaved gate of ebony wood, both of which leaves open stood. We entered and found within a space wide and bare like a great square, round which stood many high doors open thrown, and at the farther end a long bench of stone and brassiers, with cooking gear hanging thereon, and about it great plenty of bones. But we saw no one, and marvelled thereat with exceeding wonder. Then we sat down in the courtyard a little while, and presently falling asleep, slept from the forenoon till sundown, when, lo, the earth trembled under our feet, and the air rumbled with a terrible tone. Then there came upon us, from the top of the castle, a huge creature in likeness of a man, black of colour, tall and big of bulk, as he were a great day-tree, with eyes like coals of fire, and eye-teeth like boar's tusk, and a vast big gape, like the mouth of a well. Moreover, he had a long loose lips like camels, hanging down upon his breast and ears like two jams, falling over his shoulder-blades, and the nails of his hands were like claws of a lion. When we saw this frightful giant, we were like to faint, and every moment increased our fear and terror, and we became as dead men for excess of horror and affright. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and forty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Simba the seaman continued. 
when we saw this frightful giant we were struck with exceeding terror and horror and after trampling upon the earth he sat a while on the bench then he arose and coming to us seized me by the arm choosing me out from among my comrades the merchants he took me up in his hand and turning me over felt me as a butcher feeleth a sheep he is about to slaughter and i but a little mouthful in his hands but finding me lean and fleshless for the stress of toil and trouble and weariness let me go and took up another whom in like manner he turned over and felt and let go nor did he cease to feel and turn over the rest of us one after another till he came to the master of the ship now he was a sturdy stout broad-shouldered white fat and in full vigour so he pleased the giant who seized him as a butcher seizes a beast and throwing him down set his foot on his neck and break it after which he fetched a long spit and thrusting it up his backside brought it forth of the crown of his head then lighting a fierce fire he set it over the spit with the rays thereon and turned it over the coals till the flesh was roasted when he took the spit off the fire and set it like a kebab stick before him then he tear the body limb from limb as one joineth a chicken and rendering the flesh with his nails fell to eating of it and gnawing the bones till there was nothing left but some of these which he threw on one side of the wall this done he sat for a while then he lay down on the stone bench and fell asleep snarking and snoring like the gurgling of a lamb or a cow with its throat cut nor did he awake till morning when he rose and fared forth and went his ways as soon as we were certified that he was gone we began to talk with one another weeping and bemoaning ourselves for the risk we ran and saying would heaven we had been drowned in the sea or that the apes had eaten us that were better than to be roasted over the coals by allah this is a vile foul death but whatso the lord willeth must come to pass and there is no majesty and there is no might save in him the glorious the great we shall assuredly perish miserably and none will know of us and there is no escape for us from this place then we arose and roamed about the island hoping that haply we might find a place to hide us in or a means of flight for indeed death was a light matter to us provided we were not roasted over the fire and eaten however we could not find no hiding place and the evening overtook us so of the excess of our terror we returned to the castle and sat down a while presently the earth trembled under our feet and the black ogre came up to us and turning us over felt one after another till a fan amount of his liking whom he took and served as he had done the captain killing and roasting and eating him after which he lay down on the bench and slept all night snarking and snoring like a beast with its throat cut till daybreak when he arose and went out as before then we drew together and conversed and said one to another by allah we had better throw ourselves into the sea and be drowned than die roasted for this is an abominable death quote one of us hear ye my words let us cast about to kill him and be at peace from the grief of him and rid the moslems of his barbarity and tyranny then said i hear me o my brothers if there is nothing for it but to slay him let us carry some of this firewood and planks down to the seashore and make us a boat wherein if we succeed in slaughtering him we may either embark and let the waters carry us whither allah willeth or else abide it here till some ship pass when we will take passage in it if we fail to kill him we will embark on the boat and put out to sea and if we be drowned we shall at least escape being roasted over a kitchen fire with sliced veasons whilst if we escape we escape and if we be drowned we die martyrs by allah said they all this reed is all right and we agreed upon this and set about carrying it out so we hailed down to the beach the pieces of wood which lay about the bench and making a boat moored it to the strand after which we stowed therein somewhat of victual and returned to the castle as soon as evening fell the earth trembled under our feet and in came the blackamoor upon us snarling like a dog about to bite 
He came up to us and feeling us and turning us over one by one, took one of us and did with him as he had done before and ate him, after which he lay down on the bench and snored and snorted like thunder. As soon as we were assured that he slept, we arose, and taking two iron spits of those standing there, heated them in the fiercest of the fire, till they were red-hot, like burning coals, when we gripped fast hold of them, and going up to the giant, as he lay snoring on the bench, thrust them into his eyes, and pressed up on them, all of us, with our united might, so that his eyeballs burst and he became stone blind. Thereupon he cried with a great cry, whereat our hearts trembled, and springing up from the bench, he fell a groping after us, blindfold. We fled from him right and left, and he saw us not, for his sight was altogether blent. But we were in terrible fear of him, and made sure we were dead men despairing of escape. Then he found the door, feeling for it with his hands, and went out roaring aloud, and behold, the earth shook under us, for the noise of his roaring, and we quaked for fear. As he quitted the castle we followed him, and betook ourselves to the place where we had moored our boat, saying to one another, If this accursed abide absent till the going down of the sun, and come not to the castle, we shall know that he is dead, and if he come back, we will embark in the boat and paddle till we escape, committing our affair to Allah. But, as we spoke, behold, up came the blackamoor with other two as they were gulls, fouler and more frightful than he, with eyes like red-hot coals, which when we saw we hurried into the boat, and casting off the moorings paddled away, and pushed out to sea. As soon as the ogres caught sight of us, they cried out at us, and running down to the seashore, fell a-pelting us with rocks, whereof some fell among us, and others fell into the sea. We paddled with all our might till we were beyond their reach, but the most part of us were slain by the rock-throwing, and the winds and waves sported with us and carried us into the midst of the dashing sea, swollen with billows clashing. We knew not whither we went, and my fellows died one after another, till there remained but three, myself and two others. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and forty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Simba the seaman thus continued. Most part of us were slain by the rock-throwing, and only three of us remained on board the boat, for, as often as one died, we threw him into the sea. We were so exhausted for stress and hunger, but we took courage and heartened one another, and worked for dear life, and paddled with main and might, till the winds cast us upon an island, as we were dead men for fatigue and fear and famine. We landed on the island, and walked about it for a while, finding that it abounded in trees and streams and birds, and we ate of the fruits, and rejoiced in our escape from the black and our deliverance from the perils of the sea, and thus we did till nightfall, when we lay down and fell asleep for excess of fatigue. But we had hardly closed our eyes before we were aroused by a hissing sound like the sort of wind, and awakening saw a serpent like a dragon, a seld seen sight of monstrous make and belly of enormous bulk which lay in circle round us. Presently it reared its head and, seizing one of my companions, swallowed him up to his shoulders. Then it gulped down the rest of him, and we heard his ribs crack in its belly. Presently it went its way, and we abode in sore amazement and grief for our comrade, and mortal fear for ourselves, saying, By Allah, this is a marvellous thing! Each kind of death that threatens us is more terrible than the last. We were rejoicing in our escape from the black ogre, and our deliverance from the perils of the sea. But now we have fallen into that which is worse. There is no majesty, and there is no might save in Allah. By the Almighty we have escaped from the blackamoor, and from drowning, but how shall we escape from this abominable and viperish monster? Then we walked about the island, eating of its fruits and drinking of its streams till dusk, when we climbed up into a high tree and went to sleep there, I being the topmost boat. As soon as it was dark night, up came the serpent, looking right and left, and, making for the tree whereon we were, 
climbed up to my comrade and swallowed him down to his shoulders. Then it coiled about the bowl with him, whilst I, who could not take my eyes off the sight, heard his bones crack in its belly, and it swallowed him whole, after which it slid down from the tree. When the day broke and the light showed me that the serpent was gone, I came down, as I were a dead man for stress of fear and anguish, and thought to cast myself into the sea, and be at rest from the woes of the world, but could not bring myself to this, for verily life is dear. So I took five pieces of wood, broad and long, and bound one crosswise to the soles of my feet, and others in like fashion on my right and left sides, and over my breast, and the broadest and largest abound across my head, and made them fast with ropes. Then I lay down on the ground on my back, so that I was completely fenced in by the pieces of wood, which enclosed me like a buyer. So as soon as it was dark, up came the serpent, as usual, and made towards me, but could not get at me to swallow me for the wood that fenced me in. So it wriggled round me on every side, whilst I looked on, like one dead by reason of my terror, and every now and then it would glide away and come back. But as often as it tried to come at me, it was hindered by the pieces of wood wherewith I had bound myself on every side. It ceased not to beset me thus from sundown to dawn, but when the light of day shone upon the beast it made off, in the utmost fury and extreme disappointment. Then I put out my hand and unbound myself, well nigh down among the dead men for fear and suffering, and went down to the island shore, where the ship afar off in the midst of the waves suddenly struck my sight. So I tore off a great branch of a tree, and made signs with it to the crew, shouting out the while, which when the ship's company saw they said to another, We must stand in and see what this is, peradventure tis a man. So they made for the island, and presently heard my cries, whereupon they took me on board and questioned me of my case. I told them all my adventures, from first to last, whereat they marvelled mightily and covered my shame with some of their clothes. Moreover, they set before me somewhat of food, and I ate my fill, and I drank cold sweet water, and was mightily refreshed, and Allah Almighty quickened me after I was virtually dead. So I praised the Most Highest and thanked Him for His favours and exceeding mercies, and my heart revived in me after utter despair, till me seemed as if all I had suffered were but a dream I had dreamed. We sailed on with a fair wind Almighty sent us, till we came to an island called Al Salahita, with boundeth in sandal wood when the captain cast anchor. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section four. Recording by Christine G. in Oslo, Norway. The eleventh of December, two thousand and eleven. Section five of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 5 When it was the five hundred and forty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Sinbad the seaman continued, and when we had cast anchor, the merchants and the sailors landed with their goods to sell and to buy. Then the captain turned to me and said, Hark ye, thou art a stranger and a pauper, and tellest us that thou hast undergone frightful hardship. Wherefore I have a mind to benefit thee with somewhat that may further thee to thy native land, so thou wilt ever bless me and pray for me. So be it, answered I, thou shalt have my prayers. Quoth he, Know then that there was with us a man, a traveller whom we lost, and we know not if he be alive or dead, for we had no news of him. So I purpose to commit his bales of good to thy charge, that thou mayst sell them in this island. A part of the proceeds we will give thee as an equivalent for thy pains and services, and the rest we will keep till we return to Baghdad, where we will inquire for his family and deliver it to them, together with the unsold goods. 
Say me, then, wilt thou undertake the charge and land and sell them as other merchants do? I replied, Hearkening and obedience to thee, O my lord, and great is thy kindness to me, and thanked him, whereupon he bade the sailors and porters bear the bales in question ashore, and commit them to my charge. The ship's scribe asked him, O master, what bales are these, and what merchant's name shall I write upon them? And he answered, Write on them the name of Sinbad the seaman, him who was with us in the ship, and whom we lost at the Rook's island, and of whom we have no tidings. For we mean this stranger to sell them, and we will give him a part of the price for his pains, and keep the rest till we return to Baghdad, where, if we find the owner, we will make it over to him, and if not, to his family. And the clerk said, Thy words are apposite, and thy reed is right. Now when I heard the captain give orders for the bales to be inscribed with my name, I said to myself, By Allah, I am Sindbad the seaman. So I armed myself with courage and patience, and waited till all the merchants had landed and were gathered together, talking and chaffering about buying and selling. Then I went up to the captain and asked him, O my lord, knowest thou what manner of man was this Sindbad, whose goods thou hast committed to me for sale? And he answered, I know of him not, save that he was a man from Baghdad city, Sindbad hight the seaman, who was drowned with many others when we lay anchored at such an island and I have heard nothing of him since then. At this I cried out with great cry, and said, O captain, whom Allah keep, know that I am that Sinbad the seaman, and that I was not drowned, but when thou castest anchor at the island I landed with the rest of the merchants and crew, and I sat down in a pleasant place by myself, and ate somewhat of food I had with me, and enjoyed myself till I became drowsy and was drowned in sleep, and when I awoke I found no ship and none near me. These goods are my goods, and these bales are my bales, and all the merchants who fetch jewels from the Valley of Diamonds saw me there, and will bear me witness that I am the very Sinbad the seaman, for I related to them everything that had befallen me, and told them how you forgot me and left me sleeping on the island, and that betided me which betided me. When the passengers and crew heard my words, they gathered about me, and some of them believed me, and others disbelieved. But presently, behold, one of the merchants, hearing me mention the Valley of Diamonds, came up to me and said to them, Hear what I say, good people. When I related to you the most wonderful thing in my travels, and I told you that at the time we cast down our slaughtered animals into the Valley of Serpents, I casting with the rest, as was my wont, there came up a man, hanging to mine, ye believed me not, and gave me the lie. Yes, quoth they, thou didst tell us some such tale, but we had no call to credit thee. He resumed, Now this is the very man, by token that he gave me diamonds of great value, and high price, whose like are not to be found, requiting me more than would have come up sticking to my quarter of meat. And I accompanied with him to Bassora city, where he took leave of us and went on to his native stead, whilst we returned to our own land. This is he, and he told us his name, Sinbad the seaman, and how the ship left him on the desert island. And know ye that Allah hath sent him hither, so might the truth of my story be made manifest to you. Moreover, these are his goods, for when he first foregathered with us he told us of them, and the truth of his words is patent. Hearing the merchant's speech, the captain came up to me and considered me straightly a while, after which he said, What was the mark on thy bales? Thus and thus answered I, and reminded him of somewhat that had passed between him and me when I was shipping with him from Bassora. Thereupon he was convinced that I was indeed Sinbad the seaman, and took me round the neck and gave me joy of my safety, saying, By Allah, O my lord, thy case is indeed wondrous, and thy tale marvellous, but lauded be Allah, who hath brought thee and me together again, and who hath restored to thee thy goods and gear. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and fiftieth night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Sinbad the seaman thus continued. Alhamdulillah, quoth the captain, lauded be Allah who hath restored unto thee thy goods and gear. Thus I disposed of my merchandise to the best of my skill, and profited largely on them, whereat I rejoiced with exceeding joy, and congratulated myself on my safety and the recovery of my goods. We ceased not to buy and sell at the several islands till we came to the land of Hind where we brought cloves and ginger and all manner of spices. And thence we fared on to the island of Sindh, where also we bought and sold. 
In these Indian seas I saw wonders without number or count, amongst others a fish like a cow, which bringeth forth its young and suckleth them like human beings, and of its skin bucklers are made. There were eke fishes like asses and camels, and tortoises twenty cubits wide. And I saw also a bird that cometh out of a seashell, and layeth eggs, and hatcheth her chicks on the surface of the water, never coming up from the sea to the land. Then we set sail again with a fair wind, and the blessing of Almighty Allah, and after a prosperous voyage arrived safe and sound at Bassorah. Here I abode a few days, and presently returned to Baghdad, where I went at once to my quarter and my house, and saluted my family and familiars and friends. I had gained on this voyage what was beyond count and reckoning, so I gave alms and largesse, and clad the widow and the orphan, by way of thanksgiving for my happy return and fell to feasting and making merry with my companions and intimates, and forgot while eating well and drinking well and dressing well, everything that had befallen me, and all the perils and hardship I had suffered. These, then, are the most admirable things I cited on my third voyage, and to-morrow, and it be the will of Allah, you shall come to me and I will relate the adventures of my fourth voyage, which is still more wonderful than those you have already heard, saith he who telleth the tale. Then Sinbad the seaman bade give Sinbad the landsman an hundred gold dinars as of want and called for food. So they spread the tables, and the company ate the night meal and went their ways, marvelling at the tale they had heard. The porter, after taking his gold, passed the night in his own house, also wondering at what his namesake the seaman had told him, and as soon as day broke and the morning showed with its sheen and shone, he rose and, praying the dawn prayer, betook himself to Sinbad the seaman who returned his salute, and received him with an open breast, and cheerful favour, and made him sit with him till the rest of the company arrived, when he caused set on food, and they ate and drank, and made merry. Then Sinbad the seaman bespake them, and related to them the narrative of the fourth voyage of Sinbad the seaman. Know, O my brethren, that after my return from my third voyage, and foregathering with my friends, and forgetting all my perils and hardships in the enjoyment of ease and comfort and repose, I was visited one day by a company of merchants, who sat down with me and talked of foreign travel and traffic, till the old bad man within me yearned to go with them and enjoy the sight of strange countries, and I longed for the society of the various races of mankind, and for traffic and profit. So I resolved to travel with them, and buying the necessaries for a long voyage and great store of costly goods, more than ever before, transported them from Baghdad to Bassorah, where I took the ship with the merchants in question, who were of the chief of the town. We set out, trusting in the blessing of Almighty Allah, and with a favouring breeze and the best conditions we sailed from island to island, and sea to sea, till one day there arose against us a contrary wind and the captain cast out his anchors, and brought the ship to a standstill, fearing lest she should founder in mid-ocean. Then we all fell to prayer, and humbling ourselves before the Most High. But as we were thus engaged, there smote us a furious squall which tore the sails to drags and tatters. The anchor cable parted, and the ship foundering, we were cast into the sea, goods and all. I kept myself afloat by swimming half the day, till, when I had given myself up for lost, the Almighty threw in my way one of the planks of the ship, whereon I and some others of the merchants scrambled. And Shahrazad received the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and fifty-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Sinbad the seaman continued as follows. And when the ship foundered, I scrambled on to a plank with some others of the merchants, and mounting it as we would a horse, paddled with our feet in the sea. We abode thus a day and a night, the wind and waves helping us on, and on the second day, shortly before the mid-time between sunrise and noon, the breeze freshened and the sea wrought, and the rising waves cast us upon an island, well-nigh dead bodies for weariness and want of sleep, cold, and hunger, and fear, and thirst. We walked about the shore, and found abundance of herbs, whereof we ate enough to keep breath in body, and to stay our failing spirits, then lay down and slept till morning hard by the sea. And when morning came with its sheen and shone, we arose and walked about the island to the right and left, till we came in sight of an inhabited house afar off. So we made towards it, and ceased not walking till we reached the door thereof, when, lo, a number of naked men issued from it 
and without saluting us or a word said, laid hold of us masterfully, and carried us to their king, who signed us to sit. So we sat down, and they set food before us such as we knew not, and whose like we had never seen in all our lives. My companions ate of it for stress of hunger, but my stomach revolted from it, and I would not eat it, and my refraining from it was, by Allah's favour, the cause of my being alive till now. For no sooner had my comrades tasted of it than their reason fled and their condition changed, and they began to devour it like madmen possessed of an evil spirit. Then the savages gave them to drink of coconut oil and anointed them therewith, and straightway after drinking thereof their eyes turned into their heads and they fell to eating greedily against their want. When I saw this I was confounded and concerned for them, nor was I less anxious about myself for fear of the naked folk. So I watched them narrowly, and it was not long before I discovered them to be a tribe of Magian cannibals whose king was a ghoul. All who came to their country, or whoso they caught in their valleys or on their roads, they brought to this king, and fed them upon that food, and anointed them with that oil, whereupon their stomachs dilated that they might eat largely, whilst their reason fled and they lost the power of thought and became idiots. Then they stuffed them with coconut oil and the aforesaid food till they became fat and gross, when they slaughtered them by cutting their throats, and roasted them for the king's eating. But as for the savages themselves, they ate human flesh raw. When I saw this I was sore dismayed for myself and my comrades, who were now become so stupefied that they knew not what was done with them, and the naked folk committed them to one who used every day to lead them out and pasture them on the island like cattle and they wandered amongst the trees and rested at will, thus waxing very fat. As for me, I wasted away and became sickly for fear and hunger, and my flesh shriveled on my bones, which, when the savages saw, they left me alone, and took no thought of me, and so far forgot me that one day I gave them the slip, and walking out of their place made for the beach which was distant, and there espied a very old man seated on a high place, girt by the waters. I looked at him, and knew him for the herdsman, who had charge of pasturing my fellows, and with him were many others in like case. As soon as he saw me he knew me to be in possession of my reason, and not afflicted like the rest whom he was pasturing, so signed to me from afar, as who should say, Turn back, and take the right-hand road, for that will lead thee into the king's highway. So I turned back, as he bade me, and followed the right-hand road, now running for fear, and then walking leisurely to rest me, till I was out of the old man's sight. By this time the sun had gone down and the darkness set in, so I sat down to rest and would have slept, but sleep came not to me that night for stress of fear and famine and fatigue. When the night was half spent I rose and walked on, till the day broke in all its beauty, and the sun rose over the heads of the lofty hills and athwart the low gravelly plains. Now I was weary and hungry and thirsty, so I ate my fill of herbs and grasses that grew in the island, and kept life in body and stayed my stomach after which I set out again and fared on all that day and the next night, staying my greed with roots and herbs. Nor did I cease walking for seven days and their nights, till the morn of the eighth day, when I caught sight of a faint object in the distance. So I made towards it, though my heart quaked for all I had suffered first and last, and behold, it was a company of men gathering pepper-grains. As soon as they saw me they hastened up to me, and surrounding me on all sides, said to me, Who art thou, and whence come? I replied, Know, O folk, that I am a poor stranger, and acquainted them with my case and all the hardships and perils I had suffered. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 5、section、six、of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Six, by Anonymous, translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section Six. When it was the five hundred and fifty-second night, she said, "It hath reached me, O auspicious King, that Sinbad the Seaman continued, and the men." Gathering pepper in the island, questioned me of my case, when I acquainted them with all the hardships and perils I had suffered, and how I had fled from the savages, whereat they marvelled and gave me joy of my safety, saying, "By Allah, this is wonderful! 
but how didst thou escape from these blacks who swarm in the island and devour all who fall in with them nor is any safe from them nor can any get out of their clutches and after i had told them the fate of my companions they made me sit by them till they got quit of their work and fetched me somewhat of good food which i ate for i was hungry and rested a while after which they took ship with me and carrying me to their island home brought me before their king who returned my salute and received me honourably and questioned me of my case i told him all that had befallen me from the day of my leaving baghdad city whereupon he wondered with great wonder at my adventures he and his courtiers and bade me sit by him then he called for food and i ate with him what sufficed me and washed my hands and returned thanks to almighty allah for all his favours praising him and glorifying him then i left the king and walked for solace about the city which i found wealthy and populous abounding in market streets well stocked with food and merchandise and full of buyers and sellers so i rejoiced at having reached so pleasant a place and took my ease there after my fatigues and i made friends with the townsfolk nor was it long before i became more in honour and favour with them and their king than any of the chief men of the realm now i saw that all the citizens great and small rode fine horses high priced and thoroughbred without saddles or housings whereat i wondered and said to the king wherefore o my lord dost thou not ride with the saddle therein is ease for the rider and increase of power what is a saddle asked he i never saw nor used such a thing in all my life and i answered with thy permission i will make thee a saddle that thou mayest ride on it and see the comfort thereof and quoth he do so so quoth i to him furnish me with some wood which being brought i sought me a clever carpenter and sitting by him showed him how to make the saddle tree portraying for him the fashion thereof in ink on the wood then i took wool and teased it and made felt of it and covering the saddle tree with leather stuffed it and polished it and attached the girth and stirrup leathers after which i fetched a blacksmith and described to him the fashion of the stirrups and bridle bit so he forged a fine pair of stirrups and a bit and filed them smooth and tinned them moreover i made fast to them fringes of silk and fitted bridle leathers to the bit then i fetched one of the best of the royal horses and saddling and bridling him hung the stirrups to the saddle and led him to the king the thing took his fancy and he thanked me then he mounted and rejoiced greatly in the saddle and rewarded me handsomely for my work when the king's wazir saw the saddle he asked of me one like it and i made it for him furthermore all the grandees and officers of state came for saddles to me so i fell to making saddles having taught the craft to the carpenter and blacksmith and selling them to all who sought till i amassed great wealth and became in high honour and great favour with the king and his household and grandees i abode thus till one day as i was sitting with the king in all respect and contentment he said to me know thou o such an one thou art become one of us dear as a brother and we hold thee in such regard and affection that we cannot part with thee nor suffer thee to leave our city wherefore i desire of thee obedience in a certain matter and i will not have thee gainsay me answered i o king what is it thou desirest of me far be it from me to gainsay thee in aught for i am indebted to thee for many favours and bounties and much kindness and praised be allah i am become one of thy servants quoth he i have a mind to marry thee to a fair clever and agreeable wife who is wealthy as she is beautiful so thou mayst be naturalized and domiciled with us i will lodge thee with me in my palace wherefore oppose me not neither cross me in this when i heard these words i was ashamed and held my peace nor could make him any answer by reason of my much bashfulness before him asked he why dost thou not reply to me o my son and i answered saying o my master it is thine to command o king of the age so he summoned the kazi and the witnesses and married me straight away to a lady of a noble tree and high pedigree wealthy in monies and means the flower of an ancient race of surpassing beauty and grace and the owner of farms and estates and many a dwelling place and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the five hundred and fifty-third night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that sindbad the seaman continued in these words 
Now after the king my master had married me to this choice wife, he also gave me a great and goodly house standing alone, together with slaves and officers, and assigned me pay and allowances. So I became in all ease and contentment and delight, and forgot everything which had befalled me of weariness and trouble and hardship. For I loved my wife with fondest love, and she loved me no less, and we were as one, and abode in the utmost comfort of life and in its happiness. And I said in myself, when I return to my native land, I will carry her with me. But whatso is predestined to a man that needs must be, and none knoweth what shall befall him. We lived thus a great while, till Almighty Allah bereft one of my neighbors of his wife. Now he was a gossip of mine, so hearing the cry of the keeners, I went in to condole with him on his loss, and found him in very ill plight, full of trouble, and weary of soul and mind. I condoled with him, and comforted him, saying, Mourn not for thy wife, who hath now found the mercy of Allah. The Lord will surely give thee a better in her stead, and thy name shall be great, and thy life shall be long in the land, inshallah. But he wept bitter tears, and replied, O oh, my friend, how can I marry another wife, and how shall Allah replace her to me with a better than she, when as I have but one day left to live? O oh, my brother, said I, return to thy senses, and announce not the glad tidings of thine own death. For thou art well, sound, and in good case. By thy life, O oh my friend, rejoined he, to-morrow thou wilt lose me, and wilt never see me again till the day of resurrection. I asked, How so? And he answered, This very day they bury my wife, and they bury me with her in one tomb, for it is the custom with us, if the wife die first, to bury the husband alive with her, and in like manner the wife if the husband die first, so that neither may enjoy life after losing his or her mate. "'By Allah!' cried I, "'this is a most vile, lewd custom, and not to be endured of any.' Meanwhile, behold, the most part of the townsfolk came in, and fell to condoling with my gossip for his wife and for himself. Presently they laid the dead woman out, as was their wont, and setting her on a bier, carried her and her husband without the city, till they came to a place in the side of the mountain, at the end of the island by the sea. And here they raised a great rock, and discovered the mouth of a stone-riveted pit or well, leading down into a vast underground cavern that ran beneath the mountain. Into this pit they threw the corpse. Then, tying a rope of palm fibers under the husband's armpits, they let him down into the cavern, and with him a great pitcher of fresh water and seven scones by way of viaticum. When he came to the bottom he loosed himself from the rope, and they drew it up, and stopping the mouth of the pit with the great stone they returned to the city leaving my friend in the cavern with his dead wife. When I saw this, I said to myself, By Allah, this fashion of death is more grievous than the first. And I went in to the king and said to him, O oh my lord, why do ye bury the quick with the dead? Quoth he, It hath been the custom, thou must know, of our forebears and our olden kings from time immemorial, if the husband die first, to bury his wife with him, and the like with the wife, so we may not sever them, alive or dead. I asked, O king of the age, if the wife of a foreigner like myself die among you, deal ye with him as with yonder man? And he answered, Assuredly, we do with him even as thou hast seen. When I heard this, my gallbladder was like to burst, for the violence of my dismay and concern for myself. My wit became dazed, I felt as if in a vile dungeon, and hated their society, for I went about in fear lest my wife should die before me, and they bury me alive with her. However, after a while I comforted myself, saying, Haply I shall predecease her, or shall have returned to my own land before she die, for none knoweth which shall go first and which shall go last. Then I applied myself to diverting my mind from this thought, with various occupations. But it was not long before my wife sickened and complained, and took to her pillow, and fared after a few days to the mercy of Allah. And the king and the rest of the folk came, as was their wont, to condole with me and her family, and to console us for her loss, and not less to condole with me for myself. Then the women washed her, and arraying her in her richest raiment and golden ornaments, necklaces and jewelry, laid her on the bier, and bore her to the mountain aforesaid, where they lifted the cover of the pit and cast her in. After which all my intimates and acquaintances, and my wife's kith and kin came round me to farewell me in my lifetime, and console me for my own death, whilst I cried out among them, saying, Almighty Allah never made it lawful to bury the quick with the dead. 
I am a stranger, not one of your kind. I cannot abear your custom, and had I known it, I never would have wedded among you. They heard me not, and paid no heed to my words, but laying hold of me, bound me by force, and let me down into the cavern, with a large gugglet of sweet water and seven cakes of bread, according to their custom. When I came to the bottom, they called out to me to cast myself loose from the cords, but I refused to do so. So they threw them down on me, and closing the mouth of the pit with the stones aforesaid, went their ways. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and fifty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Sindbad the seaman continued, When they left me in the cavern with my dead wife, and closing the mouth of the pit went their ways, I looked about me, and found myself in a vast cave full of dead bodies that exhaled a fulsome and loathsome smell, and the air was heavy with the groans of the dying. Thereupon I fell to blaming myself for what I had done, saying, By Allah, I deserve all that hath befallen me, and all that shall befall me. What curse was upon me to take a wife in this city? There is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah, the glorious, the great. As often as I say I have escaped from one calamity, I fall into a worse. By Allah, this is an abominable death to die. Would heaven I had died a decent death, and been washed and shrouded like a man and a Muslim. Would I had been drowned at sea, or perished in the mountains. It were better than to die this miserable death. And on such wise I kept blaming my own folly and greed of gain in that black hole, knowing not night from day and I ceased not to ban the foul fiend and to bless the Almighty Friend. Then I threw myself down on the bones of the dead and lay there, imploring Allah's help, and in the violence of my despair invoking death which came not to me, till the fire of hunger burned my stomach and thirst set my throat aflame, when I sat up and feeling for the bread, ate a morsel and upon it swallowed a mouthful of water. After this, the worst night I ever knew, I arose, and exploring the cavern, found that it extended a long way with hollows in its sides, and its floor was strewn with dead bodies and rotten bones that had lain there from olden time. So I made myself a place in a cavity of the cavern, afar from the corpses lately thrown down, and there slept. I abode thus a long while, till my provision was like to give out, and yet I ate not save once every day or second day nor did I drink more than an occasional draught, for fear my victuals should fail me before my death. And I said to myself, Eat little and drink little, belike the Lord shall vouchsafe deliverance to thee. One day, as I sat thus, pondering my case and bethinking me how I should do when my bread and water should be exhausted, behold, the stone that covered the opening was suddenly rolled away, and the light streamed down upon me. Quoth I, I wonder what is the matter. Haply they have brought another corpse. Then I espied folk standing about the mouth of the pit, who presently let down a dead man and a live woman, weeping and bemoaning herself, and with her an ampler supply of bread and water than usual. I saw her, and she was a beautiful woman, but she saw me not, and they closed up the opening and went away. Then I took the leg-bone of a dead man, and going up to the woman smote her on the crown of the head, and she cried one cry and fell down in a swoon. I smote her a second and a third time till she was dead. When I laid hands on her bread and water, and found on her great plenty of ornaments and rich apparel, necklaces, jewels, and gold trinkets, for it was their custom to bury women in all their finery. I carried the vivers to my sleeping place on the cavern side, and ate and drank of them sparingly, no more than sufficed to keep the life in me, lest the provant come speedily to an end, and I perish of hunger and thirst yet did I never wholly lose hope in Almighty Allah. I abode thus a great while, killing all the live folk they let down into the cavern and taking their provisions of meat and drink, till one day, as I slept, I was awakened by something scratching and burrowing among the bodies in a corner of the cave, and said, What can this be? Fearing wolves or hyenas. So I sprang up, and seizing the leg-bone aforesaid, made for the noise. As soon as the thing was ware of me, it fled from me into the inward of the cavern, and, lo, it was a wild beast. However, I followed it to the further end, till I saw afar off a point of light, not bigger than a star, now appearing, then disappearing. So I made for it, and as I drew near it grew larger and brighter, till I was certified that it was a crevice in the rock, leading to the open country, and I said to myself, There must be some reason for this opening. Either it is the mouth of a second pit, such as that by which they let me down, 
or else it is a natural fissure in the stonery. So I bethought me a while, and nearing the light found that it came from a breach in the back side of the mountain, which the wild beasts had enlarged by burrowing, that they might enter and devour the dead, and freely go to and fro. When I saw this my spirits revived, and hope came back to me, and I made sure of life, after having died a death. So I went on, as in a dream, and making shift to scramble through the breach, found myself on the slope of a high mountain, overlooking the salt sea, and cutting off all access thereto from the island, so that none could come at that part of the breach from the city. I praised my lord and thanked him, rejoicing greatly, and heartening myself with the prospect of deliverance. Then I returned through the crack to the cavern, and brought out all the food and water I had saved up, and donned some of the dead folk's clothes over my own, after which I gathered together all the collars and necklaces of pearls and jewels and trinkets of gold and silver set with precious stones and other ornaments and valuables I could find upon the corpses, and making them into bundles with the grave clothes and raiment of the dead, carried them out to the back of the mountain facing the seashore, where I established myself, purposing to wait there till it should please Almighty Allah to send me relief by means of some passing ship. I visited the cavern daily, and as often as I found folk buried alive there I killed them all indifferently, men and women, and took their victual and valuables, and transported them to my seat on the seashore. Thus I abode for a long while. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 6《Section 7 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 7 When it was the five hundredth and fifty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Sinbad the seaman continued. And after carrying all my victuals and valuables from the cavern to the coast, I abode a long while by the sea, pondering my case, till one day I caught sight of a ship passing in the midst of the clashing sea, swollen with dashing billows so i took a piece of white shroud i had with me and tying it to a staff ran along the seashore making signals therewith and calling to the people in the ship till they espied me and hearing my shouts sent a boat to fetch me off when it drew near the crew called out to me saying who art thou and how camest thou to be on this mountain where I never we saw any in our born days i answered I am a gentleman and a merchant, who hath been wrecked and saved myself on the planks of the ship, with some of my goods, and by the blessings of the Almighty, and the decrees of destiny, and my own strength and skill, after much toil and moil, I have landed with my gear in this place, where I waited some passing ship to take me off. So they took me in their boat, together with the bundles I had, made of jewels and valuables from the cavern, head up in the clothes and shrouds and rode back with me to the ship, where the captain said to me, How comest thou, O man, to yonder place on yonder mountain, behind which lieth a great city? All my life I have sailed these seas, and passed to and fro, hard by these heights. Yet never saw I here any living thing save wild beasts and birds. I repeated to him the story I had told the sailors, but acquainted him with nothing of that which had befallen me in the city and the cavern lest there should be any of the islandry in the ship. Then I took out some of the best pearls I had with me, and offered them to the captain, saying, O oh my lord, thou hast been the means of saving me off this mountain. I have no ready money, but take this for me, in requital, of thy kindness and good offices. But he refused to accept it of me, saying, When we find a shipwrecked man on the seashore, or on an island, we take him up and give him meat and drink, and if he be naked we clothe him, nor take we aught from him. Nay, when we reach a port of safety, we set him ashore with the present of our own money, and entreat him kindly and charitably, 
for the love of Allah the Most High. So I pray that his life be long in the land and rejoiced in my escape, trusting to be delivered from my stress and to forget my past mishaps. For every time I remembered being let down into the cave with my dead wife, I shuddered in horror. Then we pursued our voyage and sailed from island to island and sea to sea, till we arrived at the island of the bell which containeth a city two days journey in extent whence after six days run we reached the island kala hard by the land of hind this place is governed by a potent and puissant king and it produceth excellent camphor and an abundance of the indian rattan here also is a lead mine at last for the decree of allah we arrived in safety at bazora town where i tarried a few days then went on to baghdad city and finding my quarter entered my house with lively pleasure there i foregathered with my family and friends who rejoiced in my happy return and gave my joy of my safety i laid up in my storehouses all the goods i had brought with me and gave alms and largis to fakers and beggars and clothed the widow and the orphan then I gave myself up to pleasure, returning to my old merry mode of life. Such, then, be the most marvellous adventures of my fourth voyage. But to-morrow, if you will kindly come to me, I will tell you that which befell me in my fifth voyage, which was yet rarer and more marvellous than those which forewent it. And thou, O my brother Sinbad the landsman, shalt sup with me as thou art wont. Saith he who telleth the tale, when Sinbad the seaman had made an end of his story, he called for supper, so they spread the table, and the guests ate the evening meal, after which he gave the porter an hundred dinars as usual, and he and the rest of the company went their ways, glad at heart and marvelling at the tales they had heard, for that each story was more extraordinary than that which forewent it. The porter Sinbad passed the night in his own house, and all joy, cheer, and wonderment, and— as soon as morning came with its sheen and shone he prayed the dawn prayer and repaired to the house of sinbad the seaman who welcomed him and bade him sit with him till the rest of the company arrived when they ate and drank and made merry and the talk went round amongst them presently their host began the narrative of the fifth voyage and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say When it was the five hundred and fifty-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the host began in these words, the narrative of the fifth voyage of Sinbad the seaman. Know, O my brothers, that when I had been a while on shore after my fourth voyage, and when, in my comfort and pleasures and merrymakings, and in my rejoicing over my large gains and profits, I had forgotten all I had endured of perils and sufferings, the carnal man was again seized with the longing to travel and to see foreign countries and islands accordingly i bought costly merchandise suited to my purpose and making it up into bales repaired to bazora where i walked about the river quay till i found a fine tall ship newly builded with gear unused and fitted ready for sea she pleased me so i bought her and embarking my goods in her hired a master and crew over whom i set certain of my slaves and servants as inspectors a number of merchants also bought their outfits and paid me freight and passage money then after reciting the fatia we set sail over allah's pool and then all joined chair promising ourselves a prosperous voyage and much profit we sailed from city to city and from island to island and from sea to sea viewing the cities and countries by which we passed and selling and buying and not a full view till one day we came to a great uninhabited island deserted and desolate whereon was a white dome of biggest bulk half buried in the sands the merchants landed to examine this dome leaving me in the ship and when they drew near behold it was a huge ruckus egg they fell a beating it with stones, knowing not what it was, and presently broke it open, whereupon much water ran out of it, and the young Rukka appeared within. So they pulled it forth of the shell, and cut its throat, and took of it great store of meat. 
now i was in the ship and knew not what they did but presently one of the passengers came up to me and said oh my lord come and look at the egg we thought to be a dome so i looked and seeing the merchants beating of the stones called out to them stop stop do not meddle with the egg or the bird of rocco will come out and break our ship and destroy us but they paid no heed to me and gave not over smiting upon the egg when behold the day grew dark and done the and the sun was hidden from us as if some great cloud passed over the firmament so we raised our eyes and saw that what we took for a cloud was the rucka poised between us and the sun and it was his wings that darkened the day when he came and saw his egg broken he cried a loud cry whereupon his mate came flying up and they both began circling about the ship crying out at us with voices louder than thunder i called to the reyes and crew put out to sea and seek safety in flight before we be all destroyed so the merchants came on board and we cast off and made haste from the island to gain the open sea when the ruckas saw this they flew off and we crowded all sail on the ship thinking to get out of their country but presently the two reappeared and flew after us and stood over us each carrying in its claws a huge boulder which it had brought from the mountains as soon as the hivaka came up with us he let fall upon us the rock he held in his pounces but the master put about the ship so the rock missed her by some small matter and plunged into the waves with such violence that the ship pitched high and then sank into the turret of the sea and the bottom of the ocean appeared to us then the shiraka let fall her rock which was bigger than that of her mate and as destiny had decreed it fell on the poop of the ship and crushed it the rudder flying into twenty pieces whereupon the vessel foundered and all and everything on the board were cast into the main as for me i struggled for sweet life till almighty allah threw in my way one of the planks of the ship to which i clung and bestriding it fell a padding with my feet now the ship had gone down hard by an island in the midst of the main and the winds and waves bore me on till by permission of the most high they cast me upon the shore of the island at the last gasp for toil and distress and half dead with hunger and thirst so i landed more like a corpse than a live man and throwing myself down on the beach lay there a while till i began to revive and recover spirits when i walked about the island and found it as if it were one of the garths and gardens of paradise its trees in abundance dight bore ripe yellow fruit for fright its streams ran clear and bright its flowers were fair to the scent and to the sight and its birds warbled with delight the praises of him to whom belong permanence in all night so i ate my fill of the fruits and slaked my thirst with the water of the streams till i could no more and returned thanks to the most high and glorified him and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the five hundred and fifty-seventh night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that sinbad the seaman continued so when i escaped drowning and reached the island which afforded me fruit to eat and water to drink i returned thanks to the most high and glorified him after which i sat till nightfall hearing no voice and seeing none inhabitant then i lay down well nigh dead for travail and trouble and terror and slept without surcease till morning when i arose and walked about the, under the trees till i came to a channel of draw well fed by a spring of running water by which well sat an old man of venerable aspect girt about with a waist cloth made of the fibre of palm fronds quoth i to myself haply the sheikh is one of those who were wrecked in the ship and hath made his way to this island so i drew near to him and saluted him and he returned my salem by signs but spoke not and i said to him o nuncle mine 
what causeth thee to sit here he shook his head and moaned and signed to me with his hand as who should say take me on thy shoulders and carry me to the other side of the well channel and quoth i in my mind i will deal kindly with him and do what he desireth it may be that i shall win me a reward in heaven for he may be a paralytic so i took him on my back and carrying him to the place where he pointed said to him dismount at thy leisure but he would not get off my back and wound his legs around my neck i looked at him and seeing that they were like a buffalo's hide for blackness and roughness was affrighted and would have cast him off but he clung to me and gripped my neck with his legs till i was well nigh choked the world grew black in my sight and i fell senseless to the ground like one dead but he still kept his seat and raising his legs drummed with his heels and beat harder than palm rods on my back and shoulders till he forced me to rise for excess of pain then he signed to me with his hand to carry him hither and thither among the trees which bore the best fruits and if ever i refused to do his bidding or loitered and took my leisure he beat me with his feet more grievously than if i had been beaten with whips he ceased not to signal with his hand whenever he was minded to go so i carried him about the island like a captive slave and he bepissed and cock-skittled my shoulders and back dismounting not night or day and when as he wished to sleep he wound his legs around my neck and leaned back and slept a while then arose and beat me whereupon i sprang up in haste unable to gainsay him because of the pain he inflicted on me and indeed i blamed myself and sore repented me of having taken compassion on him and continued in this condition suffering fatigue not to be described till i said to myself i brought him a will and he requited me with my ill by allah never more will i do any man a service so long as i live and again and again i besought the most high that i might die for stress of weariness and misery and thus i abode a long while till one day i came with him to a place wherein was abundance of gourds many of them dry so he took a great dry gourd and cutting open the heed scooped out the inside and cleaned it after which i gathered grapes from a vine which grew hard by and squeezed them into the gourd till it was full of the juice then i sopped up the mouth and set it in the sun where i left it for some days until it became strong wine and every day i used to drink of it to comfort and sustain me under my fatigues with that froward and obstinate fiend and as often as i drank myself drunk i forgot my troubles and took new heart one day he saw me drinking and signed me with his hand as who should say what is that quoth i it is an excellent cordial but cheereth the heart and reviveth the spirits then being heated with wine i ran and danced with him among the trees clapping my hands and singing and making merry and i staggered under him by design when he saw this he signed to me to give him the gore that he might drink and i feared him and gave it to him so he took it and draining it to the dregs cast it to the ground whereupon he grew fulsome and began to clap hands and jig to and fro on my shoulders and he made water upon me so copiously that all my dress was drenched but presently the fumes of the wine rising to his head he became helplessly drunk and his side muscles and limbs relaxed and he swayed to and fro on my back when i saw that he had lost his senses for drunkenness i put my hand to his legs and loosing them from the neck stooped down well nigh to the ground and threw him at full height and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section 7Section 8 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6 by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 8. 
When it was the five hundred and fifty-eighth night, she said it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Sinban the seaman continued. So I threw the devil off my shoulders, hardly crediting my deliverance from him and fearing lest he should shake off his drunkenness and do me a mischief. Then I took up a great stone from among the trees, and coming up to him, smote him therewith on the head, with all my might, and crushed in his skull as he lay dead drunk. Thereupon his flesh, and fat and blood, being in a pulp, he died and went to his deserts. The fire, no mercy of Allah, be upon him. I then returned, with the heart at ease, to my former station on the seashore, and abode in that island many days, eating of its fruits and drinking of its waters, and keeping a lookout for passing ships. Till one day, as I sat on the beach, recalling all that had befallen me, and saying, I wonder if Allah will save me alive and restore me to my home and family and friends. Behold, a ship was making for the island, through the dashing sea and clashing waves. Presently it cast anchor, and the passengers landed. So I made for them, and when they saw me, all hastened up to me and gathered around me, questioned me of my case and how I came thither. I told them all that had betided me, whereat they marvelled with exceeding marvel and said, he who rode on thy shoulders is called the Sheikh al Bayar, or Old Man of the Sea. Footnote. More literally, the Chief of the Sea. Sheikh being here a chief rather than an elder, so the Old Man of the Mountain, famous in crusading days, was the chief who lived on the Nusaria or Ansari range, a northern prolongation of the Libanus. Our Old Man of the text may have been suggested by the Quranic commentators on chapter 6. When an infidel rises from the grave, a hideous figure meets him and says, Why wonderest thou at my loathsomeness? I am thine evil deeds. Thou didst ride upon me in the world, and now I will ride upon thee. End of footnote. And none ever felt his legs on neck, and came off alive but thou. And those who die under him, he eateth. So praise be to Allah for thy safety. Then they set somewhat of food before me, whereof I ate my fill, and gave me somewhat of clothes wherewith I clad myself anew, and covered my nakedness. After which they took me up to the ship, and we sailed for days and nights, till fate brought us to a place called City of the Apes, builded with lofty houses, all of which gave upon the sea and it had a single gate studded and strengthened with iron nails. Now every night, as soon as it is dusk, the dwellers in this city used to come forth of the gates, and putting out to sea in boats and ships, pass the night upon the waters, in their fear lest apes should come down on them from the mountains. Hearing this, I was sore troubled remembering what I had before suffered from the ape kind. Presently I landed to solace myself in the city, but meanwhile the ship set sail without me, and I repented of having gone ashore, and calling to mind my companions, and what had befallen me with the apes, first and after, sat down and fell a-weeping and lamenting. Presently one of the townsfolk accosted me, and said to me, O oh my lord, meseeth thou art a stranger in these parts? Yes, answered I. I am indeed a stranger and a poor one, who came hither in a ship which cast anchor here, and I landed to visit the town. But when I could have gone on board again, I found they had sailed without me. Quoth he, Come and embark with us, for if thou lie the night in the city, the apes will destroy thee. Hearkening and obedience, replied I, and rising, straight away embarked with him in one of the boats whereupon they pushed off from the shore, and anchoring a mile or so from the land, there passed the night. At daybreak they rode back to the city and landing, went each about his business. Thus they did every night, for if any tarried in the town by night, the apes came down on him and slew him. As soon as it was day, the apes left the place, and ate of the fruits of the gardens, then went back to the mountains, and slept there till nightfall, when they again came down upon the city. 
Footnote. In parts of West Africa, and especially in Gorilla Land, there are many stories of women and children being carried off by apes, and all believe that the former bear issue to them. It is certain that the anthropoid ape is lustfully excited by the presence of women, and I have related how at Cairo, 1856, a huge cynocephalus would have raped a girl had it not been bayoneted. Young ladies who visit the Demidov Gardens and Menagerie at Florence were often scandalised by the vicious exposure of the baboons' party-coloured persons. The female monkey equally solicits the attention of man, and I heard in India from my late friend Mirza Ali Akbar of Bombay that to his knowledge connection had taken place. Whether there would be issue and whether such issue would be viable are still disputed points. The produce would add another difficulty to the pseudoscience called psychology. As such mule would have only half a soul, and issued by a congener would have a quarter soul. A traveller well known to me once proposed to breed pithecoid men, who might be useful as hewers of wood and drawers of water. His idea was to put the highest races of ape to the lowest of humanity. I never heard what became of his breeding stables. End of footnote. Now this place is farthest of the country of the blacks, and one of the strangest things that befell me during my sojourn in the city was on this wise. One of the company, with whom I passed the night in the boat, asked me, O oh my lord, thou art apparently a stranger in these parts. Hast thou any craft whereat thou canst work? And I answered, By Allah, O my brother, I have no trade, nor know I any handicraft. For I was a merchant and a man of money and substance, and had a ship of my own, laden with great store of goods and merchandise. But it foundered at sea, and all were drowned except me, who saved myself on a piece of plank, which Allah vouchsafed to me of his favour. Upon this he bought me a cotton bag, and giving it to me, said, Take this bag and fill it with pebbles from the beach, and go forth with a company of the townsfolk, to whom I will give a charge respecting thee. Do as they do, and be like thou shalt gain what may further thy return voyage to thy native land. Then he carried me to the beach, where I filled my bag with pebbles, large and small, and presently we saw a company of folk issue from the town each bearing a bag like mine, filled with pebbles. To these he committed me, commending me to their care and saying, This man is a stranger, so take him with you and teach him how to gather, that he may get his daily bread, and you will earn your reward and recompense in heaven. On our heads and eyes be it, answered they, and bidding me welcome, fed on with me till we came to a spacious wadi, full of lofty trees with trunks so smooth that none might climb them. Now sleeping under these trees were many apes, which, when they saw us, rose and fled from us, and swarmed up among the branches, whereupon my companions began to pelt them with what they had in their bags, and the apes fell to plucking of the fruit of the trees and casting them at the folk. I looked at the fruits they cast at us and found them to be Indian. Footnote. Arab, Jahuz al-Hindi. Our word cocoa is from the port. Cocoa meaning a bug, bugbear, in allusion to its caricature of the human face, hair, eyes and mouth. I may here note that a cocoa tree is easily climbed with a bit of rope or a handkerchief. End of footnote. Or cocoa nuts. So I chose out a great tree full of apes and going up to it began to pelt them with stones and they in return pelted me with nuts which I collected as did the rest, so that even before I had made an end of my bag full of pebbles, I had gotten great plenty of nuts. And as soon as my companions had in like manner gotten as many nuts as they could carry, we returned to the city, where we arrived at the fag end of the day. Then I went in to the kindly man, who had brought me in company with the nut-gatherers, and gave him all I had gotten, thanking him for his kindness, but he would not accept them, saying, Sell them and make profit by the price. And presently he added, Giving me the key of a closet in his house, Store thy nuts in this safe place, and go thou forth every morning, 
and gather them as thou hast done today, and choose out the worst for sale, and supply in thyself, but lay up the rest here, so haply thou mayst collect enough to serve thee for thy return home. Allah requite thee, answered I, and did as he advised me, going out daily with the cocoa nut gatherers, who commended me to one another, and showed me the best stocked trees. Footnote. Tomb pictures in Egypt show tame monkeys gathering fruits, and Grossier, description of China quoted by Hole and Lane, mentions a similar mode of harvesting tea by irritating the monkeys of the Middle Kingdom. End of footnote. Thus did I, for some time, till I had laid up great store of excellent nuts, besides a large sum of money, the price of those I had sold. I became thus at my ease, and bought all I saw, and had a mind too, and passed my time pleasantly, greatly enjoying my stay in the city, till, as I stood on the beach one day, a great ship, steering through the heart of the sea, presently cast anchor by the shore, and landed a company of merchants, who proceeded to sell and buy and barter their goods for cocoa nuts and other commodities. Then I went to my friends and told them of the coming of the ship, and how I had a mind to return to my own country. And he said, "'Tis for thee to decide." So I thanked him for his bounties, and took leave of them. Then, going to the captain of the ship, I agreed with him for my passage, and embarked my cocoa nuts, and what else I had possessed. We weighed anchor, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and fifty-ninth night, she said it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Sinbad the seaman continued. So I left the city of the apes, and embarked my cocoa nuts, and what else I possessed. We weighed anchor the same day, and sailed from island to island, and sea to sea. And whenever we stopped, I sold and traded with my cocoa nuts, and the Lord requited me more than I erst had and lost. Amongst other places we came to an island abounding in cloves. Footnote. Cloves and cinnamon in those days grew in widely distant places. End of footnote. And cinnamon and pepper. And the country people told me that by the side of each pepper bunch groweth a great leaf, which shadeth it from the sun, and casteth the water off it in the wet season. But when the rain ceaseth, the leaf turneth over and droopeth down by the side of the bunch. Footnote. In pepper plantations it is usual to set bananas for shading the young shrubs which bear bunches like ivy fruit, not pods. End of footnote. Here I took great store of pepper and cloves and cinnamon in exchange for cocoa nuts, and we passed thence to the island of al Usirat. Footnote. The Bressel edit has al Maharat. Langles calls it the island of al Kamari. See Lane, section 386, and a footnote. Whence cometh the cormoran, aloes wood, and thence to another island, five days' journey in length, where grows the Chinese lean aloes, which is better than the cormoran, but the people of this island. Footnote. Insula pro peninsula. Cormoran is a corruption of Kanya, Virgo the goddess Durga, and Kumari a maid, a princess, from a temple of Shiva's wife, hence Ptolemy's, and near it to the northeast, Promontorium, Cori Quad Coromini, Caput Insula Focant, says Maphis. In the text, Alud refers to the eaglewood, so called because spotted like the bird's plume, that of Champa, Kokin, China, mentioned in Camoans, is still famous. End of footnote. Are fouler of condition and religion than those of the other, for that they love fornication and wine-bibbing, and know not prayer nor call to prayer. Thence we came to the pearl fisheries, and I gave the divers some of my cocoa nuts, and said to them, Dive for my luck and lot. They did so, and brought up from the deep blight. Footnote. Arabic. Bikrat is tank, pool, reach, blight. Hence, Bik Burkhat, Fa'arun, in the Suez Gulf. End of footnote. Great store of large and priceless pearls, 
and they said to me, By Allah, O my master, thy luck is a lucky. Then we sailed on with the blessing of Allah, whose name be exalted, and ceased not sailing till we arrived safely at Busara. There I abode a little, and then went on to Baghdad, where I entered my quarter and found my house, and foregathered with my family, and saluted my friends, who gave me joy of my safe return. And I laid up all my goods and valuables in my storehouses. Then I distributed alms and largesse, and clothed the widow and orphan, and made presents to my relations and comrades. For the Lord hath requited me fourfold that I had lost. After which I returned to my old merry way of life, and forgot all I had suffered in the great profit and gain I had made. Such, then, is the history of my fifth voyage, and its wonderments. And now to supper, and to-morrow, come again I will tell you what befell me in my sixth voyage. For it was still more wonderful than this, saith he who telleth the tale. Then he called for food, and the servants spread the table, and when they had eaten the evening meal, he bade gave Simbad the porter an hundred golden dinars, and the landsman returned home and laid him down to sleep, much marvelling at all he had heard. Next morning, as soon as it was light, he prayed the dawn prayer, and, after blessing Muhammad the cream of all creatures, betook himself to the house of Sinbad the seaman, and wished him a good day. The merchant bade him, sat and talked with him, till the rest of the company arrived. Then the servants spread the table, and when they had well eaten and drunken, and were mirthful and merry, Sinbad the seaman began, in his words, the narrative of The Sixth Voyage of Sinbad the Seaman Know, O my brothers and friends and companions all, that I abode some time, after my return from my fifth voyage, in great solace and satisfaction and mirth, and merriment, joyance and enjoyment. And I forgot what I had suffered, seeing the great gain and profit I had made till, one day, as I sat making merry and enjoying myself with my friends, there came in to me a company of merchants, whose case told tales of travel, and talked with me of voyage and adventure and greatness of pelf and lucre. Thereupon I remember the days of my return from abroad, and my joy at once more seeing my native land and foregathering with my family and friends, and my soul yearned for travel and traffic. So, compelled by fate and fortune, I resolved to undertake another voyage, and, buying me fine and costly merchandise meant for foreign trade, made it up into bales, with which I journeyed from Baghdad to Bassara. Here I found a great ship ready for sea, and full of merchants and notables, who had with them goods of price. So I embarked my bales therein, and we left Basara in safety and good spirits, under the safeguard of the king, the preserver. And Shah Razad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and sixtieth night, she said it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Sinbad the seaman continued. And after embarking my bales and leaving Basara in safety and good spirits, we continued our voyage from place to place and from city to city, buying and selling and profiting and diverting ourselves with the sight of countries where strange folk dwell. And fortune and this voyage smiled upon us, till one day, as we went along, behold, the captain suddenly cried with a great cry and cast his turban on the deck. Then he buffeted his face like a woman, and plucked out his beard, and fell down in the waist of the ship, with nigh fainting for stress of grief and rage, and crying, O oh, alas, for the ruin of my house, and the orphan ship of my poor children! So all the merchant and sailors came round about him, and asked him, O oh, master, what is the matter? For the light had become night before their sight, and he answered, saying, Know, O folk, that we have wandered from our course, and left the sea whose ways we know, and come into a sea whose ways I know not, and unless Allah vouchsafe us a means of escape, we are all dead men. Wherefore pray ye to the Most High, and he deliver us from this strait. 
Happily amongst you is one righteous, whose prayers the Lord will accept. Then he arose and clomb the mast, to see whether there was any escape from that strait, and he would have loosened the sails. But the wind redoubled upon the ship, and the whirled her around thrice, and drave her backwards, whereupon the rudder brake, and she fell off toward the, a high mountain. With this the captain came down from the mast, saying, There is no majesty, and there is no might save in Allah, the glorious, the great, nor can man prevent that which he is foreordained by fate. By Allah we are fallen on a place of sure destruction, and there is no way of escape for us, nor can any of us be saved. Then we all fell a-weeping over ourselves, and bidding one another farewell, for that our days were to come to an end, and we had lost all hope of life. Presently the ship struck the mountain and broke up, and all and everything on board of her were plunged into the sea. Some of the merchants were drowned, and others made shift to reach the shore and save themselves upon the mountain. I amongst the number, and when we got ashore, we found a great island, or rather peninsula. Footnote. Probably Cape Cormoran, to judge from the river, but the text names Sarandib, Ceylon Island, famous for gems. This was noticed by Marco Polo, section 3, cap 19, and ancient authors relate the same of Tabrabane, end of footnote, whose base was strewn with wreckage of crafts and goods and gear cast up by the sea from the broken ships, whose passengers had been drowned, and the quantity confounded Compt in calculation. So I climbed the cliffs into the inward of the isle, and walked on inland, until I came into a stream of sweet water that welled up at the nearest foot of the mountains, and disappeared in the earth under the range of the hills on the opposite side. But all the other passengers went over the mountains, to the inner tracks, and, dispersing hither and thither, were confounded at what they saw and became like madmen at the sight of the wealth and treasures wherewith the shores were strewn. As for me, I looked into the bed of the stream, aforesaid, and saw therein great plenty of rubies and great royal pearls. Footnote. I need hardly trouble the reader with a note on pearl fisheries. The descriptions of travellers are continuous from the days of Pliny, Solanus, and Marco Polo. Maximilian of Transylvania, in his narrative of Magellan's voyage, says that Celebes produced pearls big as turtles doves' eggs, and the king of Pornay, Borneo, had two unions as great as goose's eggs. Pigafetta reduces this to hen's eggs, and Sir Thomas Herbert to dove's eggs. End of footnote. And all kinds of jewels and precious stones, which were as gravel to the bed of the rivulets that ran through the fields, and the sand sparkled and glittered with gems and precious ores. Moreover, we found in the island abundance of the finest lean aloes, both Chinese and Cormoran, and there also is a spring of crude ambergris, footnote, Arabic, anbar, pronounced ambar, wherein I would derive ambrosia. Ambergris was long supposed to be a fossil, a vegetable which grew upon the sea bottom or rose in springs, or a substance produced in the water like naphtha or bitumen. Now it is known to be the jester of a whale, it is found in lumps weighing several pounds upon the Zanzibar coast, and is sold at a high price, being held a potent aphrodisiac. A small hollow is drilled in the bottom of the cup, and the coffee is poured upon the bit of ambergris it contains. When the oleaginous matter shows in dots amidst the kema coffee cream, the bubbly froth which floats upon the surface and which an expert coffee servant distributes equally among the guests. Argensola mentions in Ceylon springs of liquid bitumen thicker than our oil, and some of pure balsam. End of footnote. Which floweth like wax or gum over the stream banks, for the great heat of the sun, and runneth down to the sea shore, where the monsters of the deep come up and swallowing it, return into the sea. But it burneth in their bellies, so they cast it up again, 
and it congealeth on the surface of the water, whereby its colour and quantities are changed. And at last the waves cast it ashore, and the travellers and merchants who know it collect it and sell it. But as to the raw amber grease, which is not swallowed, it floweth over the channel and congealeth on the banks, and when the sun shineth on it, it melteth, and scenteth the whole valley in with a musk-like fragrance. Then, when the sun ceaseth from it, it congealeth again. But none can get to this place, where is the crude amber grease, because of the mountains, which enclose the island on all sides, and which foot of a man cannot ascend. Footnote. The tale-teller forgets that Sinbad and his companions have just ascended it, but this in consequence is a characteristic of the Eastern Saga. I may note that the description of the ambergris in the text tells us admirably, well, what it is not. End of footnote. We continued thus to explore the island, marvelling at the wonderful works of Allah and the riches we found there, but saw troubled for our own case and dismayed at our prospects. Now we had picked up on the beach some small matter of victual from the wreck and husbanded it carefully, eating but once every day or two. In our fear lest it should fail us and we die miserably of famine or affright. Moreover, we were weak for colic brought on by the seasickness and the low diet, and my companions deceased, one after the other, till there was but a small company of us left. Each that died we washed, and shrouded in some of the clothes and linen cast ashore by the tides. And after little the rest of my fellows perished, one by one, till I had buried the last of the party, and abode alone on the island, with but a little provision left, I who was wont to have so much. And I wept over myself, saying, Would heaven I had died before my companions, and they had washed me and buried me. It had been better than I should perish, and none wash me and shroud me and bury me. But there is majesty, and there is no might save in Allah, the glorious, the great. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 8section 9 of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 6 by anonymous translated by richard francis burton section 9 when it was the 561st night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that sinbad the seaman continued in these words now after I had buried the last of my party and abode alone on the island, I arose and dug me a deep grave on the seashore, saying to myself, Whenas I grow weak and I know that death cometh to me, I will cast myself into the grave and die there. So the wind may drift the sand over me and cover me, and I be buried therein. Then I fell to reproaching myself for my little wit in leaving my native land and betaking me again to travel after all I had suffered during my first five voyages, and when I had not made a single one without suffering more horrible perils and more terrible hardships than in its forerunner, and having no hope of escape from my present stress. And I repented me of my folly and bemoaned myself, especially as I had no need of money, seeing that I had enough and more than enough and could not spend what I had, no, nor a half of it in all my life. However, after a while Allah sent me a thought, and I said to myself, By God, needs must this stream have an end as well as a beginning. Ergo an issue somewhere, and belike its course may lead to some inhabited place. So my best plan is to make me a little boat, big enough to sit in, and carry it and launch it on the river, embark therein and drop down the stream. If I escape, I escape by God's leave, and if I perish, better die in the river than here. Then, sighing for myself, I set to work collecting a number of pieces of Chinese and cormoran aloes wood, and I bound them together with ropes from the wreckage. Then I chose out from the broken up ships straight planks of even size and fixed them firmly upon the aloes wood, making me a boat raft a little narrower than the channel of the stream. And I tied it tightly and firmly as though it were nailed. 
Then I loaded it with the goods, precious ores and jewels, and the union pearls which were like gravel, and the best of the ambergris, crude and pure. Together with what I had collected on the island, and what was left me of victual and wild herbs. Lastly I lashed a piece of wood on either side, to serve me as oars, and launched it, and embarking, did according to the saying of the poet. Fly, fly with life, when as evils threat, leave the house to tell of its builder's fate. Land after land shalt thou seek and find, but no other life on thy wish shall wait. Fret not thy soul in thy thoughts a night, all woes shall end or sooner or late. Whoso is born in one land to die, there and only there shall gang his gate. Nor trust great things to another wight, soul hath only soul for confederate. My boat raft drifted with the stream, I pondering the issue of my affair, and the drifting ceased not till I came to the place where it disappeared beneath the mountain. I rowed my conveyance into the place, which was intensely dark, and the current carried the raft with it down the underground channel. The thin stream bore me on through a narrow tunnel where the raft touched either side and my head rubbed against the roof, return therefrom being impossible. Then I blamed myself for having thus risked my life, and said, If this passage grow any straighter, the raft will hardly pass, and I cannot turn back, so I shall inevitably perish miserably in this place. And I threw myself down upon my face on the raft, by reason of the narrowness of the channel, whilst the stream ceased not to carry me along, knowing not night from day, for the excess of the gloom which encompassed me about in my terror and concern for myself lest I should perish. And in such condition my course continued down the channel which now grew wide and then straighter till, sore a weary by reason of the darkness which could be felt, I fell asleep as I lay prone on the raft and I slept knowing not if the time were long or short. When I awoke at last, I found myself in the light of heaven, and opening my eyes I saw myself in a broad stream, and the raft moored to an island in the midst of a number of Indians and Abyssinians. As soon as these blackamoors saw that I was awake, they came up to me and bespoke me in their speech. But I understood not what they said, and thought that this was a dream and a vision, which had betided me for stress of concern and chagrin. But I was delighted at my escape from the river. When they saw I understood them not and made them no answer, one of them came forward and said to me in Arabic, Peace be with thee, O my brother. Who art thou, and whence faredst thou thither? How camest thou into this river, and what manner of land lies beyond yonder mountains? For never knew we any one make his way thence to us. Quoth I, and upon thee be peace and the truth of Allah and his blessing. Who are ye, and what country is this? O oh, my brother, answered he, we are husbandmen and tillers of the soil, who came out to water our fields and plantations, and finding thee asleep on this raft, laid hold of it, and made it fast by us, against thou shouldest awake at thy leisure. So tell us how thou camest hither. I answered, For Allah's sake, O my Lord, ere I speak give me somewhat to eat, for I am starving, and after ask me what thou wilt. So he hastens to fetch me food, and I ate my fill till I was refreshed, and my fear was calmed by a good belly full, and my life returned to me. Then I rendered thanks to the Most High, for mercies great and small, glad to be out of the river and rejoicing to be amongst them, and I told them all my adventures, from first to last, especially my troubles in the narrow channel. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and sixty-second night, she said it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Sinbad the seaman continued. When I landed and found myself amongst the Indians and Abyssinians, and had taken some rest, they consulted among themselves and said to one another, There is no help for it, but we carry him with us and present him to our king, that he may acquaint him with his adventures. 
So they took me, together with the raft boat, and its lading of monies and merchandise, jewels, minerals, and golden gear, and brought me to their king, who was king of Sarandib, telling him what had happened, whereupon he saluted me and bade me welcome. Then he questioned me of my condition and adventures through the man who had spoken Arabic, and I repeated to him my story from beginning to end. Whereat he marvelled exceedingly, and gave me joy of my deliverance, after which I arose and fetched from the raft great store of precious ores and jewels and ambergris and lean aloes, and presented them to the king, who accepted them, and treated me with the utmost honour, appointing me a lodging in his own palace. So I consorted with the chief of the islanders, and they paid me the utmost respect, and I quitted not the royal palace. Now the island of Sarandib lieth under the equinoctial line, its night and day both numbering twelve hours. It measureth eighty leagues long by a breadth of thirty, and its width is bounded by a lofty mountain and a deep valley. The mountain is conspicuous from a distance of three days, and it containeth many kinds of rubies and other minerals, and spice trees of all sorts. The surface is covered with emery, wherewith gems are cut and fashioned. Diamonds are in its rivers and pearls are in its valleys. I ascended that mountain and solaced myself with a view of its marbles, which are indescribable and afterwards I returned to the king. Thereupon all the travellers and merchants who came to the place questioned me of the affairs of my native land, and of the caliph Harun al-Rashid and his rule, and I told them of him, and of that what for he was renowned, and they praised him because of this, whilst I in turn questioned them of their manners and customs of their own countries, and got the knowledge I desired. One day the king himself asked me of the fashions and forms of government of my country, and I acquainted him with the circumstance of the caliph's sway in the city of Baghdad, and the justice of his rule. The king marvelled at my account of his appointments, and said, By Allah, the caliph's ordinances are indeed wise, and his fashions of praiseworthy guise, and thou hast made me love him, by what thou tellest me. Wherefore I have a mind to make him a present, and send it by thee. Quoth I, Hearken in an obedience, O my lord, I will bear thy gift to him, and to inform him that thou art his sincere lover and true friend. Then I abode with the king in great honour, and regard and consideration for a long while till, one day, as I sat in his palace, I heard news of a company of merchants that were fitting out a ship for Basara, and said to myself, I cannot do better than voyage with these men. So I rose without stay or delay, and kissed the king's hand, and acquainted him with my longing, to set out with the merchants. For that I pined after my people, and mine own land. Quoth he, Thou art thine own master, yet, if it be thy will to abide with us, on our head and eyes be it, for thou gladdenest us with thy company. By Allah, O my Lord, answered I, thou hast indeed overwhelmed me with thy favours and well-doings, but I weary for a sight of my friends and family and native country. When he heard this, he summoned the merchants in question, and commended me to their care, paying my freight and passage money. Then he bestowed on me great riches from his treasuries, and charged me with a magnificent present for the Caliph Harun al-Rashid. Moreover, he gave me a sealed letter, saying, Carry this with thine own hand to the commander of the faithful, and give him many salutations from us. Hearing and obedience, I replied, the missive was written on the skin of the kawi, which is finer than lamb parchment and of yellow colour, with ink of ultramarine, and the contents were as follows. Peace be with thee from the king of Al-Hind, before whom are a thousand elephants, and upon whose palace crenelles are a thousand jewels. But after, Lord to the Lord, and praises to his prophet, we send thee a trifling gift, which be thou pleased to accept. Thou art to us a brother and a sincere friend, and great is the love we bear for thee in heart. Favour us with a reply. The gift besitteth not thy dignity, but we beg of thee, O our brother, graciously to accept it, 
and peace be with thee. And the present was a cup of ruby, a span high, the inside of which was adorned with precious pearls, and a bed covered with the skin of the serpent which swalloweth the elephant, which skin hath spots, each like a dinar, and whoso sitteth upon it, never sickeneth. And a hundred thousand miscals of Indian line aloes, and a slave girl like a shining moon. Then I took leave of him, and of all my intimates and acquaintances in the island, and embarked with the merchants aforesaid. We sailed with a fair wind, committing ourselves to the care of Allah, be he extolled and exalted. And by his permission arrived at Basarah, where I passed a few days and nights equipping myself and packing up my bales. Then I went on to Baghdad city, the house of peace, where I sought an audience with the caliph, and laid the king's presence before him. He asked me whence they came, and I said to him, By Allah, O commander of the faithful, I know not the name of the city, nor the way thither. He then asked me, O Sinbad, is this true which the king writeth? And I answered after kissing the ground, O my lord, I saw in his kingdom much more than he hath written in his letter. For state processions a throne is set for him upon a huge elephant, eleven cubits high, and upon this he sitteth having his great lords and officers and guests standing in two ranks, on his right hand and on his left. At his head is a man handing in hand a golden javelin, and behind him another with a great mace of gold, whose head is an emerald, a span long and as thick as a man's thumb. And when he mounteth horse, there mount with him a thousand horsemen, clad in gold, brocade, and silk. And as the king proceedeth, a man proceedeth him, crying, This is the king of great dignity, of high authority. And he continueth to repeat his praises in words I remember not, saying at the end of his panegyric, This is the king owning the crown, whose like nor Solomon nor the mirage ever possessed. Then he is silent, and one behind him proclaimeth, saying, He will die, again I say he will die. And the other addeth, Extolled be the perfection of the living who dieth not. Moreover, by reason of his justice and ordinance and intelligence, there is no kazi in his city. And all his lieges distinguish between truth and falsehood. Quoth the caliph, How great is this king! His letter hath shown me this. And as for the mightiness of his dominion, thou hast told us what thou hast I witnessed. By Allah, he hath been endowed with wisdom and with wide rule. Then I related to the commander of the faithful all that had befallen me in my last voyage, at which he wondered exceedingly, and bade his historians record my story and store it up in his treasuries, for the edification of all who might see it. Then he conferred on me exceeding great favours, and I repaired to my quarter and entered my home, where I warehoused all my goods and possessions. Presently my friends came to me and I distributed presents among my family and gave alms and largesse, after which I yielded myself to joyance and enjoyment, mirth and merrymaking, and forgot all that I had suffered. Such then, O my brothers, is the history of what befell me in my sixth voyage. And tomorrow, inshallah, I will tell you the story of my seventh and last voyage, which is still more wondrous and marvellous than that of the first six, saith he who telleth the tale. Then he bade lay the table, and the company supped with him, after which he gave the porter a hundred dinars, as of want, and they all went their ways, marvelling beyond measure at that which they had heard. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and sixty-third night, she said it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Sinbad the seaman had related the history of what befell him in his sixth voyage, and all the company had dispersed, Sinbad the landsman went home and slept as of want. Next day he rose and prayed the dawn prayer, and repaired to his namesake's house, where, after the company was all assembled, the host began to relate the seventh voyage of Sinbad the seaman. Know, O company, 
that after my return from my sixth voyage, which brought me abundant profit, I resumed my former life and all possible joyance and enjoyment and mirth and making merry day and night. And I tarried some time in this solace and satisfaction, till my soul began once more to long to sail the seas and see foreign countries, and company with merchants and hear new things. So having made up my mind, I packed up in bales a quantity of precious stuffs, suited for sea trade, and repaired with them from Baghdad city to Basra town, where I found a ship ready for sea. And in her a company of considerable merchants. I shipped with them and becoming friends, we set forth on our venture, in health and safety, and sailed with a fair wind, till we came to a city called Matanat al-Sin. But after we had left it, as we fared on in all cheer and confidence, devising of traffic and travel, behold, there sprang up a violent headwind, and a tempest of rain fell on us and drenched us and our goods. So we covered the bales with our cloaks and garments, and drug it in canvas, lest they be spoiled by the rain, and betook ourselves to prayer and supplication to Almighty Allah, and humbled ourselves before him for deliverance from the peril that was upon us. But the captain arose, and tightening his girdle, tucked up his skirts, and after taking refuge with Allah from Satan the stoned, climbed to the masthead, whence he looked out right and left, and gazing at the passengers and crew, fell to buffeting his face and plucking out his beard. So we cried to him, O Rays, what is the matter? And he replied, saying, Seek ye deliverance of the Most High from the strait into which we have fallen, and bemoan yourselves and take leave of one another. For know that the wind hath gotten the mastery of us, and hath driven us into the utmost of the seas of the world. Then he came down from the masthead, and opening his sea chest, pulled out a bag of blue cotton, from which he took a powder like ashes. This he set in a saucer wetted with a little water, and after waiting a short time, smelt and tasted it. And then he took out of the chest a booklet, wherein he read a while and said, weeping, Know, O ye passengers, that in this book is a marvellous matter, denoting that whoso come hither shall surely die, without hope of escape, for that this ocean is called the sea of the clime of the king, wherein is a sepulchre of our Lord Solomon, son of David, on both be peace and therein are serpents of vast bulk and fearsome aspect. And what ship soever cometh to these climes, there riseth to her a great fish out of the sea, and swalloweth her up with all and everything on board her. Hearing these words from our captain, great was our wonder, but hardly had he made an end of speaking, when the ship was lifted out of the water, and let fall again, and we applied to praying the death prayer, and committing our souls to Allah, Presently we heard a terrible great cry like the loud pealing thunder, whereat we were terror-struck and became as dead men, giving ourselves up for lost. Then behold, there came up to us a huge fish, as big as a tall mountain, at whose sight we became wild for a fight, and, weeping sore, made ready for death, marvelling at its vast size and gruesome resemblance, when, lo, a second fish, made its appearance, and which we had seen naught more monstrous. So we bemoaned ourselves of our lives, and farewelled one another. But suddenly up came a third fish, bigger than the first two, whereupon we lost the power of thought and reason, and were stupefied for the excess of our fear and horror. Then the three fish began circling around about the ship, and the third and biggest opened his mouth to swallow it, and we looked into its mouth, and behold, it was wider than the gate of a city, and its throat was like a long valley. So we besought the Almighty, and called for succour upon his Apostle, on whom be blessing and peace, when suddenly a violent squall of wind arose and smote the ship, which rose out of the water and settled upon a great reef, the haunt of sea monsters, where it broke up and fell asunder into planks, and all and everything on board were plunged into the sea. As for me... I tore off all my clothes but my gown, and swam a little way, till I happened upon one of the ship's planks, whereto I clung and bestrode it like a horse, whilst the winds and the waters sported with me, 
and the waves carried me up and cast me down, and I was in most piteous plight for fear and distress and hunger and thirst. Then I reproached myself for what I had done, and my soul was weary after a life of ease and comfort. And I said to myself, O Sinbad, O Seaman, thou repentest not, and yet thou art ever suffering hardships and travails. Yet wilt thou not renounce sea travel? Or, and thou say, I renounce? Thou liest in thy renouncement? Endure then with patience that which thou sufferest. For verily thou deservest all that betideth thee. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 9《Section 10 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 10. When it was the five hundredth and sixty-fourth night. She said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Sindmad the seaman continued, But when I had bestridden the plank, quoth I to myself, Thou deservest all that betideth thee. All this is decreed to me of Allah, whose name be exalted. To turn me from my greed of gain, Whence ariseth all that I endure, for I have wealth galore? Then I returned to my senses, and said, In very sooth, this time I repent to the Most High, with a sincere repentance, of my lust for gain and venture, and never will I again name travel with tongue nor in thought. And I ceased not to humble myself before Almighty Allah, and weep and bewail myself, recalling my former estate of solace and satisfaction and mirth and merriment and joyance and thus i abode two days at the end of which time i came to a great island abounding in trees and streams there i landed and ate of fruits of the island and drank of its waters till i was refreshed and my life returned to me and my strength and spirits were restored and I recited, Oft when thy case shows knotty and tangled skein, Fate downs from heaven and straightens every ply. In patience keep thy soul till clear thy lot, For he who ties the knot can eke untie. Then I walked about till I found on the further side A great river of sweet water, Running with a strong current, Whereupon I called to mind the boat-raft I had made aforetime, and said to myself, Needs must I make another. Haply I may free me from this strait. If I escape, I have my desire, and I vow to Allah Almighty to forswear travel. And if I perish, I shall be at peace, and shall rest from toil and moil. So I rose up, and gathered together, great store of pieces of wood from the trees, which were all of the finest sanders wood, whose like is not alb, I knew it not, and made shift to twist creepers and tree twigs into a kind of rope, with which I bound the billets together, and so contrived a raft, then saying, and I be saved, tis of God's grace, I embarked thereon and committed myself to the current, and it bore me on for the first day and the second, and the third, after leaving the island. Whilst I lay in the raft, eating not, and drinking, when I was athirst, of the water of the river, till I was weak and giddy as a chicken, for stress of fatigue and famine and fear, at the end of this time I came to a high mountain, whereunder ran the river, which, when I saw, I feared for my life, by reason of the straitness I had suffered in my former journey, and I would fain have stayed the raft, and landed on the mountain side. But the current overpowered me, 
and drew me into the subterranean passage like an archway, whereupon I gave myself up for lost, and said, There is no majesty, there is no might save in Allah, the glorious, the great. However, after a little, the raft glided into open air, and I saw before me a wide valley, whereinto the river fell with a noise like the rolling of thunder, and a swiftness as the rushing of the wind. I held on to the raft, for fear of falling off it, whilst the waves tossed me right and left, and the craft continued to descend with the current, nor could I avail to stop it, nor turn it shorewards, till it stopped with me, at a great and goodly city, grandly edified, and containing much people. And when the townsfolk saw me on the raft, dropping down with the current, they threw me out ropes which I had not strength enough to hold. Then they tossed a net over the craft, and drew it ashore with me, whereupon I fell to the ground amidst them, as I were a dead man, for stress of fear and hunger and lack of sleep. After a while there came up to me out of the crowd an old man, of reverend aspect, well stricken in years, who welcomed me, and threw over an abundance of handsome clothes wherewith I covered my nakedness. Then he carried me to the hammam bath, and brought me cordial sherbets and delicious perfumes. Moreover, when I came out, he bore me to his house, where his people made much of me, and, seating me in a pleasant place, set rich food before me, whereof I ate my fill, and returned thanks to God the Most High for my deliverance. Thereupon his pages fetched me hot water, and I washed my hands, and his handmaids brought me silken napkins, with which I dried them, and wiped my mouth. Also the sheikh set apart for me an apartment in a part of his house, and charged his pages and slave-girls to wait upon me, and do my will, and supply my wants. They were assiduous in my service, and I abode with him in the guest-chamber three days, taking my ease of good eating and good drinking, and good sense, till life returned to me, and my terrors subsided, and my heart was calmed, and my mind was eased. On the fourth day the sheikh, my host, came in to me, and said, Thou cheerest us with thy company, O my son, and praise be Allah for thy safety. Say, wilt thou now come down with me to the beach and the bazaar, and sell thy goods, and take their price? Be like thou mayst buy thee wherewithal to traffic. I have ordered my servants to remove thy stock in trade from the sea, and they have piled it on the shore. I was silent a while, and said to myself, What mean these words, and what goods have I? Then said he, O my son, be not troubled nor careful, but come with me to the market, and if any offer for thy goods what price contenteth thee, take it. But, and thou be not satisfied, I will lay them up for thee in my warehouse, against a fitting occasion for sale. So I bethought me of my case, and said to myself, Do his bidding, and see what are these goods. And I said to him, O oh, my nuncle the sheikh, I hear and I obey. I may not gainsay thee in aught, for Allah's blessing is on all thou dost. Accordingly he guided me to the market street, where I found that he had taken in pieces the raft which carried me, and which was of sandalwood, and I heard the broker calling it for sale. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and sixty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Sinbad the seaman thus resumed his tale. I found that the sheikh had taken to pieces my raft, which lay on the beach, and the broker was crying the sandalwood for sale. Then the merchants came, and opened the gate of bidding for the wood, and bid against one another, till its price reached a thousand dinars. 
When they left bidding, and my host said to me, Here, O my son, this is the current price of thy goods in hard times like these. Wilt thou sell them for this, or shall I lay them up for thee in my storehouses, till such time as prices rise? O my lord, answered I, the business is in thy hands, do as thou wilt. Then asked he, Wilt thou sell the wood to me, O my son, for an hundred gold pieces, over and above what the merchants have bidden for it? And I answered, Yes, I have sold it to thee for monies received. So he bade his servants transport the wood to his storehouses, and, carrying me back to his house, seated me and counted out to me the purchase money, after which he laid it in bags, and setting them in a privy place, locked them up with an iron padlock, and gave me its key. Some days after this, the sheikh said to me, O oh my son, I have somewhat to propose to thee, wherein I trust thou wilt do my bidding. Quoth I, What is it? Quoth he, I am a very old man, and I have no son, but I have a daughter, who is young in years, and fair of favour, and endowed with abounding wealth and beauty. Now I have a mind to marry her to thee, that thou mayst abide with her in this our country, and I will make thee master of all I have in hand, for I am an old man, and thou shalt stand in my stead. I was silent for shame, and made him no answer, whereupon he continued, Do my desire in this, O my son, for I wish but thy will, and if thou wilt but do as I say, thou shalt have her at once, and be as my son, and all that is under my hand, or that cometh to me, shall be thine, and if thou have a mind to traffic and travel to thy native land, none shall hinder thee, and thy property will be at thy sole disposal, so do as thou wilt. By Allah, O my uncle, replied I, thou art become to me even as my father, and I am a stranger, and have undergone many hardships, while for stress of that which I have suffered, naught of judgment or knowledge is left to me, it is for thee, therefore, to decide what I shall do. Hereupon he sent his servants for the Kazai, and the witnesses, and married me to his daughter, making us for a noble marriage feast, and high festival. When I went into her, I found her perfect in beauty, and loveliness, and symmetry, and grace, clad in rich raiment, and covered with a profusion of ornaments and necklaces, and other trinkets of gold and silver and precious stones, worth a mint of money, a price none could pay. She pleased me, and we loved each other, and I abode with her in solace and delight of life, till her father was taken to the mercy of Allah Almighty. So we shrouded him and buried him, and I laid hands on the whole of his property, and all his servants and slaves became mine. Moreover, the merchants installed me in his office, for he was their sheikh and their chief, and none of them purchased aught but with his knowledge and by his leave. And now his rank passed on to me. When I became acquainted with the townsfolk, I found that at the beginning of each month they were transformed, in that their faces changed, and they became like birds, and they put forth wings, wherewith they flew unto the upper regions of the firmament, and none remained in the city save the women and children. And I said in my mind, When the first of the month cometh, I will ask one of them to carry me with them, whither they go. So when the time came, and their complexion changed, and their forms altered, I went in to one of the townsfolk, and said to him, Allah upon thee, carry me with thee, that I might divert myself with the rest, and return with you. This may not be, answered he. But I ceased not to solicit him, and I importuned him, till he consented. Then I went out in his company, without telling any of my family, or servants, or friends, and he took me on his back, 
and flew up with me so high in air that I heard the angels glorifying God in the heavenly dome. Whereat I wondered and exclaimed, Praise be Allah, extolled be the perfection of Allah. Hardly had I made an end of pronouncing the tasbih, Praise be Allah, when there came out a fire from heaven and all but consumed the company, whereupon they fled from it and descended with curses upon me, and, casting me down on a high mountain, went away, exceeding wrath with me, and left me there alone. As I found myself in this plight, I repented of what I had done, and reproached myself for having undertaken that for which I was unable, saying, There is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah. The Glorious, the Great No sooner am I delivered from one affliction than I fall into a worse. And I continued in this case, knowing not whither I should go, when, lo, there came up two young men, as they were moons, each using as a staff a rod of red gold. So I approached them and saluted them, and when they returned my salam, I said to them, Allah upon you twain, who are ye, and what are ye? Quoth they, we are of the servants of the Most High Allah, abiding in this mountain. And, giving me a rod of red gold they had with them, went their ways, and left me. I walked on along the mountain ridge, staying my steps with the staff, and pondering the case of the two youths, when, behold, a serpent came forth from under the mountain, with a man in her jaws, whom she had swallowed even to below his navel. And he was crying out, and saying, Whoso delivereth me, Allah will deliver him from all adversity. So I went up to the serpent, and smote her on the head with the golden staff, whereupon she cast the man forth of her mouth. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 10《Section 11 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and at Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and at Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. When it was the five hundred and sixty sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Sinbad the seaman thus continued. When I smote the serpent on the head with my golden staff, she cast the man forth of her mouth. Then I smote her a second time, and she turned and fled. Whereupon he came to me and said, Since my deliverance from yonder serpent hath been at thy hands, I will never leave thee, and thou shalt be my comrade on this mountain. And welcome, answered I. So we fared on along the mountain, till we fell in with a company of folk, and I looked and saw amongst them the very man who carried me and cast me down there. I went to him, and spake him fair, excusing myself to him, and saying, O oh my comrade, is it not thus that friend should deal with friend? Quoth he, It was thou who well nigh destroyed us by thy tasba and thy glorifying God on my back. Quoth I, Pardon me, for I had no knowledge of this matter, but if thou wilt take me with thee, I swear not to say a word. So he relented, and consented to carry me with him, but he made an express condition that, so long as I abode on his back, I should abstain from pronouncing the tasba or otherwise glorifying God. Then I gave the wand of gold to him, whom I had delivered from the serpent, and bade him farewell. And my friend took me on his back, and flew with me as before, till he brought me to the city, and set me down in my own house. My wife came to meet me, and saluting me gave me joy of my safety, and then said, Beware of going forth hereafter with yonder folk, neither consort with them, for they are brethren of the devils, and know not how to mention the name of Allah Almighty, neither worship they him. And how did thy father with them? asked I. And she answered, My father was not of them, neither did he as they. And as now he is dead, methinks, thou hadst better sell all we have, 
and with the price buy merchandise, and journey to thine own country and people, and I with thee, for I care not to tarry in this city, my father and mother being dead. So I sold all the sheikh's property piecemeal, and looked for one who should be journeying thence to Bassorah, that I might join myself to him. And while thus doing I heard of a company of townsfolk who had a mind to make the voyage, but could not find them a ship. So they bought wood and built them a great ship, wherein I took passage with them, and paid them all the hire. Then we embarked, I and my wife, with all our movables, leaving our houses and domains, and so forth, and set sail, and ceased not sailing from island to island and from sea to sea, with a fair wind and a favouring, till we arrived at Besora safe and sound. I made no stay there, but freighted another vessel, and transferring my goods to her, set out forthright for Baghdad city, where I arrived in safety, and entering my quarter and repairing to my house, foregathered with my family and friends and familiars, who laid up my goods in my warehouses. When my people, who, reckoning the period of my absence on this my seventh voyage, had found it to be seven and twenty years, and had given up all hope of me, heard of my return, and they came to welcome me and to give me joy of my safety, and I related to them all that had befallen me, whereat they marvelled with exceeding marvel. Then I forswore travel, and vowed to Allah the Most High I would venture no more by land or sea, for that this seventh and last voyage had surfeited me of travel and adventure, and I thanked the Lord, be he praised and glorified, and blessed him for having restored me to my kith and kin and country and home. Consider therefore, O Sinbad, O landsman, continued Sinbad the seaman, what sufferings I have undergone, and what perils and hardships I have endured before coming to my present state. Allah upon thee, O my lord, answered Sinbad the landsman, pardon me the wrong I did thee. And they cease not from friendship and fellowship, abiding in all cheer and pleasures and solace of life, till there came to them the destroyer of delights, and the sunderer of societies, and the shatterer of palaces, and the caterer for cemeteries to wit, the cup of death, and glory be to the living one who dieth not. A translation of the seventh voyage of Sinbad the Seaman, according to the version of the Calcutta edition, which differs in essential form from the preceding tale. Know, O my brothers and friends and companions all, that when I left voyaging and commercing, I said in myself, Sufficeth me that hath befallen me, and I spent my time in solace and pleasure. One day, as I sat at home, there came a knock at the door, and when the porter opened, a page entered, and said, The caliph biddeth thee to him. I went with him to the king's majesty, and kissed ground, and saluted him, whereupon he welcomed me, and entreated me with honour, and said, O Sinbad, I have an occasion for thee, wilt thou do it? So I kissed his hand, and asked him, saying, O my lord, what occasion hath the master for the slave? Whereto he answered me, I am minded that thou travel to the king of Sarandib, and carry to him our writ and our gift, for that he hath sent to us a present and a letter. I trembled at these words, and rejoined, by Allah the Omnipotent, O my lord, I have taken a loathing to wayfair, and when I hear the words voyage or travel, my limbs tremble for what hath befallen me of hardships and horrors. Indeed, I have no desire whatever for this, more by token as I have bound myself by oath not to quit Baghdad. Then I informed the caliph of all I had passed through from first to last, and he marvelled with exceeding marvel, and said, by the Almighty, O Sinbad, from ages of old such mishaps as happened to thee were never known to happen to any, and thou dost only write never even to talk of travel. For our sake, however, thou wilt go this time, and carry our present and our letter to him of Sarandib, and Inshallah, by God's leave, thou shalt return quickly, and on this wise we shall be under no obligation to the said king. I replied that I heard and obeyed, being unable to oppose his command. So he gave me gifts, and the missive with money to pay my way, and I kissed hands and left the presence. Then I dropped down from Baghdad to the Gulf, and with other merchants embarked, and our ship sailed before a fair wind many days and nights, till, by Allah's aid, we reached the island of Serendib. As soon as we had made fast, we landed, and I took the present and the letter, and, going in with them to the king, kissed ground before him. When he saw me, he said, 
Well come, O Sinbad, by Allah omnipotent, we were longing to see thee, and glory be to God, who hath again shown us thy face. Then taking me by the hand, he made me sit by his side, rejoicing, and he welcomed me with familiar kindness again, and entreated me as a friend. After this he began to converse with me, and courteously addressed me, and asked, What was the cause of thy coming to us, O Sinbad? So, after kissing his hand and thanking him, I answered, O my lord, I have brought thee a present from my master, the caliph Harun al-Rashid, and offered him the present and the letter, which he read, and at which he rejoiced with passing joy. The present consisted of a mare worth ten thousand ducats, bearing a golden saddle set with jewels, a book, a sumptuous suit of clothes, and an hundred different kinds of white carine cloths and silks of Suez, Kufa and Alexandria, Greek carpets, and an hundred mons, weight of linen and raw silk. Moreover, there was a wondrous rarity, a marvellous cup of crystal, middlemost of which was the figure of a lion, faced by a kneeling man grasping a bow with arrow, drawn to the very head, together with the food tray, of Suleiman, the son of David, on whom be peace. The missive ran as follows. Peace from King al-Rashid, the aided of Allah, who hath vouchsafed to him and his forefathers noble rank and widespread glory, be on the fortunate sultan. But after, thy letter came to our hands, and we rejoice thereat, and we have sent the book entitled Delight of the Intelligent and for Friends the Rare Present, together with sundry curiosities suitable for kings, so do thou favour us by accepting them, and peace be with thee. Then the king lavished upon me much wealth, and entreated me with all honour. So I prayed for him, and thanked him for his munificence. Some days after I craved his leave to depart, but could not obtain it except by great pressing, whereupon I farewelled him, and fared forth from his city, with merchants and other companions, homewards bound without any desire for travel or companions, homewards bound without any desire for travel or trade. We continued voyaging and coasting along many islands, but when we were halfway, we were surrounded by a number of canoes, wherein were men like devils, armed with bows and arrows, swords and daggers, habited in mail coats and other armory. They fell upon us and wounded and slew all who opposed them. Then, having captured the ship and her contents, carried us to an island where they sold us at the meanest price. Now I was bought by a wealthy man, who, taking me to his house, gave me meat and drink and clothing, and treated me in the friendliest manner, so I was heartened and I rested a little. One day he asked me, Do thou know any art or craft? And I answered him, O oh my lord, I am a merchant, and know nothing but trade and traffic. Dost thou know, rejoined he, how to use bow and arrow? Yes, replied I. I know that much. Thereupon he bought me a bow and arrows, and mounted me behind him on an elephant. Then he set out as night was well nigh over, and, passing through a forest of huge growths, came to a tall and sturdy tree, up which he made me climb. Then he gave me the bow and arrows, saying, Sit here now, and when the elephants troop hither in early morning, shoot at them. Belike thou wilt hit one, and if he fall, come and tell me. With this he left me. I hid myself in the trees, being in sore terror and trembling nigh, till the sun arose, and when the elephants appeared and wandered about among the trees, I shot my arrows at them, and continued till I had shot down one of them. In the evening I reported my success to my master, who was delighted in me, and entreated me with high honour, and the next morning he removed the slain elephant. In this wise I continued, every morning shooting an elephant, which my master would remove, till one day, as I was perched in hiding on the tree, there came suddenly and unexpectedly an innumerable host of elephants, whose screaming and trumpeting were such that I imagined the earth trembled under them. All surrounded my tree, whose circumference was some fifty cubits, and one enormous monster came up to it, and, winding his trunk round the bull, hauled it up by the roots and dashed it to the ground. I fell down fainting amongst the beasts when the monster elephant wound his trunk about me, and, setting me on his back, went off with me, the others accompanying us. He carried me, still unconscious, till he reached the place for which he was making, when he rolled me off his back and presently went his ways, followed by the others. So I rested a little, 
and, when my terror had subsided, I looked about me and found myself among the bones of elephants, whereby I concluded that this was their burial place, and that the monster elephant had led me thither on account of the tusks. So I arose and walked a whole day and night, till I arrived at the house of my master, who saw my color changed by stress of a fright and famine. He rejoiced in my return, and said to me, by Allah, thou hast made my heart sore. I went when thou wast missing, and found the tree torn up, and thought that the elephants had slain thee. Tell me how it was with thee. I acquainted him with all that had betided me, whereat he wondered greatly, and rejoiced, and at last asked me, Dost thou know the place? Whereto I answered, Yes, O my master. So we mounted an elephant, and fared until we came to the spot, and when my master beheld the heaps of tusks, he rejoiced greatly, then carrying away as many as he wanted, and he returned with me home. After this he entreated me with increased favour, and said, O oh, my son, thou hast shown us the way to great gain, wherefore Allah requite thee. Thou art freed for the Almighty's sake and before his face. The elephants used to destroy many of us on account of our hunting them for their ivories and sorovellos, but Allah hath preserved thee from them, and thou hast profited us by the heaps to which thou hast led us. O oh, my master, replied I, God free thy neck from the fire, and do thou grant me, O oh, my master, thy gracious leave to return to my own country. Yes, quoth he, thou shalt have that permission, but we have a yearly fair, when merchants come to us from various quarters to buy up these ivories. The time is drawing near, and when they shall have done their business, I will send thee under their charge, and will give thee wherewithal to reach thy home. So I blessed and thanked him, and remained with him, treated with respect and honour for some days, when the merchants came as he had foretold, and bought and sold and bartered, and when they had made their preparations to return, my master came to me, and said, Rise and get thee ready to travel with the traders and route to thy country. They had bought a number of tusks which they had bound together in loads, and were embarking them when my master sent me with them, paying for my passage and settling all my debts besides which he gave me a large present in goods. We set out and voyaged from island to island till we had crossed the sea and landed on the shores of the Persian Gulf. When the merchants brought out and sold their stores, I also sold what I had at a high profit, and I bought some of the prettiest things in the place for presents and beautiful rarities and everything else I wanted. I likewise bought for myself a beast, and we fared forth and crossed the deserts from country to country till I reached Baghdad. Here I went into the caliph, and, after saluting him and kissing hands, informed him of all that had befallen me. Whereupon he rejoiced in my safety, and thanked Almighty Allah, and he bade my story be written in letters of gold. I then entered my house, and met my family and brethren, and such is the end of the history that happened to me during my seven voyages. Praise be to Allah, the One, the Creator, the Maker of all things in heaven and earth. Now when Shahrazad had ended her story of the two Sinbads, Dinarzad exclaimed, O oh my sister, how pleasant is thy tale, and how tasteful, how sweet, and how grateful! She replied, And what is this compared with that I could tell thee to-morrow night? Quoth the king, What may it be? And she said, It is a tale touching the city of brass. It is related that there was, in tide of yore, and in times and years long gone before, at Damascus of Syria, a caliph known as Ab Amalik bin Marwan, the fifth of the Amiad house. As this commander of the faithful was seated one day in his palace, conversing with his sultans and kings and the grandees of his empire, the talk turned upon the legends of past peoples and the traditions of our lord Solomon, David's son, on the twain be peace, and on that which Almighty Allah had bestowed on him of lordship and dominion over men, and jinn, and birds, and beasts, and reptiles, and the wind, and other created things, and quoth the caliph, Of a truth we hear from those who forewent us that the Lord, extolled and exalted be he, vouchsafed unto none the like of that which he vouchsafed unto our lord Solomon, and that he attained unto that whereto never attained other than he, in that he was wont to imprison jinns and marids and satans and cucurbites of copper, and to stop them with lead and seal them with his ring. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say 
her permitted say. End of section 11. Section 12 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6 by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. When it was the 567th night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the caliph Abd al-Malik bin Marwan sat conversing with his grandees concerning our lord Solomon, and these noted what Allah had bestowed upon him of lordship and dominion, quoth the commander of the faithful, Indeed, he attained unto that whereto never attained other than he, in that he was wont to imprison jinns and marids and satans in cucurbites of copper, and stopped them with lead and sealed them with his ring. Then said Talib bin Sal, who was a seeker after treasures and had books that discovered to him hoards and wealth hidden under the earth, O commander of the faithful, Allah make thy dominion to endure and exalt thy dignity here and hereafter. My father told me of my grandfather, that once he took ship with the company, intending for the island of Sicilia or Sicily, and sailed until there arose against them a contrary wind, which drove them from their course, and brought them, after a month, to a great mountain in one of the lands of Allah the Most High. But where the land was they wot not. Quoth my grandfather, This was in the darkness of the night, and as soon as it was day there came forth to us from the caves of the mountain folk black of colour and naked of body, as they were wild beasts, understanding not one word of what was addressed to them, nor was there any of them who knew Arabic, save their king who was one of their kind. When he saw the ship, he came down to it with a company of his followers, and saluting us, bade us welcome, and questioned us of our case and our faith. We told him all concerning ourselves, and he said, Be of good cheer, for no harm shall befall you. And when we, in turn, asked them of their faith, we found that each was of one of the many creeds prevailing before the preaching of al-Islam and the mission of Muhammad, whom may Allah bless and keep. So my shipmates remarked, We wot not what thou sayest. Then quoth the king, No Adam's son hath ever come to our land before you, but fear not, and rejoice in the assurance of safety, and of return to your own country. Then he entertained us three days, feeding us on the flesh of birds and wild beasts and fishes, than which they had no other meat, and on the fourth day he carried us down to the beach, that we may divert ourselves by looking upon the fisher folk. There we saw a man casting his net to catch fish, and presently he pulled them up, and behold, in them was a cucubite of copper, stopped with lead and sealed with the signet of Solomon, son of David, on whom be peace. He brought the vessel to land and broke it open, when there came forth a smoke which rose, a twisting, blew to the zenith, and we heard a horrible voice saying, I repent, I repent, pardon, O Prophet of Allah, I will never return to that which I did aforetime. Then the smoke became a terrible giant, frightful of form, whose head was level with the mountain tops, and he vanished from our sight, whilst our hearts were well nigh torn out for terror, but the blacks thought nothing of it. Then we returned to the king and questioned him of the matter, whereupon quoth he, Know that this was one of the jinns whom Solomon, son of David, being wroth with them, shut up in these vessels and cast into the sea, after stopping the mouths with melted lead. Our fishermen oft times, in casting their nets, bring up such bottles, which, being broken open, there come forth of them jinns, who, deeming that Solomon is still alive and can pardon them, make their submission to him, and say, I repent, O prophet of Allah. The caliph marvelled at Talib's story, and said, Glory be to God, verily, to Solomon was given a mighty dominion. Now al-Nabiga al-Zubyani was present, and he said, Talib hath spoken soothly, as is proven by the saying of the all-wise, the primeval one. And Solomon, when Allah to him said, Rise, be thou caliph, rule with righteous sway, Honor obedience for obeying thee, and who rebels imprison him for I. Wherefore he used to put them in copper bottles and cast them into the sea.
The poet's words seemed good to the caliph, and he said, By Allah, I long to look upon some of these Solomonic vessels, which must be a warning to whoso will be warned. O commander of the faithful, replied Talib, it is in thy power to do so without stirring abroad. Send to thy brother Abd al-Aziz bin Marwan, so he may write to Musa bin Nasser, governor of Maghrib, or Morocco, bidding him to take horse thence to the mountains whereof I spoke, and fetch thee therefrom as many of such cucubites as thou hast a mind to, for those mountains adjoin the frontiers of his province. The caliph approved his counsel, and said, Thou hast spoken sooth, O Talib, and I desire that, touching this matter, thou be my messenger to Musa bin Nasir, wherefore thou shalt have the white flag, and all thou hast a mind to, of monies and honour and so forth, and I will care for thy family during thine absence. With love and gladness, O commander of the faithful, answered Talib. Go with the blessing of Allah and his aid, quoth the caliph and bade write a letter to his brother abd al-aziz his viceroy in egypt and another to musa bin nasser his viceroy in northwestern africa bidding him go himself in quest of the solomonic bottles leaving his son to govern in his stead moreover he charged him to engage guides and to spare neither men nor money nor to be remiss in the matter as he would take no excuse then he sealed the two letters and committed them to talib bin sal bidding him advance the royal ensigns before him and make his utmost speed and gave him treasure and horsemen and footmen to further him on his way and made provision for the wants of his household during his absence so talib set out and arrived in due course at cairo and shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the five hundred and sixty-eighth night she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Talib bin Sal set out with his escort and crossed the desert country between Syria and Egypt, where the governor came out to meet him and entreated him and his company with high honor, whilst they tarried with him. Then he gave them a guide to bring them to the Said, or Upper Egypt, where the Emir Musa had his abiding place. And when the son of Nasir heard of Talib's coming, he went forth to meet him and rejoiced in him. Talib gave him the caliph's letter, and he took it reverently, and, laying it on his head, cried, I hear, and I obey the Prince of the Faithful. Then he deemed it best to assemble his chief officers, and, when all were present, he acquainted them with the contents of the Caliph's letter, and sought counsel of them how he should act. O Amir, answered they, if thou seekest one who shall guide thee to the place, summon the Sheikh Abd al-Samad ibn Abd al-Qudus al-Samudi for he is a man of varied knowledge, who hath travelled much, and knoweth by experience all the seas and wastes and words and countries of the world, and the inhabitants and wonders thereof. Wherefore send thou for him, and he will surely guide thee to thy desire. So Musa sent for him, and behold, he was a very ancient man, shot in years and broken down with lapse of days. The emir saluted him, and said, O Sheikh Abd al-Samad, our lord, the commander of the faithful, Abd al-Amik bin Marwan, hath commanded me thus and thus. I have small knowledge of the land wherein is that which the caliph desireth, but it is told me that thou knowest it well, and the ways thither. Wilt thou, therefore, go with me, and help me to accomplish the caliph's need? So it please Allah the Most High, thy trouble and travail shall not go waste. Replied the Sheikh, I hear and obey the bidding of the commander of the faithful. But no, O Emir, that road thither is long and difficult, and the ways few. How far is it? asked Musa. And the sheikh answered, It is a journey of two years and some months, going and the like returning, and the way is full of hardships and terrors and things wondrous and marvellous. Now thou art a champion of the faith, and our country is hard by that of the enemy, and peradventure the Nazarenes may come out upon us in thine absence, wherefore it behoveth thee to leave one to rule thy government in thy stead. It is well, answered the emir, and appointed his son Harun governor during his absence, requiring the troops to take the oath of fealty to him, and bidding them obey him in all he should commend. And they heard his words, and promised obedience. Now this Harun was a man of great prowess, and a renowned warrior, and a doughty knight, 
and the Sheikh Abd al Samad feigned to him that the place they sought was distant but four months' journey along the shores of the sea, with camping places all along the way, adjoining one another, and grass and springs, adding, Allah will assuredly make the matter easy to us through thy blessing, O lieutenant of the commander of the faithful. Quoth the Emir Musa, Knowest thou if any of the kings hath trodden this land before us? And quoth the Sheikh, Yes, it belonged aforetime to Darius, the Greek, king of Alexandria. But he said to Musa privately, O Emir, take with thee a thousand camels laden with victual and a store of guglets. The Emir asked, And what shall we do with these? And the Sheikh answered, On our way is the desert of Kauron, or Cyrene, the which is a vast wold four days' journey long, and lacketh water, nor therein doth sound or voice ever sound, nor is soul at any time to be seen. Moreover there bloweth the Simoon, and other hot winds, called Al-Jawab, which dry up the water-skins. But if there be water in the guglets, no harm can come to it. Right, said Musa, and sending to Alexandria, let bring thence great plenty of guglets. Then he took with him his wazir and two thousand cavalry, clad in male cap a pie, and set out, without other, to guide them, but Abd al Samad, who forewent them, riding on his hackney. The party fared on diligently, now passing through inhabited lands, then ruins, and anon traversing frightful wards and thirsty wastes, and then mountains which spired high in air, nor did they leave journeying a whole year's space till one morning when the day broke after they had travelled all night behold the sheikh found himself in a land he knew not and said there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah the glorious the great quoth the emir what is to do o sheikh and he answered saying by the lord of kaaba we have wandered from our road how cometh that asked musa and abd al samad answered the stars were overclouded, and I could not guide myself by them. Where on God's earth are we now? asked the emir, and the sheikh answered, I know not, for I never set eyes on this land till this moment. Said Musa, Guide us back to the place where we went astray. But the other, I know it no more. Then Musa, Let us push on. Haply Allah will guide us to it, or direct us aright of his power. So they fared on till the hour of noon prayer, when they came to a fair champagne, and wide and level and smooth as it were the sea when calm, and presently there appeared to them on the horizon some great thing, high and black, in whose midst as it were smoke rising to the confines of the sky. They made for this, and stayed not in their course till they drew near thereto, when lo, it was a high castle, firm of foundations and great and gruesome, as it were a towering mountain, builded all of black stone, with frowning crenelles and a door of gleaming china steel that dazzled the eyes and dazed the wits. Round about it were a thousand steps, and that which appeared afar off was, as it were, smoke rising, was a central dome of lead and hundred cubits high. When the emir saw this, he marveled thereat with exceeding marvel, and how this place was void of inhabitants. And the sheikh, after he had certified himself thereof, said, There is no god but the god, and Muhammad is the apostle of God. Quoth Musa, I hear thee praise the Lord, and hallow him, and meseemeth thou rejoicest. O Amir, answered Abd al Samad, Rejoice, for Allah, extolled and exalted be he, hath delivered us from the frightful wards and thirsty wastes. How knowest that? said Musa, and the other, I know it for that my father told me of my grandfather, that he said, We were once journeying in this land, and, straying from the road, we came to this palace, and thence to the city of Brass, between which and the place thou seekest is two full months' travel, but thou must take the seashore, and leave it not, for there be watering-places, and wells and camping-grounds established by King Zu al Karnain Iskander, who, when he went to the conquest of Mauritania, found by the way thirsty deserts and wastes and wilds, and dug therein water-pits, and built cisterns. Quoth Musa, Allah rejoice thee with good news. And quoth the Sheikh, Come, let us go look upon yonder palace and its marvels, for it is an admonition to whose will be admonished. So the emir went up to the palace, with the sheikh and his officers, and coming to the gate found it open. 
Now this gate was builded with lofty columns and porticoes, whose walls and ceilings were inlaid with gold and silver and precious stones, and there led up to it flights of steps, among which were two wide stairs of colored marble, never was seen their like, and over the doorway was a tablet, whereon were graven letters of gold in the old ancient Ionian character. "'Oh, Amir!' asked the sheikh. "'Shall I read?' And Musa answered, "'Read, and God bless thee, for all that betideth us in this journey dependeth on thy blessing.' So the sheikh, who was a very learned man, and versed in all tongues and characters, went up to the tablet and read whatso was thereon, and it was versed like this. The signs that here their mighty works portray warn us that all must tread the selfsame way. O thou who standest in this stead to hear tidings of folk whose power hath passed for aye, enter this palace gate and ask the news of greatness fallen into dust and clay. Death has destroyed them and dispersed their might, and in the dust they lost their rich display, as had they only set their burdens down to rest a while, and then had rode away. When the emir Musa heard these couplets, he wept till he lost his senses, and said, There is no god but the god, the living, the eternal, who ceaseth not. Then he entered the palace, and was confounded at its beauty and the goodliness of its construction. He diverted himself a while by viewing the pictures and images therein, till he came to another door, over which also were written verses, and said to the sheikh, Come read me these. So he advanced and read as follows. Under these domes how many a company, halted of old and fared without and stay. See thou what might displays on other whites, time with his shifts which could such lords waylay. They shared together what they gathered, and left their joys and fared to death decay. What joys they joyed, what food they ate, and now, in dust, they're eaten, for the worm a prey. At this the emir Musa wept bitter tears, and the world waxed yellow before his eyes, and he said, Verily we were created for a mighty matter. Then they proceeded to explore the palace, and found it desert and void of living thing, its courts desolate and dwelling places laid waste. In the midst stood a lofty pavilion, with a dome rising high in air, and about it were four hundred tombs builded of yellow marble. The emir drew near unto these, and behold, amongst them was a great tomb, wide and long, and at its head stood a tablet of white marble, whereon were engraven these couplets. How oft have I fought, and how many have slain! How much have I witnessed of blessing and bane! How much have I eaten, how much have I drunk! How oft have I hearkened to singing girls' strain! How much have I bidden, how oft have forbid! How many a castle and castle lane! I have sieged, and have searched, and the cloistered maids, in the depths of its walls for my captives were ta'en. But of ignorance sinned I to win me the meads, which one proved not, and brought nothing of gain. Then reckon thy reckoning, O man, and be wise, ere the goblet of death and doom thou shalt drain. For yet but a little the dust on thy head, they shall strew, and thy life shall go down to the dead. And the emir and his companions wept. Then, drawing near unto the pavilion, they saw that it had eight doors of sandalwood, studded with nails of gold and stars of silver, and inlaid with all manner of precious stones. On the first door were written these verses. What I left, I left it not for the nobility of soul, but through sentence and decree that to every man are dight. What while I lived happy, with temper hot and high, my hoarding place defending like a lion in the fight, I took no rest, and greed of gain forbade me give a grain of mustard seed to save from the fires of hell my sprite, until stricken on a day as with arrow by decree of the maker, the fashioner, the lord of might and right. When my death was appointed, my life I could not keep by the many of my stratagems, my cunning, and my slight. My troops I had collected availed me not, and none of my friends and my neighbors had power to mend my plight. Through my life I was weaned in journeying to death, in stress or in solace, in joyance or despite. So when money-bags are bloated, and dinar unto dinar, thou addest, all may leave thee with fleeting of the night. 
and the driver of a camel and the digger of a grave are what thine heirs shall bring ere the morning dawneth bright and on judgment day alone shalt thou stand before thy lord overladen with thy sins and thy crimes and shine affright let the world not seduce thee with lurings but behold what measure to thy family and neighbors it hath doled when musa heard these verses he wept with such weeping that he swooned away then coming to himself he entered the pavilion and saw therein a long tomb awesome to look upon whereon was a tablet of china steel and sheikh abd al samad drew near it and read this inscription in the name of everlasting allah the never beginning the never ending in the name of allah who begetteth not nor is he begot and unto whom the like is not in the name of allah the lord of majesty and might in the name of the living one who to death is never dight and shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the five hundred and sixty ninth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that sheikh abd al samad having read the aforesaid also found the following o thou who comest to this place take warning by that which thou seest of the accidents of time and the vicissitudes of fortune and be not deluded by the world and its pomp and vanities and fallacies and falsehoods and vain allurements for that it is flattering deceitful and treacherous and the things thereof are but a loan to us which it will borrow back from all borrowers it is like unto the dreams of the dreamer and the sleep visions of the sleeper or as the mirage of the desert which the thirsty take for water and satan maketh it fair for men even unto death these are the ways of the world wherefore put not thou thy trust therein neither incline thereto for it betrayeth him who leaneth upon it and who committeth himself thereunto in his affairs fall not thou into its snares neither take hold upon its skirts but be warned by my example i possessed four thousand bay horses and a haughty palace and i had to wife a thousand daughters of kings high-bosomed maids as they were moons i was blessed with a thousand sons as they were fierce lions and i abode a thousand years glad of heart and mind and i amassed treasures beyond the competence of all the kings of the regions of the earth deeming that delight would still endure to me but there fell on me unawares the destroyer of delights and the sunderer of societies and the desolator of domiciles and the spoiler of inhabited spots the murderer of great and small babes and children and mothers he who hath no ruth on the poor for his poverty or feareth the king for all his bidding or forbidding verily we abode safe and secure in this palace till there descended upon us the judgment of the lord of the three worlds lord of the heavens and lord of the earths the vengeance of the manifest truth overtook us when there died of us every day too till a great company of us had perished when i saw that destruction had entered our dwellings and had homed with us and in the sea of deaths had drowned us I summoned a writer, and bade him indite these verses and instances and admonitions, the which I let grave with rule and compass, on these doors and tablets and tombs. Now I had an army of a thousand thousand bridles, men of warrior mien, with forearms strong and keen, armed with spears and mail cloaks sheen, and swords that gleam. So I bade them don their long hanging halbrooks and gird on their biting blades and mount their high-mettled steeds and level their dreadful lances and when as there fell on us the doom of the lord of heaven and earth i said to them ho all ye soldiers and troopers can ye avail to ward off that which is fallen on me from the omnipotent king but the troopers and soldiers availed not unto this and said how shall we battle with him to whom no chamberlain barreth access the lord of the door which hath no doorkeeper then quoth i to them bring me my treasures now i had in my treasuries a thousand cisterns in each of which were a thousand quintals of red gold and the like of white silver besides pearls and jewels of all kinds and other things of price beyond the attainment of the kings of the earth so they did that and when they had laid all the treasure in my presence i said to them can ye ransom me with all this treasure or buy me one day of life therewith but they could not so they resigned themselves to foreordained fate and fortune and i submitted to the judgment of allah enduring patiently that which he decreed unto me of affliction 
till he took my soul and made me to dwell in my grave. And if thou ask of my name, I am Cush, the son of Shaddad, son of Ad the Greater. And upon the tablets were engraved these lines. And thou wouldst know my name, whose day is done, with shifts of time and chances neath the sun. Know I am Shaddad's son, who ruled mankind, and o'er all earth upheld dominion. All stubborn peoples abject were to me, and Sham to Cairo, and to Adnanwan. I reigned in glory, conquering many kings, and people feared my mischief every one. Yea, tribes and armies in my hand I saw, the world all dreaded me, both friends and foe. When I took horse, I viewed my numbered troops, bridles on neighing steeds a million, and I had wealth that none could tell or count, against misfortune treasuring all I won. Fain had I bought my life with all my wealth, and for a moment's space my death to shun. But God would not save what his purpose willed, so from my brethren cut I bowed alone. And death, that sunders man, exchanged my lot to pauper hut from Grandier's mansion, when found I all mine actions gone and pass, wherefore I'm pledged and by my sin undone. Then fear, O oh man, who by a brink dost range, the turns of fortune, and the chance of change. The Emir Musa was hurt to his heart, and loathed his life for what he saw of the slaughtering places of the folk, and as they went about the highways and byways of the palace, viewing its sitting chambers and pleasances, behold, they came upon a table of yellow onyx, upborne on four feet of juniper wood, and thereon these words graven, At this table have eaten a thousand kings, blind of the right eye, and a thousand blind of the left, and yet other thousands sound of both eyes, all of whom have departed the world, and have taken up their sojourn in the tombs and the catacombs. All this the emir wrote down, and left the palace, carrying off with him not save the table aforesaid. Then he fared on with his host three days' space, under the guidance of the Sheikh Abd al-Samad, till they came to a high hill, whereon stood a horseman of brass. In his hand he held a lance with a broad head, in brightness like blinding leaven, whereon was graven, O thou that comest unto me, if thou know not the way to the city of brass, rub the hand of this rider, and he will turn round and presently stop. Then taketh the direction whereto he faceth, and fare fearless, for it will bring thee without hardship to the city aforesaid. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 12section twelve of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the book of a thousand nights and a night volume six by anonymous translated by richard francis burton section thirteen when it was the five hundred and seventieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the emir Musa rubbed the horseman's hand, he revolved like the dazzling lightning, and stopped facing in a direction other than that wherein they were journeying. So they took the road to which he pointed, which was the right way, and finding it a beaten track, fared on through their days and nights, till they had covered a wide tract of country. Then they came upon a pillar of black stone like a furnace chimney, wherein was one sunken up to his armpits. He had two great wings and four arms, two of them like the arms of the sons of Adam, and other two as they were lion's paws with claws of iron, and he was black and tall and frightful of aspect with hair like horses' tails, and eyes like blazing coals, slit upright in his face. Moreover he had in the middle of his forehead a third eye, as it were that of a lynx, from which flew sparks of fire, and he cried out, saying, 
glory to my lord who hath adjudged unto me this grievous torment and sore punishment until the day of doom when the folk saw him they lost their reason for affright and turned to flee so the emir musa asked the sheikh abd al samad what is this and he answered i know not whereupon quoth musa draw near and question him of his condition haply he will discover to thee his case allah assain thee emir indeed i am afraid of him replied the sheikh but the emir rejoined saying fear not he is hindered from thee and from all others by that wherein he is so abd al samad drew near to the pillar and said to him which was therein o creature what is thy name and what art thou and how camest thou here in this fashion i am an ifrit of the jinn replied he by name dahish son of al amash and am confined here by the almight prisoned here by the providence and punished by the judgment of Allah, till it pleases him to whom belong might and majesty to release me. Then said Musa, Ask him why he is in durance of this column. So the sheikh asked him of this, and the ifrit replied, saying, Verily my tale is wondrous, and my case marvellous, and it is this. One of the sons of Iblis had an idol of red carnelian, whereof I was guardian and there served it a king of the kings of the sea a prince of puissant power and prow of prowess overruling a thousand thousand warriors of the john who smote with swords before him and answered his summons in time of need all these were under my commandment and obeyed my behest being each and every rebels against solomon son of david on whom be peace and i used to enter the belly of the idol and thence bid and forbid them now this king's daughter loved the idol and was frequent in prostration to it and assiduous in its service and she was the fairest woman of her day accomplished in beauty and loveliness elegance and grace she was described unto solomon and he sent to her father saying give me thy daughter to wife and break shine idol of carnelian and testify saying there is no god but the god and solomon is the prophet of allah and thou do this our due shall be thy due and thy debt shall be our debt but if thou refuse make ready to answer the summons of the lord and don thy grave gear for i will come upon thee with an irresistible host which shall fill the waste places of earth and make thee as yesterday that is passed away and hath no return for i when this message reached the king he waxed insolent and rebellious prideful and contumacious and he cried to his wazirs what say ye of this know ye that solomon son of david hath sent requiring me to give him my daughter to wife and break my idol of carnelian and enter his faith and they replied o mighty king how shall solomon do thus with thee even could he come at thee in the midst of this vast ocean he could not prevail against thee for the marids of the john will fight on thy side and thou wilt ask succour of shine idol whom thou servest and he will help thee and give thee victory over him so thou wouldst do well to consult on this matter thy lord meaning the idol aforesaid and hear what he saith if he say fight him fight him and if not not so the king went in without stay or delay to his idol and offered up sacrifices and slaughtered victims after which he fell down before him prostrate and weeping and repeated these verses o my lord well i weet thy puissant hand Suleiman would break thee and see thee banned. O my lord, to crave succour, here I stand. Command, and I bow to thy high command. Then I, continued the Ifrit, addressing the sheikh and those about him, of my ignorance and want of wit and recklessness of the commandment of Solomon, and lack of knowledge anent his power, entered the belly of the idol and made answer as follows 
As for me, of him I feel not a fright, for my lore and my wisdom are infinite. If he wish for warfare, I'll show him fight, and out of his body I'll tear his sprite. When the king heard my boastful reply, he hardened his heart, and resolved to wage war upon the prophet, and to offer him battle. Wherefore he beat the messenger with a grievous beating, and returned a foul answer to Solomon, threatening him, and saying, Of a truth thy soul hath suggested to thee a vain thing. Dost thou menace me with mendacious words? But gird thyself for battle, for an thou come not to me, I will assuredly come to thee. So the messenger returned to Solomon, and told him all that had passed, and what so had befallen him, which, when the prophet heard, he raged like doomsday, and addressed himself to the fray, and levied armies of men and john and birds and reptiles. He commanded his wazir al dimiriat king of the john, to gather together the maidens of the jinn from all parts, and he collected for him six hundred thousand thousand of devils. Moreover, by his order, his wazir Asaf bin Barkiya levied him an army of men to the number of a thousand thousand or more. These all he furnished with arms and armor, and mounting with his host upon his carpet, took flight through air, while the beasts fared under him, and the birds flew overhead, till he lighted down on the island of the refractory king, and encompassed it about, filling earth with his hosts. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and seventy-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the Ifrit continued. So when Solomon the prophet, with whom be peace, lighted down with his host on the island, he sent to our king, saying, Behold, I am come. Defend thy life against that which is fallen upon thee, or else make thy submission to me, and confess my apostleship, and give me thy daughter to lawful wife, and break thine idol, and worship the one God, the alone worshipful, and testify thou, and shine, and say, There is no God but the God, and Solomon is the apostle of Allah. This, if thou do, thou shalt have pardon and peace. But if not, it will avail thee nothing to fortify thyself in this island, for Allah extolled and exalted be he, hath bidden the wind obey me, so I will bid it bear me to thee on my carpet, and make thee a warning, and an example to deter others. But the king made answer to his messenger, saying, It may not on any wise be as he requireth of me, so tell him I come forth to him. With this reply the messenger returned to Solomon, who thereupon gathered together all the jinn that were under his hand, to the number of a thousand thousand, and added to them other than they of Merids and Satans from the islands of the sea and the tops of the mountains, and drawing them up on parade, opened his armories and distributed to them arms and armor. Then the prophet drew out his host in battle array, dividing the beasts into two bodies, one on the right wing of the men and the other on the left and bidding them tear the enemy's horses in sunder. Furthermore he ordered the birds which were in the island to hover over their heads, and when as the assault should be made, that they should swoop down and tear out the foe's eyes with their beaks, and buffet their faces with their wings. And they answered, saying, We hear and we obey Allah and thee, O Prophet of Allah. Then Solomon seated himself on a throne of alabaster, studded with precious stones, and plated with red gold, and commanding the wind to bear him aloft, set his wazir Asaf bin Barkiya, and the kings of mankind on his right, and his wazir al dimiriat and the kings of the jinn on his left, arraying the beasts and vipers and serpents in the van. Thereupon they all set on us together, and we gave them battle two days over a vast plain. But on the third day disaster befell us. 
and the judgment of Allah the Most High was executed upon us. Now the first to charge upon them were I and my troops, and I said to my companions, Abide in your places whilst I sally forth to them, and provoke al dimiriat to combat singular. And behold, he came forth to the duello as he were a vast mountain, with his fires flaming and his smoke spiring, and shot at me a falling star of fire, but I swerved from it, and it missed me. Then I cast at him in my turn a flame of fire, and smote him, but his shaft overcame my fire, and he cried out at me so terrible a cry that meseemed the skies were fallen flat upon me, and the mountains trembled at his voice. Then he commanded his hosts to charge. Accordingly they rushed on us, and we rushed on them, each crying out upon other and battle reared its crest rising in volumes and smoke ascending in columns and hearts well nigh cleaving the birds and the flying jinn fought in the air and the beasts and men and the foot-faring john in the dust and i fought with al dimiriat till i was aweary and he not less so at last i grew weak and turned to flee from him whereupon my companions and tribesmen likewise took to flight, and my hosts were put to the rout. And Solomon cried out, saying, Take yonder furious tyrant, the accursed, the infamous. Then man fell upon man, and jinn upon jinn, and the armies of the prophet charged down upon us with the wild beasts and lions on their right hand, and on their left rending our horses and tearing our men, whilst the birds hovered overhead in air, pecking out our eyes with their claws and beaks, and beating our faces with their wings. And the serpents struck us with their fangs, till the most of our folk lay prone upon the face of the earth, like the trunks of date trees. Thus defeat befell our king, and we became a spoil unto Solomon. As to me, I fled from before al Dimiriat, but he followed me three months' journey, till I fell down for weariness, and he overtook me, and, pouncing upon me, made me prisoner. Quoth I, By the virtue of him who hath exalted thee, and abased me, spare me, and bring me into the presence of Solomon, on whom be peace. So he carried me before Solomon, who received me after the foulest fashion, and bade bring this pillar and hollow it out. Then he set me herein and chained me, and sealed me with his signet ring, and al dimiriat bore me to this place wherein thou seest me. Moreover he charged a great angel to guard me, and this pillar is my prison until judgment day. Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say, her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and seventy-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the jinni who was prisoned in the pillar had told them his tale from first to last, the folk marvelled at his story, and at the frightfulness of his favour. And the emir Musa said, There is no god but the god. Soothly was Solomon gifted with a mighty dominion, then said the sheikh abid al samad to the jinni ho there i would fain ask thee of a thing whereof do thou inform us ask what thou wilt answered the ifritahish and the sheikh said are there hereabouts any of the ifrits imprisoned in bottles of brass from the time of solomon on whom be peace yes replied the jinni there be such in the sea of al karkar on the shores whereof dwell a people of the lineage of noah on whom be peace for their country was not reached by the deluge and they are cut off there from the other sons of adam quoth abd al samad and which is the way to the city of brass and the place wherein are the cucurbites of solomon and what distance lieth between us and it quoth the ifrit it is near at hand and directed them in the way thither so they left him and fared forward till there appeared to them afar off a great blackness, and therein two fires facing each other. And the emir Musa asked the sheikh, 
what is yonder vast blackness and its twin fires and the guide answered rejoice o emir for this is the city of brass as it is described in the book of hidden treasures which i have by me its walls are of black stone and it hath two towers andalusian brass which appear to the beholder in the distance as they were twin fires and hence it is named the city of brass then they fared on without ceasing till they drew near the city and behold it was as it were a piece of a mountain or a mass of iron cast in a mould and impenetrable for the height of its walls and bulwarks while nothing could be more beautiful than its buildings and its ordinance so they dismounted down and sought for an entrance but saw none neither found any trace of opening in the walls albeit there were five and twenty portals to the city but none of them was visible from without then quoth the emir o sheikh i see to this city no sign of any gate and quoth he o emir thus is it described in my book of hidden treasures it hath five and twenty portals but none thereof may be opened save from within the city asked musa and how shall we do to enter the city and view its wonders and talib son of sakhal his wazir answered allah assain the emir let us rest here two or three days and god willing we will make shift to come within the walls then said musa to one of his men mount thy camel and ride round about the city so happily thou may light upon a gate or a place somewhat lower than this fronting us or inshallah a breach whereby we can enter accordingly he mounted his beast taking water and victuals with him and rode round the city two days and two nights without drawing rein to rest but found the wall thereof as it were one block without breach or way of ingress and on the third day he came again in sight of his companions dazed and amazed at what he had seen of the extent and loftiness of the place and said o emir the easiest place of access is this where you have alighted then musa took talib and abd al samad and ascended the highest hill which overlooked the city when they reached the top they beheld beneath them a city never saw eyes a greater or a goodlier with dwelling places and mansions of towering height and palaces and pavilions and domes gleaming gloriously bright and sconces and bulwarks of strength infinite and its streams were a-flowing and flowers a-blowing and fruits a-glowing it was a city with gates impregnable but void and still without a voice or a cheering inhabitant the owl hooted in its quarters the bird skimmed circling over its squares and the raven croaked in its great thoroughfares weeping and bewailing the dwellers who erst made it their dwelling the emir stood a while marvelling and sorrowing for the desolation of the city and saying glory to him whom nor ages nor changes nor times can blight him who created all things of his might presently he chanced to look aside and caught sight of seven tablets of white marble afar off so he drew near them and finding inscriptions graven thereon called the sheikh and bade him read these accordingly he came forward and examining the inscriptions found that they contained matter of admonition and warning and instances and restraint to those of understanding on the first tablet was inscribed in the ancient greek character o son of adam how heedless art thou of that which is before thee verily thy years and months and days have diverted thee therefrom knowest thou not that the cup of death is filled for thy bane which in a little while to the dregs thou shalt drain look to thy doom ere thou enter thy tomb where be the kings who held dominion over the lands and abased allah's servants and built these palaces and had armies under their commands by allah the destroyer of delights and the severer of societies and the devastator of dwelling-places came down upon them and transported them from the spaciousness of their palaces 
to the stateness of their burial places. And at the foot of the tablet were written the following verses. Where are the kings earth peopling? Where are they? The built and peopled left they air and eye. They're tombed, yet pledged to actions passed away, and after death upon them came decay. Where are their troops? They failed to ward and guard. Where are the wealth and hordes in treasuries lay? The Empyrean's lord surprised them with one word, nor wealth nor refuge could their doom delay. When the emir heard this, he cried out, and the tears ran down his cheeks, and he exclaimed, By Allah, from the world abstaining is the wisest course and the soul assaining. And he called for pen-case and paper, and wrote down what was graven on the first tablet. Then he drew near the second tablet, and found these words graven thereon. O son of Adam, what hath seduced thee from the service of the Ancient of Days, and made thee forget that one day thou must defray the debt of death? Wottest thou not that it is a transient dwelling, wherein for none there is abiding? and yet thou takest thought unto the world, and cleaves fast thereto? Where be the kings who Iraq peopled, and the four quarters of the globe possessed? Where be they who abode in Ispahan, and the land of Khorasan? The voice of the summoner of death summoned them, and they answered him, and the herald of destruction hailed them, and they replied, Here are we. Verily that which they builded and fortified profited them not, neither did what they had gathered and provided avail for their defense. And at the foot of the tablet were graven the following verses. Where be the men who built and fortified? High places never man there like espied. In fear of fate they levied troops and hosts, availing not when came the time and tide. Where be the Kisras, homed in strongest walls? As though they ne'er had been from home, they tried. The Emir Musa wept and exclaimed, By Allah, we are indeed created for a grave matter. Then he copied the inscription and passed on to the third tablet. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 13 Recording by Eva Easton, Slotesburg, New York, December 2011. Section 14 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE BOOK OF A THOUSAND NIGHTS AND A NIGHT, VOLUME Six BY ANONYMOUS TRANSLATED BY RICHARD FRANCIS BURTON SECTION 14 When it was the five hundred and seventy-third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the emir Musa passed on to the third tablet, whereon was written, O son of Adam, the things of this world thou lovest and prizest, and the hest of thy lord thou spurnest and despisest. All the days of thy life pass by, and thou art content thus to abide. Make ready thy viaticum against the day appointed for thee, to see and prepare to answer the lord of every creature that be. And at the foot were written these verses. Where is the white who peopled in the past, hind land and sinned, and there the tyrant played? Husanj and Habash bound beneath his yoke, And Nubia curbed, and lo its puissance laid. Look not for news of what is in his grave. Ah, he is far who can thy vision aid. The stroke of death fell on him sharp and sure, Nor saved him palace, nor the lands he swayed. At this Musa wept with sore weeping, and going on to the fourth tablet, he read, inscribed thereon, O son of Adam, how long shall thy Lord bear with thee, 
and thou every day sunken in the sea of thy folly? Hath it then been established unto thee that some day thou shalt not die? O son of Adam, let not the deceits of thy days and nights and times and hours delude thee with their delights, but remember that death lieth ready for thee ambushing, fain on thy shoulders to spring, nor doth a day pass but he mourneth with thee in the morning, and nighteth with thee by night. Beware then of his onslaught, and make provision thereagainst. As was with me, so it is with thee. Thou wastest thy whole life, and squanderest the joys in which thy days are rife. Hearken therefore to my words, and put thy trust in the Lord of lords. For in the world there is no stability. It is but as a spider's web to thee. And at the foot of the tablet were written these couplets. Where is the man who did those labors ply, And based and built and reared these walls on high? Where be the castle's lords, who therein dwelt, Fared forth and left them in decay to lie? All are entombed in pledge against the day, When every sin shall show to every eye. None but the Lord most high endurance hath, Whose might and majesty shall never die. When the emir read this, he swooned away, and presently coming to himself, marvelled exceedingly, and wrote it down. Then he drew near the fifth tablet, and behold, thereon was graven. O son of Adam, what is it that distracteth thee from obedience of thy Creator, and the author of thy being, him who reared thee when as thou wast a little one, and fed thee when as thou wast full grown? Thou art ungrateful for his bounty, albeit he watcheth over thee with his favours, letting down the curtain of his protection over thee. Needs must there be for thee an hour bitterer than aloes, and hotter than live coals. Provide thee therefore against it, for who shall sweeten its gall or quench its fires? Bethink thee who forewent thee of peoples and heroes, and take warning by them ere thou perish. And at the foot of the tablet were graven these couplets. Where be the earth kings who from where they bode, sped and to graveyards with their hoardings yode? Erst on their mounting days their hats beheld, hosts that conceal the ground whereon they rode. How many a king they humbled in their day, how many a host they led and laid on load! But from the Empyrean's lord in haste there came one word, and joy waxed grief ere morning glowed. The emir marvelled at this and wrote it down, after which he passed on to the sixth tablet, and, behold, was inscribed thereon, O son of Adam, think not that safety will endure for ever, and I, seeing that death is sealed to thy head alway. Where be thy fathers, where be thy brethren, where thy friends and dear ones? They have all gone to the dust of the tombs, and presented themselves before the glorious, the forgiving, as if they had never eaten nor drunken, and they are a pledge for that which they have earned. So look to thyself ere thy tomb come upon thee and at the foot of the tablet were these couplets. Where be the kings who ruled the Franks of old? Where be the king who peopled Tingis wold? Their works are written in a book, which he, the one, the all-father, shall as witness hold. At this the emir Musa marvelled, and wrote it down, saying, There is no god but the god. Indeed, how goodly were these folk! Then he went up to the seventh tablet, and, behold, thereon was written, Glory to him who foreordaineth death to all he createth, the living one who dieth not. O son of Adam, let not thy days and their delights delude thee, neither shine hours and the delices of their time, and know that death to thee cometh, and upon thy shoulders sitteth. Beware, then, of his assault, and make ready for his onslaught. As it was with me, so it is with thee. 
thou wastest the sweet of thy life and the joyance of shine hours give ear then to my reed and put thy trust in the lord of lords and know that in the world is no stability but it is as it were a spider's web to thee and all that is therein shall die and cease to be where is he who laid the foundation of amid and builded it and builded farakin and exalted it where be the peoples of the strong places when as them they had inhabited after their might into the tombs they descended they have been carried off by death and we shall in like manner be afflicted by doom none abideth save allah the most high for he is allah the forgiving one the emir musa wept and copied all this and indeed the world was belittled in his eyes then he descended the hill and rejoined his host with whom he passed the rest of the day casting about for a means of access to the city and he said to his wazir talib bin sakhil and to the chief officers about him how shall we contrive to enter this city and view its marvels haply we shall find therein wherewithal to win the favour of the commander of the faithful allah prolong the emir's fortune replied talib let us make a ladder and mount the wall therewith so peradventure we may come at the gate from within quoth the emir this is what occurred to my thought also and admirable is the advice then he called for carpenters and blacksmiths and bade them fashion wood and build a ladder plated and banded with iron so they made a strong ladder and many men wrought at it a whole month then all the company laid hold of it and set it up against the wall and it reached the top as truly as if it had been built for it before that time the emir marvelled and said the blessing of allah be upon you it seems as though ye had taken the measure of the muir so excellent is your work then said he to his men which of you will mount the ladder and walk along the wall and cast about for a way of descending into the city so to see how the case stands and let us know how we may open the gate whereupon quoth one of them i will go up o emir and descend and open to you and musa answered saying go and the blessing of allah go with thee so the man mounted the ladder but when he came to the top of the wall he stood up and gazed fixedly down into the city then clapped his hands and crying out at the top of his voice by allah thou art fair cast himself down into the place and musa cried by allah he is a dead man but another came up to him and said o emir this was a madman and doubtless his madness got the better of him and destroyed him i will go up and open the gate to you if it be the will of allah the most high go up replied musa and allah be with thee but beware lest thou lose thy head even as did thy comrade then the man mounted the ladder but no sooner had he reached the top of the wall than he laughed aloud saying well done well done and clapping palms cast himself down into the city and died forthright when the emir saw this he said and such be the action of a reasonable man what is that of the madman if all our men do on this wise we shall have none left and shall fail of our errand and that of the commander of the faithful get ye ready for the march verily we have no concern with this city but a third one of the company said haply another may be steadier than they so a third mounted the wall and a fourth and a fifth and all cried out and cast themselves down even as did the first nor did they leave to do thus till a dozen had perished in like fashion then the sheikh abd al samad came forward and heartened himself and said this affair is reserved to none other than myself for the experienced is not like the inexperienced quoth the emir indeed thou shalt not do that nor will i have thee go up 
and thou perish we shall all be cut off to the last man since thou art our guide but he answered saying peradventure that which we seek may be accomplished at my hands by the grace of god most high so the folk all agreed to let him mount the ladder and he arose and heartening himself said in the name of allah the compassionating the compassionate and mounted the ladder calling on the name of the lord and reciting the verses of safety when he reached the top of the wall he clapped his hands and gazed fixedly down into the city whereupon the folk below cried out to him with one accord saying O Sheikh Abd al Samad, for the Lord's sake, cast not thyself down. And they added, Verily, we are Allah's, and unto him we are returning. If the Sheikh fall, we are dead men, one and all. Then he laughed beyond all measure, and sat a long hour, reciting the names of Allah Almighty, and repeating the verses of safety. Then he rose a rid, cried out at the top of his voice, saying, O Emir, have no fear, no hurt shall betide you, for Allah, to whom belong might and majesty, hath averted from me the wiles and malice of Satan. By the blessing of the words, in the name of Allah, the compassionating the compassionate, asked Musa, What didst thou see, O Sheikh? And Abd al-Samad answered, I saw ten maidens, as they were hurries of heaven, calling to me with their hands. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and seventy-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the Sheikh Abd al-Samad answered, I saw ten maidens like hurries of heaven, and they calling and signing, Come hither to us. And me seemed there was below me a lake of water. So I thought to throw myself down, when, behold, I espied my twelve companions lying dead. So I restrained myself and recited somewhat of Allah's book, whereupon he dispelled from me the damsel's witch-like wiles and malicious guiles, and they disappeared. And doubtless this was an enchantment devised by the people of the city to repel any who should seek to gaze upon or to enter the place. And it hath succeeded in slaying our companions. Then he walked on along the wall, till he came to the two towers of brass aforesaid, and saw therein two gates of gold, without padlocks or visible means of opening. Hereat he paused as long as Allah pleased, and gazed about him a while, till he espied in the middle of one of the gates a horseman of brass, with hand outstretched as if pointing, and in his palm was somewhat written. So he went up to it and read these words, O thou who comest to this place, and thou wouldst enter, turn the pin in my navel twelve times, and the gate will open. Accordingly he examined the horseman, and finding in his navel a pin of gold, firm set and fast fixed, he turned it twelve times, whereupon the horseman revolved like the blinding lightning, and the gate swung open with a noise like thunder. He entered and found himself in a long passage, which brought him down some steps into a guard-room furnished with goodly wooden benches whereon sat men dead over whose heads hung fine shields and keen blades and bent bows and shafts ready notched thence he came to the main gate of the city and finding it secured with iron bars and curiously wrought locks and bolts and chains and other fastenings of wood and metal said to himself be like the keys are with yonder dead folk so he turned back to the guard-room, and seeing amongst the dead an old man seated upon a high wooden bench, who seemed the chiefest of them, said in his mind, Who knows but they are with this sheikh? Doubtless he was the warder of the city, and these others were under his hand. So he went up to him, and lifting his gown, behold, 
the keys were hanging to his girdle, whereat he joyed with exceeding joy, and was like to fly for gladness. Then he took them, and going up to the portal, undid the padlocks, and drew back the bolts and bars, whereupon the great leaves flew open with a crash, like the pealing thunder, by reason of its greatness and terribleness. At this he cried out, saying, Allah Akbar, God is most great. And the folk without answered him with the same words, rejoicing and thanking him for his deed. The Emir Musa also was delighted at the Sheikh's safety and the opening of the city gate, and the troops all pressed forward to enter. But Musa cried out to them, saying, O folk, if we all go in at once, we shall not be safe from some ill chance which may betide us. Let half enter, and other half tarry without. So he pushed forwards with half his men, bearing their weapons of war, and finding their comrades lying dead, they buried them. And they saw the doorkeepers, and eunuchs, and chamberlains, and officers, reclining on couches of silk, and all were corpses. Then they fared on till they came to the chief market-place, full of lofty buildings, whereof none overpassed the others, and found all its shops open, with the scales hung out, and the brazen vessels ordered, and the caravanserais full of all manner goods. And they beheld the merchants sitting on shop-boards, dead, with shriveled skin and rotted bones, a warning to those who can take warning. And here they saw four separate markets, all replete with wealth. Then they left the great bazaar, and went on till they came to the silk market, where they found silks and brocades, or frayed with red gold and diapered with white silver upon all manner of colours, and the owners lying dead upon mats of scented goat's leather, and looking as if they would speak. After which they traversed the market-street of pearls and rubies and other jewels, and came to that of the shroffs and money-changers, whom they saw sitting dead upon carpets of raw silk and dyed stuffs in shops full of gold and silver. Thence they passed to the perfumer's bazaar, where they found the shops filled with drugs of all kinds, and bladders of musk and ambergris, and nadscent and camphor, and other perfumes, in vessels of ivory and ebony and calan wood, and Andalusian copper, the which is equal in value to gold, and various kinds of rattan and Indian cane. But the shopkeepers all lay dead, nor was there with them aught of food. And hard by this drug market they came upon a palace, imposingly edified, and magnificently decorated. So they entered, and found therein banners displayed, and drawn sword-blades, and strung bows, and bucklers hanging by chains of gold and silver, and helmets gilded with red gold. In the vestibules stood benches of ivory, plated with glittering gold, and covered with silken stuffs, whereon lay men whose skin had dried up on their bones. The fool had deemed them sleeping, but, for lack of food, they had perished and tasted the cup of death. Now when the Emir Musa saw this, he stood still, glorifying Allah the Most High, and hallowing Him, and contemplating the beauty of the palace, and the massiveness of its masonry, and fair perfection of its ordinance. For it was builded after the goodliest and stablest fashion, and the most part of its adornment was of green lapis lazuli, and on the inner door, which stood open, were written in characters of gold and ultramarine these couplets. Consider thou, O man, what these places to thee showed, and be upon thy guard ere thou travel the same road, and prepare thee good provisions some day may serve thy turn, for each dweller in the house needs must yield with those who yod. Consider how this people their palaces adorned, and in dust have been pledged for the seed of acts they sowed. They built, but their building availed them not, and hordes, nor saved their lives, nor day of destiny foreslowed. 
how often did they hope for what things were undecreed, and passed unto their tombs before hope the bounty showed, and from high and awful state all a sudden they were sent to the straightness of the grave, and, oh, base is their abode. Then came to them a crier after burial, and cried, What booted thrones or crowns or the gold to you bestowed? Where now are gone the faces hid by curtain and by veil, whose charms were told in Proverbs, those beauties a la mode? The tombs aloud reply to the questioners and cry, Death's canker and decay those rosy cheeks corrode. Long time they ate and drank, but their joyance had a term, and the eater eke was eaten, and was eaten by the worm. When the emir read this he wept, till he was like to swoon away. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and seventy-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the emir wept till he was like to swoon away, and bade write down the verses, after which he passed on into the inner palace, and came to a vast hall, at each of whose four corners stood a pavilion, lofty and spacious, washed with gold and silver, and painted in various colors. In the heart of the hall was a great jetting fountain of alabaster, surmounted by a canopy of brocade, and in each pavilion was a sitting-place, and each place had its richly wrought fountain and tank paved with marble, and streams flowing in channels along the floor, and meeting in great and grand cistern of many-coloured marbles. Quoth the emir to the sheikh Abd al Samad, Come, let us visit yonder pavilion. So they entered the first, and found it full of gold, and silver, and pearls, and jacinths, and other precious stones and metals, besides chests filled with brocades, red and yellow and white. Then they repaired to the second pavilion, and, opening a closet there, found it full of arms and armor, such as gilded helmets, and Davidian hauberks, and Hindi swords, and Arabian spears, and Karasmian maces, and other gear of fight and fray. Thence they passed to the third pavilion, wherein they saw closets padlocked and covered with curtains, wrought with all manner of embroidery. They opened one of these, and found it full of weapons, curiously adorned with open work, and with gold and silver damascene and jewels. Then they entered the fourth pavilion, and, opening one of the closets there, beheld in it great store of eating and drinking vessels of gold and silver, with platters of crystal, and goblets set with fine pearls, and cups of carnelian, and so forth. So they all fell to taking that which suited their tastes, and each of the soldiers carried off what he could. When they left the pavilions they saw in the midst of the palace a door of teakwood marquetried with ivory and ebony, and plated with glittering gold, over which hung a silken curtain purfled with all manner of embroideries, and on this door were locks of white silver, that opened by artifice without a key. The Sheikh Abd al Samad went valiantly up thereto, and by the aid of his knowledge and skill opened the locks, whereupon the door admitted them into a corridor paved with marble and hung with veil-like tapestries embroidered with figures of all manner beasts and birds whose bodies were of red gold and white silver and their eyes of pearls and rubies amazing all who looked upon them passing onwards they came to a saloon builded all of polished marble inlaid with jewels which seemed to the beholder as though the floor were flowing water and whoso walked thereon slipped the emir bade the sheikh strew somewhat upon it that they might walk over it which being done they made shift to fare forwards till they came to a great domed pavilion of stone gilded with red gold and crowned with a cupola of alabaster about which were set lattice windows carved and jewelled with rods of emerald beyond the competence of any king 
Under this dome was a canopy of brocade, reposing upon pillars of red gold, and wrought with figures of birds whose feet were of smaragd, and beneath each bird was a network of fresh-hued pearls. The canopy was spread above a jetting fountain of ivory and carnelian, plated with glittering gold, and thereby stood a couch set with pearls and rubies and other jewels, and beside the couch a pillar of gold. On the capital of the column stood a bird fashioned of red rubies, and holding in his bill a pearl which shone like a star, and on the couch lay a damsel as she were the lucident sun, eyes never saw a fairer. She wore a tight-fitting body robe of fine pearls, with a crown of red gold on her head, filleted with gems, and on her forehead were two great jewels, whose light was as the light of the sun. On her breast she wore a jeweled amulet, filled with musk and ambergris, and worth the empire of the Caesars and around her neck hung a collar of rubies and great pearls, hollowed and filled with odiferous musk, and it seemed as if she gazed on them to the right and to the left. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 14 Recording by Eva Easton, Slotesburg, New York, December 2011. Section 15 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Volume 6 by Anonymous Translated by Richard Francis Burton Section 15 When it was the five hundred and seventy-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the damsel seemed to be gazing at the folk to the right and to the left. The emir Musset marvelled at her exceeding beauty, and was confounded at the blackness of her hair and the redness of her cheeks which made the beholder deem her alive and not dead, and said to her, Peace be with thee, O damsel. But Talib ibn Sakhl said to him, Allah preserve thee, O emir, verily this damsel is dead, and there is no life in her. So how shall she return thy salam? Adding, Indeed, she is but a corpse embalmed with exceeding art. Her eyes were taken out after her death, and quicksilver set under them, after which they were restored to their sockets. Wherefore they glisten, and when the air moveth the lashes, she seemeth to wink, and it appeareth to the beholder, as though she looked at him, for all she is dead. At this the emir marvelled beyond measure, and said, Glory be to God, who subjugateth his creatures to the dominion of death. Now the couch on which the damsel lay had steps, and thereon stood two statues of Andalusian copper, representing slaves, one white and the other black. The first held a mace of steel, and the second a sword of watered steel which dazzled the eye. And between them, on one of the steps of the couch, lay a golden tablet, whereon were written, in characters of white silver, the following words, In the name of God, the compassionating, the compassionate, Praise be to Allah, the Creator of mankind, and He is the Lord of Lords, the Causer of Causes. In the name of Allah, the Never-Beginning, the Everlasting, the Ordainer of Fate and Fortune, O son of Adam, what hath befooled thee in this long esperance? What hath unminded thee of the death-day's mischance? Knowest thou not that death calleth for thee? and hasteneth to seize upon the soul of thee? Be ready, therefore, for the way, and provide thee for thy departure from the world, for assuredly thou shalt leave it without delay. Where is Adam, first of humanity? Where is Noah with his progeny? Where be the kings of Hind and Iraq plain, and they who over earth's widest regions reign? 
Where do the Amalekites abide and the giants and tyrants of olden tide? Indeed, their dwelling places are void of them, and they have departed from kindred and home. Where be the kings of Arab and Ajam? They are dead, all of them, and gone, and are become rotten bones. Where be the lords so high instead? They are all done dead. Where are Korah and Hamam? Where is Shaddad, son of Ad? Where be Canaan and zul lord of the stakes? By Allah the reaper of lives hath reaped them, and made void the lands of them. Did they provide them against the day of resurrection, or make ready to answer the Lord of men? O thou, if thou know me not, I will acquaint thee with my name. I am Tadmura, daughter of the kings of the Amalekites, of those who held dominion over the lands in equity, and brought low the necks of humanity. I possessed that which never king possessed, and was righteous in my rule, and did justice among my lieges. Yea, I gave gifts and largesse, and freed bondsmen and bondswomen. Thus lived I many years in all ease and delight of life, till death knocked at my door, and to me and to my folk befell calamities galore, and it was on this wise. There betided us seven successive years of drought, wherein no drop of rain fell on us from the skies, and no green thing sprouted for us on the face of earth. So we ate what was with us a victual, then we fell upon the cattle and devoured them, until nothing was left. Thereupon I let bring my treasures, and meted them with measures, and sent out trusty men to buy food. They circuited all the lands in quest thereof, and left no city unsought, but found it not to be bought, and returned to us with the treasure after a long absence, and gave us to know that they could not succeed in bartering fine pearls for poor wheat, bushel for bushel, weight for weight. So when we despaired of succor, we displayed all our riches and things of price, and shutting the gates of the city and its strong places, resigned ourselves to the deem of our Lord, and committed our case to our King. Then we all died, as thou seest us, and left what we had builded, and all we had hoarded. This, then, is our story, and after the substance naught abideth but the trace. Then they looked at the foot of the tablet, and read these couplets. O child of Adam, let not hope make mock and flight at thee. Prom all thy hands have treasured, removed thou shalt be. I see thou covetest the world, and fleeting worldly charms, and races past, and gone have done the same as thou I see. Lawful and lawless wealth they got, but all their hoarded store, their term accomplished, not delayed of destiny's decree. Armies they led and puissant men, and gained them gold galore, then left their wealth and palaces by pate compelled to flee, to straightness of the graveyard, and humble bed of dust whence pledged for every word and deed they never more went free, as a company of travellers had unloaded in the night, at house that lacketh food, nor is o'er fain of company, whose owner saith, O folk, there be no lodging here for you. So packed they who had erst unpacked, and fared hurriedly, misliking much the march, nor the journey, nor the halt, had aught of pleasant chances, or had aught of goodly greet. Then prepare thou good provision for to-morrow's journey stored, naught but righteous honest life shall avail thee with the Lord. And the Emir Musa wept as he read, By Allah the fear of the Lord is the best of all property, the pillar of certainty, and the sole sure stay. Verily death is the truth manifest, and the sure behest, and therein, O thou, is the goal and return place evident. Take warning, therefore, by those who to the dust did wend, and hastened on the way of the predestined end. Seest thou not that hoary hairs summon thee to the tomb, and that the whiteness of thy locks maketh moan of thy doom?
Wherefore, be thou on the wake, ready for thy departure, and shine account to make. O son of Adam, what hath hardened thy heart in mode abhorred? What hath seduced thee from the service of thy Lord? Where be the peoples of old time? They are a warning to whoso will be warned. Where be the kings of Alsin and the lords of majestic mien? Where is Shaddad bin Ad, and whatso he built and he established? Where is Nimrod, who revolted against Allah and defied him? Where is Pharaoh, who rebelled against God and denied him? Death followed hard upon the trail of them all, and laid them low, sparing neither great nor small, male nor female, and the reaper of mankind cut them off, yea, by him who maketh night to return upon day. Know, O thou who comest to this place, that she whom thou seest here was not deluded by the world and its frail delights. For it is faithless, perfidious, a house of ruin, vain and treacherous, and salutary to the creature is the remembrance of his sins. Wherefore she feared her Lord, and made fair her dealings, and provided herself with provant against the appointed marching day. Whoso cometh to our city, and Allah vouchsafeth him competence to enter it, let him take of the treasure all he can, but touch not aught that is on my body, for it is the covering of my shame and the outfit for the last journey. Wherefore let him fear Allah, and despoil naught thereof, else will he destroy his own self. This have I set forth to him for a warning from me, and a solemn trust to be. Wherewith peace be with ye, and I pray Allah to keep you from sickness and calamity. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying, her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and seventy-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the emir Musa read this, he wept with exceeding weeping, till he swooned away, and presently coming to himself, wrote down all he had seen, and was admonished by all he had witnessed. Then he said to his men, Fetch the camels, and load them with these treasures, and vases, and jewels. O Emir, asked Talib, shall we leave our damsel with what is upon her, things which have no equal, and whose like is not to be found, and more perfect than aught else thou takest? Nor couldst thou find a goodlier offering wherewithal to propitiate the favour of the commander of the faithful. But Musa answered, O man, heardest thou not what the lady saith on this tablet? More by token, that she giveth it in trust to us who are no traitors. And shall we, rejoined the wazir Talib, because of these words leave all these riches and jewels, seeing that she is dead? What should she do with these that are the adornments of the world, and the ornament of the worldling, seeing that one garment of cotton would suffice for her covering? we have more right to them than she. So saying, he mounted the steps of the couch between the pillars. But when he came within reach of the two slaves, lo, the mace-bearer smote him on the back, and the other struck him with the sword he held in his hand, and lopped off his head, and he dropped down dead. Quoth the emir, Allah have no mercy on thy resting-place. Indeed, there was enough in these treasures, and greed of gain assuredly degradeth a man. Then he bade admit the troops. So they entered and loaded the camels with those treasures and precious oars, after which they went forth, and the emir commanded them to shut the gate as before. They fared on along the seashore a whole month, till they came in sight of a high mountain overlooking the sea and full of caves wherein dwelt a tribe of blacks, clad in hides, with burnooses also of hide, and speaking an unknown tongue. When they saw the troops, they were startled, like shying steeds, and fled into the caverns, whilst their women and children stood at the cave doors, looking on the strangers. O Sheikh Abd al-Samad, asked the emir, 
what are these folk and he answered they are those whom we seek for the commander of the faithful so they dismounted and setting down their loads pitched their tents whereupon almost before they had done down came the king of the blacks from the mountain and drew near the camp now he understood the arabic tongue so when he came to the emir he saluted him with the salam and musa returned his greeting and entreated him with honour then quoth he to the emir are ye men or jinn well we are men quoth musa but doubtless ye are jinn to judge by your dwelling apart in this mountain which is cut off from mankind and by your inordinate bulk nay rejoined the black we also are children of adam of the lineage of ham son of noah with whom be peace and this sea is known as al karkar asked musa o king what is your religion and what worship ye and he answered saying we worship the god of the heavens and our religion is that of muhammad whom allah bless and preserve and how came ye by the knowledge of this questioned the emir seeing that no prophet was inspired to visit this country no emir replied the king that there appeared to us while ere from out the sea a man from whom issued a light that illumined the horizons and he cried out in a voice which was heard of men far and near saying o children of ham reverence to him who seeth and is not seen and say ye there is no god but the god and muhammad is the messenger of god and he added i am abu al abbas al khizr before this we were wont to worship one another but he summoned us to the service of the lord of all creatures and he taught us to repeat these words there is no god save the god alone who hath for partner none and his is the kingdom and his is the praise he giveth life and death and he over all things is almighty nor do we draw near unto allah be he exalted and extolled except with these words for we know none other but every eve before friday we see a light upon the face of earth and we hear a voice saying holy and glorious lord of the angels and the spirit what he willeth is and what he willeth not is not every boon is of his grace and there is neither majesty nor is there might save in allah the glorious the great but ye quoth the king who and what are ye and what bringeth you to this land quoth musa we are officers of the sovereign of al-islam the commander of the faithful abd al-malik bin marwan who hath heard tell of the lord solomon son of david on whom be peace and of that which the most high bestowed upon him of supreme dominion how he held sway over jinn and beast and bird and was wont when he was wroth with one of the marids to shut him in a cucurbite of brass and stopping its mouth on him with lead whereon he impressed his seal ring to cast him into the sea of al karkar now we have heard tell that this sea is nigh your land so the commander of the faithful hath sent us hither to bring him some of these cucurbites that he may look thereon and solace himself with their sight such then is our case and what we seek of thee o king and we desire that thou further us in the accomplishment of our errand commanded by the commander of the faithful with love and gladness replied the black king and carrying them to the guest-house entreated them with the utmost honour and furnished them with all they needed feeding them upon fish they abode thus three days when he bade his divers fetch from out the sea some of the vessels of solomon so they dived and brought up twelve cucurbites whereat the emir and the sheikh and all the company rejoiced in the accomplishment of the caliph's need then musa gave the king of the blacks many and great gifts and he in turn made him a present of the wonders of the deep being fishes in human form saying your entertainment these three days hath been of the meat of these fish quoth the emir needs must we carry some of these to the caliph 
for the sight of them will please him more than the cucurbites of Solomon. Then they took leave of the black king, and setting out on their homeward journey, travelled till they came to Damascus, where Musa went in to the commander of the faithful, and told him of all that he had cited, and heard of verses and legends and instances, together with the manner of the death of Talib bin Sakhl, and the caliph said, Would I had been with you, that I might have seen what you saw. Then he took the brazen vessels, and opened them, cucurbite after cucurbite, whereupon the devils came forth of them, saying, We repent, O Prophet of Allah, never again will we return to the like of this thing, no, never, and the caliph marvelled at this. As for the daughters of the deep presented to them by the black king, they made them cisterns of planks full of water, and laid them therein, but they died of the great heat. Then the caliph sent for the spoils of the brazen city, and divided them among the faithful. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 15 Recording by Eva Easton Slotesburg, New York, December 2011section 16 of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 6 by anonymous translated by richard francis burton Section 16. When it was the five hundred and seventy-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the caliph marvelled much at the cucurbites and their contents. Then he sent for the spoils, and divided them among the faithful, saying, Never gave Allah unto any the like of that which he bestowed upon Solomon David's son. Thereupon the emir Musa sought leave of him, to appoint his son governor of the province in his stead, that he might betake himself to the holy city of Jerusalem, there to worship Allah. So the commander of the faithful invested his son Harun with the government, and Musa repaired to the glorious and holy city, where he died. This, then, is all that hath come down to us of the story of the city of Brass, and God is all-knowing. Now, continued Shahrazad, I have another tale to tell Anant, the craft and malice of women, or the tale of the king, his son, his concubine, and the seven wazirs. There was, in days of yore, and in ages and times long gone before, a puissant king among the kings of China, the crown of crowned heads, who ruled over many men of war and vassals, with wisdom and justice, might and majesty, equitable to his riots, liberal to his lieges, and dearly beloved by the hearts of his subjects. He was wealthy as he was powerful, but he had grown old without being blessed with a son, and this caused him sore affliction. He could only brood over the cutting off of his seed, and the oblivion that would bury his name, and the passing of his realm into the stranger's hands. So he secluded himself in his palace, never going in and out, or rising and taking rest, till the lieges lost all tidings of him, and were sore perplexed, and began to talk about their king. Some said, He's dead. Others said, No, he's not. But all resolved to find a ruler who would reign over them, and carry out the customs of government. At last, utterly despairing of male issue, he sought the intercession of the Prophet, whom Allah bless and keep, with the Most High, and implored him, by the glory of his prophets and saints and martyrs and others of the faithful who were acceptable to heaven, that he would grant him a son, to be the kulth of his eyes and heir to the kingdom after him. Then he rose forthright, and, withdrawing to his sitting saloon, sent for his wife, who was the daughter of his uncle. 
now this queen was of surpassing beauty and loveliness the fairest of all his wives and the dearest to him as she was the nearest and to boot a woman of excellent wit and passing judgment she found the king dejected and sorrowful tearful-eyed and heavy-hearted so she kissed ground between his hands and said o king may my life ransom thy life may time never prove thy foe nor the shifts of fortune prevail over thee may allah grant thee every joy and ward off from thee all annoy how is it i see thee brooding over thy case and tormented by the displeasures of memory he replied thou wottest well that i am a man now shotten in years who hath never been blessed with a son a sight to cool his eyes so i know that my kingdom shall pass away to the stranger in blood and my name and memory will be blotted out amongst men tis this causeth me to grieve with excessive grief allah do away with thy sorrows quoth she long ere this day a thought struck me and yearning for issue arose in my heart even as in thine one night i dreamed a dream and a voice said to me the king thy husband pineth for progeny if a daughter be vouchsafed to him she will be the ruin of his realm if a son the youth will undergo much trouble and annoy but he will pass through it without loss of life such a son can be conceived by thee and thee only and the time of thy conception is when the moon conjoineth with gemini i woke from my dream but after what i heard that voice declare i refrained from breeding and would not consent to bear children there is no help for it but that i have a son inshallah god willing cried the king thereupon she soothed and consoled him till he forgot his sorrows and went forth amongst the lieges and sat as of wont upon his throne of estate all rejoiced to see him once more and especially the lords of his realm now when the conjunction of the moon and gemini took place the king knew his wife carnally and by order of allah almighty she became pregnant presently she announced the glad tidings to her husband and led her usual life until her nine months of pregnancy were completed and she bare a male child whose face was as the ranger of the moon on its fourteenth night the lieges of the realm congratulated one another thereanent and the king commanded an assembly of his ulema and philosophers astrologers and horoscopists whom he thus addressed i desire you to forecast the fortune of my son and to determine his ascendant and whatever is shown by his nativity they replied tis well in allah's name let us do so and cast his nativity with all diligence after ascertaining his ascendant they pronounced judgment in these words we see his lot favorable and his life viable and durable save that a danger awaiteth his youth the father was sorely concerned at this saying when they added but o king he shall escape from it nor shall aught of injury accrue to him hereupon the king cast aside all cark and care and robed the wizards and dismissed them with splendid honoraria and he resigned himself to the will of heaven and acknowledged that the decrees of destiny may not be countervailed he committed his boy to wet nurses and dry nurses handmaids and eunuchs leaving him to grow and fill out in the harim till he reached the age of seven then he addressed letters to his viceroys and governors in every clime and by their means gathered together ulema and philosophers and doctors of law and religion from all countries to a number of three hundred and threescore he held an especial assembly for them and when all were in presence he bade them draw near him and be at their ease while he sent for the food trays and all ate their sufficiency and when the banquet ended and the wizards had taken seats in their several degrees the king asked them 
What ye wherefore I have gathered you together? Whereto all answered, We wot not, O king. He continued, It is my wish that you select from amongst you fifty men, and from these fifty ten, and from these ten one, that he may teach my son omnem rem scibilem. For whenas I see the youth perfect in all science, I will share my dignity with the prince, and make him partner with me in my possessions. No, O king, they replied, that among us none is more learned or more excellent than al Sindibad hight the sage, who warneth in thy capital under thy protection. If such be thy design, summon him and bid him do thy will. The king acted upon their advice, and the sage, standing in the presence, expressed his loyal sentiments with his salutation, whereupon his sovereign bade him draw nigh, and thus raised his rank, saying, I would have thee to know, O sage, that I summoned this assembly of the learned, and bade them choose me out a man to teach my son all knowledge, when they selected thee without dissenting thought or voice. If then thou feel capable of what they claimed for thee, come thou to the task and understand that a man's son and heir is the very fruit of his vitals and core of his heart and liver. My desire of thee is thine instruction of him, and to happy issue Allah guideth. The king then sent for his son and committed him to al Sindibad, conditioning the sage to finish his education in three years. He did accordingly, but at the end of that time the young prince had learned nothing, his mind being wholly occupied with play and disport. And when summoned and examined by his sire, behold, his knowledge was as nil. Thereupon the king turned his attention to the learned once more, and bade them elect a tutor for his youth. So they asked, And what hath his governor al Sindibad been doing? And when the king answered, He hath taught my son not. The ulema and philosophers and high officers summoned the instructor and said to him, O sage, what prevented thee from teaching the king's son during this length of days? O wise man, he replied, The prince's mind is wholly occupied with disport and play. Yet, and the king will make with me three conditions and keep to them, I will teach him in seven months what he would not learn, nor indeed could any other lesson him, within seven years. I hearken to thee, quoth the king, and I submit myself to thy conditions. And, quoth al Sindibed, hear from me, sire, and bear in mind these three sayings, whereof the first is, Do not to others what thou wouldst not they do unto you. And second, do not hastily without consulting the experienced. And thirdly, where thou hast power, show pity. In teaching this lad I require no more of thee but to accept these three dictae and adhere thereto. Cried the king, Bear ye witness against me, O all ye here assembled, that I stand firm by these conditions and caused a procès verbal to be drawn up with his personal security and testimony of his courtiers. Thereupon the sage, taking the prince's hand, led him to his place, and the king sent them all requisites of provant and kitchen batteries, carpets, and other furniture. Moreover, the tutor bade build a house whose walls he lined with the whitest stucco painted over with ceruse, and lastly he delineated thereon all the objects concerning which he proposed to lecture his pupil. When the place was duly furnished, he took the lad's hand and installed him in the apartment which was amply furnished with belly timber, and after establishing him therein, went forth and fastened the door with seven padlocks. Nor did he visit the prince save every third day when he lessened him on the knowledge to be extracted from the wall pictures and renewed his provision of meat and drink, after which he left him again to solitude. 
So, whenever the youth was straitened in breast by the tedium and ennui of loneliness, he applied himself diligently to his object lessons, and mastered all the deductions therefrom. His governor, seeing this, turned his mind into other channel, and taught him the inner meanings of the external objects. And in a little time the pupil mastered every requisite. Then the sage took him from the house, and taught him cavalries and jerid play and archery. When the pupil had thoroughly mastered these arts, the tutor sent to the king, informing him that the prince was perfect and complete in all things required to figure favorably amongst his peers. Hereat the king rejoiced, and, summoning his wazirs and lords of estate to be present at the examination, commanded the sage to send his son into the presence. Thereupon Alcindibad consulted his pupil's horoscope, and found it barred by an inauspicious conjunction which would last seven days. So, in sore affright for the youth's life, he said, Look into thy nativity scheme. The prince did so, and recognizing the portent, feared for himself, and presently asked the sage, saying, what dost thou bid me do? I bid thee, he answered, remain silent, and speak not a word during this night, even though thy sire slay thee with scourging. And thou pass safely through this period, thou shalt win to high rank, and succeed to thy sire's reign. But an things go otherwise, then the behest is with Allah, from the beginning to the end thereof. Quoth the pupil, Thou art in fault, O preceptor, and thou hast shown undue haste in sending that message to the king before looking into my horoscope. Hadst thou delayed till the week had passed, all had been well. Quoth the tutor, O my son, what was to be was, and the sole defaulter therein was my delight in thy scholarship. But now be firm in thy resolve, Rely upon Allah Almighty, and determine not to utter a single word. Thereupon the prince fared for the presence, and was met by the wazirs who led him to his father. The king accosted him, and addressed him, but he answered not, and sought speech of him, but he spake not. Whereupon the courtiers were astounded, and the monarch, sore concerned for his son, summoned al Sindibad. But the tutor so hid himself that none could hit upon his trace, nor gain tidings of him, and folk said, He was ashamed to appear before the king's majesty and the courtiers. Under these conditions the sovereign heard some of those present, saying, Send the lad to the seraglio, while he will talk with the women, and soon set aside this bashfulness, and approving their counsel, gave orders accordingly. So the prince was led into the palace, which was compassed about by a running stream, whose banks were planted with all manner of fruit-trees, and sweet-smelling flowers. Moreover, in this palace were forty chambers, and in every chamber ten slave-girls, each skilled in some instrument of music, so that, whenever one of them played, the palace danced to her melodious strains. Here the prince passed one night, but on the following morning the king's favorite concubine happened to cast eyes upon his beauty and loveliness, his symmetrical stature, his brilliancy, and his perfect grace, and love got hold of her heart, and she was ravished with his charms. So she went up to him and threw herself upon him, but he made her no response. Whereupon, being dazed by his beauty, she cried out to him, and required him of himself, and importuned him. Then she again threw herself upon him, and clasped him to her bosom, kissing him, and saying, O king's son, grant me thy favours, and I will set thee in thy father's stead. I will give him to drink of poison, so he may die, and thou shalt enjoy his realm and wealth. When the prince heard these words, he was sore enraged against her, and said to her by signs, O oh, accursed one, so it please Almighty Allah, I will assuredly requite thee this thy deed, whenas I can speak. 
for I will go forth to my father, and will tell him, and he shall kill thee. So signing, he arose in rage, and went out from her chamber, whereat she feared for herself. Thereupon she buffeted her face, and rent her raiment, and tear her hair, and bared her head, then went into the king, and cast herself at his feet, weeping and wailing. When he saw her in this plight, he was sore concerned, and asked her, what aileth thee, O damsel? How is it with thy lord my son? Is he not well? And she answered, O king, this thy son, whom thy courtiers avouch to be dumb, required me of myself, and I repelled him. Whereupon he did with me as thou seest, and would have slain me. So I fled from him, nor will I ever return to him, nor to the palace again, no, never again. When the king heard this, he was wroth with exceeding wrath, and, calling his seven wazirs, bade them put the prince to death. However, they said one to other, If we do the king's commandment, he will surely repent of having ordered his son's death, for he is passing dear to him, and this child came not to him save after despair, and he will round upon us and blame us, saying, why did ye not contrive to dissuade me from slaying him? So they took counsel together to turn him from his purpose. And the chief wazir said, I will warrant you from the king's mischief this day. Then he went into the presence, and prostrating himself, craved leave to speak. The king gave him permission, and he said, O king, though thou hadst a thousand sons, yet were it no light matter, to thee to put one of them to death on the report of a woman, be she true or be she false. And belike this is a lie and a trick of her against thy son. For indeed, O king, I have heard tell great plenty of stories of the malice, the craft, and perfidy of women. Quoth the king, Tell me somewhat of that which hath come to thy knowledge thereof. And the wazir answered, saying, Yes, there hath reached me, O king, a tale entitled the king and his wazir's wife there was once a king of the kings a potent man and a proud who was devoted to the love of women and one day being in the privacy of his palace he espied a beautiful woman on the terrace roof of her house and could not contain himself from falling consummately in love with her he asked his folk to whom the house and the damsel belonged and they said, This is the dwelling of the wazir such an one, and she is his wife. So he called the minister in question, and dispatched him on an errand to a distant part of the kingdom, where he was to collect information and to return. But as soon as he obeyed and was gone, the king contrived by a trick to gain access to his house and his spouse. When the wazir's wife saw him, she knew him, and springing up, kissed his hands and feet, and welcomed him. Then she stood afar off, busying herself in his service, and said to him, O our Lord, what is the cause of thy gracious coming? Such an honour is not for the like of me. Quoth he, The cause of it is that love of thee, and desire thee words have moved me to this. Whereupon she kissed ground before him a second time, and said, by Allah, O our Lord, indeed I am not worthy to be the handmaid of one of the king's servants. Whence then have I the great good fortune to be in such high honour and favour with thee? Then the king put out his hand to her, intending to enjoy her person, when she said, This thing shall not escape us, but take patience, O my king, and abide with thy handmaid all this day that she may make ready for thee somewhat to eat and drink. So the king sat down on his minister's couch, and she went in haste and brought him a book, wherein he might read, whilst she made ready the food. He took the book, and beginning to read, found therein moral instances and exhortations, such as restrained him from adultery, and broke his courage to commit sin and crime. After a while she returned and set before him some ninety dishes of different kinds of colours, and he ate a mouthful of each and found that, while the number was many, the taste of them was one. 
At this he marveled with exceeding marvel, and said to her, O damsel, I see these meats to be manifold and various, but the taste of them is simple and the same. Allah prosper the king, replied she. This is a parable I have set for thee, that thou mayst be admonished thereby. He asked, And what is its meaning? And she answered, Allah amend the case of our lord the king. In thy palace are ninety concubines of various colors, but their taste is one. When the king heard this, he was ashamed, and rising hastily went out, without offering her any affront, and returned to his palace. But in his haste and confusion he forgot his signet ring, and left it under the cushion where he had been sitting, and albeit he remembered it, he was ashamed to send for it. Now hardly had he reached home when the wazir returned, and presenting himself before the king, kissed the ground and made his report to him of the state of the province in question. Then he repaired to his own house, and sat down on his couch, and chancing to put his hand under the cushion, behold, he found the king's seal-ring. So he knew it, and taking the matter to heart, held aloof in great grief from his wife for a whole year, not going in unto her, nor even speaking to her, whilst she knew not the reason of his anger. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 16 Recording by Eva Easton, Slotesburg, New York January 2012Section 17 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 17. When it was the five hundred and seventy-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir held aloof from his wife, whilst she knew not the cause of his wrath. At last, being weary of the longsome neglect, she sent for her sire and told him the case. Whereupon quoth he, I will complain of him to the king at some time when he is in the presence. So one day he went into the king, and, finding the wazir and the kazi of the army before him, complained thus, saying, Almighty Allah, amend the king's case. I had a fair flower-garden, which I planted with mine own hand, and thereon spent my substance till it bare fruit, and its fruitage was ripe for plucking, when I gave it to this thy wazir, who ate of it what seemed good to him, then deserted it, and watered it not, so that its bloom wilted, and withered, and its sheen departed, and its state changed. Then said the wazir, O my king, this man saith sooth, I did indeed care for and guard the garden, and kept it in good condition, and ate thereof, till one day I went thither, and I saw the trail of the lion there, Wherefore I feared for my life, and withdrew from the garden. The king understood him that the trail of the lion meant his own seal-ring, which he had forgotten in the woman's house. So he said, Return, O wazir, to thy flower-garden, and fear nothing, for the lion came not near it. It hath reached me that he went thither, but by the honour of my fathers and forefathers he offered it no hurt. Hearkening and obedience answered the minister, and, returning home, sent for his wife, and made his peace with her, and thenceforth put faith in her chastity. This I tell thee, O king, continued the wazir, for no other purpose save to let thee know how great is their craft, and how precipitancy bequeatheth repentance. And I have also heard the following story of the confectioner, his wife, and the parrot. 
Once upon a time there dwelt in Egypt a confectioner who had a wife famed for beauty and loveliness, and a parrot which, as occasion required, did the office of watchman and guard, bell and spy, and flapped her wings did she but hear a fly buzzing about the sugar. This parrot caused abundant trouble to the wife, always telling her husband what took place in his absence. Now one evening, before going out to visit certain friends, the confectioner gave the bird strict injunctions to watch all night, and bade his wife make all fast, as he should not return until morning. Hardly had he left the door than the woman went for her old lover, who returned with her, and they passed the night together in mirth and merriment, while the parrot observed all. Betimes in the morning the lover fared forth, and the husband returning was informed by the parrot of what had taken place. Whereupon he hastened to his wife's room, and beat her with a painful beating. She thought in herself, Who could have informed against me? And she asked a woman that was in her confidence whether it was she. The woman protested by the worlds, visible and invisible, that she had not betrayed her mistress, but informed her that on the morning of his return home the husband had stood some time before the cage, listening to the parrot's talk. When the wife heard this she resolved to contrive the destruction of the bird. Some days after the husband was again invited to the house of a friend, where he was to pass the night and before departing he enjoined the parrot with the same injunctions as before wherefore his heart was free from care for he had his spy at home the wife and her confidant then planned how they might destroy the credit of the parrot with the master for this purpose they resolved to counterfeit a storm and this they did by placing over the parrot's head a hand-mill which the lover worked by pouring water upon a piece of hide by waving a fan, and by suddenly uncovering a candle hid under a dish. Thus did they raise such a tempest of rain and lightning, that the parrot was drenched and half drowned in a deluge. Now rolled the thunder, then flashed the lightning, that from the noise of the hand-mill, this from the reflection of the candle, when thought the parrot to herself, In very sooth the flood hath come on, such an one as belike Noah himself never witnessed. So saying, she buried her head under her wing, a prey to terror. The husband, on his return, hastened to the parrot to ask what had happened during his absence, and the bird answered that she found it impossible to describe the deluge and tempest of the last night, and that years would be required to explain the uproar of the hurricane and storm. When the shopkeeper heard the parrot talk of last night's deluge, he said, Surely, O bird, thou art gone clean daft. Where was there, even in a dream, rain or lightning last night? Thou hast utterly ruined my house and ancient family. My wife is the most virtuous woman of the age, and all thine accusations of her are lies. So in his wrath he dashed the cage upon the ground, tore off the parrot's head and threw it from the window. Presently his friend, coming to call upon him, saw the parrot in this condition with head torn off, and without wings or plumage. Being informed of the circumstances, he suspected some trick on the part of the woman, and said to the husband, When your wife leaves home to go to the hammam bath, compel her confidant to disclose the secret. So, as soon as his wife went out, the husband entered his harem, and insisted on the woman telling him the truth. She recounted the whole story, and the husband now bitterly repented having killed the parrot, of whose innocence he had proof. This I tell thee, O king, continued the wazir, that thou mayst know how great art the craft and malice of women, and that to act in haste leadeth to repent at leisure. So the king turned from slaying his son, but next day the favorite came in to him, and kissing the ground before him said, O king, why dost thou delay to do me justice? Indeed the kings have heard that thou commandest a thing, 
and thy wazir countermandeth it. Now the obedience of kings is in the fulfillment of their commandments, and every one knows thy justice and equity. So do thou justice for me on the prince. I also have heard tell a tale concerning the fuller and his son. There was once a man which was a fuller, and he used every day to go forth to the tigress bank a cleaning clothes, and his son was wont to go with him that he might swim whilst his father was fulling, nor was he forbidden from this. One day, as the boy was swimming, he was taken with cramp in the forearms and sank, whereupon the fuller plunged into the water and caught hold of him, but the boy clung about him and pulled him down, and so father and son were both drowned. Thus it is with thee, O king, except thou prevent thy son and do me justice on him, I fear lest both of you sink together, thou and he. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and eightieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the favorite had told her tale of the fuller and his son, she ended with, I fear lest both of you sink together, thou and he. Moreover, continued she, for an instance of the malice of men, I have heard tell a tale concerning the rake's trick against the chaste wife. A certain man loved a beautiful and lovely woman, a model of charms and grace, married to a man whom she loved and who loved her. Moreover, she was virtuous and chaste like unto me, and her rake of a lover found no way to her. So when his patience was at an end, he devised a device to win his will. Now the husband had a young man whom he had brought up in his house, and who was in high trust with him as his steward. So the rake addressed himself to the youth, and ceased not insinuating himself into his favor by presents and fair words and deeds, till he became more obedient to him than the hand to the mouth, and did whatever he ordered him. One day he said to him, Hark ye, such an one, wilt thou not bring me into the family dwelling-place some time when the lady is gone out? Yes, answered the young steward, so, when his master was at the shop and his mistress gone forth to the hammam, he took his friend by the hand, and, bringing him into the house, showed him the sitting-rooms and all that was therein. Now the lover was determined to play a trick upon the woman, so he took the white of an egg which he had brought with him in a vessel, and spilt it on the merchant's bedding, unseen by the young man, after which he returned thanks, and, leaving the house, went his way. In an hour or so the merchant came home, and going to the bed to rest himself, found thereon something wet. So he took it up in his hand, and looked at it, and deemed it man's seed. Whereat he stared at the young man with eyes of wrath, and asked him, Where is thy mistress? And he answered, She is gone forth to the hammam, and will return forthright after she has made her ablutions. When the man heard this, his suspicion concerning the seaman was confirmed, and he waxed furious, and said, Go at once, and bring her back. The steward accordingly fetched her, and when she came before her husband, the jealous man sprang upon her, and beat her a grievous beating. Then binding her arms behind her, offered to cut her throat with a knife. But she cried out to the neighbors who came to her, and she said to them, This my man hath beat me unjustly, and without cause, and is minded to kill me, though I know not what is mine offense. So they rose up and asked him, Why hast thou dealt thus with her? And he answered, She is divorced. Quoth they, Thou hast no right to maltreat her, either divorce her or use her kindly, for we know her prudence and purity and chastity. Indeed, she hath been our neighbor this long time, and we wot no evil of her. Quoth he, When I came home I found on my bed seed like human sperm, and I know not the meaning of this. 
Upon this a little boy, one of those present, came forward and said, Show it to me, nuncle mine. When he saw it, he smelt it, and calling for fire and a frying pan, he took the white of egg and cooked it, so that it became solid. Then he ate of it, and made the husband and the others taste of it, and they were certified that it was white of egg. So the husband was convinced that he had sinned against his wife's innocence, she being clear of all offense, and the neighbors made peace between them after the divorce. And he prayed her pardon, and presented her with an hundred gold pieces. And so the wicked lover's cunning trick came to naught. And know, O king, that this is an instance of the malice of men and their perfidy. When the king heard this, he bade his son be slain. But on the next day the second wazir came forward for intercession, and kissed ground in prostration. Whereupon the king said, Raise thy head, prostration must be made to Allah only. So the minister rose from before him, and said, O king, hasten not to slay thy son, for he was not granted to his mother by the Almighty, but after despair. Nor didst thou expect such good luck. And we hope that he will live to become a guerdon to thy reign, and a guardian of thy good. Wherefore have patience, O king. Belike he will offer a fit excuse, and if thou make haste to slay him, thou wilt surely repent, even as the merchant white repented. Ask the king, And how was it with the merchant, O wazir? And the wazir answered, O king, I have heard a tale of the miser and the loaves of bread. There was once a merchant who was a niggard and miserly in his eating and drinking. One day he went on a journey to a certain town, and as he walked in the market streets, behold, he met an old trot with two scones of bread, which looked sound and fair. He asked her, Are these for sale? And she answered, Yes. So he beat her down, and bought them at the lowest price, and took them home to his lodging, where he ate them that day. When morning morrowed, he returned to the same place, and, finding the old woman there with other two scones, bought these also. And thus he ceased not, during twenty-five days' space, when the old wife disappeared. He made enquiry for her, but could hear no tidings of her, till one day, as he was walking about the high streets, he chanced upon her. So he accosted her, and after the usual salutation, and with much praise and politeness, asked why she had disappeared from the market, and ceased to supply the two cakes of bread. Hearing this, at first she evaded giving him a reply, but he conjured her to tell him her case. So she said, Hear my excuse, O my lord, which is that I was attending upon a man who had a corroding ulcer on his spine, and his doctor bade us knead flour with butter into a plaster, and lay it on the place of pain, where it abode all night. In the morning I used to take that flour and turn it into dough, and make it into two scones, which I cooked and sold to thee or to another. But presently the man died, and I was cut off from making cakes. When the merchant heard this he repented, when as repentance availed him naught, saying, Verily we are Allah's, and verily unto him we are returning. There is no majesty, and there is no might, save in him, the glorious, the great. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and eighty-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the old trot told the merchant the provenance of the scones, he cried, there is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah, the glorious, the great. And he repeated the saying of the Most High, Whatever evil falleth to thee, it is from thyself. And vomited till he fell sick, and repented whenas repentance availed him not. Moreover, O king, continued the second wazir, I have heard tell of the malice of women, a tale of the lady and her two lovers. 
Once upon a time there was a man who was sword-bearer to one of the kings, and he loved a damsel of the common sort. One day he sent his page to her with a message, as of wont between them, and the lad sat down with her and toyed with her. She inclined to him and pressed him to her breast, and groped him and kissed him, whereupon he sought carnal connection of her, and she consented. But as the two were thus, lo, the youth's master knocked at the door. So she pushed the page through a trap-door into an underground chamber there, and opened the door to his lord, who entered, hending sword in hand, and sat down upon her bed. Then she came up to him, and sported, and toyed with him, kissing him, and pressing him to her bosom. And he took her, and lay with her. Presently her husband knocked at the door, and the gallant asked her, Who is that? Whereto she answered, My husband. Quoth he, How shall I do? Quoth she, Draw thy sword, and stand in the vestibule, and abuse me, and revile me. And when my husband comes in to thee, do thou go forth and wend thy ways. He did as she bade him, and when the husband entered, he saw the king's sword-bearer standing with naked brand in hand, abusing and threatening his wife. But when the lover saw him, he was ashamed, and sheathing his scimitar, went forth the house. Said the man to his wife, What means this? And she replied, O man, how blessed is the hour of thy coming! Thou hast saved a true believer from slaughter, and it happed after this fashion. I was on the house terrace spinning, when, behold, there came up to me a youth, distracted and panting for fear of death, fleeing from yonder man, who followed upon him as hard as he could with his drawn sword. The young man fell down before me, and kissed my hands and feet, saying, O protector of thy mercy, save me from him who would slay me wrongously. So I hid him in that underground chamber of ours, and presently in came yonder man to me, naked brand in hand, demanding the youth, but I denied him to him, whereupon he fell to abusing and threatening me as thou sawest. And praised be Allah who sent thee to me, for I was distraught and had none to deliver me. Well hast thou done, O woman, answered the husband. Thy reward is with Allah the Almighty, and may he abundantly requite thy good deed. Then he went to the trap-door and called to the page, saying, Come forth, and fear not, no harm shall befall thee. So he came out, trembling for fear, and the husband said, Be of good cheer, none shall I hurt thee, condoling with him on what had befallen him, whilst the page called down blessings on his head. Then they both went forth, nor was that Cornuto, nor was the page, aware of that which the woman had contrived. This then, O king, said the wazir, is one of the tricks of women, so beware lest thou rely upon their words. The king was persuaded, and turned from putting his son to death. But on the third day the favorite came in to him, and, kissing the ground before him, cried, O king, do me justice on thy son, and be not turned from thy purpose by thy minister's prate, for there is no good in wicked wazirs. And be not as the king of Baghdad, who relied on the word of a certain wicked counsellor of his. Quoth he, And how was that? Quoth she, There hath been told me, O auspicious and well-advised king, a tale of the king's son and the ogress. A certain king had a son whom he loved, and favoured with exceeding favour, over all his other children. And this son said to him one day, O oh, my father, I have a mind to fare a coursing and a hunting. So the king bade furnish him, and commanded one of his wazirs to bear him company, and do all the service he needed during his trip. The minister accordingly took everything that was necessary for the journey, and they set out with a retinue of eunuchs and officers and pages, and rode on, sporting as they went, till they came to a green and well-grassed champagne, abounding in pasture and water and game. Here the prince turned to the minister and told him that the place pleased him, and he purposed to halt there. So they sat down in that sight, and they loosed the falcons and lynxes and dogs, 
and caught great plenty of game, whereat they rejoiced and abode there some days, in all joyance of life and its delight. Then the king's son gave the signal for departure, but, as they went along, a beautiful gazelle, as if the sun rose shining from between her horns that had strayed from her mate, sprang up before the prince, whereupon his soul longed to make prize of her, and he coveted her. So he said to the wazir, I have a mind to follow that gazelle. And the minister replied, Do what seemeth good to thee. Thereupon the prince rode single-handed after the gazelle, till he lost sight of his companions, and chased her all that day till dusk, when she took refuge in a bit of rocky ground, and darkness closed in upon him. Then he would have turned back, but knew not the way, whereat he was sore concerned, and said, There is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah the glorious, the great. He sat his mare all night till morning dawned, in quest of relief, but found none, and when the day appeared he fared on at hazard, fearful, famished, thirsty, and knowing not whither to wend, till it was noon, and the sun beat down upon him with burning heat. By that time he came in sight of a great city, with massive base and lofty bulwarks, but it was ruined and desolate, nor was there any live thing therein save owl and raven. As he stood among the buildings, marvelling at their ordinance, lo, his eyes fell on a damsel, young, beautiful, and lovely, sitting under one of the city walls, wailing and weeping copious tears. So he drew nigh to her, and asked, Who art thou, and who brought thee hither? She answered, I am called Bint al-Tamimah, daughter of al Tiak, king of the grey country. I went out one day to obey a call of nature, when an ifrit of the jinn snatched me up and soared with me between heaven and earth, but as he flew there fell on him a shooting star in the form of a flame of fire and burned him and i dropped here where these three days i have hungered and thirsted but when i saw thee i longed for life and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section seventeen recording by eva easton slotsburg new york January 2012. Section 18 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. J. Frank The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous Translated by Richard Francis Burton Section 18 When it was the five hundred and eighty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the prince, when addressed by the daughter of King al Tayek, who said to him, When I saw thee I longed for life, was smitten with ruth and grief for her, and took her up on his courser's crupper, saying, Be of good cheer, and keep thine eyes cool and clear. For if Allah, extolled and exalted be he, restore me to my people and family, I will send thee back to thine own folk. Then he rode on, praying for deliverance, and presently the damsel said to him, O king's son, set me down, that I may do an occasion under this wall. So he drew bridle, and she alighted. He waited for her a long while, as she hid herself behind the wall, and she came forth with the foulest of favors which, when he saw, his hair stood on end, and he quaked for fear of her, and he turned deadly pale. Then she sprang upon his steed, behind him, wearing the most loathly of aspects, and presently she said to him, 
O king's son, what ails thee that I see thee troubled and thy favor changed? I have bethought me of somewhat that troubles me. Seek aid against it of thy father's troops and his braves. He whom I fear careth not for troops, neither can braves affright him. Aid thyself against him with thy father's monies and treasures. He whom I fear will not be satisfied with wealth. Ye hold that ye have in heaven a God who seeth, and is not seen, and is omnipotent and omniscient. Yes, we have none but him. Then pray thou to him. Haply he will deliver thee from me thine enemy. So the king's son raised his eyes to heaven, and began to pray with his whole heart, saying, O oh my God, I implore thy succor against that which troubleth me. Then he pointed to her with his hand, and she fell to the ground, burnt black as charcoal. Therewith he thanked Allah and praised him, and ceased not to fare forwards. And the Almighty, extolled and exalted be he, of his grace made the way easy to him, and guided him into the right road, so that he reached his own land and came upon his father's capital after he had despaired of life. Now all this befell by the contrivance of the wazir who travelled with him, to the end that he might cause him to perish on the way. But Almighty Allah succoured him. And this, said the damsel, have I told thee, O king, that thou mayest know that wicked wazirs deal not honestly by, nor counsel with sincere intent, their kings. Wherefore be thou wise and ware of them in this matter. The king gave ear to her speech, and bade put his son to death. But the third wazir came in and said to his brother ministers, I will warrant you from the king's mischief this day. And going in to him, kissed the ground between his hands, and said, O king, I am thy true counsellor, and solicitous for thee and for thine estate, and indeed I read thee the best of read. It is that thou hasten not to slay thy son, the coolth of thine eyes, and the fruit of thy vitals. Haply his sin is but a slight slip, which this damsel hath made great to thee. And indeed I have heard tell that the people of two villages once destroyed one another because of a drop of honey. Asked the king, How was that? And the wazir answered, saying, Know, O king, that I have heard this story anent. THE DROP OF HONEY A certain hunter used to chase wild beasts in Wald, and one day he came upon a grotto in the mountains, where he found a hollow full of bees' honey. So he took somewhat thereof in a water-skin he had with him, and throwing it over his shoulder carried it to the city, followed by a hunting-dog which was dear to him. He stopped at the shop of an oil-man and offered him the honey for sale, and he bought it. Then he emptied it out of the skin that he might see it, and in the act a drop fell to the ground, whereupon the flies flocked to it, and a bird swooped down upon the flies. Now the oil-man had a cat, which sprang upon the bird, and the huntsman's dog, seeing the cat, sprang upon it and slew it. Whereupon the oilman sprang upon the dog and slew it, and the huntsman in turn sprang upon the oilman and slew him. Now the oilman was of one village, and the huntsman of another, and when the people of the two places heard what had passed, they took up arms and weapons, and rose one on another in wrath, and the two lines met nor did the sword leave to play amongst them till there died of them much people. None knoweth their number, save Almighty Allah. And among other stories of the malice of women, continued the wazir, 
I have heard tell, O king, one concerning the woman who made her husband sift dust. A man once gave his wife a durham to buy rice. So she took it and went to the rice seller, who gave her the rice and began to jest with her and ogle her, for she was dowered with beauty and loveliness, saying, Rice is not good but with sugar, which, if thou wilt have, come in with me for an hour. So saying, Give me sugar, she went in with him into his shop, and he won his will of her, and said to his slave, Weigh her out a Durham's worth of sugar. But he made the slave a privy sign, and the boy, taking the napkin in which was the rice, emptied it out, and put in earth and dust in its stead, and for the sugar set stones, after which he again knotted up the napkin and left it by her. His object in doing this was that she should come to him a second time, so when she went forth of the shop he gave her the napkin and she took it, thinking to have in it rice and sugar, and ganged her gait. But when she returned home, and setting it before her husband, went for a cooking-pot, he found in it earth and stones. So, as soon as she came back bringing the pot, he said to her, Did I tell thee I had aught to build, that thou bringest me earth and stones? When she saw this, she knew that the rice-seller's slave had tricked her. So she said to her husband, O oh, man, in my trouble of mind for what hath befallen me, I went to fetch the sieve and brought the cooking-pot. What hath troubled thee? asked he. And she answered, O oh, husband, I dropped the durham thou gavest me in the market street, and was ashamed to search for it before the folk. Yet I grudged to lose the silver, so I gathered up the earth from the place where it fell, and brought it away, thinking to sift it at home. Wherefore I went to fetch the sieve, but brought the cooking-pot instead. Then she fetched the sieve, and gave it to her husband, saying, Do thou sift it, for thine eyes are sharper than mine. Accordingly he sat, sifting the clay, till his face and beard were covered with dust and he discovered not her trick, neither knew what had befallen her. This then, O king, said the wazir, is an instance of the malice of women, and consider the saying of Allah Almighty, Surely the cunning of you women is great. And again, indeed the malice of Satan is weak in comparison with the malice of women. The king gave ear to his wazir's speech, and was persuaded thereby, and was satisfied by what he cited to him of the signs of Allah. And the lights of good counsel arose and shone in the firmament of his understanding, and he turned from his purpose of slaying his son. But on the fourth day the favorite came in to him weeping and wailing, and kissing the ground before him, said, O oh, auspicious king and lord of good reed, I have made plainly manifest to thee my grievance, and thou hast dealt unjustly by me, and hast forborne to avenge me on him who hath wronged me, because he is thy son and the darling of thy heart. But Allah, extolled and exalted be he, will presently succor me against him, even as he succored the king's son against his father's wazir. And how was that? asked the king. And she answered, I have heard tell, O king, a tale of the enchanted string. There was once in times gone by a king who had one son and none other. And when the prince grew up to man's estate, he contracted him in marriage to another king's daughter. Now the damsel was a model of beauty and grace, and her uncle's son had sought her in wedlock of her sire, but she would none of him. So when he knew that she was to be married to another, envy and jealousy got hold of him, and he bethought himself and sent a noble present to the wazir 
of the bridegroom's father, and much treasure, desiring him to use craft for slaying the prince, or contrive to make him leave his intent of espousing the girl, and adding, O oh, Wazir, indeed jealousy moveth me to this, for she is my cousin. The wazir accepted the present and sent an answer, saying, Be of good cheer and of eyes cool and clear, for I will do all that thou wishest. Presently the bride's father wrote to the prince, bidding him to his capital, that he might go in to his daughter. Whereupon the king his father gave him leave to wend his way thither, sending with him the bribed wazir and a thousand horse, besides presents and litters, tents and pavilions. The minister set out with the prince, plotting the while in his heart to do him a mischief, and when they came into the desert he called to mind a certain spring of running water in the mountains there, called Al-Sara, whereof whosoever drank from a man became a woman. So he called a halt of the troops near the fountain, and presently mounting steed again said to the prince, Hast thou a mind to go with me and look upon a spring of water near hand? The prince mounted, knowing not what should befall him in the future, and they rode on, unattended by any, and without stopping till they came to the spring. The prince, being thirsty, said to the wazir, O oh, minister, I am suffering from drouth. And the other answered, Get thee down and drink of this spring. So he alighted and washed his hands and drank, when, behold, he straightway became a woman. As soon as he knew what had befallen him, he cried out and wept till he fainted away, and the wazir came up to him as if to learn what had befallen him, and cried, What aileth thee? So he told him what had happened and the minister feigned to condole with him, and weep for his affliction, saying, Allah Almighty be thy refuge to thine affliction. How came this calamity upon thee, and this great misfortune to betide thee? And we, carrying thee with joy and gladness, that thou mightest go in to the king's daughter? Verily now I know not whether we shall go to her or not, but the reed is thine. What dost thou command me to do? Quoth the prince, Go back to my sire, and tell him what hath betided me, for I will not stir hence till this matter be removed from me, or I die in my regret. So he wrote a letter to his father, telling him what had happened, and the wazir took it and set out on his return to the city leaving what troops he had with the prince, and inwardly exulting for the success of his plot. As soon as he reached the king's capital, he went in to him, and, telling him what had passed, delivered the letter. The king mourned for his son with sore mourning, and sent for the wise men and masters of esoteric science, that they might discover and explain to him this thing which had befallen his son, but none could give him an answer. Then the wazir wrote to the lady's cousin, conveying to him the glad news of the prince's misfortune, and he, when he read the letter, rejoiced with great joy, and thought to marry the princess, and answered the minister, sending him rich presents and great store of treasure, and thanking him exceedingly. Meanwhile the prince abode by the stream three days and three nights, eating not nor drinking, and committing himself in his strait unto Allah, extolled and exalted be he, who disappointeth not whoso relieth on him. On the fourth night, lo, there came to him a cavalier on a bright bay steed with a crown on his head, as he were of the sons of the kings, and said to him, who brought thee hither, O youth? The prince told him his mishap, how he was wending to his wedding, and how the wazir had led him to a spring, whereof he drank and incurred what had occurred. And as he spoke, his speech was broken by tears. 
Having heard him, the horseman pitied his case and said, It was thy father's wazir who cast thee into this strait, for no man alive save he knoweth of this spring. Presently adding, Mount thee behind me and come with me to my dwelling, for thou art my guest this night. Acquaint me who thou art, ere I fare with thee, quoth the prince, and quoth the other, I am a king's son of the John, as thou a king's son of mankind. So be of good cheer, and keep thine eyes clear of tear, for I will surely do away thy cark and care, and this is a slight thing unto me. So the prince mounted him behind the stranger, and they rode on, leaving the troops, from the first of the day till midnight, when the king's son of the jinn asked the prince, Knowest thou how many days' march we have covered in this time? Not I. We have come a full year's journey for a diligent horseman. The prince marveled at this and said, How shall I do to return to my people? That is not thine affair, but my business. As soon as thou art quit of thy complaint, thou shalt return to thy people in less than the twinkling of an eye. FOR THAT IS AN EASY MATTER TO ME. WHEN THE PRINCE HEARD THESE WORDS, HE WAS READY TO FLY FOR EXCESS OF JOY. IT SEEMED TO HIM AS HE WERE IN THE imbroglio OF A DREAM, AND HE EXCLAIMED, GLORY BE TO HIM WHO CAN RESTORE THE UNHAPPY TO HAPPINESS. AND SHAHRAZAD PERCEIVED THE DAWN OF DAY, AND CEASED SAYING HER PERMITTED SAY. When it was the five hundred and eighty-third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the prince of the jinns said to the prince of mankind, When thou art quit of thy complaint, thou shalt return to thy folk in less than the twinkling of an eye. And the king's son rejoiced. They fared on all that night till the morning morrowed, when, lo, they found themselves in a green and smiling country, full of trees spiring, and birds choiring, and garths fruit-growing, and palaces high-showing, and waters a-flowing, and odoriferous flowers a-blowing. Here the king's son of the jinn alighted from his steed, and bidding the prince do the like, took him by the hand and carried him into one of the palaces, where he found a great king and puissant sultan, and abode with him all that day, eating and drinking till nightfall. Then the king's son of the jinn mounted his courser, and taking the prince up behind him, fared on swiftly through the murks and glooms until morning, when, lo, they found themselves in a dark land and a desert, full of black rocks and stones, as it were a piece of hell. And the prince asked the jinni, What is the name of this land? Answered the other, It is called the Black Country, and belongs to one of the kings of the jinn, by name Zu'ul Janahan, against whom none of the other kings may prevail. Neither may any enter his dominion save by his permit, so tarry thou here whilst I go ask leave. So saying, he went away, and returning after a while, they fared on again, till they landed at a spring of water welling forth of a black rock. And the king's son of the jinn said to the king's son of men, A light. He dismounted, and the other cried, Drink of this water. So he drank of the spring without stay or delay, and no sooner had he done so than, by the grace of Allah, he became a man as before. At this he joyed with exceeding joy, and asked the jinni, O oh, my brother, how is this spring called? Answered the other, It is called the women's spring, for that no woman drinketh thereof, but she becometh a man. Wherefore do thou praise Allah the Most High, and thank him for thy restoration, and mount. So the prince prostrated himself in gratitude to the Almighty, 
after which he mounted again, and they fared on diligently all that day, till they returned to the Jinnis' home, where the prince passed the night in all solace of life. They spent the next day in eating and drinking till nightfall, when the king's son of the jinn asked the prince, Hast thou a mind to return to thy people this very night? Yes, he answered, for indeed I long for them. Then the jinnee called one of his father's slaves, Rajiz Hait, and said to him, Take this young man mounted on thy shoulders, and let not the day dawn, ere he be with his father-in-law and his wife. Replied the slave, Hearkening and obedience, and with love and gladness, and upon my head and eyes. Then, withdrawing a while, reappeared in the form of an ifrit. When the prince saw this, he lost his senses for a fright, but the jinnee said to him, Fear not, no harm shall befall thee. Mount thy horse, and leap him on to the ifrit's shoulders. Nay, answered he, I will leave my horse with thee, and bestride his shoulders myself. So he bestrode the ifrit's shoulders, and when the genie cried, Close thine eyes, O my lord, and be not craven, he strengthened his heart and shut his eyes. Thereupon the ifrit rose with him into the air, and ceased not to fly between sky and earth, whilst the prince was unconscious, nor was the last third of the night come before he alighted down with him on the terrace roof of his father-in-law's palace. Then said the Ifrit, Dismount and open thine eyes, for this is the palace of thy father-in-law and his daughter. So he came down, and the Ifrit flew away, and left him on the roof of the palace. When the day broke, and the prince recovered from his troubles, he descended into the palace, and as his father-in-law caught sight of him, he came to meet him, and marveled to see him descend from the roof of the palace, saying, We see folk enter by doors, but thou comest from the skies. Quoth the prince, Whatso Allah, may he be extolled and exalted, willeth, that cometh to pass. And he told him all that had befallen him, from first to last, whereat the king marvelled and rejoiced in his safety, and as soon as the sun rose, bade his wazir make ready splendid bride feasts. So did he, and they held the marriage festival, after which the prince went in unto his bride, and abode with her two months, then departed with her for his father's capital. As for the damsel's cousin, he died forthright of envy and jealousy. When the prince and his bride drew near his father's city, the king came out to meet them with his troops and wazirs, and so Allah, blessed and exalted be he, enabled the prince to prevail against his bride's cousin and his father's minister. And I pray the Almighty, added the damsel, to aid thee against thy wazirs, O king, and I beseech thee to do me justice on thy son. When the king heard this, he bade put his son to death. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and eighty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the favorite had told her tale to the king, she said, I beseech thee to do me justice by putting thy son to death. Now this was the fourth day, so the fourth wazir entered, and kissing the ground before him said, Allah, establish and protect the king. O king, be deliberate in doing this thou art resolved upon, for the wise man doth not till he hath considered the issue thereof. And the proverb saith, Whoso looketh not to his actions' end, hath not the world to friend and whoso acteth without consideration, there befalleth him what befell the hammam keeper with his wife. And what betided him? asked the king. 
and the wazir answered, I have heard tell, O king, a tale of the wazir's son and the hammam keeper's wife. There was once a bath-keeper to whom resorted the notables of the folk and head-men, and one day there came in to him a handsome youth of the sons of wazirs, who was fat and bulky of body. So he stood to serve him, and when the young man put off his clothes, he saw not his yard, for that it was hidden between his thighs, by reason of the excess of his fat and there appeared thereof but what was like unto a filbert. At this the bath-keeper fell a-lamenting and smiting hand upon hand, which when the youth saw he said to him, What ails thee, O bath-keeper, to lament thus? And he answered, saying, O my lord, my lamentation is for thee, because thou art in sore straits, for all thy fair fortune and goodliness and exceeding comeliness, seeing thou hast not wherewithal to do and receive delight like unto other men. Quoth the youth, Thou sayest sooth, but thou mindest me of somewhat I had forgotten. What is that? asked the bath-keeper. And the youth answered, Take this gold piece and fetch me a pretty woman that I may prove my nature on her. So he took the money, and betaking himself to his wife, said to her, O woman, there is come to me in the bath a young man of the sons of the wazirs, as he were the moon on the fullest night. But he hath no prickle like other men, for that which he hath is but some small matter like unto a filbert. I lamented over his youth, and he gave me this dinar, and asked me to fetch him a woman on whom he might approve himself. Now thou art worthier of the money than another, and from this no harm shall betide us, for I will protect thee. So do thou sit with him a while, and laugh at him, and take this dinar from him. So the good wife took the dinar, and rising, adorned herself, and donned the richest of her raiment. Now she was the fairest woman of her time. Then she went out with her husband, and he carried her into the wazir's son in a privy place. When she came into him, she looked at him, and finding him a handsome youth, fair of favor as he were the moon at full, was confounded at his beauty and loveliness, and on likewise his heart and wit were amazed at the first sight of her and the sweetness of her smile. So he rose forthright, and locking the door, took the damsel in his arms, and pressed her to his bosom, and they embraced, whereupon the young man's yard swelled and rose on end, as it were that of a jackass, and he rode upon her breast and futtered her, whilst she sobbed and sighed and writhed and wriggled under him. Now the bath-keeper was standing behind the door, awaiting what should be tied between them, and he began to call her, saying, O oh, Um Abdillah, enough! Come out, for the day is long upon thy sucking child. Quote the youth, Go forth to thy boy, and come back. But quoth she, If I go forth from thee, my soul will depart my body. As regards the child, so I must either leave him to die of weeping, or let him be reared an orphan without a mother. So she ceased not to abide with him till he had done his desire of her ten times running, while her husband stood at the door, calling her and crying out and weeping and imploring succor. But none came to aid him, and he ceased not to do thus, saying, I will slay myself. Till at last, finding no way of access to his wife, and being distraught with rage and jealousy, to hear her sighing and murmuring and breathing hard under the young man, he went up to the top of the bath, and casting himself down therefrom, died. Moreover, O king, continued the wazir, there hath reached me another story of the malice of women. What is that? asked the king. And the wazir said, 
know o king that it is anent the wife's device to cheat her husband there was once a woman who had no equal in her day for beauty and loveliness and grace and perfection and a certain lewd youth and an obscene setting eyes on her fell in love with her and loved her with exceeding passion but she was chaste and inclined not to adultery it chanced one day that her husband went on a journey to a certain town whereupon the young man fell to sending to her many times a day but she made no reply at last he resorted to an old woman who dwelt hard by and after saluting her he sat down and complained to her of his sufferings for love of the woman and his longing to enjoy her quoth she i will warrant thee this no harm shall befall thee for i will surely bring thee to thy desire inshallah and it please allah the most high at these words he gave her a dinar and went his way when the morning morrowed, she appeared before the woman, and renewing an old acquaintance with her, fell to visiting her daily, eating the undertime with her and the evening meal, and carrying away food for her children. Moreover, she used to sport and jest with her till the wife became corrupted, and could not endure an hour without her company. Now she was wont, when she left the lady's house, to take bread and fat wherewith she mixed a little pepper and to feed a bitch that was in that quarter and thus she did day by day till the bitch became fond of her and followed her wherever she went one day she took a cake of dough and putting therein an overdose of pepper gave it to the bitch to eat whereupon the beast's eyes began to shed tears for the heat of the pepper and she followed the old woman weeping when the lady saw this she was amazed and asked the ancient o oh, my mother what ails this bitch to weep answered she learn o oh, my heart's love that hers is a strange story know that she was once a close friend of mine a lovely and accomplished young lady a model of comeliness and perfect grace a young nazarene of the quarter fell in love with her and his passion and pining increased on him till he took to his pillow and he sent to her times manifold begging her to have compassion on him and show him mercy but she refused albeit i gave her good counsel saying o oh, my daughter have pity on him and be kind and consent to all he wisheth she gave no heed to my advice until the young man's patience failing him he complained at last to one of his friends, who cast an enchantment on her, and changed her human shape into canine form. When she saw what transformation had befallen her, and that there was none to pity her case save myself, she came to my house and began to fawn on me, and buss my hands and feet, and whine and shed tears, till I recognized her and said to her, how often did i not warn thee but my advice profited thee not and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section 18 recording by m j frank portland oregon Section 19 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 19. When it was the 585th night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the old trot related to the young lady the tale of the bitch, and recounted the case in her cunning and deceit, with the view to gain her consent, and said to her, When the enchanted beast came to me, and wept, I reminded her, 
how often did I not warn thee? But my advice profited thee not. However, O oh my daughter, seeing her misery, I had compassion on her case, and kept her by me. And as often as she bethinketh herself of her former estate, she weepeth thus in pity for herself. When the lady heard this, she was taken with great alarm, and said, O oh my mother, by Allah, thou affrightest me with this thy story. Why so? asked the old woman. Answered the lady, Because a certain handsome young man fell in love with me, and hath sent many times to me. But hitherto I have repelled him, and now I fear lest there befall me the like of what befell this bitch. O oh, my daughter, rejoined the old woman, look thou to what I counsel thee, and beware of crossing me, for I am in great fear for thee. If thou know not his abiding place, describe his semblance to me that I may fetch him to thee, and let not any one's heart be angered against thee. So the lady described him to her, and she showed not to know him, and said, When I go out I will ask after him. But when she left the lady she went straight to the young man and said to him, Be of good cheer, for I have played with the girl's wits. So to-morrow at noon wait thou at the head of the street, till I come and carry thee to her house, where thou shalt take thine ease with her the rest of the day and all night long. At this the young man rejoiced with exceeding joy, and gave her two dinars, saying, When I have won my wish of her, I will give thee ten gold pieces. Then she returned to the lady, and said to her, I have seen him and spoken with him on this matter. I found him exceeding wroth with thee, and minded to do thee a harm. But I plied him with fair words till he agreed to come to-morrow at the time of the call to noon prayer. When the lady heard this, she rejoiced exceedingly, and said, O oh, my mother, if he keeps his promise, I will give thee ten dinars. Quoth the old woman, Look to his coming from none but from me. When the next morn morrowed, she said to the lady, Make ready the early meal, and forget not the wine, and adorn thyself, and don thy richest dress and decoration, whilst I go and fetch him to thee. So she clad herself in her finest finery, and prepared food, whilst the old woman went out to look for the young man, who came not. So she went around searching for him, but could come by no news of him, and she said to herself, What is to be done? Shall the food and drink she hath gotten ready be wasted, and I lose the gold pieces she promised me? Indeed, I will not allow my cunning contrivance to come to naught but will look her out another man, and carry him to her. So she walked about the highways till her eyes fell on a pretty fellow, young and distinguished-looking, to whom the folk bowed, and who bore in his face the traces of travel. She went up to him, and saluting him, asked, Hast thou a mind to meet and drink, and a girl adorned and ready? Answered he, Where is this to be had? At home, in my house, rejoined she, and carrying him to his own house, knocked at the door. The lady opened to them, and ran in again, to make an end of her dressing and perfuming, whilst the wicked old woman brought the man, who was the husband and housemaster, into the saloon and made him sit down congratulating herself on her cunning contrivance. Presently in walked the lady who no sooner set eyes on her husband sitting by the old trot than she knew him, and guessed how the case stood. Nevertheless, she was not taken aback, and without stay or delay bethought her of a device to hoodwink him. So she pulled off her outer boot and cried at her husband, Is this how thou keepest the contract between us? How canst thou betray me and deal thus with me? Know that when I heard of thy coming, I sent this old woman to try thee, and she hath made thee fall into that against which I warn thee. So now I am certified of thine affair, and that thou hast broken faith with me. I thought thee chaste and pure till I saw thee, with my own eyes, in this old woman's company, and knew that thou didst frequent loose baggages. 
So saying, she fell to beating him with her slipper about the head, and crying out, Divorce me, divorce me, whilst he excused himself and swore to her, by Allah the Most High, that he had never in his life been untrue to her, nor had done aught of that whereof she suspected him. But she stinted not to weep and scream and bash him, crying out and saying, Come to my help, O Muslims, till he laid hold of her mouth with his hand, and she bit it. Moreover, he humbled himself to her and kissed her hands and feet, whilst she would not be appeased and continued to cuff him. At last she winked at the old woman to come and hold her hand from him. So she came up to her and kissed her hands and feet, till she made peace between them, and they sat down together, whereupon the husband began to kiss her hands, saying, Allah Almighty, requite thee with all good, for that thou hast delivered me from her. And the old woman marvelled at the wife's cunning and ready wit. This, then, O king, said the wazir, is one of the many instances of the craft and malice and perfidy of women. When the king heard this story, he was persuaded by it, and turned from his purpose to slay his son. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and eighty-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the fourth wazir had told his tale, the king turned from his purpose to slay his son. But on the fifth day, the damsel came into him hending a bowl of poison in hand, calling on heaven for help and buffeting her cheeks and face, and said to him, O king, either thou shalt do me justice and avenge me on thy son, or I will drink up this poison cup and die, and the sin of my blood shall be on thy head at the day of doom. These thy ministers accuse me of malice and perfidy, but there be none in the world more perfidious than men. Hast thou not heard the story of the goldsmith and the cashmere singing girl? What befell the twain, O damsel? asked the king. And she answered, saying, There hath come to my knowledge, O august king, a tale of the goldsmith and the cashmere singing girl. There lived once in a city of Persia a goldsmith who delighted in women and in drinking wine. One day, being in the house of one of his intimates, he saw painted on the wall the figure of a lutenist, a beautiful damsel. Beholder never beheld a fairer or a more pleasant. He looked at the picture again and again, marveling at its beauty, and fell so desperately in love with it that he sickened for passion and came near to die. It chanced that one of his friends came to visit him, and sitting down by his side, asked how he did and what ailed him whereto the goldsmith answered, O oh, my brother, that which ails me is love, and it befell on this wise. I saw a figure of a woman painted on the house wall of my brother, such an one, and became enamoured of it. Hereupon the other fell to blaming him, and said, This was of thy lack of wit. How couldst thou fall in love with a painted figure on a wall that can neither harm nor profit? that seeth not, neither heareth, that neither taketh nor withholdeth, said the sick man. He who painted yonder picture never could have limbed it save after the likeness of some beautiful woman. Haply, rejoined his friend, he painted it from imagination. In any case, replied the goldsmith, here am I dying for love of the picture, and if there live the original thereof in the world, I pray Allah Most High to protect my life till I see her. When those who were present went out, they asked for the painter of the picture, and, finding that he had travelled to another town, wrote him a letter, complaining of their comrade's case, and inquiring whether he had drawn the figure of his own inventive talents, or copied it from a living model. To which he replied, I painted it after a certain singing girl belonging to one of the wazirs in the city of Kashmir, in the land of Hind. When the goldsmith heard this, he left Persia for Kashmir city, where he arrived after much travail. 
He tarried a while there, till one day he went and clapped up an acquaintance with a certain of the citizens who was a druggist, a fellow of a sharp wit, keen, crafty, and being one even tied in company with him, asked him of their king and his polity, to which the other answered, saying, Well, our king is just and righteous in his governance, equitable to his lieges, and beneficent to his commons, and abhorreth nothing in the world save sorcerers. But whenever a sorcerer or sorceress falls into his hands, he casteth them into a pit without the city, and there leaveth them in hunger to die. Then he questioned him of the king's wazirs, and the druggist told him of each minister, his fashion and condition, till the talk came round to the singing girl, and he told him, She belongeth to such a wazir. The goldsmith took note of the minister's abiding place, and waited some days, till he had devised a device to his desire. And one night of rain and thunder and stormy winds, he provided himself with thieves' tackle and repaired to the house of the wazir who owned the damsel. Here he hanged a rope ladder with grappling irons to the battlements, and climbed up to the terrace roof of the palace. Thence he descended to the inner court, and making his way into the harem, found all the slave girls lying asleep, each on her own couch, and amongst them reclining on a couch of alabaster, and covered with a coverlet of cloth of gold, a damsel, as she were the moon rising on a fourteenth night. At her head stood a candle of ambergris, and at her feet another, each in a candlestick of glittering gold, her brilliancy dimming them both, and under her pillow lay a casket of silver, wherein were her jewels. He raised the coverlet, and drawing near her, considered her straightly, and behold, it was the lutenist whom he desired, and of whom he was come in quest. So he took out a knife, and wounded her in the back parts, a palpable outer wound, whereupon she awoke in terror. But when she saw him she was afraid to cry out, thinking he came to steal her goods. So she said to him, Take the box and what is therein, but slay me not, for I am in thy protection and under thy safeguard, and my death will profit thee nothing. Accordingly he took the box and went away. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and eighty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the goldsmith had entered the wazir's palace, he wounded the damsel slightly in the back parts, and taking the box which contained her jewels, wended his way. And when morning morrowed, he donned clothes after the fashion of men of learning, and doctors of the law, and taking the jewel-case went in therewith to the king of the city, before whom he kissed the ground, and said to him, O king, I am a devout man, with all a loyal well-wisher to thee, and come hither a pilgrim to thy court, from the land of Khorasan, attracted by the report of thy just governance, and righteous dealings with thy subjects, and minded to be under thy standard. I reached this city at the last of the day, and finding the gate locked and barred, threw me down to sleep without the walls. But as I lay betwixt sleep and wake, behold, I saw four women come up, one riding on a broomstick, another on a wine-jar, a third on an oven-peel, and a fourth on a black bitch, and I knew that they were witches making for thy city. One of them came up to me, and kicked me with her foot, and beat me with a fox's tail she had in her hand, hurting me grievously. Whereat I was wroth, and smote her with a knife I had with me, wounding her in the back parts, as she turned to flee from me. When she felt the wound she fled before me, and in her flight let drop this casket, which I picked up, and opening, found these costly jewels therein. So do thou take it for I have no need thereof, being a wanderer in the mountains, who hath rejected the world from my heart, and renounced it in all that is in it, seeking only the face of Allah the Most High. Then he set the casket before the king, and fared forth. 
the king opened the box and emptying out all the trinkets it contained fell to turning them over with his hand till he chanced upon a necklace whereof he had made a gift to the wazir to whom the girl belonged seeing this he called the minister in question and said to him this is the necklace i gave thee he knew it at first sight and answered it is and i gave it to a singing girl of mine quoth the king fetch that girl to me forthwith so he fetched her to him and he said uncover her back parts and see if there be a wound therein or no the wazir accordingly bared her backside and finding a knife wound there said yes o my lord there is a wound then said the king this is the witch of whom the devotee told me and there can be no doubt of it and bade cast her into the witch's well so they carried her thither at once as soon as it was night and the goldsmith knew that his plot had succeeded he repaired to the pit taking with him a purse of a thousand dinars and entering into converse with the water sat talking with him till a third part of the night was past when he broached the matter to him saying know o my brother that this girl is innocent of that they lay to her charge and that it was i brought this calamity upon her then he told him the whole story first and last adding take o my brother this purse of a thousand dinars and give me the damsel that i may carry her to my own land for these gold pieces will profit thee more than keeping her in prison moreover allah will requite thee for us and we too will both offer up prayers for thy prosperity and safety when the warder heard this story he marvelled with exceeding marvel at the device and its success then taking the money he delivered the girl to the goldsmith conditioning that he should not abide one hour with her in the city thereupon the goldsmith took the girl and fared on with her without ceasing till he reached his own country and so he won his wish see then o king said the damsel the malice of men and their wiles now thy wiseers hinder thee from doing me justice on thy son but to-morrow we shall stand both thou and i before the just judge and he shall do me justice on thee o king when the king heard this he commanded to put his son to death but the fifth wazir came in to him and kissing the ground before him said o mighty king delay and hasten not to slay thy son speed will oftentimes repentance breed and i fear for thee lest thou repent even as did the man who never laughed for the rest of his days and how was that o wazir asked the king quoth he i have heard tell o king this tale concerning the man who never laughed during the rest of his days there was once a man who was rich in lands and houses and monies and goods eunuchs and slaves and he died and went to the mercy of allah the most high leaving a young son who when he grew up gave himself to feasting and carousing and hearing music and singing and the loud laughter of parasites and he wasted his substance in gifts and prodigality till he had squandered all the money his father left him and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section 19 recording by rhonda fetterman section 20 of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 20. When it was the five hundred and eighty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the young man, when he had squandered all the money his father had left him, and naught thereof remained to him, betook himself to selling his slaves and handmaids lands and houses and spent the proceeds on likewise till he was reduced to beggary and must needs labour for his living 
he abode thus a year's space at the end of which time he was sitting one day under a wall awaiting who should hire him when behold there came up to him an old man of comely aspect and apparel and saluted him the young man asked o uncle hast thou known me aforetime and the other answered not so o my son i know thee not at all at all but i see the trace of gentle breeding on thee despite thy present case o uncle rejoined the poor man needs must fate and fortune be accomplished but o uncle o bright of blee hast thou any occasion wherein thou wouldst employ me said the other i wish o my son to employ thee in a slight manner what is it quoth the young man and quoth the stranger we are eleven old men in one house but we have none to serve us so an thou wilt stay and take service with us thou shalt have food and clothing to thy heart's content besides what cometh to thee of coin and other good and haply allah will restore thee thy fortune by our means replied the youth hearkening and obedience but i have a condition to impose on thee what is that o my son it is that thou keep our secret in what thou seest us do and if thou see us weep that thou question us not of the cause of our weeping it is well o uncle come with me o my son with the blessing of allah almighty so he followed him to the bath where the old man caused cleanse his body of the crusted dirt after which he sent one to fetch a handsome garment of linen and clad him therein then he carried him to his company which was in his domicile and the youth found a house lofty and spacious and strongly builded wherein were sitting chambers facing one another and saloons in each one a fountain of water with the birds warbling over it and windows on every side giving upon a fair garden within the house the old man brought him into one of the parlours which was variegated with many coloured marbles the ceiling thereof being decorated with ultramarine and glowing gold and the floor bespread with silken carpets here he found ten sheikhs in mourning apparel seated one opposite other weeping and wailing he marvelled at their case and purposed to ask the reason when he remembered the condition and held his peace then he who had brought him delivered to him a chest containing thirty thousand dinars and said to him o my son spend freely from this chest what is fitting for our entertainment and thine own and be thou faithful and remember that wherewith i charge thee i hear and i obey answered he and served them days and nights till one of them died whereupon his fellows washed him and shrouded him and buried him in a garden behind the house nor did death cease to take them one after other till there remained but the sheikh who had hired the youth for service then the two men old and young dwelt together in that house alone for years and years nor was there with them a third save allah the most high till the elder fell sick and when the younger despaired of his life he went up to him and condoling with him said o oh, uncle mine i have waited upon you twelve years and have not failed of my duties a single hour but have been loyal and faithful to you and served you with my might and main yes o oh, my son answered the old man thou hast served us well until all my comrades are gone to the mercy of allah to whom belong honour and glory and needs must i die also o oh, my lord said the other thou art in danger of death and i would fain have thee acquaint me with the cause of your weeping and wailing and of your unceasing mourning and lamentation and regrets o oh, my son answered the old man it concerns thee not to know this so importune me not of what i may not do for i have vowed to almighty allah that i would acquaint none of his creatures with this lest he be afflicted with what befell me and my comrades if then thou desire to be delivered from that into which we fell look thou open not yonder door and pointed to a certain part of the house but if thou have a mind to suffer what we have suffered 
then open it, and thou shalt learn the cause of that thou hast seen us do. And when as thou knowest it, thou shalt repent what time repentance will avail thee not. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and eighty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the surviving sheikh of the ten said to the youth, Beware how thou open yonder door, or thou shalt repent what time repentance will avail thee not. Then his sickness grew on him, and he accomplished his term, and departed life to the presence of his lord. And the young man washed him with his own hands, and shrouded him, and buried him by the side of his comrades, after which he abode alone in the place, and took possession of whatsoever was therein. With all he was uneasy and troubled concerning the case of the old men, till one day as he sat pondering the words of his dead master, and his injunction not to open the door, he suddenly bethought himself to go and look for it. So he rose up, and repaired to the part whither the dead man had pointed, and sought till, in a dark unfrequented corner, he found a little door, over which the spider had spun her webs, and which was fastened with four padlocks of steel. Seeing this he recalled the old man's warning, and restrained himself, and went away. And he held aloof from it seven days, whilst all the time his heart prompted him to open it. On the eighth day his curiosity got the better of him, and he said, Come what will, needs must I open the door, and see what will happen to me therefrom. Nothing can avert what is fated and foreordained of Allah the Most High, nor doth aught befall but by his will. So saying, he rose and broke the padlocks, and opening the door saw a narrow passage, which he followed for some three hours when, lo, he came out on the shore of a vast ocean, and fared on along the beach, marvelling at this main, whereof he had no knowledge, and turning right and left. Presently a great eagle swooped down upon him from the lift, and seizing him in its talons, flew away with him betwixt heaven and earth, till it came to an island in the midst of the sea, where it cast him down and flew away. The youth was dazed and knew not whither he should wend, but after a few days as he sat pondering his case, he caught sight of the sails of a ship in the middlemost of the main, as it were a star in the sky. And his heart clave to it, so haply his deliverance might be therein. He continued gazing at the ship until it drew nigh, when he saw that it was a foist builded all of ivory and ebony, inlaid with glistening gold made fast by nails of steel, with oars of sandal and line aloes. In it were ten damsels, high bosom maids, as they were moons, and when they saw him they came ashore to him, and kissed his hands, saying, Thou art the king, the bridegroom. Then there accosted him a young lady, as she were the sun shining in sky serene, bearing in hand a silken napkin, wherein were a royal robe and a crown of gold set with all manner rubies and pearls. She threw the robe over him and set the crown upon his head, after which the damsels bore him on their arms to the foist, where he found all kinds of silken carpets and hangings of various colors. Then they spread the sails and stretched out into mid-ocean. Quoth the young man, Indeed, when they put to sea with me, me seemed it was a dream, and I knew not whither they were wending with me. Presently we drew near to land, and I saw the shore full of troops none knoweth their number save Allah, extolled and exalted be he, and all were magnificently arrayed and clad in complete steel. As soon as the vessel had made fast the land, they brought me five marked horses of noble breeds, housed and saddled with gold, inlaid with all manner of pearls and high-priced bezel stones. I chose out one of them and mounted it, whilst they led the four others before me. Then they raised the banners and the standards over my head, 
whilst the troops range themselves right and left and we set out with drums beating and cymbals clashing and rode on whilst i debated in myself whether i were in sleep or on wake and we never ceased faring i believing not in that my estate but taking all this for the imbroglio of a dream till we drew near to the green mead full of palaces and gardens and trees and streams and blooms and birds chanting the praises of allah the one the victorious hereupon behold an army sallied out from amid the palaces and gardens as it were the torrent when it poureth down and the host overflowed the mead these troops halted at a little distance from me and presently there rode forth from amongst them a king preceded by some of his chief officers on foot when he came up to the young man saith the tale-teller he dismounted also and the two saluted each other after the goodliest fashion then said the king come with us for thou art my guest so they took horse again and rode on stirrup touching stirrup in great and stately procession conversing as they went till they came to the royal palace where they alighted together and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the five hundred and ninetieth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the two rode together in stately procession till they entered the palace when the king taking the young man by the hand led him into a domed room followed by his suite and making him sit down on a throne of gold seated himself beside him then he unbound the swath from his lower face and behold the king was a young lady like the splendid sun shining in the sheeny sky perfect in beauty and loveliness brilliancy and grace arrogance and all perfection the youth looked upon this singular blessing and embodied boon and was lost in wonder at her charms and comeliness and seemly head and at the splendour and affluence he saw about him when she said know o king that i am the queen of this land and that all the troops thou hast seen whether horse or foot are women there is no man amongst them for in this our state the men delve and sow and ear and occupy themselves with the tillage of the earth and the building of towns and other mechanical crafts and useful arts whilst the women govern and fill the great offices of state and bear arms at this the youth marvelled with exceeding marvel and as they were in discourse behold in came the wazir who was a tall grey-haired old woman of venerable semblance and majestic aspect and it was told him that this was the minister quoth the queen to her bring us the kazi and witnesses so she went out to do this and the queen turning to him conversed with him in friendly fashion and enforced herself to reassure his awe of her and do away his shame with speech blander than the zephyr saying art thou content to be to me barren and i to thee femme thereupon he arose and would have kissed ground between her hands but she forbade him and he replied saying o my lady i am the least of thy slaves who serve thee seest thou all these servants and soldiers and riches and hoards and treasures asked she and he answered yes quoth she all these are at thy commandment to dispose of them and give and bestow as seemeth good to thee then she pointed to a closed door and said all these things are at thy disposal save yonder door that shalt thou not open and if thou open it thou shalt repent when repentance will avail thee not so beware and again i say beware hardly had she made an end of speaking when the waziress entered followed by the kazai and witnesses all old women with their hair streaming over their shoulders and of reverend and majestic presence and the queen bade them draw up the contract of marriage between herself and the young man accordingly they performed the marriage ceremony and the queen made a great bride feast to which she bade all the troops 
and after they had eaten and drunken, he went in unto his bride, and found her a maid virginal. So he did away her hymen, and abode with her seven years in all joyance and solace and delight of life. Till one day of the days he bethought himself of the forbidden door, and said in himself, Except there were within treasures greater and grander than any I have seen, she had not forbidden me therefrom. So he rose and opened the door, when, lo, behind it was the very bird which had brought him from the seashore to the island. And it said to him, No welcome to a face that shall never prosper. When he saw it and heard what it said, he fled from it. But it followed him, and seizing him in its talons, flew with him an hour's journey betwixt heaven and earth, till it set him down in the place whence it had first carried him off, and flew away. When he came to his senses, he remembered his late estate, great, grand, and glorious, and the troops which rode before him, and his lordly rule, and all the honour and fair fortune he had lost, and fell to weeping and wailing. He abode two months on the seashore, where the bird had set him down, hoping yet to return to his wife, till as he sat one night wakeful, mourning and musing, behold, he heard one speaking, albeit he saw no one, and saying, How great were the delights! Alas, far from thee is the return of that which is past! When he heard this, he redoubled in his regrets, and despaired of recovering his wife and his fair estate that was. So he returned, weary and broken-hearted, to the house where he had dwelt with the old men, and knew that they had fared even as he, and that this was the cause of their shedding tears and lamenting their lot, wherefore he ever after held them excused. Then, being overcome with chagrin and concern, he took to his chamber and gave himself up to mourning and lamentation. And he ceased not crying and complaining, and left eating and drinking, and pleasant sense and merriment. Nor did he laugh once till the day of his death, when they buried him beside the sheikhs. See then, O king, continued the wazir, what cometh of precipitance? Verily it is unpraiseworthy, and bequeatheth repentance, and in this I give thee true advice and loyal counsel. When the king heard this story, he turned from slaying his son, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 20. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Section 21 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 21. When it was the five hundred and ninety-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the king heard this story he turned from slaying his son. But on the sixth day the favorite came in to him, handing a naked knife in hand, and said to him, Know, O my lord, that except thou hearken to my complaint and protect thy right and thine honor against these thy ministers, who are banded together against me, to do me wrong, I will kill myself with this knife, and my blood will testify against thee on the day of doom. Indeed, they pretend that women are full of tricks and malice and perfidy, and they design thereby to defeat me of my due and hinder the king from doing me justice. But behold, I will prove to thee that men are more perfidious than women by the story of a king among the kings, and how he gained access to the wife of a certain merchant. And what passed between them? asked the king. And she answered, I have heard tell, O august king, a tale of the king's son and the merchant's wife. A certain merchant who was addicted to jealousy had a wife that was a model of beauty and loveliness 
and of the excess of his fear and jealousy of her, he would not abide with her in any town, but built her a pavilion without the city, apart from all other buildings. And he raised its height and strengthened its doors, and provided them with curious locks. And when he had occasion to go into the city, he locked the doors and hung the keys about his neck. One day, when the merchant was abroad, the king's son of that city came forth to take his pleasure and solace in the open country without the walls, and seeing the solitary pavilion, stood still to examine it for a long while. At last he caught sight of a charming lady looking and leaning out of one of the windows, and being smitten with amazement at her grace and charms, cast about for a means of getting to her, but could find none. So he called up one of his pages, who brought him ink case and paper, and wrote her a letter, setting forth his condition for love of her. Then he set it on the pile point of an arrow, and shot it at the pavilion, and it fell in the garden, where the lady was then walking with her maidens. She said to one of the girls, Hasten and bring me yon letter, for she could read writing and when she had read it and understood what he said in it of his love and passion yearning and longing she wrote him a merciful reply to the effect that she was smitten with a yet fiercer desire for him and then threw the letter down to him from one of the windows of the pavilion when he saw her he picked up the reply and after reading it came under the window and said to her let me down a thread that i may send thee this key which do thou take and keep by thee. So she let down a thread, and he tied the key to it. Then he went away, and repairing to one of his father's wazirs, complained to him of his passion for the lady, and that he could not live without her. And the minister said, And how dost thou bid me contrive? Quoth the prince, I would have thee set me in a chest, and commit it to the merchant, feigning to him that it is thine, and desiring him to keep it for thee in his country house some days that i may have my will of her then do thou demand it back from him the wazir answered with love and gladness so the prince returned to his palace and fixing the padlock the key whereof he had given the lady on a chest he had by him entered therein then the wazir locked it upon him and setting it on a mule carried it to the pavilion of the merchant who, seeing the minister, came forth to him and kissed his hands, saying, Belike our lord the wazir hath some need or business which we may have the pleasure and honour of accomplishing for him? Quoth the minister, I would have thee set this chest in the safest and best place within thy house, and keep it till I seek it of thee. So the merchant made the porters carry it inside, and set it down in one of his store closets, after which he went out on business. As soon as he was gone, his wife arose and went up to the chest, and unlocked it with the key the king's son had given her, whereupon there came forth a youth like the moon. When she saw him, she donned her richest raiment, and carried him to her sitting saloon, where they abode seven days, eating and drinking and making merry. And as often as her husband came home, she put the prince back into the chest and locked it upon him. One day the king asked for his son, and the wazir hurried off to the merchant's place of business, and sought of him the chest. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and ninety-second night, she said it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the wazir reached the merchant's counting-house, he asked for the box. The man accordingly repaired in haste to his pavilion, contrary to his custom, and knocked at the door. When his wife was ware of him, she hurried the prince back into the chest, but in her confusion forgot to lock it. The merchant bade the porters take it up and carry it to his house in the town. So they took up the box by the lid, whereupon it flew open, and, lo, the prince was lying within. When the merchant saw him and knew him for the king's son, he went out to the wazir and said to him, Go in thou and take the king's son, for none of us may lay hands on him. 
so the minister went in, and taking the prince, went away with him. As soon as they were gone, the merchant put away his wife, and swore that he would never marry again. And, continued the damsel, I have heard tell also, O king, a tale of the page who feigned to know the speech of birds. A certain man of rank once entered the slave market, and saw a page being cried for sale. So he bought him, and carrying him home, said to his wife, Take good care of him. The lad abode there for a while, till one day the man said to his wife, Go forth to-morrow to the garden, and take thy solace therein, and amuse thyself, and enjoy thyself. And she replied, With love and gladness. Now when the page heard this, he made ready in secret meat and drink, and fruits and dessert, and sallied forth with them privily that night to the garden, where he laid the meat under one tree, the wine under another, and the fruit and conserves under a third in the way his mistress must pass. When morning morrowed, the husband bade him accompany the lady to that garden carrying with him all the provisions required for the day. So she took horse and riding thither with him, dismounted and entered. Presently, as they were walking about, a crow croaked, and the page said, Thou sayest sooth, whereupon his mistress asked him, Dost thou know what the crow said? And he answered, Yes, O my lady, he said, under yonder tree is meat, go and eat it. So she said, I see thou really dost understand them. Then she went up to the tree, and finding a dish of meat ready dressed, was assured that the youth told the truth, and marvelled with exceeding marvel. They ate of the meat and walked about a while, taking their pleasure in the garden, till the crow croaked a second time. And the page again replied, Thou sayest sooth. What said he? quoth the lady, and quoth the page, O oh, my lady, he saith that under such a tree are a gugglet of water flavoured with musk and a pitcher of old wine. So she went up with him to the tree, and finding the wine and water there, redoubled in wonderment, and the page was magnified in her eyes. They sat down and drank then arose and walked in another part of the garden. Presently the crow croaked again, and the page said, Thou sayest sooth, said the lady. What saith he now? And the page replied, He saith that under yonder tree are fruits fresh and dried. So they went thither and found all as he said, and sat down and ate. Then they walked about again till the crow croaked a fourth time, whereupon the page took up a stone and threw it at him. Quoth she, What said he that thou shouldst stone him? O oh, my lady, answered he, he said what I cannot tell thee. Say on, rejoined she, and be not abashed in my presence, for there is naught between me and thee. But he ceased not to say, No, and she pressed him to speak, till at last she conjured him to tell her. And he answered, The crow said to me, Do with thy lady even as doth her husband. When she heard his words, she laughed till she fell backward, and said, This is a light matter, and I may not gainsay thee therein. So saying, she went up to a tree, and spreading the carpet under it, lay down, and called to him to come and do her need, when, lo! Her husband, who had followed them unawares and saw this, called out to the page, saying, Hark ye, boy, what ails thy mistress to lie there weeping? Answered the page, O oh, my lord, she fell off the tree and was killed, and none but Allah, be he extolled and exalted, restored her to thee. Wherefore she lay down a while to recover herself by rest. When the lady saw her husband standing by her head, she rose and made a show of weakness and pain, saying, O oh, my back, O oh, my sides, come to my help, O oh, my friends, I shall never survive this. So her husband was deceived, and said to the page, Fetch thy mistress's horse, and set her thereon. Then he carried her home, the boy holding one stirrup and the man the other, and saying, 
Allah vouchsafe thee ease and recovery. These then, O king, said the damsel, are some instances of the craft of men and their perfidy. Wherefore let not thy wazirs turn thee from succouring me and doing me justice. Then she wept, and when the king saw her weeping, for she was the dearest to him of all his slave-girls, he once more commanded to put his son to death. But the sixth minister entered, and kissing ground before him, said, May the Almighty advance the king. Verily I am a loyal counsellor to thee, in that I counsel thee to deal deliberately in the matter of thy son. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and ninety-third night, she said it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the sixth wazir said, O king, deal deliberately in the matter of thy son, for falsehood is as smoke, and fact is built on base which shall not be broken. Yea, and the light of sooth dispelleth the night of untruth. Know that the perfidy of women is great, even as saith Allah the Most High in his holy book. Verily the malice of you is great, and indeed a tale hath reached me that a certain woman befooled the chiefs of the state on such wise as never did any before her. Asked the king, And how was that? And the wazir answered, I have heard tell a tale, O king, as follows concerning the lady and her five suitors. A woman of the daughters of the merchants was married to a man who was a great traveller. It chanced once that he set out for a far country and was absent so long that his wife, for pure ennui, fell in love with a handsome young man of the sons of the merchants, and they loved each other with exceeding love. One day the youth quarrelled with another man, who lodged a complaint against him with the chief of police, and he cast him into prison. When the news came to the merchant's wife, his mistress, she well-nigh lost her wits. Then she arose, and donning her richest clothes, repaired to the house of the chief of police. She saluted him, and presented a written petition to this purport. He thou hast clapped in jail is my brother, such and such, who fell out with such an one, and those who testified against him bore false witness. He hath been wrongfully imprisoned, and I have none other to come into me, nor to provide for my support. Therefore I beseech thee of thy grace to release him. When the magistrate had read the paper, he cast his eyes on her, and fell in love with her forthright. So he said to her, Go into the house, till I bring him before me. Then I will send for thee, and thou shalt take him. O oh, my lord, replied she, I have none to protect me save Almighty Allah. I am a stranger, and may not enter any man's abode. Quoth the Wali, I will not let him go, except thou come to my home, and I take my will of thee. Rejoined she, If it must be so, thou must needs come to my lodging, and sit and sleep the siesta, and rest the whole day there. And where is thy abode? asked he. And she answered, in such a place, and appointed him for such a time. Then she went out from him, leaving his heart taken with love of her, and she repaired to the Kazi of the city, to whom she said, O oh, our lord the Kazi! He exclaimed, Yes, and she continued, Look into my case, and thy reward be with Allah the Most High. Quoth he, Who hath wronged thee? And quoth she, O oh, my lord, I have a brother, and I have none but that one, and it is on his account that I come to thee. Because the Wali hath imprisoned him for a criminal, and men have borne false witness against him, that he is a wrongdoer, and I beseech thee to intercede for him with the chief of police. When the Kazi looked on her, he fell in love with her forthright, and said to her, Enter the house and rest a while with my handmaids, whilst I send to the Wali to release thy brother. If I knew the money fine which is upon him, I would pay it out of my own purse, 
so I may have my desire of thee, for thou pleasest me with thy sweet speech. Quoth she, If thou, O my lord, do thus, we must not blame others. Quoth he, And thou wilt not come in when thy ways. Then said she, And thou wilt have it so, O our lord, it will be privier and better in my place than in thine for here are slave-girls and eunuchs and goers in and comers out and indeed i am a woman who wotteth not of this fashion but need compelleth asked the kazi and where is thy house and she answered in such a place and appointed him for the same day and time as the chief of police then she went out from him to the wazir to whom she preferred her petition for the release from prison of her brother who was absolutely necessary to her but he also required her of herself saying suffer me to have my will of thee and i will set thy brother free quoth she and thou wilt have it so be it in my house for there it will be privier both for me and for thee it is not far distant and thou knowest that which behoveth us women of cleanliness and adornment asked he where is thy house in such a place answered she and appointed him for the same time as the two others then she went out from him to the king of the city and told him her story and sought of him her brother's release who imprisoned him inquired he and she replied "'Twas the chief of police. "'When the king heard her speech, "'it transpierced his heart with the arrows of love, "'and he bade her enter the palace with him, "'that he might send to the kazi and release her brother. "'Quoth she, "'O king, this thing is easy to thee, "'whether I will or nil. "'And if the king will indeed have this of me, "'it is of my good fortune.' but if he come to my house he will do me the more honour by setting step therein even as saith the poet o my friends have ye seen or have ye heard of his visit whose virtues i hold so high quoth the king we will not cross thee in this so she appointed him for the same time as the three others and told him where her house was and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section twenty one. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Section twenty two of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jacob Starr The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton, Section 22. When it was the five hundred and ninety-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the woman told the king where her house was, and appointed him for the same time as the wali, the kazi, and the wazir. Then she left him, and betaking herself to a man, which was a carpenter, said to him, I would have thee make me a cabinet with four compartments, one above other, each with its door for locking up. Let me know thy hire, and I will give it thee. Replied he, my price will be four dinars, but, O noble lady, and well protected, if thou wilt vouchsafe me thy favours, I will ask nothing of thee. Rejoined she, And there be no help but that thou have it so, then make thou five compartments with their padlocks. And she appointed him to bring it exactly on the day required. Said he, It is well, sit down, O my lady, and I will make it for thee forthright, and after I will come to thee at my leisure. So she sat down by him, whilst he fell to work on the cabinet, and when he had made an end of it, she chose to see it at once carried home and set up in the sitting-chamber. Then she took four gowns and carried them to the dyer, who dyed them each of a different color, after which she applied herself to making ready meat and drink, fruits, flowers, and perfumes. Now when the appointed trysting day came, she donned her costliest dress, and adorned herself, and scented herself, 
then spread the sitting-room with various kinds of rich carpets and sat down to await who should come and behold the kazi was the first to appear devancing the rest and when she saw him she rose to her feet and kissed the ground before him then taking him by the hand made him sit down by her on the couch and lay with him and fell to jesting and toying with him by and by he would have her do his desire but she said o oh my lord doff thy clothes and turban and assume this yellow cassock and this headkerchief whilst i bring thee meat and drink and after thou shalt win thy will so saying she took his clothes and turban and clad him in the cassock and kerchief but hardly had she done this when lo there came a knocking at the door asked he who is that rapping at the door and she answered my husband quoth the kazi what is to be done and where shall i go quoth she fear nothing i will hide thee in this cabinet and he do as seemeth good to thee so she took him by the hand and pushing him into the lowest compartment locked the door upon him then she went to the house door where she found the wali so she bust ground before him and taking his hand brought him into the saloon where she made him sit down and said to him o oh my lord this house is thy house this place is thy place and i am thy handmaid thou shalt pass all this day with me wherefore do thou doff thy clothes and don this red gown for it is a sleeping gown so she took away his clothes and made him assume the red gown and set on his head an old patched rag she had by her after which she sat by him on the divan and she sported him while he toyed with her a while till he put out his hand to her whereupon she said to him o oh, our lord this day is thy day and none shall share in it with thee but first of thy favour and benevolence write me an order for my brother's release from jail that my heart may be at ease quoth he hearkening and obedience on my head and eyes be it and wrote a letter to his treasurer saying as soon as this communication shall reach thee do thou set such an one free without stay or delay neither answer the bearer a word then he sealed it and she took it from him after which she began to toy again with him on the divan when behold someone knocked at the door he asked who is that and she answered my husband what shall i do said he and she enter this cabinet till i send him away and return to thee so she clapped him into the second compartment from the bottom and padlocked the door on him and meanwhile the kazi heard all they said then she went to the house door and opened it whereupon lo the wazir entered she bust the ground before him and received him with all honour and worship saying o my lord thou exaltest us by coming to our house Allah never deprive us of the light of thy countenance. Then she seated him on the divan, and said to him, O my lord, doff thy heavy dress and turban, and don these lighter vestments. So he put off his clothes and turban, and she clad him in a blue cassock and a tall red bonnet, and said to him, Erst thy garb was that of the wazirate, so leave it to its own time, and don this light gown, which is better fitted for carousing and making merry and sleep thereupon she began to play with him and he with her and he would have done his desire of her but she put him off saying o oh my lord this shall not fail us as they were talking there came a knocking at the door and the wazir asked her who is that to which she answered my husband quoth he what is to be done quoth she enter this cabinet till i get rid of him and come back to thee and fear thou nothing so she put him in the third compartment and locked the door on him after which she went out and opened the house door and lo and behold in came the king as soon as she saw him she kissed ground before him and taking him by the hand led him into the saloon and seated him on the divan at the upper end then she said to him verily o king thou dost us high honour and if we brought thee to gift the world and all that therein is it would not be worth a single one of thy steps uswards and shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the five hundred and ninety-fifth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the king entered the lady's house she said to him had we brought thee to gift the world and all which is therein it would not be worth a single one of thy steps uswards and when he had taken his seat on the divan she said 
give me leave to speak one word. Say what thou wilt, answered he. And she said, O my lord, take thine ease, and doff thy dress and turban. Now his clothes were worth a thousand dinars, and when he put them off, she clad him in a patched gown, worth at the very most ten dirhams, and fell to talking and jesting with him, all this while the folk in the cabinet hearing everything that passed, but not daring to say a word. Presently the king put his hand to her neck, and sought to do his desire of her, when she said, This thing shall not fail us, but I had first promised myself to entertain thee in this sitting-chamber, and I have that which shall content thee. Now as they were speaking, some one knocked at the door, and he asked her, Who is that? My husband, answered she, and he, Make him go away of his own good will, or I will fare forth to him and send them away per force, replied she. Nay, O my lord, have patience till I send him away by my skilful contrivance. And I, how shall I do? inquired the king, whereupon she took him by the hand, and making him enter the fourth compartment of the cabinet, locked it upon him. Then she went out and opened the house door, and behold, the carpenter entered and saluted her. Quoth she, What manner of thing is this cabinet thou hast made me? What aileth thee, O my lady? asked he. And she answered, the top compartment is too straight. Rejoined he, Not so. And she, Go in thyself and see, it is not wide enough for thee. Quoth he, It is wide enough for four. And entered the fifth compartment, whereupon she locked the door on him. Then she took the letter of the chief of police, and carried it to the treasurer, who, having read and understood it, kissed it and delivered her lover to her. She told him all she had done, and he said, and how shall we act now? She answered, We will remove hence to another city, for after this work there is no tarrying for us here. So Twain packed up what goods they had, loading them on camels, set out forthright for another city. Meanwhile the five abode each in his compartment of the cabinet without eating or drinking three whole days, during which time they held their water until at last the carpenter could retain his no longer, so he staled on the king's head, and the king urined on the wazir's head, and the wazir piddled on the wali, and the wali pissed on the head of the kazi. Whereupon the judge cried out and said, What nastiness is this? Doth not what strait we are in suffice us, but you must make water upon us? The chief of police recognized the kazi's voice, and answered, saying aloud, Allah increase thy reward, O kazi! And when the kazi heard him, he knew him for the wali. Then the chief of police lifted up his voice and said, What means this nastiness? And the wazir answered, saying, Allah increase thy reward, O Ali! Whereupon he knew him to be the minister. When the wazir lifted up his voice and said, What means this nastiness? But when the king heard and recognized his minister's voice, he held his peace and concealed his affair. Then said the wazir, May God damn this woman for her dealing with us. She hath brought hither all the chief officers of the state, except the king. Quoth the king, Hold your peace, for I was first to fall into the toils of this lewd strumpet. Whereat cried the carpenter, And I, what have I done? I made her a cabinet for four gold pieces, and when I came to seek my hire, she tricked me into entering this compartment, and locked the door on me and they fell to talking with one another, diverting the king and doing away his chagrin. Presently the neighbors came up to the house, and, seeing it deserted, said one to other, But yesterday our neighbor, the wife of such an one, was in it, but now no sound is to be heard therein, nor is soul to be seen. Let us break open the doors, and see how the case stands, lest it comes to the ears of the wali or the king, and we be cast into prison, and regret not doing this thing before. So they broke open the doors and entered the saloon, where they saw a large wooden cabinet and heard men within groaning for hunger and thirst. Then said one of them, Is there a Janai in this cabinet? And his fellow, Let us keep fuel about it and burn it with fire. When the Kazi heard this, he bawled out to them, Do it not! And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and ninety-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the neighbors proposed to heap fuel about the cabinet, and to burn it, the kazi bawled out to them, Do it not! And they said one to another, 
Verily the jinn make believe to be mortals and speak with men's voices. Thereupon the Kazi repeated somewhat of the sublime Koran and said to the neighbors, Draw near to the cabinet wherein we are. So they drew near, and he said, I am so and so the Kazi, and ye are such an one and such an one, and we are here a company. Quoth the neighbors, Who brought you here? And he told them the whole case from beginning to end. Then they fetched a carpenter, who opened the five doors and let out Kazi, Wazir, Wali, King, and Carpenter in their queer disguises, and each, when he saw how the others were accoutred, fell a-laughing at them. Now she had taken away all their clothes, so every one of them sent out to his people for fresh clothes, and put them on, and went out, covering himself therewith from the sight of the folk. "'Consider therefore, O our lord, the king,' said the wazir, "'what a trick this woman played off upon the folk, and I have heard tale also a tale of the three wishes, or the man who longed to see the knight of power. A certain man had longed all his life to look upon the knight of power, and one night it befell that he gazed at the sky and saw the angels and heaven's gates thrown open, and he beheld all things prostrating themselves before their lord, each in its several stead. So he said to his wife, Hark ye, such an one, verily Allah hath shown me the knight of power, and it hath been proclaimed to me, from the invisible world, that three prayers will be granted unto me, so I will consult thee for counsel as to what shall I ask. Quoth she, O man, the perfection of man and his delight is in his prickle, therefore do thou pray Allah to great in thy yard and magnify it. So he lifted up his hands to heaven and said, O Allah, great in my yard and magnify it. Hardly had he spoken when his tool became as big as a column, and he could neither sit nor stand nor move about, nor even stir from his stead. And when he would have carnally known his wife, she fled before him from place to place. So he said to her, O oh, accursed woman, what is to be done? This is thy list by reason of thy lust. She replied, No, by Allah, I did not ask for this length and huge bulk, for which the gate of a street were too straight. Pray heaven to make it less. So he raised his eyes to heaven and said, O oh Allah, rid me of this thing and deliver me therefrom. And immediately his prickle disappeared altogether and he became clean smooth. When his wife saw this, she said, I have no occasion for thee. Now thou art become pegless as a eunuch, shaven and shorn. And he answered her, saying, All this comes of thine ill-omened counsel and thine imbecile judgment. I had three prayers accepted of Allah, wherewith I might have gotten me my good, both in this world and in the next, and now two wishes are gone in pure waste by lewd will, and there remaineth but one. Quoth she, Pray Allah the Most High to restore thee thy yard as it was. So he prayed to his lord, and his prickle was restored to its first estate. Thus the man lost his three wishes by the ill counsel and lack of wit in the woman. And this, O king, said the wazir, have I told thee that thou mightest be certified of the thoughtlessness of women and their inconsequence and silliness, and see what cometh of hearkening to their counsel? Wherefore be not persuaded by them to slay thy son, thy heart's core, who shall cause thy remembrance to survive thee. The king gave ear to his minister's words, and forbore to put his son to death. But on the seventh day the damsel came in shrieking, and, after lighting a great fire in the king's presence, made as she would cast herself therein whereupon they laid hands on her and brought her before him. He asked her, Why hast thou done this? And she answered, Except thou do me justice on thy son, I will cast myself into this very fire and accuse thee of this on the day of resurrection, for I am aweary of my life, and before coming into thy presence I wrote my last will and testament, and gave alms of my goods and resolved upon death, and thou wilt repent with all repentance, even as did the king of having punished the pious woman who kept the hammam. Quoth the king, How is that? And quoth she, I have heard tell, O king, this tale concerning the stolen necklace. There was once a devotee, a recluse, a woman who had devoted herself to religion. Now she used to resort to a certain king's palace, whose dwellers were blessed by her presence, and she was held of them in high honor. One day she entered that palace, according to her custom, and sat down beside the king's wife. Presently the queen gave her a necklace worth a thousand dinars, saying, Keep this for me, O woman, whilst I go to the hammam. So she entered the bath, which was in the palace, and the pious woman remaining in the place where the queen was, and awaiting her return, laid the necklace on the prayer carpet, and stood up to pray. As she was thus engaged, there came a magpie, which snatched up the necklace while she went out to obey the call of nature, and, carrying it off, 
hid it inside a crevice in a corner of the palace walls. When the queen came out of the bath, she sought the necklace of the recluse, who also searched for it, but found it not, nor could light on any trace of it. So she said to the king's wife, By Allah, O my daughter, none hath been with me. When thou gavest me the necklace, I laid it on the prayer carpet, and I know not if one of the servants saw it and took it without my heed, whilst I was engaged in prayer. Almighty Allah only knoweth what is come of it. When the king heard what had happened, he bade his queen to put the bathwoman to the question by fire and grievous blows. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 22. Recording by Jacob Starr. Salt Lake City, Utah. November 18th, 2011. Section 23 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. J. Frank. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6 by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 23. When it was the five hundred and ninety-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the king bade his queen question the bathwoman with fire and grievous blows, they tortured her with all manner tortures, but could not bring her to confess or to accuse any. Then he commanded to cast her into prison, and manacle and fetter her. And they did as he bade. One day after this, as the king sat in the inner court of his palace, with the queen by his side and water flowing round him, he saw the pie fly into a crevice in a corner of the wall and pull out the necklace. Whereupon he cried out to a damsel who was with him, and she caught the bird and took the necklace from it. By this the king knew that the pious bathwoman had been wronged and repented of that he had done with her. So he sent for her to the presence and fell to kissing her head and with many tears sought pardon of her. Moreover, he commanded much treasure to be given to her, but she refused and would none of it. However, she forgave him and went away, swearing never again to enter any one's house. So she betook herself to wandering in the mountains and valleys and worshipped God until she died and Almighty Allah have mercy upon her. And for an instance of the malice of the male sex, continued the damsel, I have heard, O king, tell this tale of the two pigeons. A pair of pigeons once stored up wheat and barley in their nest during the winter, and when the summer came, the grain shriveled and became less, so the male pigeon said to his wife, Thou hast eaten of this grain. Replied she, No, by Allah, I have never touched it. But he believed not her words, and beat her with his wings, and pecked her with his bill, till he killed her. When the cold season returned, the corn swelled out and became as before, whereupon he knew that he had slain his wife wrongously and wickedly, and he repented when as repentance availed him not. Then he lay down by her side, mourning over her and weeping for grief, and left meat and drink till he fell sick and died. But, added the damsel, I know a story of the malice of men more extraordinary than any of these. Quoth the king, Let us hear what thou hast to tell. And quoth she, I have heard tell, O king, this story 
of Prince Bairam and the Princess Al Datma. There once was a king's daughter who had no equal in her time for beauty and loveliness and symmetrical stature and grace, brilliancy, amorous lace, and the art of ravishing the wits of the masculine race. And her name was Al Datma. She used to boast, Indeed, there is none like me in this age. Nor was there one more accomplished than she in horsemanship and martial exercises and all that behooveth the cavalier. So all the king's sons sought her to wife, but she would take none of them, saying, No man shall marry me, except he overcome me at lunge of lance and stroke of sword in fair field and patent plain. If any can do this, I will willingly wed him. But if I overcome him, I will take his horse and clothes and arms and write with fire upon his forehead, this is the freed man of al Datma. Now the sons of the kings flocked to her from every quarter far and near, and she overcame them and put them to shame, stripping them of their arms and branding them with fire. Presently the son of a king of the kings of the Persians by name Bairam ibn Taji heard of her, and journeyed from afar to her father's court, bringing with him men and horses and great store of wealth and royal treasures. When he drew near the city, he sent her parent a rich present, and the king came out to meet him and honored him with the utmost honor. Then the king's son sent a message to him by his vizier, demanding his daughter's hand in marriage. But the king answered, saying, O oh, my son, as regards my daughter al -Datma, I have no power over her, for she hath sworn by her soul to marry none except he overcome her in the listed field. Quoth the prince, I journeyed hither from my father's court with no other object but this. I came here to woo and for thine alliance to sue. Quoth the king, Thou shalt meet her to-morrow. So next day he sent to bid his daughter, who, making ready for battle, donned her harness of war, and the folk, hearing of the coming joust, flocked from all sides to the field. Presently the princess rode into the lists, armed cap a pied and belted with visor down, and the Persian king's son came out single-handed to meet her, equipped at all points after the fairest of fashions. Then they drove at each other and fought a great while, wheeling and falsing, advancing and retreating, till the princess, finding in him such courage and cavalries as she had seen in none else, began to fear for herself lest he put her to shame before the bystanders and knew that he would assuredly overcome her. So she resolved to trick him, and, raising her visor, lo, her face appeared more brilliant than the full moon, which, when he saw, he was confounded by her beauty, and his strength failed, and his spirit faltered. When she perceived this, she fell upon him unawares in his moment of weakness, and tear him from his saddle, and he became in her hands as he were a sparrow in the clutches of an eagle, knowing not what was done with him for amazement and confusion. So she took his steed and clothes and armor, and branding him with fire let him wend his ways. When he recovered from his stupor, he abode several days without meat or drink or sleep, for despite and love of the girl which had taken hold upon his heart. 
then he sent a letter by certain of his slaves to his father advising him that he could not return home till he had won his will of the princess or died for want of her when his sire got the letter he was sore concerned for his son and would have succored him by sending troops and soldiers but his wazirs dissuaded him from this and exhorted him to patience so he committed his affair to almighty allah meanwhile the prince cast about for a means of coming to his desire and presently disguising himself as a decrepit old man with a white beard over his own black beard repaired to a garden of the princess where she used to walk most of her days here he sought out the gardener and said to him i am a stranger from a far country and from my youth upwards i have been a gardener and in the grafting of trees and the culture of fruits and flowers and care of the vine none is more skilled than i when the gardener heard this he rejoiced in him with exceeding joy and carried him into the garden where he commended him to his underlings and the prince betook himself to the service of the garden and the tending of the trees and the bettering of their fruits and improving the persian water wheels and disposing the irrigation channels one day as he was thus employed lo he saw some slaves enter the garden leading mules laden with carpets and vessels and asked them the meaning of this to which they answered the princess is minded to take her pleasure when he heard these words he hastened to his lodging and fetching some of the jewels and ornaments he had brought with him from home sat down in the garden and spread somewhat of them out before him, shaking and making a show of extreme old age. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the five hundred and ninety-eighth night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the son of the Persian king, after disguising himself as an old man shotten in years and taking a seat in the garden, spread out somewhat of the jewels and ornaments before him and made a show of shaking and trembling as if for decrepitude and the weakness of extreme senility. After an hour or so, a company of damsels and eunuchs entered with the princess in their midst as she were the moon among the stars and dispersed about the garden plucking the fruits and diverting themselves presently they espied a man sitting under one of the trees and making towards him who was the prince found him a very old man whose hands and feet trembled for decrepitude, and before him store of precious jewels and royal ornaments. So they marveled at his case, and asked him what he did there with the jewels. When he answered, With these trinkets I would fain buy me to wife one of you. They laughed together at him, and said, if one of us married thee, what wilt thou do with her? Said he, I will give her one kiss and divorce her. Then quoth the princess, I give thee this damsel to wife. So he rose and coming up to her, leaning on his staff and shivering and staggering, kissed her and gave her the jewels and ornaments whereat she rejoiced, and they, laughing at him, went their way. Next day they came again to the garden, and finding him seated in the same place, with more jewels and ornaments than before spread in front of him, asked him, O oh, Sheikh, what wilt thou do with this jewelry? 
and he answered, saying, I wish therewith to take one of you to wife, even as yesterday. So the princess said, I marry thee to this damsel. And he came up to her and kissed her and gave her the jewels, and they all went their ways. But seeing such generosity to her handmaids, the princess said to herself, I have more right to all these fine things than these baggages, and no harm can betide me. So when morning morrowed, she went down from her chamber singly into the garden, in the habit of one of her damsels, and presenting herself privily before the prince, said to him, O oh, Sheik, the king's daughter hath sent me to thee, that thou mayest marry me. He looked at her and knew her. So he answered, With love and gladness, and gave her jewels and ornaments of the finest and costliest. Then he rose to kiss her, and she off her guard and fearing nothing, but when he came up to her, he suddenly laid hold of her with a strong hand, and instantly throwing her down, on the ground abated her maiden head. Then he pulled the beard from his face and said to her, Dost thou not know me? asked she. Who art thou? and he answered, I am Bairam, the king's son of Persia, who have changed my favor and am become a stranger to my people and estate for thy sake and have lavished my treasures for thy love. So she rose from under him in silence, and answered not his address, nor spake a word of reply to him, being dazed for what had befallen her, and seeing nothing better than to be silent for fear of shame. And she bethought herself and said, If I kill myself it will be useless. And if I do him die, his death will profit me not. And presently added, Nothing will serve me but that I elope with him to his own country. Then she gathered together her monies and treasures, and sent to him, acquainting him therewith, to the intent that he also might equip himself with his wealth and needs. And they agreed upon an night on which to depart. So at the appointed time they mounted race-horses and set out under cover of the gloom, nor did morning morrow till they had traversed a great distance. And they ceased not faring forwards till they drew near his father's capital in the land of the Persians. When the king heard of his son's coming, he rode out to meet him with his troops and rejoiced in him with exceeding joy. Then, after a few days, he sent the princess's father a splendid present and a letter to the effect that his daughter was with him and demanding her wedding equipage. Aldatma's father came out to meet the messengers with the greatest gladness, for that he had deemed his daughter lost and had grieved sore for her loss. After which he made bride feasts, and summoning the kasi and the witnesses, let draw up the marriage contract between his daughter and the prince of Persia. He invested the envoys with robes of honor. Then he made ready her equipage and dispatched it to her. And Prince Behran abode with her till death, southern their union. See therefore, O king, continued the favorite, the malice of men in their dealing with women. As for me, I will not go back from my due till I die. So the king once more commanded to put his son to death, but the seventh wazir came in to him, and kissing the ground before him, said, O king, have patience with me, whilst I speak these words of good counsel to thee. How many patient and slow-moving men unto their hope attain, and how many who are precipitate fall into shameful state. 
now i have seen how this damsel have profligately excited the king by lies to horrible and unnatural cruelties but i his mameluke whom he hath overwhelmed with his favours and bounties do prefer him true and loyal reed for that i o king know of the malice of women that which none knoweth save myself and in particular there hath reached me on this subject the story of the old woman and the son of the merchant with its warning instances asked the king and what fell out between them o wazir and the seventh wazir answered i have heard tell o king the tale of the house with the belvedere a wealthy merchant had a son who was very dear to him and who said to him one day o oh, my father i have a boon to beg of thee quoth the merchant o oh, my son what is it that i may give it thee and bring thee to thy desire though it were the light of mine eyes quoth the youth give me money that i may journey with the merchants to the city of baghdad and see its sights and sail on the tigris and look upon the palace of the caliphs for the sons of the merchants have described these things to me and i long to see them for myself said the father o oh, my child o oh, my little son how can i endure to part from thee but the youth replied i have said my say and there is no help for it but i journey to baghdad with thy consent or e'en without it such a longing for its sight hath fallen upon me as can only be assuaged by the going hither and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the five hundred and ninety-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the merchant's son said to his sire, There is no help for it but that I journey to Baghdad. Now when the father saw that there was no help for it, he provided his son with goods to the value of thirty thousand gold pieces, and sent him with certain merchants in whom he trusted, committing him to their charge. Then he took leave of the youth, who journeyed with his friends, the merchants, till they reached Baghdad, the house of peace, where he entered the market and hired him a house so handsome and delectable and spacious and elegant that on seeing it he well-nigh lost his wits for admiration. For therein were pavilions facing one another, with floors of colored marbles and ceilings inlaid with gold and lapis lazuli and its gardens were full of warbling birds so he asked the doorkeeper what was its monthly rent and he replied ten dinars quoth the young man speakest thou soothly or dost thou but jest with me quoth the porter by allah i speak not but the truth for none who taketh up his abode in this house lodgeth in it more than a week or two and how is that quoth the youth and quoth the porter o oh, my son whoso dwelleth in this house cometh not forth of it except sick or dead Wherefore it is known amongst all the folk of Baghdad, so that none offereth to inhabit it, and thus cometh it that its rent is fallen so low. Hearing this, the young merchant marveled with exceeding marvel, and said, Needs must there be some reason for this sickening and perishing. However, after considering a while and seeking refuge with Allah from Satan the stoned, he rented the house and took up his abode there. Then he put away apprehension from his thought and busied himself with selling and buying 
and some days passed by without any such ill case befalling him in the house as the doorkeeper had mentioned. One day as he sat upon the bench before his door, there came up a grizzled crone, as she were a snake, speckled, white, and black, calling aloud on the name of Allah, magnifying him inordinately, and at the same time putting away the stones and other obstacles from the path. Seeing the youth sitting there, she looked at him, and marvelled at his case, whereupon quoth he to her, O woman, dost thou know me, or am I like any thou knowest? When she heard him speak, she toddled up to him, and saluting him with the salam, asked, How long hast thou dwelt in this house? Answered he, Two months, O my mother. And she said, It was hereat I marveled, for I, O my son, know thee not. Neither dost thou know me, nor yet art thou like unto any one I know. But I marveled, for that none other than thou hath taken up his abode in this house, but hath gone forth from it dead or dying, save thee alone. Doubtless, O my son, thou hast periled thy young years, but I suppose thou hast not gone up to the upper story, neither looked out from the belvedere there. So saying, she went her way, and he fell a pondering her words, and said to himself, I have not gone up to the top of the house, nor did I know that there was a belvedere there. Then he arose forthright, and going in, searched the byways of the house, till he espied in a wall corner among the trees a narrow door between whose posts the spider had woven her webs, and said to himself, Happily the spider hath not webbed over the door, but because death and doom is within. However, he heartened himself with the saying of God the Most High, Say, Nothing shall befall us but what Allah hath written for us. And opening the door, ascended a narrow flight of stairs till he came to the terrace roof, where he found a belvedere in which he sat down to rest and solace himself with the view. Presently he caught sight of a fine house and a well cared for hard by, surmounted by a lofty belvedere overlooking the whole of Baghdad in which sat a damsel fair as a houri. Her beauty took possession of his whole heart and made away with his reason, bequeathing to him the pains and patience of Job and the grief and weeping of Jacob. And as he looked at her and considered her curiously, an object to enamour an ascetic and make a devotee lovesick, fire was lighted in his vitals and he cried folk say that whoso taketh up his abode in this house dieth or sickeneth and this be so yon damsel is assuredly the cause would heaven i knew how i shall win free of this affair for my wits are clean gone then he descended from the terrace, pondering his case, and sat down in the house. But being unable to rest, he went out and took his seat at the door, absorbed in melancholy thought, when, behold, up came the old woman afoot, praising and magnifying Allah as she went. When he saw her, he rose, and accosting her with a courteous salam, and wishes for her life being prolonged, said to her, O oh, my mother, I was healthy and hearty, till thou madest mention to me of the door leading to the belvedere. 
So I opened it, and ascending to the top of the house, saw thence what stole away my senses. And now methinks I am a lost man, and I know no physician for me but thyself. When she heard this, she laughed and said, No harm shall befall thee, inshallah, so Allah please. Whereupon he rose and went into the house, and coming back with an hundred dinars in his sleeve, said to her, Take this, O my mother, and deal with me the dealing of lords with slaves, and succor me quickly, for if I die, a claim for my blood will meet thee on the day of doom. Answered she, With love and gladness. But, O oh, my son, I expect thou lend me thine aid in some small matter whereby hangs the winning of thy wish. Quoth he, What wouldst thou have me do, O oh, my mother? Quoth she, Go to the silk market, and inquire for the shop of Abu al-Faf bin Kaidam. Sit thee down on his counter, and salute him, and say to him, Give me the face veil thou hast by thee or frayed with gold, for he hath none handsomer in his shop. Then buy it of him, O my son, at his own price, however high, and keep it till I come to thee to-morrow, Allah Almighty willing. So saying, she went away, and he passed the night upon live coals of the gasa wood. Next morning he took a thousand ducats in his pocket, and repairing to the silk market, sought out the shop of Abu al-Fath. To him he was directed by one of the merchants. He found him a man of dignified aspect, surrounded by pages, eunuchs, and attendants, for he was a merchant of great wealth and consideration befriended by the caliph. And of the blessings which Allah the Most High had bestowed upon him, was the damsel who had ravished the young man's heart. She was his wife, and had not her match for beauty, nor was her like to be found with any of the sons of the kings. The young man saluted him, and Abu al-Fath returned his salam and bade him be seated. So he sat down by him and said to him, O oh, merchant, I wish to look at such a face veil. Accordingly, he bade his slave bring him a bundle of silk from the inner shop, and opening it brought out a number of veils, whose beauty amazed the youth. Among them was the veil he sought. So he bought it for fifty gold pieces, and bore it home well pleased. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and cease to say her permitted say. End of section 23 Recording by M. J. Frank, Portland, Oregon Section 24 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Mattingly. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 24 when it was the six hundredth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the youth after buying the veil of the merchant bore it home but hardly had he reached the house when lo up came the old woman he rose to her and gave her his purchase when she bade him bring a live coal with which she burnt one of the corners of the veil then folded it up as before and repairing to abu al fath's house knocked at the door asked the damsel who is there and she answered i such an one 
Now the damsel knew her for a friend of her mother, so when she heard her voice she came out, and opening the door to her said, What brought thee here, O my mother? My mamma hath left me, and gone to her own house, replied the old woman. O my daughter, I know thy mother is not with thee, for I have been with her in her home, and I come not to thee, but because I fear to pass the hour of prayer, wherefore I desire to make my wuzu ablution with thee, for I know thou art clean, and thy house pure. The damsel admitted the old trot, who saluted her, and called down blessings upon her. Then she took the ewer, and went into the wash-house, where she made her ablutions, and prayed in a place there. Presently she came out again, and said to the damsel, O oh, my daughter, I suspect thy handmaidens have been in yonder place, and defiled it. So do thou show me another place where I may pray, for the prayer I have prayed I account null and void. Thereupon the damsel took her by the hand, and said to her, O oh, my mother, come and pray on my carpet where my husband sits. So she stood there and prayed and worshipped, bowed and prostrated. And presently she took the damsel unawares, and made shift to slip the veil under the cushion unseen of her. Then she blessed her and went her ways. Now, as the day was closing, Abu al-Fath came home, and sat down upon the carpet, whilst his wife brought him food, and he ate of it his sufficiency, and washed his hands, after which he leant back upon the cushion. Presently he caught sight of a corner of the veil protruding from under the cushion, so he pulled it out, and considered it straightly, when, knowing it for that he had sold to the young man, he at once suspected his wife of unchastity. Thereupon he called her, and said, Whence had thou this veil? And she swore an oath to him, saying, None hath come to me but thou. The merchant was silent for fear of scandal, and said to himself, If I open up this chapter, I shall be put to shame before all Baghdad. For he was one of the intimates of the caliph, and so he could do nothing save hold his peace. So he asked no questions, but said to his wife, whose name was Marzia, It hath reached me that thy mother lieth ill of heartache, and all the women are with her, weeping over her. Wherefore I order thee to go to her. Accordingly she repaired to her mother's house, and found her in the best of health. And she asked her daughter, What brings thee here at this hour? So she told her what her husband had said, and sat with her a while. When, behold, up came porters, who brought her clothes from her husband's house, and transporting all her paraphernalia and what not else belonged to her of goods and vessels, deposited them in her mother's lodging. When the mother saw this, she said to her daughter, Tell me what hath passed between thee and thy husband to bring about this. But she swore to her that she knew not the cause thereof, and that there had befallen nothing between them to call for this conduct. Quoth her mother, Needs must there be a cause for this. And she answered, saying, I know of none, and after this with almighty Allah be it to make provision. Whereupon her mother fell a-weeping, and lamented her daughter's separation for the like of this man by reason of his sufficiency and fortune, and the greatness of his rank and dignity. On this wise things abode some days, after which the cursed, ill-omened old woman, whose name was Miriam the Coronist, paid a visit to Marzia in her mother's house, and saluted her cordially, saying, What ails thee, O my daughter, O my darling? Indeed thou hast troubled my mind. Then she went in to her mother, and said to her, O my sister, what is this business about thy daughter and her husband? it hath reached me that he hath divorced her. What hath she done to call for this? Quoth the mother, Belike her husband will return to her by the blessed influence of thy prayers, O Haviza. So do thou pray for her, O my sister, for thou art a day faster and a night prayer. Then the three fell to talking together, and the old woman said to the damsel, O my daughter, grieve not, for if Allah please, I will make peace between thee and thy husband before many days. And then she left them, and going to the young merchant said to him, Get ready a handsome entertainment for us, for I will bring her to thee this very night. So he sprang up and went forth, and provided all that was fitting of meat and drink and so forth, and then sat down to await the twain. Whilst the old woman returned to the girl's mother and said to her, O oh, my sister, we have a splendid bride feast to-night, so let thy daughter go with me, that she may divert herself and make merry with us, and throw off her cark and care and forget the ruin of her home. I will bring her back to thee, even as I took her away. The mother dressed her daughter in her finest dress and costliest jewels, and accompanied her to the door, where she commended her to the old woman's charge, saying, 
where, lest thou let any of almighty Allah's creatures look upon her, for thou knowest her husband's rank with the caliph, and do not tarry, but bring her back to me as soon as possible. The old woman carried the girl to the young man's house, which she entered, thinking at the place where the wedding was to be held. But as soon as she came into the sitting saloon, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that as soon as the damsel entered the sitting saloon, the youth sprang up to her and flung his arms around her neck and kissed her hands and feet. She was confounded at his loveliness, as well as at the beauty of the place and the profusion of meat and drink, flowers and perfumes, that she saw therein, and deemed all was a dream. When the old woman saw her amazement, she said to her, The name of Allah be upon thee, O my daughter. Fear not, I am here sitting with thee, and I will not leave thee for a moment. Thou art worthy of him, and he is worthy of thee. So the damsel sat down shamefast, and in great confusion. But the young man jested and toyed with her, and entertained her with laughable stories and loving verses, till her breast broadened, and she became at her ease. Then she ate and drank, and growing warm with wine, took the lute and sang these couplets. My friend who went hath returned once more, O oh, the welcome light that such beauty shows, And but for the fear of those arrowy eyes, From his lovely cheek I had culled the rose. And when the youth saw that she to his beauty did incline, He waxed drunken without wine, And his life was a light matter to him, Compared with his love. Presently the old woman went out, And left them alone together to enjoy their loves till the next morning, When she went into them and gave them both good morrow, and asked the damsel, How hast thou passed the night, O my lady? Answered the girl, Right well, thanks to thy adroitness and the excellence of thy going between. Then said the old woman, Up, let us go back to thy mother. At these words the young man pulled out an hundred sequins and gave them to her, saying, Take this and leave her with me to-night. So she left him and repaired to the girl's mother, to whom, quoth she, Thy daughter saluteth thee, and the bride's mother hath sworn her to abide with her this night. Replied the mother, O my sister, bear her my salam, and if it please and amuse the girl, there is no harm in her staying the night. So let her do this, and divert herself, and come back to me at her leisure. For all I fear for her is her chagrin on account of an angry husband. And the old woman ceased not to make excuse after excuse to the girl's mother, and to put off cheat upon cheat upon her, till Maziah had tarried seven days with the young man, of whom she took an hundred dinars a day for herself, while he enjoyed all the solace of life and coition. But at the end of this time the girl's mother said to her, Bring my daughter back to me forthright, for I am uneasy about her, because she hath been so long absent, and I misdoubt me of this. So the old woman went out, saying, Woe to thee! Shall such words be spoken to the like of me? and going to the young man's house, took the girl by the hand, and carried her away, leaving him lying asleep on his bed, for he was drunken with wine, to her mother. She received her with pleasure and gladness, and seeing her in redoubled beauty and brilliancy, rejoiced in her with exceeding joy, saying, O oh, my daughter, my heart was troubled about thee, and in my uneasiness I offended against this my sister the coronist, with a speech that wounded her replied Messiah, Rise, and kiss her hands and feet, for she hath been to me as a servant in my hour of need, and if thou do it not, thou art no mamma of mine, nor am I thy girl. So the mother went up at once to the old woman, and made her peace with her. Meanwhile, the young man recovered from his drunkenness, and missed the damsel, but congratulated himself on having enjoyed his desire. Presently Miriam, the old coronist, came in to him, and saluted him, saying, what thinkest thou of my feet? Quoth he, Excellently well conceived, and contrived of thee was that same. And then quoth she, Come, let us mend what we have marred, and restore this girl to her husband, for we have been the cause of their separation, and it is unrighteous. Asked he, How shall I do? And she answered, Go to Abel al Fath's shop, and salute him, and sit down by him till thou seest me pass by. When do thou rise in haste, and catch hold of my dress, and abuse me, and threaten me, demanding of me the veil? And do thou say to the merchant, 
Thou knowest, O my lord, the face veil I bought of thee for fifty dinars. It so chanced that my handmaid put it on and burnt a corner of it by accident. So she gave it to this old woman, who took it, promising to get it fine drawn and return it, and went away, nor have I seen her from that day to this. With joy and good will, replied the young man, and rising forthright, walked to the shop of the silk merchant, with whom he sat a while, till, behold the old woman passing, telling her beads on a rosary she held in hand. Whereupon he sprang up, and laying hold of her dress, began to abuse and rail at her, while she answered him with fair words, saying, Indeed, my son, thou art excusable. So the people of the bazaar flocked round the two, saying, What is the matter? And he replied, O folk, I bought of this merchant a veil for fifty dinars, and gave it to my slave girl, who wore it a while, then sat down to fumigate it with perfume. Presently a spark flew out of the censer, and lighting on the edge of the veil, burnt a hole in it. So we committed it to this pestilent old woman, that she might give it to who should find draw it, and return it to us. But from that time we have never set eyes on her again till this day. Answered the old woman, This young man speaks sooth. I had the veil from him, but I took it with me into one of the houses where I am wont to visit, and forgot it there, nor do I know where I left it, and being a poor woman I feared its owner and dared not face him. Now the girl's husband was listening to all they said, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the young man seized the old woman, and spoke to her of the veil, as she had primed him, the girl's husband was listening to all they said from beginning to end, and when he heard the tale which the crafty old woman had contrived with the young man, he rose to his feet and said, Allah Almighty, I crave pardon of the omnipotent one for my sins and for what my heart suspected. And he praised the Lord who had discovered to him the truth. Then he accosted the old woman and said to her, Dost thou use to visit us? Replied she, O my son, I visit you and other than you for the sake of alms. But from that day to this none hath given me news of the veil. Asked the merchant, Hast thou inquired at my house? And she answered, O oh my lord, I did indeed go to thy house and ask, but they told me that the person of the house had been divorced by the merchant, so I went away and asked no farther, nor have I inquired of anybody else until this day. Hereupon the merchant turned to the young man and said, Let the old woman go her way, for the veil is with me. So saying, he brought it out from the shop and gave it to the fine drawer before all present. Then he betook himself to his wife, and giving her somewhat of money, took her to himself again, after making abundance of excuses to her, and asking pardon of Allah, because he knew not what the old woman had done. Said the wazir, This then, O king, is an instance of the malice of women, and for another to the same purport, I have heard tell the following tale anent. The King's Son and the Ifrit's Mistress A certain king's son was once walking alone for his pleasure, when he came to a green meadow abounding in trees laden with fruit and birds singing on the boughs and a river running athwart it the place pleased him so he sat down there and taking out some dried fruits he had brought with him began to eat when lo he espied a great smoke rising up to heaven and taking fright he climbed up into a tree and hid himself among the branches thence he saw an ifrit rise out of the midst of the stream bearing on his head a chest of marble secured by a padlock he set down the chest on the meadow sward and opened it, and there came forth a damsel of mortal race, like the sun shining in the sheeny sky. After seating her, he solaced himself by gazing on her a while, then laid his head in her lap and fell asleep. Whereupon she lifted up his head, and laying it on the chest, rose and walked about. Presently she chanced to raise her eyes to the tree wherein was the prince, and seeing him, signed to him to come down. He refused, but she swore to him, saying, Except thou come down and do as I bid thee, I will wake the ifrit and point thee out to him, when he will straightway kill thee. The king's son, fearing she would do as she said, came down, whereupon she kissed his hands and feet, and besought him to do her need. To this he consented, and when he had satisfied her wants, she said to him, Give me this seal-ring I see on thy finger. 
So he gave her his signet, and she set it in a silken kerchief she had with her, wherein were more than fourscore others. When the prince saw this, he asked her, What dost thou with all these rings? And she answered, In very sooth, this ifrit carried me off from my father's palace and shut me in this box, which he beareth about on his head wherever he goeth with the keys about him, and he hardly leaveth me one moment alone of the excess of his jealousy over me, and hindereth me from what I desire. When I saw this, I swore that I would deny my last favours to no man whatsoever, and these rings thou seest are after the tale of the men who have had me. For after coition I took from each a seal ring, and laid it in this kerchief. And then she added, And now go thy ways, that I may look for another than thyself, for the ifrit will not awake yet a while. Hardly crediting what he had heard, the prince returned to his father's palace, but the king knew naught of the damsel's malice, for she feared not this, and took no count thereof. And seeing that his son had lost his ring, he bade put him to death. Then he rose from his place, and entered his palace. But his wazirs came in to him, and prevailed with him to abandon his purpose. And the same night the king sent for all of them, and thanked them for having dissuaded him from slaying his son, and the prince also thanked them, saying, It was well done of you to counsel my father to let me live, and inshallah I will soon requite you abundantly. Then he related to them how he had lost the ring, and they offered up prayers for his long life and advancement, and withdrew. See then, O king, said the wazir, the malice of women and what they do unto men. The king hearkened to the minister's counsel, and again countermanded his order to slay his son. Next morning, it being the eighth day, as the king sat in his audience chamber, in the midst of his grandees and emirs and wazirs and olima, the prince entered, with his hand in that of his governor, al Sindibad and praised his father and his ministers, and lords and divines, in the most eloquent words, and thanked them for having saved his life, so that all who were present wondered at his eloquence and fluency of speech. His father rejoiced in him with exceeding all-surpassing joy, and calling him to him, kissed him between the eyes. Then he called his preceptor, al Sindibad, and asked him why his son had kept silence these seven days, to which he replied, O oh, our Lord, the truth is, it was I who enjoined him to this, in my fear for him of death. I knew this from the day of his birth, and when I took his nativity I found it written in the stars that if he should speak during this period he would surely die. But now the danger is over by the king's fortune. At this the king was glad, and said to his wazirs, If I had killed my son, would the fault have fallen on me, or the damsel, or on the preceptor, al Sindibad? But all present refrained from replying, and al Sindibad said to the prince, Answer thou, O my son. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 24section 25 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Mattingly. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous, translated by Richard Francis Burton, Section 25. When it was the six hundred and third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when al Sindibad said, Answer thou, O my son, the prince replied, I have heard tell that a merchant at whose house certain guests once alighted sent his slave-girl to the market to buy a jar of clotted milk. So she bought it and set out on her return home. But on the way there passed over her a kite, holding and squeezing a serpent in its claws. And a drop of the serpent's venom fell into the milk-jar unknown to the girl, so when she came back, the merchant took the milk from her and drank of it, he and his guests. But hardly had it settled in their stomachs when they all died. Now consider, O king, whose was the fault in this matter? Thereupon some present said, It was the fault of the company, who drank the milk without examining it. And others some, That of the girl, who left the jar without cover. But al Sindibad asked the prince, 
What sayest thou, O my son? Answered he, I say that the folk err. It was neither the fault of the damsel nor of the company, for their appointed hour was come. Their divinely decreed provision was exhausted, and Allah had foreordained them to die thus. When the courtiers heard this, they marvelled greatly, and lifted up their voices, blessing the king's son, and saying, O oh, our Lord, thou hast made a reply sans peur, and thou art the sagest man of thine age, sans reproche. Indeed I am no sage, answered the prince. The blind sheikh and the son of three years and the son of five years were wiser than I. Said the bystanders, O youth, tell us the stories of these three who were wiser than thou art, O youth. Answered he, With all my heart, I have heard tell this tale concerning the sandalwood merchant and the sharpers. There once lived an exceeding rich merchant who was a great traveller and who visited all manner of places. One day, being minded to journey to a certain city, he asked those who came thence, saying, What kind of goods bought most profit there? And they answered, Chanders wood, for it selleth at a high price. So he laid out all his money in sandal and set out for that city. And arriving there at close of day, behold, he met an old woman driving her sheep. Quoth she to him, Who art thou, O man? And quoth he, I am a stranger, a merchant. Beware of the townsfolk, said she, for they are cheats, rascals, robbers, who love nothing more than imposing on the foreigner, that they may get the better of him and devour his substance. Indeed, I give thee good counsel. Then she left him, and on the morrow there met him one of the citizens, who saluted him and asked him, O oh, my lord, whence comest thou? Answered the merchant, From such a place. And what merchandise hast thou bought with thee? inquired the other. And replied he, Chanders would, for it is high of price with you. Quoth the townsman, He blundered who told thee that, for we burn nothing under our cooking pots save sandalwood, whose worth with us is but that of fuel. When the merchant heard this, he sighed and repented, and stood balanced between belief and unbelief. And then he alighted at one of the khans of the city, and when it was night he saw a merchant make fire of Chanders wood under his cooking pot. Now this was the man who had spoken with him, and this proceeding was a trick of his. When the townsman saw the merchant looking at him, he asked, Wilt thou sell me thy sandalwood for a measure of whatever thy soul shall desire? I sell it to thee, answered the merchant, and the buyer transported all the wood to his own house and stored it up there, whilst the seller purposed to take an equal quantity of gold for it. Next morning the merchant, who was a blue-eyed man, went out to walk in the city. But as he went along, one of the townsfolk, who was blue-eyed and one-eyed to boot, caught hold of him, saying, Thou art he who stole my eye, and I will never let thee go. The merchant denied this, saying, I never stole it, the thing is impossible. Whereupon the folk collected round them, and besought the one-eyed man to grant him till the morrow, that he might give him the price of his eye. So the merchant procured one to be surety for him, and they let him go. Now his sandal had been rent in the struggle with the one-eyed man, so he stopped at a cobbler's stall, and gave it to him, saying, Mend it, and thou shalt have of me what shall content thee. Then he went on, till he came to see some people sitting at play of forfeits, and sat down with them, to divert his cark and care. They invited him to play with them, and he did so, but they practised on him, and overcoming him offered him his choice, either to drink up the sea, or disperse all the money he had. Have patience with me till to-morrow, said he, and they granted him the delay he sought. Whereupon he went away, sore concerned for what had betided him, and knowing not how he should do, and sat down in a solitary place, heart heavy, careful thought oppressed and behold the old woman passed by and seeing him thus said to him peradventure the townsfolk have gotten the better of thee for i see thee troubled at that which hath befallen thee recount to me what aileth thee so he told her all that had passed from first to last and she said as for him who diddled thee in the matter of the chanders wood thou must know that with us it is worth ten gold pieces a pound but i will give thee a reed whereby I trust thou shalt deliver thyself, and it is this. 
go to such and such a gate whereby lives a blind sheikh a cripple who is knowing wise as a wizard and experienced and all resort to him and ask him what they require when he counsels them what will be their advantage for he is versed in craft and magic and trickery now he is a sharper and the sharpers resort to him by night therefore i repeat go thou to his lodging and hide thyself from thine adversaries so that thou mayest hear what they say unseen of them for he telleth them which party got the better and which got the worse and haply thou shalt learn from them some plan which may avail to deliver thee from them and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the six hundred and fourth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the old woman said to the merchant go this night to that expert who is frequented by the townsfolk and hide thine identity haply shalt thou hear from him some plea which shall deliver thee from thine adversaries so he went to the place she mentioned and hid himself albeit he took a seat near the blind man before long up came the sheikh's company who were wont to choose him for their judge they saluted the oldster and one another and sat down round him whereupon the merchant recognized his four adversaries the chief set somewhat of food before them and they ate then each began to tell what had befallen him during his day and amongst the rest came forward he of the chanders wood and he told the sheikh how he had bought of one man's sandal below its price and had agreed to pay for it a sa'ah or measure of whatever the seller should desire quoth the old man thine opponent hath the better of thee asked the other how can that be and the sheikh answered what if he say i will take the measure full of gold or silver wilt thou give it to him yes replied the other i will give it to him and still be the gainer and the sheikh answered and if he say i will take the measure full of fleas half male and half female what wilt thou do so the sharper knew that he was worsted and then came forward the one-eyed man and said o sheikh i met to-day a blue-eyed man a stranger to the town so i picked a quarrel with him and caught hold of him saying twas thou robbest me of my eye nor did i let him go till some became surety for him that he should return to me to-morrow and satisfy me for my eye quoth the oldster if he will he may have the better of thee and thou the worse how so asked the sharper and the chief said he may say to thee pluck out thine eye and i will pluck out one of mine then we will weigh them both and if thine eye be of the same weight as mine thou sayest sooth in what thou avouchest so wilt thou owe him the legal price of his eye and be stone blind whilst he will see with his other eye so the sharper knew that the merchant might baffle him with such plea then came the cobbler and said o sheikh a man bought me his sandal shoe to-day saying mend this and i asked him what wage wilt thou give me when he answered thou shalt have of me what will content thee now nothing will content me but all the wealth he hath quoth the oldster and he will he may take his sandal from thee and give thee nothing how so quoth the cobbler and quoth the sheikh he has but to say to thee the sultan's enemies are put to the rout his foes are waxed weak and his children and helpers are multiplied art thou content or no if thou say i am content he will take his sandal and go away and if thou say i am not content he will take his sandal and beat thee wherewith over the face and the neck so the cobbler owned himself worsted and then came forward the gamester and said o sheikh i played at forfeits with a man to-day and beat him and quoth i to him if thou drink the sea i will give thee all my wealth and if not i will take all that is thine replied the chief and he will he may worst thee how so asked the sharper and the sheikh answered he hath but to say hold for me the mouth of the sea in thine hand and give it to me and i will drink it but thou wilt not be able to do this so he will baffle thee with this plea when the merchant heard this he knew how it behoved him to deal with his adversaries. Then the sharpers left the sheikh, and the merchant returned to his lodging. Now, when morning morrowed, the gamester came to him, and summoned him to drink the sea. So he said to him, 
Hold for me its mouth, and I will drink it up. Whereupon he confessed himself beaten, and redeemed his forfeit by paying an hundred gold pieces. Then came the cobbler, and sought of him what should content him. Quoth the merchant, Our lord the sultan hath overcome his foes, and hath destroyed his enemies, and his children are multiplied. Art thou content, or no? I am content, replied the cobbler, and, giving up the shoe without wage, went away. Next came the one-eyed man, and demanded the legal price of his eye. Said the merchant, Pluck out thine eye, and I will pluck out mine, then we will weigh them, and if they are equal in weight, I will acknowledge thy truth, and pay thee the price of thine eye. But if they differ, thou liest, and I will sue thee for the price of mine eye. Quoth the one-eyed man, Grant me time. But the merchant answered, saying, I am a stranger, and grant time to none, nor will I part from thee till thou pay. So the sharper ransomed his eye by paying him an hundred ducats, and went away. Last of all came the buyer of the chander's wood, and said, Take the price of thy ware. Asked the merchant, What wilt thou give me? And the other answered, We agreed for a sa'ar measure of whatever thou shouldst desire. So, if thou wilt, take it full of gold and silver. Not I, rejoined the merchant, not I. Nothing shall serve me, but I must have it full of fleas, half male and half female. Said the sharper, I can do nothing of the kind and confessing himself beaten, returned him his sandalwood, and redeemed himself from him with an hundred sequins, to be off his bargain. Then the merchant sold the chander's wood at his own price, and quitting the city of sharpers, returned to his own land, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the merchant had sold his chander's wood, and had taken the money, he quitted that city, and returned to his own land. And then the prince continued, But this is not more wondrous than the tale of the three-year-old child. What may that be? asked the king. And the prince answered, I have heard tell this tale, of the debauchee and the three-year-old child. Know, O king, that a certain profligate man, who was addicted to the sex, once heard of a beautiful and lovely woman who dwelt in a city other than his own. So he journeyed hither, taking with him a present, and wrote her a note, setting forth all that he suffered of love longing and desire for her, and how his passion for her had driven him to forsake his native land and come to her. And he ended by praying for an assignation. She gave him leave to visit her, and, as he entered her abode, she stood up and received him with all honour and worship, kissing his hands, and entertaining him with the best entertainment of meat and drink. Now she had a little son, but three years old, whom she left, and busied herself in cooking rice. Presently the man said to her, Come, let us go and lie together. But she replied, My son is sitting looking at us. Quoth the man, He is a little child, understanding not, neither knowing how to speak. Quoth the woman, Thou wouldst not say thus, and thou knew his intelligence. And when the boy saw that the rice was done, he wept with bitter weeping, and his mother said to him, What gars thee weep, O my son? Ladle me out some rice, answered he, and put clarified butter in it. So she ladled him out somewhat of rice, and put butter therein. And the child ate a little, and then began to weep again. Quoth she, What ails thee now, O my son? And quoth he, O oh, mother mine, I want some sugar with my rice. At this said the man who was an angered, Thou art none other than a cursed child. Curse thyself by Allah, answered the boy, seeing thou weariest thyself, and journeyest from city to city in quest of adultery. As for me, I wept because I had somewhat in my eye, and my tears brought it out, and now I have eaten rice with butter and sugar, and am content. So which is the curse of us twain? The man was confounded at this rebuke from a little child, and forthright grace entered him, and he was reclaimed. Wherefore he laid not a finger on the woman, but went out from her and returned to his own country, where he lived a contrite life till he died. As for the story of the five-year-old, continued the prince, I have heard tell, O king, the following anent, the stolen purse. 
Four merchants once owned in common a thousand gold pieces, so they laid them mingled together in one purse and set out to buy merchandise therewith. They happened as they wended their way on a beautiful garden, so they left the purse with a woman who had care of the garden, saying to her, Mind thee, thou shalt not give it back save when all four of us in person demand it of thee. She agreed to this, and they entered and strolled a while about the garden walks, and ate and drank and made merry. After which one of them said to the others, I have with me scented full as earth. Come, let us wash our heads therewith in this running water. Quoth another, We lack a comb. And a third, Let us ask the keeper, belike she hath a comb. Thereupon one of them arose, and accosting the caretaker, said to her, Give me the purse. She said, Not until ye be all present, or thy fellows bid me give it to thee. Then he called to his companions, who could see him but not hear him, saying, She will not give it me. And they said to her, Give it him, thinking he meant the comb. So she gave him the purse, and he took it, and made off as fast as he could. When the other threes were wary of waiting, they went to the keeper and asked her, Why wilt thou not give him the comb? Answered she, He demanded naught of me save the purse, and I gave not that same but with your consent, and he went away with it. And when they heard her words, they buffeted their faces, and laying hands upon her, said, We authorize thee only to give him the comb. And she rejoined, He named not a comb to me. Then they seized her, and hailed her before the Kazi, to whom they related their claim, and he condemned her to make good the purse, and bound over sundry of her debtors to answer for her. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 25 Section 26 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gemlad. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 26. When it was the six hundred and sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the Kazi condemned the caretaker to make good the purse, and bound over sundry of her debtors to answer for her. So she went forth, confounded, and knowing not her way out of difficulty. Presently she met a five-year-old boy, who, seeing her troubled, said to her, What ails thee, O my mother? But she gave him no answer, contemning him because of his tender age, and he repeated his question a second time, and a third time till, at last, she told him all that had passed, not forgetting the condition that she was to keep the purse until all four had demanded it of her. Said the boy, Give me a dear round to buy sweetmeats withal, and I will tell you how thou mayst acquit thyself. So she gave him a silver, and said to him, What hast thou to say? Quoth he, Return to the Kazi, and say to him, It was agreed between myself and them that I should not give them the purse, except all four of them were present. Let them all four come, and I will give them the purse, as was agreed. So she went back to the Kazi, and said to him as the boy had counselled, and he asked the merchants, Was it thus agreed between you and this woman? And they answered, Yes. Quoth the Kazi, Then bring me your comrade, and take the purse. So they went in quest of their fellow, whilst the keeper came off scot-free, and went her way without let or hindrance. And Allah is omniscient. When the king and his wazir and those present in the assembly heard the prince's words, they said to his father, O oh, our lord the king, in very sooth thy son is the most accomplished man of his time. And they called down blessings upon the king and the prince. Then the king strained his son to his bosom, and kissed him between the eyes, and questioned him of what had passed between the favourite and himself. And the prince swore to him, By almighty Allah, and by his holy prophet, that it was she who had required him of love which he refused, adding, Moreover, she promised me that she would give thee poison to drink and kill thee, so should the kingship be mine. Whereupon I waxed wroth and signed to her, O oh, accursed one, when as I can speak I will requite thee. So she feared me and did what she did. The king believed his words, and sending for the favourite, said to those present, How shall we put this damsel to death? Some counselled him to cut out her tongue, and other some to burn it with fire. But when she came before the king, she said to him, 
my case with thee is like unto naught save the tale of the fox and the folk how so asked he and she said i have heard o king tell a story of the fox and the folk a fox once made his way into a city by the wall and entering a courier's storehouse played havoc with all therein and spoiled the skins for the owner one day the courier set a trap for him and taking him beat him with the hides till he fell down senseless whereupon the man deeming him to be dead cast him out into the road by the city gate presently an old woman who was walking by seeing the fox said this is a fox whose eye hung about a child's neck is salutary against weeping so she plucked out his right eye and went away then passed a boy who said what does this tail on this fox and cut off his brush after a while up came a man saying this is a fox whose gall cleareth away film and dimness from the eyes if they be anointed therewith like coal took out his knife to slit up the fox's paunch but reynard said in himself we bore with the plucking out of the eye and the cutting off of the tail but as for the slitting of the paunch there is no putting up with that so saying he sprang up and made off through the gate of the city hardly believing in his escape quoth the king i excuse her and in my son's hands be her doom if he will let him torture her and if he will let him kill her quoth the prince pardon is better than vengeance and mercy is of the quality of the noble and the king repeated tis for thee to decide o my son so the prince set her free saying depart from our neighbourhood and allah pardon what is past therewith the king rose from his throne of estate and seating his son thereon crowned him with his crown and bade the grandees of his realm swear fealty and commanded them do homage to him and he said o oh, folk indeed i am stricken in years and desire to withdraw apart and devote myself only to the service of my lord and i call you to witness that i divest myself of the kingly dignity even as i have divested myself of my crown and set it on my son's head so the troops and officers swore fealty to the prince and his father gave himself up to the worship of his lord nor stinted from this whilst his son abode in his kingship doing justice and righteousness and his power was magnified and his sultanate strengthened and he abode in all delight and solace of life till there came to him the certainty judah and his brethren there was once a man and a merchant named omar and he had for issue three sons the eldest called salim the youngest judah and the cadet salim he reared them all till they came to man's estate but the youngest he loved more than his brothers who seeing this waxed jealous of judah and hated him now when their father who was a man shotten in years saw that his two eldest sons hated their brother he feared lest after his death trouble should befall him from them so he assembled a company of his kinsfolk together with divers men of learning and property distributors of the kazi's court and bidding bring all his monies and cloth said to them o folk divide ye this money and stuff into four portions according to the law they did so and he gave one part to each of his sons and kept the fourth himself saying this was my good and i have divided it among them in my lifetime and this that i have kept shall be for my wife their mother wherewithal to provide for her subsistence when as she shall be a widow and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the six hundred and seventh night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the merchant had divided his money and stuff into four portions he said this share shall be for my wife their mother wherewithal to provide for her subsistence when as she shall be a widow a little while after this he died and neither of the two elder brothers was content with his share but sought more of judah saying our father's wealth is in thy hands so he appealed to the judges and the moslems who had been present at the partition came and bore witness of that which they knew wherefore the judge forbade them from one another but judah and his brothers wasted much money in bribes to him after this the twain left him a while presently however they began again to plot against him and he appealed a second time to the magistrate who once more decided in his favour but all three lost much money which went to the judges nevertheless salim and selim forbore not to seek his hurt and to carry the case from court to court he and they losing till they had given all their good for food to the oppressors and they became poor all three then the two elder brothers went to their mother and flouted her and beat her and seizing her money crave her away 
So she betook herself to her son Judah, and told him how his brothers had dealt with her, and fell to cursing the twain. Said he, Oh, my mother, do not curse them, for Allah will requite each of them according to his deed. But, O oh, mother mine, see, I am become poor, and so are my brethren, for strife occasioneth loss ruin rife, and we have striven amain and fought, I and they, before the judges, and it hath profited us naught. Nay, we have wasted all our father left us, and are disgraced among the folk by reason of our testimony one against other. Shall I then contend with them anew on thine account, and shall we appeal to the judges? This may not be. Rather do thou take up thine abode with me, and the scone I eat I will share with thee. Do thou pray for me, and Allah will give me the means of thine alimony. Leave them to receive of the Almighty the recompense of their deed, and console thyself with the saying of the poet who said, if a fool oppress thee, bear patiently, and from time expect thy revenge to see. Shun tyranny, for if mount oppressed, a mount t'would be shattered by tyranny. And he soothed and comforted her, till she consented and took up her dwelling with him. Then he get him a net, and went a-fishing every day in the river of the banks about Bulak and old Cairo, or some other place in which there was water. And one day he would earn ten coppers, another twenty, and another thirty, which he spent upon his mother and himself and they ate well and drank well. But as for his brothers, they plied no craft, and neither sold nor bought. Misery and ruin and overwhelming calamity entered their houses, and they wasted that which they had taken from their mother, and became of the wretched naked beggars. So at times they would come to their mother, humbling themselves before her exceedingly, and complaining to her of hunger, and she, her mother's heart being pitiful, would give them some mouldy, sour-smelling bread, or if there were any meat cooked the day before, she would say to them, Eat it quick, and go, ere your brother come, for it would be grievous to him, and he would harden his heart against me, and you would disgrace me with him. So they would eat in haste, and go. One day among days they came in to their mother, and she set cooked meat and bread before them. As they were eating, behold, in came their brother Judah, at whose sight the parent was put to shame and confusion, fearing lest he should be wroth with her, and she bowed her face earthwards, abashed before her son. But he smiled in their faces, saying, Welcome, O my brothers, a blessed day. How comes it that you visit me on this blessed day? Then he embraced them both, and treated them lovingly, saying to them, I thought not that you would have left me desolate by your absence, nor that you would have forborne to come and visit me and your mother. Said they, By Allah, O our brother, we longed so for thee, and naught without us but abashment, because of what befell between us and thee. But indeed we have repented much. "'Twas Satan's doing, the curse of Allah the Most High be upon him, and now we have no blessing but thyself and our mother. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Judah entered his place and saw his brothers, he welcomed them both, saying, And I have no blessing but you twain. And his mother exclaimed, Allah whiten thy face, and increase thy prosperity, for thou art the most generous of us all, O my son. Then he said, Welcome to you both. Abide with me, for the Lord is bountiful, and good aboundeth with me. So he made peace with them, and they supped and righted with him, and next morning, after they had broken their fast, Judah shouldered his net and went out, trusting in the opener, whilst the two others also went forth, and were absent till midday, when they returned and their mother set the noon meal before them. At nightfall Judah came home, bearing meat and greens, and they abode on this wise a month's space, Judah catching fish and selling it, and spending their price on his mother and his brothers, and these eating and frolicking till, one day, it chanced he went down to the river bank, and throwing his net, brought it up empty. He cast it a second time, but again it came up empty, and he said in himself, No fish in this place. So he removed to another, and threw the net there, but without avail and he ceased not to remove from place to place till nightfall, but caught not a single sprat, and said to himself, Wonderful! Had the fish fled the river, or what? Then he shouldered the net, and made for home, chagrined, concerned, feeling for his mother and brothers, and knowing not how he should feed them that night. Presently he came to a baker's oven, and saw the folk crowding for bread, with silver in their hands, whilst the baker took no note of them. So he stood there sighing, and the baker said to him, Welcome to thee, O Judah, dost thou want bread? But he was silent, and the baker continued, And thou have no dirhams, take thy sufficiency, and thou shalt get credit. So Judah said, Give me ten coppers worth of bread, and take this net in pledge. 
rejoined the baker. "'Nay, my poor fellow, the net is thy gate of earning thy livelihood, and if I take it from thee, I shall close up against thee the door of thy subsistence. Take thee ten nuffs worth of bread, and take these other ten, and to-morrow bring me fish for the twenty. "'On my head and eyes be it,' quoth Judah, and took the bread and money, saying, "'Tomorrow the Lord will dispel the trouble of my case, and will provide me the means of acquittance.' Then he bought meat and vegetables, and carried them home to his mother, who cooked them, and they supped and went to bed. Next morning he arose at daybreak, and took the net, and his mother said to him, Sit down and break thy fast. But he said, Do thou and my brothers break fast, and went down to the river about Bulak, where he ceased not to cast once, twice, thrice, and to shift about all day, without aught falling to him, till the hour of mid-afternoon prayer, when he shouldered his net and went away, sore dejected. His way led him perforce by the booth of the baker, who, when he saw him, counted out to him the loaves and the money, saying, "'Come, take it and go, and it be not to-day, twill be to-morrow.' Judah would have excused himself, but the baker said to him, "'Go, there needeth no excuse, and thou had netted aught it would be with thee, so seeing thee empty-handed, I knew thou hadst gotten aught, and if to-morrow thou have no better luck, come and take bread, and be not abashed, for I will give thee credit.' So Judah took the bread and money, and went home. On the third day also he sallied forth, and fished from tank to tank until the time of afternoon prayer, but caught nothing. So he went to the baker, and took the bread and silver as usual. On this wise he did seven days running, till he became disheartened, and said in himself, "'Today I go to the lake Karun.' So he went thither, and was about to cast his net, when there came up to him unawares a Maghrabi, a moor, clad in splendid attire, and riding a she-mule, with a pair of gold-embroidered saddle-bags on her back, and all her trappings also afraid. The moor alighted, and said to him, Peace be upon thee, O Judah, O son of Omar. And on thee likewise be peace, O my lord the pilgrim, replied the fisherman. Quoth the Maghrabi, O Judah, I have need of thee, and given thou obey me, thou shalt get great good, and shalt be my companion, and manage my affairs for me. Quoth Judah, O oh, my lord, tell me what is in thy mind, and I will obey thee, without demur. Said the moor, Repeat the Fatiha, the opening chapter of the Koran. So he recited it with him, and the moor, bringing out a silken cord, said to Judah, Pinion my elbows behind me with this cord, as fast as fast can be, and cast me into the lake, then wait a little while, and if thou see me put forth my hands above the water, raising them high ere my body show, cast thy net over me, and drag me out in haste. But if thou see me come up feet foremost, then know that I am dead, in which case do thou leave me, and take the mule and saddle-bags, and carry them to the merchant's bazaar, where thou wilt find a Jew by name Shamiah. Give him the mule, and he will give thee an hundred dinars, which do thou take, and go thy ways, and keep the matter secret with all secrecy. So Judah tied his arms tightly behind his back, and he kept saying, Tie tighter. Then he said, Push me till I fall into the lake. So he pushed him in, and he sank. Judah stood waiting some time till, behold, the moor's feet appeared above the water, whereupon he knew that he was dead. So he left him, and drove the mule to the bazaar, where, seated on a stool at the door of his storehouse, he saw the Jew, who, spying the mule, cried, in very sooth the man hath perished, adding, and naught undid him but covetous. Then he took the mule from Judah, and gave him an hundred dinars, charging him to keep the matter secret. So Judah went, and bought what bread he needed, saying to the baker, Take this gold piece. And the man summed up what was due to him, and said, I still owe thee two days' bread. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 26 Recording by Gem Lad. Section number 27 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Natalie Gray. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Volume 6 by Anonymous Translated by Richard Francis Burton Section 27 When it was the six hundred and ninth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, 
that Judar, when the baker, after summing up what was due to him, said, I still owe thee two days' bread, replied, Good, and went on to the butcher, to whom he gave a gold piece and took meat, saying, Keep the rest of the dinar on account. Then he bought vegetables, and going home, found his brothers importuning their mother for victual, whilst she cried, Have patience till your brother come home, for I have not. So he went in to them, and said, Take and eat. And they fell on the food like cannibals. Then he gave his mother the rest of his gold, saying, If my brothers come to thee, give them wherewithal to buy food and eat in my absence. He slept well that night, and next morning he took his net, and going down to Lake Karun, stood there and was about to cast his net, when, behold, there came up to him a second Maghrabi, riding on a she-mule more handsomely accoutred than he of the day before, and having with him a pair of saddle-bags, of which each pocket contained a casket. "'Peace be with thee, O Judar,' said the Moor. "'And with thee be peace, O my lord the pilgrim,' replied Judar. Asked the Moor, "'Did there come to thee yesterday a Moor riding on a mule like this of mine?' Hereat Judar was alarmed and answered, I saw none, fearing lest the other say, Whither went he? And if he replied, He was drowned in the lake, that haply he should charge him with having drowned him, wherefore he could not but deny. Rejoined the Moor, Hark ye, O unhappy, this was my brother who is gone before me. Judar persisted, I know not of him. Then the Moor inquired, Didst thou not bind his arms behind him, and throw him into the lake? And did he not say to thee, If my hands appear above the water first, cast thy net over me, and drag me out in haste? But if my feet show first, know that I am dead, and carry the mule to the Jew Shemaiah, who shall give thee an hundred dinars. Quoth Judar, Since thou knowest all this, why and wherefore dost thou question me? And quoth the Moor, I would have thee do with me as thou didst with my brother. Then he gave him a silken cord, saying, Bind my hands behind me and throw me in, and if I fare as did my brother, take the mule to the Jew, and he will give thee other hundred dinars. Said Judar, Come on. So he came, and he bound him and pushed him into the lake, where he sank. Then Judar sat watching, and after a while his feet appeared above the water, and the fisher said, He is dead and damned. Inshallah, may Maghrabis come to me every day, and I will pinion them and push them in, and they shall die, and I will content me with an hundred dinars for each dead man. Then he took the mule to the Jew, who seeing him asked, The other is dead? Answered Judar, May thy head live. And the Jew said, This is the reward of the covetous. Then he took the mule and gave Judar an hundred dinars with which he returned to his mother. O oh, my son, she said, Whence hast thou this? So he told her, and she said, Go not again to Lake Karun. Indeed, I fear for thee from the moors. Said he, O oh, my mother, I do but cast them in by their own wish, and what am I to do? This craft bringeth me an hundred dinars a day, and I return speedily. Wherefore, by Allah, I will not leave going to Lake Karun, till the race of the Maghrabah is cut off, and not one of them is left. So on the morrow, which was the third day, he went down to the lake and stood there, till there came up a third moor, riding on a mule with saddlebags, and still more richly accoutred than the first two, who said to him, Peace be with thee, O Judar, O son of Omar. And the fisherman, saying in himself, How comes it that they all know me? Returned his salute. Asked the Maghrabi, Have any moors passed by here? Two, answered Judar. Whither went they? inquired the moor. And Judar replied, 
I pinioned their hands behind them and cast them into the lake where they were drowned, and the same fate is in store for thee. The moor laughed and rejoined, saying, O oh, unhappy, every life hath its term appointed. Then he alighted and gave the fisherman the silken cord, saying, Do with me, O Judar, as thou didst with them. Said Judar, Put thy hands behind thy back, that I may pinion thee, for I am in haste, and time flies. So he put his hands behind him, and Judar tied him up and cast him in. Then he waited a while. Presently the moor thrust both hands forth of the water and called out to him, saying, Ho, good fellow, cast out thy net. So Judar threw the net over him and drew him ashore, and lo, in each hand he held a fish as red as coral. Quoth the moor, Bring me the two caskets that are in the saddlebags. So Judar brought them and opened them to him, and he laid in each casket a fish and shut them up. Then he pressed Judar to his bosom and kissed him on the right cheek and the left, saying, Allah save thee from all stress. By the Almighty, hadst thou not cast the net over me and pulled me out, I should have kept hold of these two fishes till I sank and was drowned, for I could not get ashore of myself. Quoth Judar, O my lord the pilgrim, Allah upon thee, tell me the true history of the two drowned men, and the truth anent these two fishes and the Jew. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and tenth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Judar asked the Maghrabi, saying, Prithee tell me the first of the drowned men, the Maghrabi answered, No, O Judar, that these drowned men were my two brothers, by name Abd al-Salam and Abd al-Ahad. My own name is Abd al-Samad, and the Jew also is our brother. His name is Abd al-Rahim, and he is no Jew, but a true believer of the Maliki school. Our father, whose name was Abd al-Wadud, taught us magic and the art of solving mysteries and bringing hordes to light, and we applied ourselves thereto, till we compelled the Ifrits and Marids of the jinn to do us service. By and by our sire died and left us much wealth, and we divided amongst us his treasures and talismans, till we came to the books, when we fell out over a volume called The Fables of the Ancients, whose like is not in the world, nor can its price be paid of any, nor is its value to be evened with gold and jewels, for in it are particulars of all the hidden hordes of the earth and the solution of every secret. Our father was wont to make use of this book, of which we had some small matter by heart, and each of us desired to possess it that he might acquaint himself with what was therein. Now when we fell out, there was in our company an old man by name Cohen al-Abtan, who had reared our sire and taught him divination and grammary, and he said to us, Bring me the book. So we gave it him, and he continued, Ye are my sons' sons, and it may not be that I should wrong any of you. So whoso is minded to have the volume, let him address himself to achieve the treasure of al Shamardal, and bring me the celestial planisphere, and the coal file, and the seal ring, and the sword. For the ring hath a marid that serveth it, called al Ra'ad al Kasif. And whoso hath possession thereof, neither king nor sultan may prevail against him. And if he will, he may therewith make himself master of the earth in all the length and breadth thereof. As for the brand, if its bearer draw it and brandish it against an army, the army will be put to the rout, and if he say the while, Slay yonder host, 
there will come forth of that sword lightning and fire that will kill the whole many. As for the planisphere, its possessor hath only to turn its face toward any country, east or west, with whose sight he hath a mind to solace himself, and therein he will see that country and its people, as they were between his hands, and he sitting in his place. And if he be wroth with a city and have a mind to burn it, he hath but to face the planisphere towards the sun's disk, saying, Let such a city be burnt, and that city will be consumed with fire. As for the coal file, whoso pencileth his eyes therefrom, he shall espy all the treasures of the earth. And I make this condition with you, which is, that whoso faileth to hit upon the hordes shall forfeit his right, and that none save he who shall achieve the treasure and bring me the four precious things which be therein shall have any claim to take this book. So we all agreed to this condition. And he continued, O oh, my sons, know that the treasure of al Shamardal is under the commandment of the sons of the Red King, and your father told me that he had himself essayed to open the treasure, but could not. For the sons of the Red King fled from him into the land of Egypt, and took refuge in a lake there, called Lake Karun, whither he pursued them, but could not prevail over them, by reason of their stealing into that lake, which was guarded by a spell. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and eleventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the Kohen al-Abtan had told the youths this much, he continued his tale as follows. So your father returned empty-handed, and unable to win his wish, and after failing he complained to me of his ill success, Whereupon I drew him an astrological figure and found that the treasure could be achieved only by means of a young fisherman of Cairo, Haiz Judar bin Omar, the place of foregathering with whom was at Lake Karun, for that he should be the means of capturing the sons of the Red King, and that the charm would not be dissolved, save if he should bind the hands of the treasure-seeker behind him and cast him into the lake, there to do battle with the sons of the Red King. And he whose lot it was to succeed would lay hands upon them, but if it were not destined to him, he should perish and his feet appear above water. As for him who was successful, his hands would show first, whereupon it behoved that Judar should cast the net over him and draw him ashore. Now, quoth my brothers Abd al-Salam and Abd al-Ahad, we will wend and make trial, although we perish. And quoth I, and I also will go. But my brother Abd al-Rahim, he whom thou sawest in the habit of a Jew, said, I have no mind to this. Thereupon we agreed with him that he should repair to Cairo in the disguise of a Jewish merchant, so that, if one of us perished in the lake, he might take his mule and saddlebags and give the bearer an hundred dinars. The first that came to thee the sons of the Red King slew, and so did they with my second brother. But against me they could not prevail, and I laid hands on them." cried Judar, and where is the catch? Asked the Moor, Didst thou not see me shut them in the caskets? Those were fishes, said Judar. Nay, answered the Maghribi, they are Ifrits in the guise of fish. But, O oh, Judar, continued he, thou must know that the treasure can be opened only by thy means. So say, Wilt thou do my bidding and go with me to the city Fez and Meknes, 
where we will open the treasure, and after I will give thee what thou wilt, and thou shalt ever be my brother in the bond of Allah, and return to thy family with a joyful heart. Said Judar, O my lord the pilgrim, I have on my neck a mother and two brothers. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 27. Recording by Natalie Gray. www.voicebynatalie.com. Section number 28 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Natalie Gray. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 28. When it was the six hundred and twelfth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Judar said to the Maghrabi, I have on my neck a mother and two brothers, whose provider I am, and if I go with thee, who shall give them bread to eat? Replied the Moor, This is an idle excuse. If it be but a matter of expenditure, I will give thee a thousand ducats for thy mother, wherewith she may provide herself till thou come back, and indeed thou shalt return before the end of four months. So when Judar heard mention of the thousand dinars, he said, Here with them, O pilgrim, and I am thy man. And the moor, pulling out the money, gave it to him, whereupon he carried it to his mother and told her what had passed between them, saying, Take these thousand dinars and expend of them upon thyself and my brothers, whilst I journey to Morocco with the moor, for I shall be absent four months, and great good will betide me. So bless me, O my mother. Answered she, O my son, thou desolatest me, and I fear for thee. O my mother, rejoined he, no harm can befall him who is in Allah's keeping, and the Maghrabi is a man of worth. And he went on to praise his condition to her. Quoth she, Allah incline his heart to thee. Go with him, O my son, peradventure he will give thee somewhat. So he took leave of his mother and rejoined the Moor, Abd al-Samad, who asked him, Hast thou consulted thy mother? Yes, answered Judar, and she blessed me. Then mount behind me, said the Maghrabi. So Judar mounted the mule's crupper, and they rode on from noon till the time of mid-afternoon prayer, when the fisherman was enhungered. But seeing no victual with the moor, said to him, O my lord the pilgrim, belike thou hast forgotten to bring us aught to eat by the way. Asked the moor, Art thou hungry? And Judar answered, Yes. So Abd al-Samad alighted, and made Judar alight, and take down the saddlebag. Then he said to him, What wilt thou have, O my brother? Anything. Allah upon thee, tell me what thou hast a mind to. Bread and cheese. O my poor fellow, bread and cheese besit thee not. Wish for some good thing. Just now everything is good to me. Dost thou like nice browned chicken? Yes. Dost thou like rice and honey? Yes. And the moor went on to ask him if he liked this dish and that dish, till he had named four and twenty kinds of meats, and Judar thought to himself, He must be daft. Where are all these dainties to come from, seeing he hath neither cook nor kitchen? But I'll say to him, Tis enough. So he cried, that will do, thou makest me long for all these meats, and I see nothing. Quoth the Moor, Thou art welcome, O Judar. And putting his hand into the saddlebags, pulled out a golden dish containing two hot brown chickens. Then he thrust his hand a second time, and drew out a golden dish full of kebabs. 
nor did he stint taking out dishes from saddlebags till he had brought forth the whole of the four and twenty kinds he had named, whilst Judar looked on. Then said the moor, Fall to, poor fellow. And Judar said to him, O oh, my lord, thou carest in yonder saddlebags kitchen and kitcheners. The moor laughed and replied, These are magical saddlebags, and have a servant who would bring us a thousand dishes an hour if we called for them. Quoth Judar, By Allah, a meat thing in saddlebags. Then they ate their fill and threw away what was left, after which the moor replaced the empty dishes in the saddlebags and, putting in his hand, drew out an ewer. They drank and, making the wuzu ablution, prayed the mid-afternoon prayer after which Abd al-Samad replaced the ewer and the two caskets in the saddlebags, and throwing them over the mule's back, mounted and cried, Up with thee, and let us be off, presently adding, O Judar, knowest thou how far we have come since we left Cairo? Not I, by Allah, replied he, and Abd al-Samad, We have come a whole month's journey asked Judar, and how is that? And the moor answered, Know, O Judar, that this mule under us is a marid of the jinn, who every day performeth a year's journey, but for thy sake she hath gone an easier pace. Then they set out again, and fared on westwards till nightfall, when they halted and the Maghrabi brought out supper from the saddlebags and in like manner in the morning he took forth wherewithal to break their fast. So they rode on four days, journeying till midnight, and then alighting and sleeping until morning, when they fared on again, and all that Judar had a mind to he sought of the moor, who brought it out of the saddlebags. On the fifth day they arrived at Fez and Meknes, and entered the city, where all who met the Maghrabi saluted him and kissed his hands, and he continued riding through the streets till he came to a certain door, at which he knocked, whereupon it opened, and out came a girl like the moon, to whom said he, O oh my daughter, O oh Rama, open us the upper chamber. On my head and eyes, O oh my papa, replied she, and went in, swaying her hips to and fro, with a graceful and swimming gait, like a thirsting gazelle, movements that ravished Judar's reason, and he said, This is none other than a king's daughter. So she opened the upper chamber, and the moor, taking the saddlebags from the mule's back, said, Go, and God bless thee, when, lo, the earth clove asunder, and swallowing the mule, closed up again as before. And Judar said, O oh, protector, praised be Allah, who hath kept us in safety on her back. Quoth the Maghrabi, Marvel not, O Judar, I told thee that the mule was an Ifrit, but come with us into the upper chamber. So they went up into it, and Judar was amazed at the profusion of rich furniture and pendants of gold and silver and jewels and other rare and precious things which he saw there. As soon as they were seated, the moor bade Rama bring him a certain bundle, and opening it, drew out a dress worth a thousand dinars, which he gave to Judar, saying, Don this dress, O Judar, and welcome to thee. So Judar put it on, and became a fair and sample of the kings of the west. Then the Maghrabi laid the saddlebags before him, and putting in his hand, pulled out dish after dish, till they had before them a tray of forty kinds of meat, when he said to Judar, Come near, O my master, eat and excuse us. And Shehrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and thirteenth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Maghrabi, having served up in the pavilion a tray of forty kinds of meat, said to Judar, Come near, O my master, and excuse us, 
for that we know not what meats thou desirest. But tell us what thou hast a mind to, and we will set it before thee without delay. Replied Judar, By Allah, O my lord the pilgrim, I love all kinds of meat, and unlove none. So ask me not of aught, but bring all that cometh to thy thought, for save eating, to do I have not. After this he tarried twenty days with the moor, who clad him in new clothes every day, and all this time they ate from the saddlebags, for the Maghrabi bought neither meat nor bread nor aught else, nor cooked, but brought everything out of the bags, even to various sorts of fruit. On the twenty-first day he said, O Judar, up with thee! This is the day appointed for opening the hoard of al Shamardal. So he rose, and they went afoot without the city, where they found two slaves, each holding a she-mule. The moor mounted one beast, and Judar the other, and they ceased not riding till noon, when they came to a stream of running water, on whose banks Abd al-Samad alighted, saying, Dismount, O Judar! Then he signed with his hand to the slaves, and said, To it! So they took the mules, and going each his own way, were absent a while, after which they returned, one bearing a tent which he pitched, and the other carpets which he spread in the tent, and laid mattresses, pillows, and cushions there around. Then one of them brought the caskets containing the two fishes, and another fetched the saddlebags, whereupon the Maghrabi arose and said, Come, O Judar! So Judar followed him into the tent, and sat down beside him, and he brought out dishes of meat from the saddlebags, and they ate the undern meal. Then the moor took the two caskets, and conjured over them both, whereupon there came from within voices that said, Admus, at thy service, O diviner of the world, have mercy upon us, and called aloud for aid. But he ceased not to repeat conjurations, and they to call for help, till the two caskets flew in sunder, the fragments flying about, and there came forth two men with pinion hands, saying, Quarter, O diviner of the world, what wilt thou with us? Quoth he, My will is to burn you both with fire, except ye make a covenant with me, to open to me the treasure of al Shamardal, Quoth they, We promise this to thee, and we will open the treasure sure to thee, so thou produce to us Judar bin Omar, the fisherman, for the hoard may not be opened but by his means, nor can any enter therein save Judar. Cried the Maghrabi, Him of whom ye speak I have brought and he is here, listening to you and looking at you. Thereupon they covenanted with him to open the treasure to him, and he released them. Then he brought out a hollow wand, and tablets of red carnelian, which he laid on the rod, and after this he took a chafing dish, and setting charcoal thereon, blew one breath into it, and it kindled forthwith. Presently he brought incense, and said, O Judar, I am now about to begin the necessary conjurations and fumigations, and when I have once begun, I may not speak, or the charm will be not. So I will teach thee first what thou must do to win thy wish. Teach me, quoth Judar. No, quoth the Moor, that when I have recited the spell, and thrown on the incense, the water will dry up from the river's bed, and discover to thee a golden door, the bigness of the city gate, with two rings of metal thereon. Whereupon do thou go down to the door, and knock a light knock, and wait a while. Then knock a second time, a knock louder than the first, and wait another while. After which, Give three knocks in rapid succession, and thou wilt hear a voice ask, Who knocketh at the door of the treasure, unknowing how to solve the secrets? 
Do thou answer, I am Judar the fisherman, son of Omar, and the door will open, and there will come forth a figure with a brand in hand, who will say to thee, If thou be that man, stretch forth thy neck, that I may strike off thy head. Then do thou stretch forth thy neck, and fear not, for when he lifts his hand and smites thee with the sword, he will fall down before thee, and in a little thou wilt see him a body sans soul, and the stroke shall not hurt thee, nor shall any harm befall thee. But if thou gainsay him, he will slay thee. When thou hast undone his enchantment by obedience, enter and go on till thou see another door, at which do thou knock, and there will come forth to thee a horseman riding a mare with a lance on his shoulder, and say to thee, What bringeth thee hither, where none may enter, ni man, ni genie? And he will shake his lance at thee. Bear thy breast to him, and he will smite thee and fall down forthright, and thou shalt see him a body without a soul. But if thou cross him, he will kill thee. Then go on to the third door, whence there will come forth to thee a man with a bow and arrows in his hand, and take aim at thee. Bear thy breast to him, and he will shoot at thee and fall down before thee, a body without a soul. But if thou oppose him, he will kill thee. Then go on to the fourth door. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and fourteenth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the Maghrabi said to Judar, Go on to the fourth door, and knock, and it shall be open to thee. When there will come forth to thee a lion, huge of bulk, which will rush upon thee, opening his mouth, and showing he hath a mind to devour thee. Have no fear of him, neither flee from him. But when he cometh to thee, give him thy hand, and he will bite at it, and fall down straightway, nor shall aught of hurt betide thee. Then enter the fifth door, where thou shalt find a black slave who will say to thee, Who art thou? Say, I am Judar, and he will answer, If thou be that man, open the sixth door. Then do thou go up to the door and say, O Isa, tell Musa to open the door. Whereupon the door will fly open, and thou wilt see two dragons, one on the left hand and another on the right, which will open their mouths and fly at thee, both at once. Do thou put forth to them both hands, and they will bite each a hand, and fall down dead. But an thou resist them, they will slay thee. Then go on to the seventh door, and knock, whereupon there will come forth to thee thy mother, and say, Welcome, O my son, come that I may greet thee. But do thou reply, Hold off from me, and doff thy dress. And she will make answer, O my son, I am thy mother, and I have a claim upon thee for suckling thee, and for rearing thee. How then wouldst thou strip me naked? Then do thou say, Except thou put off thy clothes, I will kill thee, and look to thy right, where thou wilt see a sword hanging up. Take it and draw it upon her, saying, Strip, whereupon she will wheedle thee and humble herself to thee. But have thou no ruth on her, nor be beguiled, and as often as she putteth off aught, say to her, Off with the rave, nor do thou cease to threaten her with death, till she doff all that is upon her, and fall down, whereupon the enchantment will be dissolved, and the charms undone, and thou wilt be safe as to thy life. Then enter the hall of the treasure, where thou wilt see the gold lying in heaps. But pay no heed to aught thereof, but look to a closet at the upper end of the hall, where thou wilt see a curtain drawn. Draw back the curtain, 
and thou wilt descry the enchanter al shamardal lying upon a couch of gold with something at his head round and shining like the moon which is the celestial planisphere he is baldricked with the sword his finger is the ring and about his neck hangs a chain to which hangs the coal file bring me the four talismans and beware lest thou forget aught of that which i have told thee or thou will repent and there will be fear for thee and he repeated his directions a second and a third and a fourth time till judar said i have them by heart but who may face all these enchantments that thou namest and endure against these mighty terrors replied the moor o judar fear not for they are semblances without life and he went on to hearten him till he said i put my trust in allah then abd al samad threw perfumes on the chafing dish and addressed himself to reciting conjurations for a time when behold the water disappeared and uncovered the river bed and discovered the door of the treasure whereupon judar went down to the door and knocked therewith he heard a voice saying who knocketh at the door of the treasure unknowing how to solve the secrets quoth he i am judar son of omar whereupon the door opened and there came forth a figure with a drawn sword who said to him stretch forth thy neck so he stretched forth his neck and the species smote him and fell down lifeless then he went on to the second door and did the like nor did he cease to do thus till he had undone the enchantments of the first six doors and came to the seventh door whence there issued forth to him his mother saying i salute thee o my son he asked what art thou and she answered o my son i am thy mother who bare thee nine months and suckled thee and reared thee quoth he put off thy clothes quoth she thou art my son how wouldst thou strip me naked but he said strip or i will strike off thy head with this sword and he stretched out his hand to the brand and drew it upon her saying except thou strip i will slay thee then the strife became long between them and as often as he redoubled on her his threats she put off somewhat of her clothes and he said to her doff the rest with many menaces while she removed each article slowly and kept saying o oh, my son thou hast disappointed my fosterage of thee till she had nothing left but her petticoat trousers then she said o oh, my son is thy heart stone wilt thou dishonor me by discovering my shame indeed this is unlawful o oh, my son and he answered thou sayest sooth put not off thy trousers at once as he uttered these words she cried out he hath made default beat him whereupon there fell upon him blows like raindrops and the servants of the treasure flocked to him and dealt him a funding which he forgot not in all his days after which they thrust him forth and threw him down without the treasure and the hoard doors closed of themselves whilst the waters of the river returned to their bed and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section 28 recording by natalie gray www.voicebynatalie.com section 29 of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 6 this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Natalie Gray. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 29. When it was the six hundred and fifteenth night, she said, it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the servants of the treasure beat judar and cast him out 
and the horrid doors closed of themselves, whilst the river waters returned to their bed, Abd al Samad the Maghrabi took Judar up in haste and repeated conjurations over him till he came to his senses, but still dazed as with drink, when he asked him, What hast thou done, O wretch? Answered Judar, O my brother, I undid all the opposing enchantments till I came to my mother, and there befell between her and myself a long contention. But I made her doff her clothes, O my brother, till but her trousers remained upon her, and she said to me, Do not dishonor me, for to discover one's shame is forbidden. So I left her her trousers out of pity, and behold, she cried out and said, He hath made default, beat him. Whereupon there came out upon me folk, whence I know not, and funding me with a belaboring which was a sister of death, thrust me forth. Nor do I know what befell me after this. Quoth the Moor, Did I not warn thee not to swerve from my directions? Verily thou hast injured me, and hast injured thyself. For if thou hadst made her take off her petticoat trousers, we had won to our wish. But now thou must abide with me till this day next year. Then he cried out to the two slaves, who struck the tent forthright and loaded it on the beasts. Then they were absent a while, and presently returned with the two mules, and the twain mounted and rode back to the city of Fez, where Judar tarried with the Maghrabi, eating well and drinking well, and donning a grand dress every day till the year was ended and the anniversary day dawned. Then the Moor said to him, Come with me, for this is the appointed day. And Judar said, Tis well. So the Maghrabi carried him without the city, where they found the two slaves with the mules, and rode on till they reached the river. Here the slaves pitched the tent and furnished it, and the moor brought forth the tray of food, and they ate the morning meal, after which Abd al-Samad brought out the wand and the tablets as before, and kindling the fire in the chafing dish, made ready the incense. Then said he, O Judar, I wish to renew my charge to thee. O my lord the pilgrim, replied he, if I have forgotten the bastinado, I have forgotten the injunctions. Asked the moor, Dost thou indeed remember them? And he answered, Yes. Quoth the moor, Keep thy wits, and think not that the woman is thy very mother. Nay, she is but an enchantment in her semblance, whose purpose is to find thee defaulting. Thou camest off alive the first time, but, and thou trip this time, they will slay thee. Quoth Judar, If I slip this time, I deserve to be burnt of them. Then Abd al-Samad cast the perfumes into the fire and recited the conjurations till the river dried up, whereupon Judar descended and knocked. The door opened, and he entered and undid the several enchantments till he came to the seventh door, and the semblance of his mother appeared before him, saying, Welcome, O my son. But he said to her, How am I thy son, O accursed? Strip! And she began to wheedle him and put off garment after garment, till only her trousers remained. And he said to her, Strip, O accursed! So she put off her trousers and became a body without a soul. Then he entered the hall of the treasures, where he saw gold lying in heaps, but paid no heed to it, and passed on to the closet at the upper end, where he saw the enchanter al Shamardal lying on a couch of gold, baldricked with the sword, with the ring on his finger, the coal file on his breast, and the celestial planisphere hanging over his head. So he loosed the sword, and taking the ring, the coal file, and the planisphere, went forth, when behold, a band of music sounded for him, and the servants of the treasure cried out, saying, Mayest thou be assained with that thou hast gained, O Judar? Nor did the music leave sounding, till he came forth of the treasure to the Maghrabi, who gave up his conjurations and fumigations, 
and rose up and embraced him and saluted him. Then Judar made over to him the four hoarded talismans, and he took them and cried out to the slaves who carried away the tent and brought the mules. So they mounted and returned to Fez city, where the moor fetched the saddlebags and brought forth dish after dish of meat till the tray was full and said, O oh, my brother, O oh, Judar, eat. So he ate till he was satisfied, when the moor emptied what remained of the meats and other dishes, and returned the empty platters to the saddlebags. Then quoth he, O oh, Judar, thou hast left home and native land on our account, and thou hast accomplished our dearest desire, wherefore thou hast a right to require a reward of us. Ask therefore what thou wilt, it is Almighty Allah who giveth unto thee by our means. Ask thy will, and be not ashamed, for thou art deserving. O my Lord, quoth Judar, I ask first of Allah the Most High, and then of thee, that thou give me yonder saddlebags. So the Maghrabi called for them, and gave them to him, saying, Take them, for they are thy due. And if thou hadst asked of me aught else instead, I had given it to thee. Eat from them, thou and thy family. But, my poor fellow, these will not profit thee, save by way of Provence, and thou hast wearied thyself with us, and we promise to send thee home rejoicing. So we will join to these other saddlebags full of gold and gems, and forward thee back to thy native land, where thou shalt become a gentleman and a merchant, and clothe thyself and thy family. Nor shalt thou want ready money for thine expenditure. And know that the manner of using our gift is on this wise. Put thy hand therein, and say, O servant of these saddlebags, I conjure thee by virtue of the mighty names which have power over thee, bring me such a dish and he will bring thee whatsoever thou askest, though thou shouldst call for a thousand different dishes a day. So saying, he filled him a second pair of saddlebags, half with gold and half with gems and precious stones, and sending for a slave and a mule, said to him, Mount this mule, and the slave shall go before thee and show thee the way, till thou come to the door of thy house where do thou take the two pair of saddlebags, and give him the mule, that he may bring it back. But admit none into thy secret, and so we commend thee to Allah. May the Almighty increase thy good, replied Judar, and laying the two pairs of saddlebags on the mule's back, mounted and set forth. The slave went on before him, and the mule followed him all that day and night, and on the morrow he entered Cairo by the gate of victory, where he saw his mother seated, saying, Alms, for the love of Allah! At this sight he well nigh lost his wits, and alighting, threw himself upon her, and when she saw him she wept. Then he mounted her on the mule and walked by her stirrup, till they came to the house, where he set her down, and taking the saddlebags, left the she-mule to the slave, who led her away, and returned with her to his master, for that both slave and mule were devils. As for Judar, it was grievous to him that his mother should beg, so when they were in the house he asked her, O oh, my mother, are my brothers well? And she answered, They are both well. Quoth he, Why dost thou beg by the wayside? Quoth she, Because I am hungry, O oh, my son. And he, before I went away, I gave thee an hundred dinars one day, the like the next, and a thousand on the day of my departure. O oh, my son, they cheated me and took the money from me, saying, We will buy goods with it. Then they drove me away, and I fell to begging by the wayside for stress of hunger. O oh, my mother, no harm shall befall thee, now I am come, so have no concern, for these saddlebags are full of gold and gems and good aboundeth with me. Verily thou art blessed, O my son, Allah accept of thee and increase thee of his bounties. 
Go, O my son, fetch us some victual, for I slept not last night for excess of hunger, having gone to bed supperless. Welcome to thee, O my mother. Call for what thou wilt to eat, and I will set it before thee this moment, for I have no occasion to buy from the market, nor need I any to cook. O my son, I see not with thee. I have with me in these saddle-bags all manner of meats. O oh, my son, whatever is ready will serve to stay hunger. True, when there is no choice, men are content with the smallest thing, but where there is plenty, they like to eat what is good, and I have abundance, so call for what thou hast a mind to. O oh, my son, give me some hot bread and a slice of cheese. O oh, my mother, this befitteth not thy condition. Then give me to eat of that which besitteth my case, for thou knowest it. O oh, my mother, rejoined he, what suit thine estate are browned meat and roast chicken, and peppered rice, and it becometh thy rank to eat of sausages, and stuffed cucumbers, and stuffed lamb, and stuffed ribs of mutton, and vermicelli with broken almonds, and nuts, and honey, and sugar, and fritters, and almond cakes. But she thought he was laughing at her, and making mock of her, so she said to him, Yow, yow, what is come to thee? Dost thou dream, or art thou daft? Asked he, Why deemest thou that I am mad? And she answered, Because thou namest to me all manner rich dishes, who can avail unto their price, and who knoweth how to dress them? Quoth he, By my life thou shalt eat of all that I have named to thee, and that at once. And quoth she, I see nothing. And he, Bring me the saddlebags. So she fetched them, and feeling them, found them empty. However, she laid them before him, and he thrust in his hand, and pulled out dish after dish, till he had set before her all he had named. Whereupon asked she, O oh, my son, the saddlebags are small, and moreover they were empty. Yet hast thou taken thereout all these dishes. Where then were they all? And he answered, O my mother, know that these saddle-bags, which the moor gave me, are enchanted, and they have a servant whom, if one desire aught, he hath but to adjure by the names which command him, saying, O servant of these saddle-bags, bring me such a dish, and he will bring it. Quoth his mother, And may I put out my hand and ask of him? Quoth he, Do so. So she stretched out her hand and said, O servant of the saddle-bags, by the virtue of the names which command thee, bring me stuffed ribs. Then she thrust in her hand and found a dish containing delicate stuffed ribs of lamb. So she took it out and called for bread and what else she had a mind to, after which Judar said to her, O my mother, when thou hast made an end of eating, empty what is left of the food into dishes other than these, and restore the empty platters to the saddle-bags carefully. So she arose and laid them up in a safe place. And look, O mother mine, that thou keep this secret, added he, and whenever thou hast a mind to aught, take it forth of the saddle-bags, and give alms, and feed my brothers, whether I be present or absent. Then he fell to eating with her, and behold, while they were thus occupied, in came his two brothers, whom a son of the quarter had apprised of his return, saying, Your brother is come back, riding on a she-mule with a slave before him, and wearing a dress that hath not its like. So they said to each other, Would to heaven we had not evilly entreated our mother. There is no hope but that she will surely tell him how he did by her, and then, oh, our disgrace with him. But one of the twain said, our mother is soft-hearted, and if she tell him, our brother is yet tenderer over us than she, and, given we excuse ourselves to him, he will accept our excuse. So they went in to him, and he rose to them, and saluting them with the friendliest salutation, bade them sit down and eat. So they ate till they were satisfied, for they were weak with hunger. After which Judar said to them, O oh, my brothers, take what is left and distribute it to the poor and needy. O oh, brother, replied they, let us keep it to sup withal. But he answered, When supper time cometh, ye shall have more than this. So they took the rest of the victual, 
and going out gave it to every poor man who passed by them, saying, Take and eat, till nothing was left. Then they brought back the dishes, and Judar said to his mother, Put them in the saddlebags. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and sixteenth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Judar, when his brethren had finished their under meal, said to his mother, Put back the platters in the saddlebags. And when it was eventide, he entered the saloon and took forth of the saddlebags a table of forty dishes, after which he went up to the upper room, and, sitting down between his brothers, said to his mother, Bring the supper. So she went down to the saloon, and, finding there the dishes ready, laid the tray and brought up the forty dishes, one after other. Then they ate the evening meal, and when they had done, Judar said to his brothers, Take and feed the poor and needy. So they took what was left and gave alms thereof, and presently he brought forth to them sweetmeats, whereof they ate, and what was left he bade them give to the neighbors. On the morrow they break their fast after the same fashion, and thus they fared ten days, at the end of which time, quoth Salim to Salim, How cometh it that our brother setteth before us a banquet in the morning, a banquet at noon, and a banquet at sundown, besides sweetmeats late at night, and all that is left he giveth to the poor? Verily this is the fashion of sultans, yet we never see him by aught, and he hath neither kitchener nor kitchen nor doth he light a fire. Whence hath he this great plenty? Hast thou not a mind to discover the cause of all this? Quoth Salim, By Allah I know not, but knowest thou any who will tell us the truth of the case? Quoth Salim, None will tell us save our mother. So they laid a plot, and repairing to their mother one day, in their brother's absence, said to her, O oh, our mother, we are hungry replied she, Rejoice, for ye shall presently be satisfied. And going into the saloon, sought of the servant of the saddlebags hot meats, which she took out and set before her sons. O oh, our mother, cried they, this meat is hot, yet hast thou not cooked, neither kindled a fire. Quoth she, It cometh from the saddlebags. And quoth they, What manner of thing be these saddlebags? She answered, They are enchanted, and the required is produced by the charm. She then told her sons their virtue, and joining them to secrecy, said they, The secret shall be kept, O our mother, but teach us the manner of this. So she taught them the fashion thereof, and they fell to putting their hands into the saddlebags, and taking forth whatever they had a mind to. But Judar knew not of this. Then quoth Salim privily to Salim, O oh, my brother, how long shall we abide with Judar servant-wise and eat of his alms? Shall we not contrive to get the saddlebags from him and make off with them? And how shall we make shift to do this? We will sell him to the galleys. How shall we do that? We too will go to the Reyes, the chief captain of the Sea of Suez, and bid him to an entertainment with two of his company. What I say to Judar do thou confirm, and at the end of the night I will show thee what I will do. So they agreed upon the sale of their brother, and going to the captain's quarters said to him, O Rice, we have come to thee on an errand that will please thee. Good, answered he, and they continued, We two are brethren, and we have a third brother, a lewd fellow and good for nothing. When our father died he left us some money which we shared amongst us, and he took his part of the inheritance, and wasted it in frowardness and debauchery, till he was reduced to poverty, when he came upon us and cited us before the magistrates, avouching that we had taken his good and that of his father, and we disputed the matter before the judges, and lost the money. Then he waited a while and attacked us a second time, until he brought us to beggary. Nor will he desist from us, and we are utterly weary of him, wherefore we would have thee buy him of us. Quoth the captain, can ye cast about with him and bring him to me here? If so, I will pack him off to sea forthright. 
quoth they, We cannot manage to bring him here, but be thou our guest this night, and bring with thee two of thy men, not one more, and when he is asleep we will aid one another to fall upon him, we five, and seize and gag him. Then shalt thou carry him forth the house, under cover of the night, and after do thou with him as thou wilt. Rejoined the captain, With all my heart, will ye sell him for forty dinars? And they, Yes, come after nightfall to such a street, by such a mosque, and thou shalt find one of us awaiting thee. And he replied, Now be off. Then they repaired to Judar, and waited a while, after which Salim went up to him and kissed his hand. Quoth Judar, What ails thee, O my brother? And he made answer, saying, Know that I have a friend, who hath many a time bidden me to his house in thine absence, and hath ever hospitably entreated me, and I owe him a thousand kindnesses, as my brother here wotteth. I met him to-day, and he invited me to his house, but I said to him, I cannot leave my brother Judar. Quoth he, Bring him with thee, and quoth I, He will not consent to that, but if ye will be my guests, thou and thy brothers, for his brothers were sitting with him, and I invited them, thinking that they would refuse. But he accepted my invitation for all of them, saying, Look for me at the gate of the little mosque, and I will come to thee, I and my brothers. And now I fear they will come and am ashamed before thee. So wilt thou hearten my heart and entertain them this night, for thy good is abundant, O my brother? Or if thou consent not, give me leave to take them into the neighbors' houses. Replied Judar, Why shouldst thou carry them into the neighbors' houses? Is our house then so straight? Or have we not wherewith to give them supper? Shame on thee to consult me. Thou hast but to call for whatever thou needest, and have rich viands and sweetmeats to spare. Whenever thou bringest home folk in my absence, ask thy mother, and she will set before thee victual more than enough. Go and fetch them. Blessings have descended upon us through such guests. So Salim kissed his hand, and going forth, sat at the gate of the little mosque till after sundown, when the captain and his men came up to him, and he carried them to the house. When Judar saw them, he bade them welcome, and seated them, and made friends of them, knowing not what the future had in store for him at their hands. Then he called to his mother for supper, and she fell to taking dishes out of the saddlebags, whilst he said, Bring such and such meats, till she had set forty different dishes before them. They ate their sufficiency, and the tray was taken away, the sailors thinking the while that this liberal entertainment came from Salim. When a third part of the night was passed, Judar set sweetmeats before them, and Salim served them, whilst his two brothers sat with the guests till they sought to sleep. Accordingly Judar lay down, and the others with him, who waited till he was asleep, when they fell upon him together, and gagging and pinioning him before he was awake, carried him forth of the house under cover of the night. And Shehrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 29. Recording by Natalie Gray. www.voicebynatalie.com Section 30 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Natalie Gray. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 30. When it was the six hundred and seventeenth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that they seized Judar, and carrying him forth of the house under cover of the night, at once packed him off to Suez, where they shackled him, and set him to work as a galley slave. And he ceased not to serve thus in silence a whole year. So far concerning Judar, but as for his brothers, they went in the next morning to his mother, and said to her, Our mother, our brother Judar is not awake. Said she, Do ye wake him? 
asked they, Where lieth he? And she answered, With the guests. They rejoined, Haply he went away with them whilst we slept, O mother. It would seem that he had tasted of strangerhood, and yearned to get at hidden hordes, for we heard him at talk with the moors, and they said to him, We will take thee with us, and open the treasure to thee. She inquired, Hath he then been in company with moors? And they replied, saying, Were they not our guests yesternight? And she, Most like he hath gone with them, but Allah will direct him on the right way, for there is a blessing upon him, and he will surely come back with great good. But she wept, for it was grievous to her to be parted from her son. Then they said to her, O accursed woman, dost thou love Judar with all this love? Whilst as for us, whether we be absent or present, thou neither joyest in us nor sorrowest for us. Are we not thy sons, even as Judar is thy son? She said, Ye indeed are my sons, but ye are reprobates who deserve no favor of me, for since your father's death I have never seen any good in you, whilst as for Judar, I have had abundant good of him, and he hath heartened my heart and entreated me with honor. Wherefore it behoveth me to weep for him, because of his kindness to me and to you. When they heard this, they abused her and beat her, after which they sought for the saddlebags, till they found the two pairs, and took the enchanted one, and all the gold from one pouch, and jewels from the other of the unenchanted, saying, This was our father's good. Said their mother, Not so, by Allah. It belongeth to your brother Judar, who brought it from the land of the Maghrabi. Said they, Thou liest, it was our father's property, and we will dispose of it as we please. Then they divided the gold and jewels between them, but a bramble arose between them concerning the enchanted saddlebags, Salim saying, I will have them, and Salim saying, I will take them. And they came to high words. Then she said, O oh, my sons, ye have divided the gold and the jewels, but this may not be divided, nor can its value be made up in money, and if it be cut in twain, its spell will be voided. So leave it with me, and I will give you to eat from it at all times, and be content to take a morsel with you. If ye allow me aught to clothe me, twill be of your bounty, and each of you shall traffic with the folk for himself. Ye are my sons, and I am your mother. Wherefore let us abide as we are, lest your brother come back and we be disgraced. But they accepted not her words, and passed the night wrangling with each other. Now it chanced that a janissary of the king's guards was a guest in the house adjoining Judar's, and heard them through the open window. So he looked out, and listening, heard all the angry words that passed between them, and saw the division of the spoil. Next morning he presented himself before the king of Egypt, whose name was Shams al Dullah and told him all he had heard. Whereupon he sent for Judar's brothers, and put them to the question, till they confessed. And he took the two pairs of saddlebags from them, and clapped them in prison, appointing a sufficient daily allowance to their mother. Now, as regards Judar, he abode a whole year in service at Suez, till one day, being in a ship bound on a voyage over the sea, a wind arose against them and cast the vessel upon a rock projecting from a mountain, where she broke up and all on board were drowned and none get ashore save Judar. As soon as he landed, he fared on inland till he reached an encampment of Badawi, who questioned him of his case, and he told them he had been a sailor. Now there was in camp a merchant, a native of Jiddah, who took pity on him and said to him, Wilt thou take service with me, O Egyptian, and I will clothe thee and carry thee with me to Jiddah? So Judar took service with him and accompanied him to Jiddah, where he showed him much favor. After a while his master the merchant set out on a pilgrimage to Mecca, taking Judar with him. And when they reached the city, the Kyrene repaired to the Haram temple, 
to circumambulate the Kaaba. As he was making the prescribed circuits, he suddenly saw his friend Abd al Samad the Moor doing the like. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and eighteenth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Judar, as he was making the circuits, suddenly saw his friend Abd al Samad also circumambulating, and when the Maghrabi caught sight of him, he saluted him and asked him of his state, whereupon Judar wept and told him all that had befallen him. So the Moor carried him to his lodging and entreated him with honor, clothing him in a dress of which the like was not, and saying to him, Thou hast seen the end of thine ills, O Judar. Then he drew out for him a geometric figure, which showed what had befallen Salim and Salim, and said to Judar, Such and such things have befallen thy brothers, and they are now in the king of Egypt's prison. But thou art right welcome to abide with me and accomplish thine ordinances of pilgrimage, and all shall be well. Replied Judar, O my lord, let me go and take leave of the merchant with whom I am, and after I will come back to thee. Dost thou owe money? asked the Moor, and he answered, No. Said Abdal Samad, Go thou and take leave of him, and come back forthright, for bread hath claims of its own from the ingenuous. So Judar returned to the merchant and farewelled him, saying, I have fallen in with my brother. Go, bring him here, said the merchant, and we will make him an entertainment. But Judar answered, saying, He hath no need of that, for he is a man of wealth and hath many servants. Then the merchant gave Judar twenty dinars, saying, Acquit me of responsibility. And he bade him adieu and went forth from him. Presently he saw a poor man, so he gave him the twenty ducats and returned to the moor, with whom he abode till they had accomplished the pilgrimage rites, when Abd al Samad gave him the seal ring that he had taken from the treasure of al Shamardal, saying, This ring will win thee thy wish, for it enchanteth and hath a servant by name al Ra'ad al Kasif. So whatever thou hast a mind to of the wants of this world, Rub this ring, and its servant will appear and do all thou biddest him. Then he rubbed the ring before him, whereupon the genie appeared, saying, Atsam, O my lord, ask what thou wilt, and it shall be given thee. Hast thou a mind to people a ruined city, or ruin a populous one, to slay a king, or to rout a host? O Ra'ad, said Abd al Samad, this is become thy lord, do thou serve him faithfully. Then he dismissed him and said to Judar, Rub the ring and the servant will appear, and do thou command him to do whatever thou desirest, for he will not gainsay thee. Now go to thine own country and take care of the ring, for by means of it thou wilt baffle thine enemies and be not ignorant of its puissance. O my lord, quoth Judar, with thy leave I will set out homewards. Quoth the Maghrabi, Summon the genie and mount upon his back, and if thou say to him, Bring me to my native city this very day, he will not disobey thy commandment. So he took leave of Moor Abd al Samad and rubbed the ring, Whereupon Al Ra'ad presented himself, saying, Atsam, ask, and it shall be given to thee. Said Judar, Carry me to Cairo this day. And he replied, Thy will be done. And taking him on his back, flew with him from noon till midnight, when he set him down in the courtyard of his mother's house and disappeared. Judar went into his mother who rose weeping and greeted him fondly, and told him how the king had beaten his brothers and cast them into jail and taken the two pairs of saddlebags, which, when he heard, it was no light matter to him, and he said to her, 
Grieve not for the past. I will show thee what I can do, and bring my brothers hither forthright. So he rubbed the ring, whereupon its servant appeared, saying, Here I am, ask and thou shalt have. Quoth Judar, I bid thee bring my two brothers from the prison of the king. So the genie sank into the earth, and came not up, but in the midst of the jail where Salim and Salim lay in piteous plight and sore sorrow for the plagues of prison, so that they wished for death, and one of them said to the other, By Allah, O my brother, affliction is longsome upon us. How long shall we abide in this prison? Death would be a relief. As he spoke, behold, the earth clove in sunder, and out came Al-Ra'ad, who took both up and plunged with them into the earth. They swooned away for excess of fear, and when they recovered, they found themselves in their mother's house and saw Judar seated by her side. Quoth he, I salute you, O my brothers. You have cheered me by your presence. And they bowed their heads and burst into tears. Then said he, Weep not, for it was Satan and Covetize that led you to do thus. How could you sell me? But I comfort myself with the thought of Joseph, whose brothers did with him even more than ye did with me, because they cast him into the pit. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and nineteenth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Judar said to his brothers, how could you do with me thus? But repent unto Allah, and crave pardon of him, and he will forgive you both, for he is the most forgiving, the merciful. As for me, I pardon you and welcome you. No harm shall befall you. Then he comforted them, and set their hearts at ease, and related to them all he had suffered, till he fell in with Sheikh Abd al-Samad, and told them also of the seal ring. They replied, O oh, our brother, forgive us this time, and if we return to our old ways, do with us as thou wilt. Quoth he, No harm shall befall you, but tell me what the king did with you. Quoth they, He beat us and threatened us with death, and took the two pairs of saddlebags from us. Will he not care? said Judar, and rubbed the ring, whereupon Al-Ra'ad appeared. When his brothers saw him, they were frighted and thought Judar would bid him slay them, so they fled to their mother, crying, O oh, our mother, we throw ourselves on thy generosity. Do thou intercede for us, O oh, our mother. And she said to them, O oh, my sons, fear nothing. Then said Judar to the servant, I command thee to bring me all that is in the king's treasury of goods and such. Let nothing remain, and fetch the two pairs of saddlebags he took from my brothers. I hear and I obey, replied Al-Ra'ad, and disappearing straightway, gathered together all he found in the treasury, and returned with the two pairs of saddlebags, and the deposits therein, and laid them before Judar, saying, O oh my lord, I have left nothing in the treasury. Judar gave the treasure to his mother, bidding her keep it, and laying the enchanted saddlebags before him, said to the genie, I command thee to build me this night a lofty palace, and overlay it with liquid gold, and furnish it with magnificent furniture, and let not the day dawn ere thou be quit of the whole work, replied he, Thy bidding shall be obeyed, and sank into the earth. Then Judar brought forth food, and they ate and took their ease, and lay down to sleep. Meanwhile Al-Ra'ad summoned his attendant jinn, and bade them build the palace. So some of them fell to hewing stones, and some to building, whilst others plastered and painted and furnished. Nor did the day dawn ere the ordinance of the palace was complete. Whereupon Al-Ra'ad came to Judar and said to him, O oh my lord, the palace is finished and in best order, and it pleased thee to come and look on it. So Judar went forth with his mother and brothers, and saw a palace whose like there was not in the whole world, and it confounded all minds with the goodliness of its ordinance. Judar was delighted with it while he was passing along the highway 
and withal it had cost him nothing. Then he asked his mother, Say me, wilt thou take up thine abode in this palace? And she answered, I will, O my son, and called down blessings upon him. Then he rubbed the ring and bade the genie fetch him forty handsome white handmaids and forty black damsels and as many mamelukes and negro slaves. Thy will be done, answered Al-Ra'ad, and betaking himself with forty of his attendant genii to Hind and Sind and Persia, snatched up every beautiful girl and boy they saw till they had made up the required number. Moreover, he sent other fourscore who fetched comely black girls, and forty others brought male chattels and carried them all to Judar's house, which they filled. Then he showed them to Judar, who was pleased with them, and said, Bring for each a dress of the finest. Ready, replied the servant. Then quoth he, Bring a dress for my mother, and another for myself, and also for my brothers. So the genie fetched all that was needed, and clad the female slaves, saying to them, This is your mistress, kiss her hands and cross her not, but serve her white and black. The Mamelukes also dressed themselves and kissed Judar's hands, and he and his brothers arrayed themselves in the robes the genie had brought them, and Judar became like unto a king, and his brothers as wazirs. Now his house was spacious, so he lodged Salim and his slave girls in one part thereof, and Salim and his slave girls in another, whilst he and his mother took up their abode in the new palace, and each in his own place was like a sultan. So far concerning them, but as regards the king's treasurer, thinking to take something from the treasury, he went in and found it altogether empty, even as saith the poet, twas as a hive of bees that greatly thrived, but when the bee swarm fled, twas clean unhived. So he gave a great cry and fell down in a fit. When he came to himself, he left the door open, and going in to King Shams al dalah said to him, O commander of the faithful, I have to inform thee that the treasury hath become empty during the night. Quoth the king, What hast thou done with my monies which were therein? Quoth he, By Allah, I have not done aught with them, nor know I what is come of them. I visited the place yesterday and saw it full. But today when I went in, I found it clean, empty, albeit the doors were locked, the walls were unpierced, and the bolts are unbroken, nor hath a thief entered it. Asked the king, Are the two pairs of saddlebags gone? Yes, replied the treasurer, whereupon the king's reason flew from his head. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 30 Recording by Natalie Gray www.voicebynatalie.com Section 31 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Novella Serena The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Volume 6 by Anonymous Translated by Richard Francis Burton Section 31 When it was the six hundred and twentieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the treasurer informed the king that all in the treasury had been plundered, including the two pairs of saddlebags, the king's reason flew from his head, and he rose to his feet, saying, Go thou before me. Then he followed the treasurer to the treasury, and he found nothing there. Whereat he was wroth with him, and he said to them, O soldiers, know that my treasury hath been plundered during the night, and I know not who did this deed, and dared thus to outrage me without fear of me. Said they, How so? And he replied, Ask the treasurer. So they questioned him, and he answered, saying, 
Yesterday I visited the treasury and it was full. But this morning, when I entered it, I found it empty, though the walls were unpierced and the doors unbroken. They all marvelled at this, and could make the king no answer, when in came the janissary, who had denounced Selim and Selim, and said to Shams al-Dallah, O oh, king of the age, all this night I have not slept for that which I saw. And the king asked, And what didst thou see? No, O oh, king of the age, answered the kavas that all night long I have been amusing myself with watching builders at work, and, when it was day, I saw a palace ready edified, whose like is not in the world. So I asked about it, and was told that Judar had come back with great wealth and mamelukes and slaves, and that he had freed his two brothers from prison, and built this palace, wherein he is as a sultan. Quoth the king, Go, look in the prison. So they went thither, and not finding Selim and Selim, returned and told the king, who said, It is plain now who be the thief. He who took Selim and Selim out of prison it is, who hath stolen my monies. Quoth the vizier, O oh, my lord, and who is he? And quoth the king, Their brother Judar, and he hath taken the two pairs of saddle-bags. But, O oh, vizier, do thou send him an emir with fifty men to seal up his goods and lay hands on him, and his brothers, and bring them to me, that I may hang them. And he was sore enraged, and said, Ho, off with the emir at once, and fetch them, that I may put them to death. But the vizier said to him, Be thou merciful, for Allah is merciful, and hasteth not to punish his servants, when as they sin against him. Moreover, he who can build a palace in a single night, as these say, none in the world can vie with him and verily i fear lest the emir fall into difficulty for judar have patience therefore whilst i devise for thee some device of getting at the truth of the case and so shalt thou win thy wish o king of the age quoth the king counsel me how i shall do o vizier and the minister said send him an emir with an invitation and i will make much of him for thee and make a show of love for him and ask him of his estate, after which we will see. If we find him stout of heart, we will use slight with him, and if weak of will, then do thou seize him, and do with him thy desire. The king agreed to this, and dispatched one of his emirs, Othman Eyes, to go and invite Judar, and say to him, The king biddeth thee to a banquet. And the king said to him, Return not, except with him. Now this Othman was a fool, proud and conceited so he went forth upon his errand and when he came to the gate of judar's palace he saw before the door a eunuch seated upon a chair of gold who at his approach rose not but sat as if none came near though there were with the emir fifty footmen now this eunuch was none other than al raad al kasif the servant of the ring whom judar had commanded to put on the guise of a eunuch and sit at the palace gate so the emir rode up to him and asked him, O oh, slave, where is thy lord? Whereto he answered, In the palace. But he stirred not from his leaning posture. Whereupon the emir Othman waxed wroth and said to him, O oh, pestilent slave, art thou not ashamed when I speak to thee to answer me sprawling at thy length like a gallows bird? Replied the eunuch, Off and multiply not words. Hardly had Othman heard this when he was filled with rage and drawing his mace, would have smitten the eunuch, knowing not that he was a devil. But Al-Rahad leapt upon him, and taking the mace from him, dealt him four blows with it. Now when the fifty men saw their lord beaten, it was grievous to them. So they drew their swords and ran to slay the slave. But he said, Do ye draw on us, O dogs? and rose at them with the mace, and every one whom he smote, he broke his bones and drowned him in his blood. So they fell back before him and fled, whilst he followed them, beating them, till he had driven them far from the palace gate, after which he returned, and sat down on his chair at the door, caring for none. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and twenty-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, 
that the eunuch having put to flight the emir othman the king's officer and his men till they were driven far from judar's gate returned and sat down on his chair at the door caring for none but as for the emir and his company they returned discomfited and funded to king shams al and othman said o oh, king of the age when i came to the palace gate i espied an eunuch seated there in a chair of gold and he was passing proud for when he saw me approach he stretched himself at full length albeit he'd been sitting in his chair and entreated me contumeliously neither offered to rise to me so i began to speak to him and he answered without stirring whereat wrath get hold of me and i drew the mace upon him thinking to smite him but he snatched it from me, and beat me and my men therewith, and overthrew us. So we fled from before him, and could not prevail against him. At this the king was wroth, and said, Let an hundred men go down to him. Accordingly the hundred men went down to attack him. But he arose, and fell upon them with the mace, and ceased not smiting them till he had put them to the rout, when he regained his chair. Upon which they returned to the king, and told him what had passed, saying, o king of the age he beat us and we fled for fear of him then the king sent two hundred men against him but these also he put to the rout and shams al said to his minister i charge thee o vizier take five hundred men and bring this eunuch in haste and with him his master judar and his brothers replied the vizier o king of the age i need no soldiers but will go down to him alone and unarmed go quoth the king and do as thou seest suitable so the vizier laid down his arms and donning a white habit took a rosary in his hand and set out afoot alone and unattended when he came to judar's gate he saw the slave sitting there so he went up to him and seating himself by his side courteously said to him peace be with thee whereto he replied and on thee be peace o mortal what wilt thou when the vizier heard him say o mortal he knew him to be of the jinn and quaked for fear then he asked him o my lord tell me is thy master judar here answered the eunuch yes he is in the palace quoth the minister o my lord go thou to him and say to him King Shams al saluteth thee, and biddeth thee honour his dwelling with thy presence, and eat of a banquet he hath made for thee. Quoth the eunuch, Tarry thou here whilst I consult him. So the vizier stood in a respectful attitude, whilst the marid went up to the palace and said to Judar, Know, O my lord, that the king sent to thee an emir and fifty men, and I beat them, and drove them away. Then, he sent a hundred men, and I beat them also, then two hundred, and these also I put to the rout. And now he hath sent thee his vizier, unarmed, bidding thee visit him and eat of his banquet. What sayest thou? Said Judar, Go, bring the vizier hither. So the marid went down and said to him, O vizier, come speak with my lord. On my head be it, replied he, and going in to Judar found him seated, in greater state than the king upon a carpet whose like the king could not spread and was dazed and amazed at the goodliness of the palace and its decoration and appointments which made him seem as he were a beggar in comparison so he kissed the ground before judar and called down blessings on him and judar said to him what is thy business o vizier replied he o my lord thy friend king shams al saluted thee with a salam and longeth to look upon thy face wherefore he hath made thee an entertainment so say wilt thou heal his heart and eat of his banquet quoth judar if he be indeed my friend salute him and bid him come to me on my head be it quoth the minister then judar bringing out the ring rubbed it and bade the jinni fetch him a dress of the best which he gave to the vizier saying don this dress and go tell the king what i say so the vizier donned the dress the like whereof he had never donned and returning to the king told him what had passed and praised the palace and that which was therein saying judar biddeth thee to him so the king called out up ye men mount your horses and bring me my steed that we may go to judar 
Then he and his suite rode off for the Carine Palace. Meanwhile, Judar summoned the Marid and said to him, It is my will that thou bring me some of the Ifrits at thy command in the guise of guards and station them in the open square before the palace, that the king may see them and be awed by them, so that his heart may tremble and he shall know that my power and majesty be greater than his. Thereupon al Rad brought him two hundred Ifrits of great stature and strength in the guise of guards, magnificently armed and equipped. And when the king came and saw these tall burly fellows, his heart feared them. Then he entered the palace and found Judar sitting in such state as nor king nor sultan could even. So he saluted him and made his obeisance to him. Yet Judar rose not to him, nor did him honour, nor said, Be seated, but left him standing. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and twenty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the king entered, Judah rose not to him, nor did him honour, nor even said, Be seated, but left him standing, so that fear entered into him, and he could neither sit nor go away, and said to himself, if he feared me, he would not leave me thus unheeded. Peraventure he will do me a mischief, because of what I did with his brothers. Then said Judar, O king of the age, it beseemeth not the like of thee to wrong the folk and to take away their good. Replied the king, O my lord, deign excuse me, for greed impelled me to this, and fate was thereby fulfilled. And, were there no offending, there would be no forgiving. And he went on to excuse himself for the past, and pray to him for pardon and indulgence, till he recited, amongst other things, this poetry. O thou of generous seed and true nobility, reproach me not for that which came from me to thee. We pardon thee if thou have wrought us any wrong, and if I wrought the wrong, I pray thee pardon me. And he ceased not to humble himself before him, till he said, Allah pardon thee, and bade him be seated. So he sat down, and Judar invested him with garments of pardon and immunity, and ordered his brothers spread the table. When they had eaten, he clad the whole of the king's company in robes of honour, and gave them largesse, after which he bade the king depart. So he went forth, and thereafter came every day to visit Judar, and held not his divan, save in his house. Wherefore friendship and familiarity waxed great between them, and they abode thus a while till one day the king, being alone with his minister, said to him, O vizier, I fear lest Judar slay me and take the kingdom away from me. Replied the vizier, O king of the age, as for his taking the kingdom from thee, have no fear of that, for Judar's present estate is greater than that of the king, and to take the kingdom would be a lowering of his dignity. But if thou fear that he kill thee, thou hast a daughter, Give her to him to wife, and thou and he will be of one condition. Quoth the king, O vizier, be thou intermediary between us and him. And quoth the minister, Do thou invite him to an entertainment, and pass the night with him in one of thy saloons. Then bid thy daughter don her richest dress and ornaments, and pass by the door of the saloon. When he seeth her, he will assuredly fall in love with her. And when we know this, I will turn to him, and tell him that she is thy daughter, and engage him in converse, and lead him on, so that thou shalt seem to know nothing of the matter till he ask her to thee to wife. When thou hast married him to the princess, thou and he will be as one thing, and thou wilt be safe from him. And if he die, thou wilt inherit all he hath, both great and small. Replied the king, Thou sayest sooth, O my vizier, and made a banquet, and invited there to Judar, who came to the sultan's palace, and they sat in the saloon in great good cheer till the end of the day. Now the king had commanded his wife to array the maiden in her richest raiment and ornaments, and carry her by the door of the saloon. She did as he told her, and when Judar saw the princess, who had not her match for beauty and grace, he looked fixedly at her, and said, Ah! and his limbs were loosened, for love and longing and passion and pine were sore upon him. Desire and transport get hold upon him, and he turned pale. Quoth the vizier, May no harm befall thee, O my lord. Why do I see thee change colour and in suffering? Asked Judar. 
o vizier whose daughter is this damsel verily she hath enthralled me and ravished my reason replied the vizier she is the daughter of thy friend the king and if she please thee i will speak to him that he marry thee to her quoth judar do so o vizier and as i live i will bestow on thee what thou wilt and will give the king whatsoever he shall ask to her dowry and we will become friends and kinsfolk quoth the minister it shall go hard but thy desire be accomplished then he turned to the king and said in his ear o king of the age thy friend judar seeketh alliance with thee and will have me ask of thee for him the hand of thy daughter the princess asia so disappoint me not but accept my intercession and what dowry soever thou askest he will give thee said the king the dowry i have already received and as for the girl she is his handmaid i give her to him to wife and he will do me honour by accepting her and shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section 31 recording by novella serena section 32 of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 6 by anonymous translated by richard francis burton section 32 when it was the 623rd night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the wazir whispered the king judar seeketh alliance with thee by taking thy daughter to wife the other replied the dowry i have already received and the girl is his handmaid he will do me honour by accepting her so they spent the rest of that night together and on the morrow the king held a court to which he summoned great and small together with the sheikh al islam then Judar demanded the princess in marriage, and the king said, The dowry I have received. Thereupon they drew up the marriage contract, and Judar sent for the saddlebags containing the jewels, and gave them to the king as settlement upon his daughter. The drums beat, and the pipes sounded, and they held high festival, whilst Judar went in unto the girl. Thenceforward he and the king were as one flesh, and they abode thus for many days, till Shams al Daulah died whereupon the troops proclaimed Judar Sultan, and he refused, but they importuned him till he consented, and they made him king in his father-in-law's stead. Then he bade build a cathedral mosque over the late king's tomb in the Bundukaniya quarter, and endowed it. Now the quarter of Judar's house was called Yamaniya, but when he became Sultan he built therein a congregational mosque and other buildings, wherefore the quarter was named after him, and was called the Judaria quarter. Moreover, he made his brother Salim his wazir of the right, and his brother Salim his wazir of the left hand, and thus they abode a year and no more, for at the end of that time Salim said to Salim, O my brother, how long is this state to last? Shall we pass our whole lives in slavery to our brother Judar? We shall never enjoy luck or lordship whilst he lives, adding, So how shall we do to kill him and take the ring and the saddle-bags? Replied Salim, thou art craftier than i do thou devise whereby we may kill him if i effect this asked salim wilt thou agree that i be sultan and keep the ring and that thou be my right hand wazir and have the saddle-bags salim answered i consent to this and they agreed to slay judar their brother for love of the world and of dominion so they laid a snare for judar and said to him o our brother verily we have a mind to glory in thee and would fain have thee enter our houses and eat of our entertainment and solace our hearts replied judar so be it in whose house shall the banquet be in mine said salim and after thou hast eaten of my victual thou shalt be the guest of my brother said judar tis well and went with him to his house where he set before him poisoned food of which when he had eaten his flesh rotted from his bones and he died then Salim came up to him, and would have drawn the ring from his finger, but it resisted him. So he cut off the finger with a knife. Then he rubbed the ring, and the marid presented himself, saying, Adsum, ask what thou wilt. Quoth Salim, Take my brother Salim, 
and put him to death, and carry forth the two bodies, the poisoned and the slaughtered, and cast them down before the troops. So the Marid took Salim and slew him. Then carrying the two corpses forth, he cast them down before the chief officers of the army, who were sitting at table in the parlour of the house. When they saw Judar and Salim slain, they raised their hands from the food, and fear get hold of them, and they said to the Marid, Who hath dealt thus with the Sultan and the Wazir? replied the genie, Their brother Salim. And behold, Salim came up to them, and said, O soldiers, eat and make merry, for Judar is dead, and I have taken to me the seal-ring, whereof the Marid before you is the servant. And I bade him slay my brother Salim, lest he dispute the kingdom with me, for he was a traitor, and I feared lest he should betray me. So now I am become sultan over you. Will ye accept of me? If not, I will rub the ring, and bid the Marid slay you all, great and small." And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and twenty-fourth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Salem said to the officers, Will ye accept me as your sultan, otherwise I will rub the ring, and the marid shall slay you all, great and small, they replied, We accept thee to king and sultan. And then he bade bury his brothers, and summoned the divan and some of the folk followed the funeral, whilst others forewent him in state procession to the audience-hall of the palace, where he sat down on the throne, and they did homage to him as king. After which he said, It is my will to marry my brother Judar's wife. Quoth they, Wait till the days of widowhood are accomplished. Quoth he, I know not days of widowhood, or aught else. As my head liveth, I needs must go in unto her this very night. So they drew up the marriage contract, and sent to tell the Princess Asiya, who replied, Bid him enter. Accordingly he went in to her, and she received him with a show of joy and welcome. But by and by she gave him poison in water, and made an end of him. Then she took the ring, and broke it, that none might possess it thenceforward, and tore up the saddle-bags. After which she sent to the Sheikh al-Islam, and other great officers of state, telling them what had passed, and saying to them, Choose you out a king to rule over you. And this is all that hath come down to us of the story of Judar and his brethren. But I have also heard, O king, a tale called The History of Garib and his brother Ajib. There was once in olden time a king of might, Kundamir Hais, who had been a brave and doughty man of war, a Karaman in his day, but was grown passing old and decrepit. Now it pleased Allah to vouchsafe him, in his extreme senility, a son, whom he named Ajib, the Wonderful, because of his beauty and loveliness. So he committed the babe to the midwives and wet-nurses and handmaids and serving-women, and they reared him till he was full seven years old, when his father gave him in charge to a divine of his own folk and faith. The priest taught him the laws and tenets of their misbelief, and instructed him in philosophy and all manner of other knowledge and it needed but three full told years, ere he was proficient therein, and his spirit waxed resolute, and his judgment mature. And he became learned, eloquent, and philosophic, consorting with the wise, and disputing with the doctors of the law. When his father saw this of him, it pleased him, and he taught him to back the steed, and stab with spear, and smite with sword, till he grew to be an accomplished cavalier, versed in all martial exercises and by the end of his twentieth year he surpassed in all things all the folk of his day. But his skill in weapons made him grow up a stubborn tyrant and a devil arrogant, using to ride forth a hunting and a chasing amongst a thousand horsemen, and to make raids and razias upon the neighbouring knights, cutting off caravans and carrying away the daughters of kings and nobles. Wherefore many brought complaints against him to his father, who cried out to five of his slaves, and when they came said, Seize this dog. So they seized Prince Ajib, and pinioning his hands behind him, beat him by his father's command, till he lost his senses. After which the king imprisoned him in a chamber so dark one might not know heaven from earth, or length from breadth. And there he abode two days and a night. Then the emirs went into the king, and kissing the ground between his hands, interceded with him for the prince, and he released him. So Ajib bore with his father for ten days, at the end of which he went into him as he slept by night, and smote his neck. 
When the day rose, he mounted the throne of his sire's estate, and bade his men arm themselves cap a pied in steel, and stand with drawn swords in front of him, and on his right hand and on his left. By and by, the emirs and captains entered, and finding their king slain and his son Ajib seated on the throne, were confounded in mind, and knew not what to do. But Ajib said to them, O folk, verily ye see what your king hath gained. Whoso obeyeth me, I will honour him, and whoso gainsayeth me, I will do with him that which I did with my sire. When they heard these words, they feared lest he do them a mischief. So they replied, Thou art our king, and the son of our king, and kissed ground before him. Whereupon he thanked them, and rejoiced in them. Then he bade bring forth money and apparel, and clad them in sumptuous robes of honour, and showered largesse upon them. Wherefore they all loved him and obeyed him. In like manner he honoured the governors of the provinces, and the sheikhs of the Badawin, both tributary and independent, so that the whole kingdom submitted to him, and the folk obeyed him, and he reigned and bade and forbade in peace and quiet for a time of five months. One night, however, he dreamed a dream as he lay slumbering, whereupon he awoke trembling, nor did sleep visit him again till morning. As soon as it was dawn, he mounted his throne, and his officers stood before him, right and left. Then he called the Oniromonts and the astrologers, and said to them, Expound to me my dream. What was the dream? asked they. And he answered, As I slept last night, I saw my father standing before me, with his yard uncovered. And there came forth of it a thing the bigness of a bee, which grew till it became as a mighty lion, with claws like hangers. As I lay wondering at this, lo, it ran upon me, and smiting me with its claws, rent my belly in sunder, whereupon I awoke startled and trembling. So expound ye to me the meaning of this dream. The interpreters looked one at other, and after considering, said, O mighty king, this dream pointeth to one born of thy sire, between whom and thee shall befall strife and enmity, wherein he shall get the better of thee. So be on thy guard against him by reason of this thy vision. When Ajib heard their words, he said, I have no brother whom I should fear. So this your speech is mere lying. They replied, We tell thee not save what we know. But he was anangered with them, and bastinadoed them. Then he arose, and going into the paternal palace, examined his father's concubines, and found one of them seven months gone with child. Whereupon he gave an order to two of his slaves, saying, Take this damsel, ye twain, and carry her to the seashore, and drown her. So they took her forthright, and going to the seashore, designed to drown her. When they looked at her, and seeing her to be of singular beauty and loveliness, said to each other, Why should we drown this damsel? Let us rather carry her to the forest, and live with her there in rare lovely us. Then they took her, and fared on with her days and nights, till they had borne her afar off, and had brought her to a bushy forest abounding in fruit-trees and streams, where they both thought at the same time to win their will of her. But each said, I will have her first. So they fell out one with the other concerning this, and while so doing a company of blackamoors came down upon them, and they drew their swords, and both sides fell to laying on load. The melee waxed hot with cut and thrust, and the two slaves fought their best, but the blacks slew them both in less than the twinkling of an eye. So the damsel abode alone, and wandered about the forest, eating of its fruits and drinking of its founts, till in due time she gave birth to a boy, brown but clean-limbed and comely, whom she named Garib the Stranger, by reason of her strangerhood. Then she cut his navel-string, and wrapping him in some of her own clothes, gave him to suck, harrowed at heart, and with vitals sorrowing for the estate she had lost and its honour and solace. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and twenty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the damsel abode in the bush, harrowed at heart, and a-sorrowed. But she suckled her babe, albeit she was full of grief and fear for her loneliness. Now behold, one day there came horsemen and footmen into the forest, with hawks and hounds, and horses laden with partridges, and cranes, and wild geese, and diverse other waterfowl and young ostriches, and hares, and gazelles, and wild oxen, and lynxes, and wolves, and lions. Presently these Arabs entered the thicket, and came upon the damsel, sitting with her child on her breast a-suckling him. So they drew near, and asked her, 
Say art thou a mortal, or a jinniya? Answered she, I am a mortal, O chiefs of the Arabs. Thereupon they told her emir, whose name was Mardas, principal of the Banu Katan, and who had come forth that day to hunt with five hundred of his cousins and the nobles of his tribe, and who in the course of the chase had happened upon her. He bade them bring her before him, which they did, and she related to him her past from first to last, whereat he marvelled. Then he cried to his kinsmen and escort to continue the chase, after which they took her and returned to their encampment, where the emir appointed her a separate dwelling-place and five damsels to serve her, and he loved her with exceeding love and went in to her and lay with her. She conceived by him straightway, and when her months were accomplished, she bare a man-child and named him Sahim Alail. He grew up with his brother Garib among the nurses, and throve and waxed upon the lap of the emir Madas, who in due time committed the two boys to a faqih for instruction in the things of their faith, after which he gave them in charge to a valiant of knights of the Arabs, for training them to smite with sword, and lunge with lance, and shoot with shaft. So by the time they reached the age of fifteen, they knew all they needed, and surpassed each and every brave of their tribe for Garib would undertake a thousand horse, and Sahim Alail no fewer. Now Mardas had many enemies, and the men of his tribe were the bravest of all the Arabs, being doughty cavaliers, none might warn himself at their fire. In his neighbourhood was an emir of the Arabs, Hassan bin Sabit Hait, who was his intimate friend, and he took to wife a noble lady of his tribe, and bade all his friends to the wedding, amongst them Mardas, lord of the Banu Katan who accepted his invitation and set forth with three hundred riders of his tribe, leaving other four hundred to guard the women. Hassan met him with honour and seated him in the highest stead. Then came all the cavaliers to the bridal, and he made them bride feasts and held high festival by reason of the marriage, after which the Arabs departed to their dwelling-places. When Mardas came in sight of his camp he saw slain men lying about and birds hovering over them right and left, and his heart sank within him at the sight. Then he entered the camp and was met by Garib, clad in complete suit of ring-mail, who gave him joy of his safe return. Quoth Mardas, What meaneth this case, O Garib? And quoth Garib, Al-Hamal bin Majid attacked us with five hundred horsemen of his tribe. Now the reason of this was that the emir Mardas had a daughter called Madiya, seer never saw fairer than she, and Al-Hamal, lord of the Banu Naban, heard of her charms, whereupon he took horse with five hundred of his men, and rode to Mardas to demand her hand. But he was not accepted, and was sent away disappointed. So he awaited till Mardas was absent on his visit to Hassan, when he mounted with his champions, and falling upon the camp of the Banu Katan, slew a number of their knights, and the rest fled to the mountains. Now Garib and his brother had ridden forth a-hunting and chasing with an hundred horse, and returned not till midday when they found that Al-Hamal had seized the camp and all therein, and had carried off the maidens, among whom was Madiya, driving her away with the captives. When Garib saw this, he lost his wits for rage, and cried out to Sahim, saying, O my brother, O son of an accursed dam, they have plundered our camp, and carried off our women and children, up and at the enemy, that we may deliver the captives. So Garib and Sahim, and their hundred horse rushed upon the foe, and Garib's wrath redoubled, and he reaped a harvest of heads slain, given the champion's death-cup to drain, till he won to Al-Hamal and saw Madiya among the captives. Then he drave at the lord of the Banu Naban braves. With his lance lunged him, and from his destrier hurled him. Nor was the time of mid-afternoon prayer come before he had slain the most part of the foe, and put to rout the rest, and rescued the captives, whereupon he returned to the camp in triumph bearing the head of Al-Hamal on the point of his lance, and improvising these couplets. I am he who is known on the day of fight, and the jinn of earth at my shade take fright, and a sword have I when my right hand wields, death hastens from left on mankind to alight. I have eke a lance, and who look thereon, see a crescent head of the liveliest light, and Garib I'm highs of my tribe the brave, and if few my men I feel not affright. Hardly had Garib made an end of these verses, when up came Mardas, who, seeing the slain and the vultures, was sore troubled, and with fluttering heart asked the cause. The youth, 
after due greetings, related all that had befallen the tribe in his stepsire's absence. So Mardas thanked him, and said, Thou hast well requited our fosterage pains in rearing thee, O Garib. Then he alighted, and entered his pavilion, and the men stood about him, all the tribe praising Garib, and saying, O our Emir, but for Garib not one of the tribe had been saved. And Mardas again thanked him, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 32 Recording by Bill Borst Section 33 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 6, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 33. When it was the six hundred and twenty-sixth night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Mardas, hearing the tribesmen's praises of Garib, again thanked him for his daring do. But the youth, when he had delivered Madia from Al-Hamal, whom he slew, was smitten by the shaft of her glances, and fell into the nets of her allurements. Wherefore his heart could not forget her, and he became drowned in love and longing, and the sweets of sleep forsook him, and he had no joy of drink or meat. He would spur his horse up to the mountain-tops, where he would spend the day in composing verses, and return at nightfall. And indeed, manifest upon him were the signs of affection and distraction. He discovered his secret to one of his companions, and it became noised abroad in the camp, till it reached the ears of Mardas, who thundered, and lightened, and rose up, and sat down, and sparked, and snorted, and reviled the sun and the moon, saying, this is the reward of him who reareth the sons of adultery. But except I kill Garib, I shall be put to shame." Then he consulted one of the wise men of his tribe, and after telling his secret took counsel with him of killing the youth. Quoth the elder, O Emir, t'was but yesterday that he freed thy daughter from captivity. If there be no help for it, but thou must slay him, let it be by the hand of another than thyself, so none of the folk may misdoubt of thee quoth Mardas, advise me how I may do him die, for I look to none but to thee for his death. O Emer, answered the other, wait till he go forth to hunt and chase. When do thou take an hundred horse and lie in wait for him in some cave, till he pass? Then fall upon him unawares, and cut him in pieces, so shalt thou be quit of his reproach. Said Mardas, this should serve me well, and chose out an hundred and fifty of his furious knights and Amalekites, whom he lessened to his will. Then he watched Garib till one day he went forth to hunt, and rode far away amongst the dells and hills. Whereupon Mardas followed him with his men, ill-omened whites, and lay in wait for him by the way against he should return from the chase, that they might sally forth and slay him. But as they lay in ambush among the trees, behold, there fell upon them five hundred true Amalekites, who slew sixty of them, and made fourscore and ten prisoners, and trussed up Mardus with his arms behind his back. Now the reason of this was that when Garib put Al-Hamal and his men to the sword, the rest fled, and ceased not flying, till they reached their lord's brother, and told him what had happened, whereat his doom day rose, and he gathered together his Amalekites, and choosing out five hundred cavaliers, each fifty ells high, set out with them in quest of blood revengement for his brother. By the way he fell in with Mardas and his companions, and there happened between them what happened. After which he bade his men alight and rest, saying, O folk, the idols have given us an easy brood reek. So guard ye Mardas and his tribesmen till I carry them away, and do them die with the foulest of deaths. When Mardis saw himself a prisoner, he repented of what he had done, and said, This is the reward of rebelling against the Lord. Then the enemy passed the night, rejoicing in their victory, while Mardis and his men despaired of life and made sure of doom. So far concerning them. But as regards Sahim al-Layl, who had been wounded in the fight with al-Hamal, he went in to his sister Medea, and she rose to him and kissed his hands, saying, May thy two hands ne'er wither nor thine enemies have occasion to be blither. But for thee and Garib we had not escaped captivity among our foes. Know, however, O my brother, 
that thy father hath ridden forth with an hundred and fifty horse, purposing to slaughter Garib, and thou wottest it would be sore loss and foul wrong to slay him, for that it was he who saved your shame and rescued your good. When Sahim heard this, the light in his sight became night. He donned his battle harness, and mounting steed, rode for the place where Garib was a-hunting. He presently came up with him, and found that he had taken great plenty of game. So he accosted him, and saluted him, and said, O oh, my brother, why didst thou go forth without telling me? Replied Garib, By Allah, naught hindered me but that I saw thee wounded, and thought to give thee rest. Then said Sahim, O oh, my brother, beware of my sire, and told him how Mardus was abroad with an hundred and fifty men seeking to slay him. Quoth Garib, Allah shall cause his treason to cut his own throat. Then the brothers set out campwards, but night overtook them by the way, and they rode on in darkness, till they drew near the wadi wherein the enemy lay, and heard the neighing of steeds in the gloom. Whereupon said Sahim, O my brother, my father and his men are ambushed in yonder valley. Let us flee from it. But Garib dismounted, and throwing his bridle to his brother, said to him, Stay in this stead till I come back to thee. Then he went on, till he drew in sight of the folk, when he saw that they were not of his tribe, and heard them naming Mardus, and saying, We will not slay him, save in his own land. Wherefore he knew that Nuncle Mardus was their prisoner, and said, By the life of Medea, I will not depart hence till I have delivered her father, that she may not be troubled. Then he sought, and ceased not seeking, till he hit upon Mardus, and found him bound with cords. So he sat down by his side, and said to him, Heaven deliver thee, O uncle, from these bonds and this shame. When Mardus saw Garib, his reason fled, and he said to him, O oh, my son, I am under thy protection, so deliver me in right of my fosterage of thee. Quoth Garib, If I deliver thee, wilt thou give me Medea? Quoth the emir, O oh, my son, by whatso I hold sacred, she is thine to all time. So he loosed him, saying, Make for the horses, for thy son Sahim is there and Mardus crept along like a snake till he came to his son, who rejoiced in him and congratulated him on his escape. Meanwhile Garib unbound one after another of the prisoners, till he had freed the whole ninety, and they were all far from the foe. Then he sent them their weapons and war-horses, saying to them, Mount ye, and scatter yourselves round about the enemy, and cry out, Ho, sons of Catan! And when they awake, do ye remove from them, and encircle them in a thin ring. So he waited till the last and third watch of the night, when he cried out, Ho, sons of Catan! And his men answered in like guise, crying, Ho, sons of Catan! as with one voice. And the mountains echoed their slogan, so that it seemed to the raiders as though the whole tribe of Banu Catan were assailing them. Wherefore they all snatched up their arms and fell upon one another. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and twenty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the raiders awoke from sleep, and heard Garib and his men crying out, Ho, sons of Catan, they imagined that the whole tribe was assailing them, wherefore they snatched up their arms, and fell one upon other with mighty slaughter. Garib and his men held aloof, and they fought one another till daybreak, when Garib and Mardas and their ninety warriors came down upon them, and killed some of them, and put the rest to flight. Then the Banu Katan took the horses of the fugitives and the weapons of the slain, and returned to the tribal camp, whilst Mardus could hardly credit his deliverance from the foe. When they reached the encampment, the stay-at-home folk all came forth to meet them, and rejoiced in their safe return. Then they alighted, and betook them to their tents, and all the youths of the tribe flocked to Garib's stead, and great and small saluted him, and did him honour. But when Mardus saw this, and the youths encircling his stepson, he waxed more jealous of Garib than before, and said to his kinsfolk, Verily, hatred of Garib groweth on my heart, and what irketh me most is that I see these flocking about him. And to-morrow he will demand Medea of me. Quoth his confidant, O Emir, ask of him somewhat he cannot avail to do. This pleased Mardus who passed a pleasant night, and on the morrow, as he sat on his stuffed carpet with the Arabs about him, Garib entered, 
followed by his men and surrounded by the youth of the tribe, and kissed the ground before Mardas, who, making a show of joy, rose to do him honour, and seated him beside himself. Then said Garib, O uncle, thou madest me a promise, do thou fulfil it. Replied the emir, O my son, she is thine to all time, but thou lackest wealth. Quoth Garib, O uncle, Ask of me what thou wilt, and I will fall upon the emirs of the Arabs in their houses, and on the kings in their towns, and bring thee fee enough to fence the land from east to west. O my son, quoth Mardas, I have sworn by all the idols that I would not give Medea, save to him who should take my blood white of mine enemy, and do away my reproach. O uncle, said Garib, tell me with which of the kings thou hast a feud, that I may go to him and break his throne upon his pate. O my son, replied Mardas, I once had a son, a champion of champions, and he went forth one day to chase and hunt with an hundred horse. They fared on from valley to valley, till they had wandered far away amongst the mountains, and came to the wadi of blossoms and the castle of Ham bin Shays bin Shaddad bin Khalad. Now in this place, O my son, dwelleth a black giant, seventy cubits high, who fights with trees from their roots up torn. And when my son reached his wadi, the tyrant sallied out upon him and his men, and slew them all, save three braves, who escaped and brought me the news. So I assembled my champions, and fared forth to fight the giant, but could not prevail against him. Wherefore I was balked of my revenge, and swore that I would not give my daughter in marriage, save to him who should avenge me of my son. Said Garib, O oh, uncle, I will go to this Amalekite, and take the reek of thy son on him, with the help of Almighty Allah. And Mardis answered, saying, O Garib, if thou get the victory over him, thou wilt gain of him such booty of wealth and treasures as fires may not devour. Cried Garib, Swear to me, before witnesses thou wilt give me her to wife, so that with heart at ease I may go forth to find my fortune. Accordingly, Mardis swore this to him, and took the elders of the tribe to witness. Whereupon Garib fared forth, rejoicing in the attainment of his hopes, and went in to his mother, to whom he related what had passed. O my son, said she, know that Mardus hateth thee, and doth but send thee to this mountain, to bereave me of thee. Then take me with thee, and let us depart the tents of this tyrant. But he answered, O my mother, I will not depart hence, till I win my wish and foil my foe. Thereupon he slept till morning arose with its sheen and shone, and hardly had he mounted his charger, when his friends, the young men, came up to him. Two hundred stalwart knights armed cap a pie and cried out to him, saying, Take us with thee, we will help thee and company thee by the way. And he rejoiced in them, and cried, Allah requite you for us with good, adding, Come, my friends, let us go. So they set out, and fared on the first day and the second day till evening, when they halted at the foot of a towering mount, and baited their horses. As for Garib, he left the rest, and walked on into that mountain, till he came to a cave whence issued a light. He entered, and found at the higher-facing end of the cave a sheikh, three hundred and forty years old, whose eyebrows overhung his eyes, and whose mustachios hid his mouth. Garib at this sight was filled with awe and veneration, and the hermit said to him, Methinks thou art of the idolaters, O my son, stone-worshipping in the stead of the all-powerful king, the creator of night and day, and of the sphere rolling on her way. When Garib heard his words, his side muscles quivered, and he said, O Sheikh, where is this lord of whom thou speakest, that I may worship him and take my fill of his sight? Replied the Sheikh, O my son, this is the supreme lord, upon whom none may look in this world. He seeth, and is not seen. He is the most high of aspect, and is present everywhere in his works. He it is, who maketh all the maid, and ordereth time to vade and fade. He is the creator of men and jinn, and sendeth the prophets to guide his creatures into the way of right. Whoso obeyeth him, he bringeth into heaven, and whoso gainsayeth him, he casteth into hell. Asked Garib, And how, O uncle, saith whoso worshippeth? this puissant lord who over all hath power o oh, my son answered the sheikh i am of the tribe of ad which were transgressors in the land and believed not in allah so he sent unto them a prophet named hud but they called him liar and he destroyed them by means of a deadly wind 
but I believed together with some of my tribe, and we were saved from destruction. Moreover, I was present with the tribe of Thamud, and saw what befell them with their prophet Salah. After Salah, the Almighty sent a prophet, called Abraham the Friend, to Nimrod son of Canaan, and there befell what befell between them. Then my companions died in the saving faith, and I continued in this cave to serve Allah the Most High, who provideth my daily bread without my taking thought. Quoth Garib, O uncle, what shall I say that I may become of the troop of this mighty Lord? Say, replied the old man, there is no God but the God, and Abraham is the friend of God. So Abraham embraced the faith of submission, with heart and tongue, and the sheikh said to him, May the sweetness of belief and devotion be established in thy heart. Then he taught him somewhat the biblical ordinances and scriptures of al-Islam, and said to him, What is thy name? And he replied, My name is Garib. Asked the old man, Whither art thou bound, O Garib? So he told him all his history, till he came to the mention of the ghoul of the mountain whom he sought, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and twenty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Garib became a Moslem, and told the sheikh his past, from first to last, till he came to the mention of the mountain ghoul whom he sought, the old man asked him, O Garib! Art thou mad that thou goest forth against the ghoul of the mountain single-handed? And he answered, O my lord, I have with me two hundred horse. O Garib, rejoined the hermit, hast thou ten thousand riders, yet shouldst thou not prevail against him? For his name is the ghoul, who eateth men we pray, Allah for safety. And he is of the children of Ham. His father's name was Hindi, who peopled Hind, and named it, and he left this son after him, whom he called Sa'adan the ghoul. Now the same was, O my son, even in his sire's lifetime, a cruel tyrant, and a rebellious devil, and had no other food than flesh of the sons of Adam. His father, when about to die, forbade him from this, but he would not be forbidden, and he redoubled in his forwardness, till Hindi banished him, and drove him forth the land of Hind, after battles and sore travail. Then he came to this country, and fortifying himself herein, established his home in this place, whence he is wont to sally forth, and cut the road of all that come and go, presently returning to the valley he haunteth. Moreover, he hath begotten five sons, warlike warlocks, each of whom will do battle with a thousand braves, and he hath flocked the valley with his booty of treasure and goods besides horses and camels and cattle and sheep. Wherefore I fear for thee from him. So do thou implore Almighty Allah to further thee against him by the talil, the formula of unity. And when thou drivest at the infidels, cry, God is most great. For saying, There is no God but the God, confoundeth those who misbelieve. Then the sheikh gave him a steel mace, an hundred pounds in weight, with ten rings, which clashed like thunder, when as the wielder brandished it and a sword forged of a thunderbolt, three ells long and three spans broad, wherewith, if one smote a rock, the stroke would cleave it in sunder. Moreover, he gave him a hauberk, and target, and a book, and said to him, Return to thy tribe, and expound unto them al-Islam. So Garib left him, rejoicing in his new faith, and fared till he found his companions, who met him with salams, saying, What made thee tarry thus? whereupon he related to them that which had befallen him, and expounded to them al-Islam, and they all Islamized. Early next morning Garib mounted and rode to the hermit to farewell him, after which he set out to return to his camp, when, behold, on his way there met him a horseman, Capapier, armed so that only his eyes appeared, who made at him, saying, Doff what is on thee, O scum of the Arabs, or I will do thee die. Therewith Garib crave at him, and there befell between them a battle such as would make a new-born child turn grey, and melt the flinty rock with its sore affray. But presently the Badawi did off his face-veil, and lo, it was Garib's half-brother Sahim Alel. Now the cause of his coming thither was that when Garib set out in quest of the mountain ghoul, 
Sahim was absent, and on his return, not seeing his brother, he went in to his mother, whom he found weeping. He asked the reason of her tears, and she told him what had happened of his brother's journey, whereupon, without allowing himself aught of rest, he donned his war-gear, and mounting rode after Garib, till he overtook him, and there befell between them what befell. When, therefore, Sahim discovered his face, Garib knew him, and saluted him, saying, What moved thee to do this? Quoth Sahim, I had a mind to measure myself with thee in the field, and make trial of my lustihood in cut and thrust. Then they rode together, and on the way Garib expounded al-Islam to Sahim, who embraced the faith nor did they cease riding till they were hard upon the valley. Meanwhile the mountain ghoul espied the dust of their horses' feet, and said to his sons, O oh, my sons, mount and fetch me yonder loot. So the five took horse, and made for the party. When Garib saw the five Amalekites approaching, he plied shovel-iron upon his steed's flank, and cried out, saying, Who are ye, and what is your race, and what do ye require? Whereupon, Falun bin Sa'adan, the eldest of the five, came out, and said, Dismount ye, and bind one another, and we will drive you to our father, that he may roast various of you, and boil various, for it is long since he has tasted the flesh of Adam's son. When Garib heard these words, he drove at Falun, shaking his mace, so that the rings rang like the roaring thunder, and the giant was confounded. Then he smote him a light blow with the mace between the shoulders, and he fell to the ground like a tall-trunked palm-tree. Whereupon Sahim and some of his men fell upon him, and pinioned him. Then putting a rope about his neck, they haled him along like a cow. Now when his brothers saw him a prisoner, they charged home upon Garib, who took three of them captive, and the fifth fled back to his sire, who said to him, What is behind thee, and where are the brothers of thee? Quoth he, Verily, a beardless youth, forty cubits high, hath taken them prisoner. Quoth Sa'adan, May the sun pour no blessing on you, and going down from his hold, tore up a huge tree, with which he went in quest of Garib and his folk. And he was on foot, for that no horse might carry him, because of the bigness of his body. His son followed him, and the twain went on until they came up with Garib and his company. When the ghoul fell upon them, without word said, and slew five men with his club. Then he made at Sahim, and struck him with his tree. But Sahim avoided the blow, and it fell harmless. Whereat Sa'adan was wroth, and throwing down the weapon, sprang upon Sahim, and caught him in his pounces, as the sparrow-hawk catcheth up the sparrow. Now when Garib saw his brother in the ghoul's clutches, he cried out, saying, Allah ho! Akbar! God is most great! O oh, the favour of Abraham the friend, the Muhammad, the Blessed One, whom Allah may keep and assain. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section thirty three. Recording by Bill Borst.